Spearmint Chewing Gum. The refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Henley Conrad, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Conrad. How are you? Fine. Uh, can you take a job? No trouble at all. Well, this is it. On Thursday of last week, we got a call from the New York police. They'd confiscated about $100,000 worth of rare gems. A man named Wells had been murdered, and they found the jewels in the water pipe beneath the sink. Your company insure Wells? No. But one of our clients in Europe was robbed about three months ago. The same jewels? We think so, but we can't be positive. They've been removed from their settings, and some of the larger ones have been recut. The police are holding Mrs. Wells, and she claims the jewels are rightfully hers. She says neither she or her husband knew they were hidden in the water pipes. Well, unless it can be proved the jewels were stolen, she's just liable to end up with them. Possession, huh? Yeah. It's a funny one. When can you start? I've started. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, World Insurance, and Indemnity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Stanley Price matter. Expense account item one, $21.85. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City after receiving from you the necessary information concerning the case. I arrived in New York at 10 o'clock that morning and went directly to police headquarters where I looked up Captain Fred D. in charge of robbery detail. Now, uh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Glad to help you any way I can. Well, if it isn't too much trouble, I'd like the whole thing from the beginning. Sure. Last Thursday, we got a call from a man named Price, Stanley Price. He said if we came to 956 East 114th Street, we'd find 100,000 in stolen jewels. Then there was a shot, and the line went dead. When we got there, we found the dead man. Wells? Yeah, Robert Wells. Shot twice in the head. You're holding the wife? Not since 8 o'clock this morning. We've got no evidence. No murder weapon, nothing. And of course, she swears she knows nothing about it. Your company thinks the jewels belong to one of their clients. Yeah, but they've been taken out of their settings and recut. Such a good job, they can't be identified. Hmm, only one thing that ties in... Wells returned from Europe last Tuesday. Been over there for about three months. The robbery was abroad. Yeah. Got anything on the man who gave you the tip? Stanley Price? No, nothing much. We know a Stanley Price. We think it's the same man. He's small-time hood. Picked up a couple of times. No convictions. Been making book lately, but we can't prove it. Can't find him anywhere. We got an APB out on him. And you released Mrs. Wells? Yeah. She living in the same place? Well, she went back to the apartment. She's still there. We got it staked out. Well, it seems to me the first thing to do is find Stanley Price. <laughs> We'd like to. I've got an old friend that knows all about small-time bookmakers. I'm going to drop by and have a talk with him. Anyone I know? Oh, probably. But he'd be hurt if I mentioned his name. <laughs> Hope you make out. Now, what about the wife? You going to see her? After I take care of a few details. What's she like? You won't mind a bit. I 
I left headquarters, checked into a hotel, then made arrangements to rent a car. At 12.30, I was pulling up in front of a brownstone in the village where an old friend lived. His name is Henri Duval, abstract painter and lover of Paris. Mutuals. Henri. Who who is he? Come on, Henri, open up. Go away. It's Johnny Dollar, Henri. I don't trust no one. My landlord is a man of many voices. I'm not your landlord. Scouts on out. Cross my heart. Johnny, <laughs> mon ami, <laughs> Johnny. I haven't much time. I need a favor. I save. I save. Uh... Hello. For you, a portrait costs only um, fifty dollars. No pictures, Henri. No pictures. Ever heard of a man named Price, Stanley Price? No. Paid your rent. Uh, same answer. I have a small ten-dollar bill here. Mon ami, you would attempt a lowly bribe? Well, what do you know? Here's another ten. Uh, you, you know, I would ask you to stay for lunch, but Greenbaum will not even let me look in his delicatessen window anymore. Twenty-five? Uh, bien. But I only do it because I have the love for Greenbaum. Show a little interest in Stanley Price for a minute. Stanley Price, here. <laughs> Peasant. He's a bookmaker? Hmm, of a sort. He owes me eleven eighty. Marianne in the eighth at Ayalia, by eight lengths. Mon Dieu, such a filly. Henri. Stanley Price. Ah, oui, oui, the low life. Where can I find him? Je ne sais pas. Henri? But it is the truth. Scout's honor? But of course. If I knew where the peasant was, would I not collect my 1180? But of course, Scout's honor. Uh, look, you see? You're only holding up one finger. Uh, Le Cob Scout. Oh. When was the last time you heard from him? When he took my two dollars that wins for me the 1180. And then he was in the fish business. Fish business? Ah, oui, oui, oui. I know because he brought me two elevators which I promptly made into a magnificent bouillabaisse for my landlord. <laughs> Terrible. The stew? I mean, no, me, no, me, no. Just the fish. Uh, believe me, those two elevators were so old, they remembered Jonah. Was he selling fish? No, 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 no. He was not selling fish. He was not selling fish. He was catching them. He had a boat. When I went down to collect my 1180, the boat was not there. Where did he keep the boat, Henri? Uh, <laughs> a disgusting place. It was called... Uh, uh, oh, a schooner landing. A place like that simply should not be. Do you know why? Stinks. Mm. Well, thanks, Henri. Oh, but, but you, you are leaving. Yeah, you can unlock the door. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Hello, bonjour, mon ami. Vive la force. I climbed back into the rented coupe and drove to the waterfront where I finally located Schooner Landing. A lot of small boats were tied up in slips, and an old man sat outside a shack at the head of the dock, sunning himself. Hello. Hello. You run this landing? Yep. You know a man named Price? Stan Price? Yep. Yep. Seen him lately? Nope. When was the last time you saw him? You're a cop. Nope. That's too bad. Why? He owes me a week's rent on a boat. Skip off? Yeah. Understand he was fishing down here. That right? Yeah. How long ago did he rent the boat? Two weeks ago. When did he skip out? About a week. Anything unusual about 
things that he did? Well, he weren't no fisherman. Why do you say that? Yeah, he didn't know the first thing about it. Fishing, that is. When he first rented my boat, he used to go out for two or three hours, come back with a couple of fish. He didn't have no gear to speak of, no live bait. Just a pole. Well, didn't that seem kind of strange? Weren't none of my business. He had a license. You mean a regular fishing license or a commercial? Yep. Commercial? Yep. Did he do anything unusual the last day he was down here? Well, don't know. He went out about four o'clock in the afternoon, was back here about six thirty. Only thing unusual about that, uh, it's a funny time to do fishing. What date was that? Week go yes. Oh no, no, wait, no. It's, it's a week go tomorrow, Wednesday. Oh. Thanks, Pop. You sure you ain't a cop? Yep. G man? Nope. Don't say no more than you have to do. Nope. Bye, Sonny. I left Schooner's Landing and made a beeline to the Bureau of Licenses, where I located the fishing license that had been issued to Stanley Price. It had his picture on it, and the clerk allowed me to take it. I thanked him, then climbed back into my car and headed for 956 East 114th Street and Mrs. Wells. Yes? My name is Dollar. What can I do for you? I get tongue-tied when I stand in a hall. You want in? That's it. Why? Ever see this picture before, Mrs. Wells? Come in. The uh, man in the picture, who is he? Don't you know? I've only seen him once. Oh, won't you sit down? Thanks. Where did you see this man, Mrs. Wells? He came to see my husband. He was leaving just as I arrived. Your husband say who he was? No, mentioned something about some business he had with him. Well, if it makes any difference to you, this man in the picture is Stanley Price. Oh, the one the police are after. The man they think killed my husband. The man who called and told the police about the jewels your husband hid in the water pipe. You're from the police? No, I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. Your husband just got back from Europe a week ago, didn't he? Yes. By boat? Yes. What day did he arrive? Last Wednesday. You know, I don't think I've ever seen a man with such attractive eyes. They're really very unusual. <laughs> nice hair, too. So curling. I'll stop back when I've got more time and we'll straighten it out. I'm leaving? Yes, I'm going home and have another talk with Dad. Well, in case I might want to get in touch with you... I'm staying at the Shelton. Oh, uh, by the way, what time did your husband's boat dock? Five o'clock. Thanks. Sure. Say hello to Dad. I finally managed to get down to my car and drive back to the hotel. I called Lieutenant D and briefed him with what had happened to date. Then I went downstairs to get some lunch. As I crossed the lobby... Don't turn around. What is this? Just keep looking straight ahead. I want something. I was just going to have some lunch. It'll keep... Well, if I haven't got much time, give me the picture. Oh. Let's have it. And if I don't? Then you get shot right in the lobby of the Shelton Hotel. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, a lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, 
delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Let's have it. Well, it's the only one of me on a bare rug facing east. What'll Mom say? The picture of Stanley Price. Okay. That's being smart. Now, you stay put. Count ten before you turn around. Believe me, Dollar, I mean it. I'll kill you if you move before ten. You're being pretty silly, Price. They'll pick you up sure. I don't think so. Oh, by the way, Henri Duval says to thank you for the 1180. Uh, 1180? Oh, yeah, tell him it was nothing. It sure wasn't. Start counting. One, two, button my shoe. Three, four, close the door. Five, six, pick up six. I counted to 20, just to be on the safe side. Any guy who'd stick a gun in my back in broad daylight in the middle of a hotel lobby was pretty desperate. I finished counting, put in a call to Henri Duval... Then headed for the robbery division and Captain D. Right in the hotel? Yeah, not ten minutes ago. I had that picture of Stanley Price from the fishing license. Well, I don't get it. What's so important about that picture? Certainly not the only one of Price. We got mugs on him in the file. I got a big hunch. My boss said it was important to prove those jewels were stolen or have somebody positively identify them. And if this wasn't done in a certain amount of time, the jewels would automatically go to Mrs. Wells. Well, that's right. Under normal circumstances, if we couldn't prove they were stolen or that they belonged to someone else, we'd have to turn them over. But there are enough extenuating circumstances. Uh, the killing of Wells, the way the jewels were hidden in the pipes, the robbery in Europe, and Wells' subsequent return a short time later, we can hold on to them for a long time. Don't. What? Do me a favor and turn them over to Mrs. Wells. I think it'll bust this thing wide open. That's a big order. Look, the guy who stuck me up in the lobby knew I had the picture. Somebody had to tell him where I was staying. Only people who knew that were you, Mr. Conrad from my company, and Mrs. Wells. All right, Mrs. Wells told Price. It wasn't Price. It wasn't? Not unless he paid Henri, uh, that is a friend of mine, 1180 in the last couple of hours. Maybe he did. He didn't. I checked. Look, I, I'm sorry, but I'm confused. Yeah, so am I a little. But I figure something like this. Wells arrived last Wednesday by boat in the afternoon around five. That's right. Stanley Price was being a fisherman then. Okay. He'd rented a boat, taken out a fishing license. The day that Wells arrived, Price went out in the afternoon, stayed about two hours, came back, and then disappeared. Then Wells shows up with a sink full of jewels. Right. Probably had him on the boat. Avoided customs by dropping them overboard, and Price picked them up. Yeah, and Price could have killed him for them. Oh, it doesn't make sense. Wells was killed in his own apartment. Yeah? If Price picked up the jewels out of the water, why go to Wells, give him the jewels, let him hide them in the sink, kill him, leave without getting them, and then call the police? I'm convinced. Another thing. The pickup was pretty carefully planned. Wells couldn't have done it all by himself. He was in Europe. Somebody here had to plan it. Someone who knew Wells had the jewels. The wife. Yeah, looks that way. And the guy who stuck you up wasn't Price. Maybe there's a third party. Yeah, could be, but I doubt it. I'd like to go down to the morgue and take a look at Wells. Sure, I'll call him. Okay, Charlie. Uh, uh. Didn't help his face. How'd you get an identification? A wife. This isn't Wells. It isn't? This is Stanley Price. You sure? The picture on the fishing license. This is the same guy. I'll have Mrs. Wells picked up. And miss out on the big catch? Let me take the jewels over to her. It'll look official. Insurance company agent and everything. The captain was reluctant, but he agreed. We went back to headquarters, and he presented me with 100,000 in jewels. I left for Mrs. Wells' apartment, followed by two of New York's finest. The captain was agreeable, but cautious. 
The boys staked out across the street, and I went into the building and up to the apartment. Hello. I spoke with Dad. Was his advice sound? Oh, he just said there were bound to be days like this. Then come in. Is this going to be uh, business? I come bearing gifts. Oh. I'm afraid the police can't keep these any longer. Uh, the jewels? Mm-hmm. There you are. I don't understand. Well, there's a little law after a certain but time. But the last time I talked with the police, they said they could impound them until my husband's murder was cleared up. Oh, afraid not. You mean I just get them? No strings? Not a one. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Sit down. Sure. Now, you work for the insurance company, don't you? Uh-huh. Well, my husband wasn't insured. Oh, he should have been. Not that you need the money now, but just suppose you hadn't been lucky enough to have your sink stopped up with all those nice little jewels. If my husband wasn't insured, why are you mixed up in this? You really want to know? Uh-huh. My company thinks those jewels were stolen from one of our clients. I just can't stop looking at your eyes. They're even bluer in this light. Honey. Mm -hmm. Get to it. All right. I think something's real wrong. Wrong? Mm-hmm. I thought maybe you'd like to tell me what it's all about. Well, you've got the jewels. And what do you think I'm going to do with them? Well, that's up to you, isn't it? Your company thinks these jewels are stolen, and you're just turning them over to me. Can't do anything else. <laughs> Mr. Dollar. Johnny. Uh, Mr. Dollar, it's too easy. Disappointed? Well, suspicious. I've been around a little while. Somehow I guessed that. And I think you're trying to put little Lois in a bind. Really? Yeah. And even if you've got the prettiest eyes in the whole wide world, I'm not going to let you. You have something in mind? Mm-hmm. Good night. What? Oh! It landed right behind my right ear. I don't know what it was, but it was hard and it was cold. Whoever was on the other end of it had moved up behind the couch while Lois had kept me occupied. I went right to sleep and stayed that way for about ten minutes. When I came to, I was all alone, except for a large swelling that was getting big enough to wear a hat. I stumbled downstairs and looked for the two policemen on stakeout, but they disappeared too. So I found a phone booth and put in a call to Captain D. Uh, they're, they're tailing the wife. Stillman just checked in and said they were with her downtown. She's doing some shopping on Fifth Avenue. She's a decoy. She's leading your boys away from Wells. Where are you? In the Wells apartment. I got slugged about ten minutes ago. Wells must have been in the apartment the whole time. After he put me to sleep, the wife probably left by the front door and led your boys downtown while Wells left by the back way. Huh. You can bet he's got the jewels. He'll try to get out of town. I'll have every exit from the city covered. Okay, but he's smart enough to know that. When you're through, meet me at Schooner's Landing. Schooner's Landing? Yeah. My guess is Wells is going to take a boat ride. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon when I arrived at Schooner's Landing. The old man was walking up from the slips. Hello, Sammy. Pop, which boat was Stanley Price renting? That one. Just getting ready to go out. I just got through gassing her up. Fella paid me prices back rent. Wait, 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 there's something wrong? Uh, dollar. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wells. Bob! Drop the gun, Dollar. Drop it! The police are right behind me. Okay. Sit down. You taking him? He's an insurance man. He's going to be our insurance. If the police try anything, I'm going to shoot you, Dollar. Hold the gun on him while I get us out of here. I thought you were shopping on Fifth Avenue. I was. Those two policemen that were following me probably still think I'm trying on lingerie. That's what happens when the police force hires gentlemen. How's your head? Uncomfortable. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll bet. Boys. Yeah? Take over the wheel. Keep it headed right for the breakwater light. Know anything about boats? They float. It's going to be a long ride. It'll be pretty rough when we hit open water. 
You're Robert Wells, aren't you? That's right. How'd you figure it? I saw Price in the morgue. Your wife identified him as you, but the picture on the fishing license showed he was Price. You didn't know whether I was working with the law or not, but you had to get the picture to give yourself enough time to get out of the country. I knew the damage it could do if it got to the police. Why did you kill Price? He wanted 50% to fence the stuff. I said no and then caught him phoning the police. Had to kill him. So you put your papers on him and told your wife to identify him as you. The jewels were in the pipes under the sink. I knew the law would be there in ten minutes, so I had to take a chance they wouldn't find him. Bob, there's a boat coming up pretty fast. So what? I hate to spoil the party, but I think it's the Coast Guard. Bob! Shut up and stay with that wheel. But it looks like the police... Shut up! All right, Dollar. Get up on the bow. Oh, I'll get seasick. Oh. I want him to see you. Look, I don't swim very well. How about if I take this life preserver? Put it down. Sure. Ah! 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 <laughs> Stay right there, honey. Stop your boat. Heave to. Better do like the man says. Come on, Dollar. Stop that boat. All right, all right. Keep your barnacles on. Expense account item two. Eight dollars and seventy-five cents for a big dinner that made up for the lunch I'd missed. After that, I went back to the hotel and got myself twelve hours of a good night's sleep. Expense account item three. The twenty-five dollars I'd bribed Henri Duval with. The last time I saw him, he was in Greenbaum's delicatessen spending the money with his arm around Greenbaum. They were both smiling. Expense account items four and five, forty-two dollars and fifteen cents, car rental and hotel bill. Item six, fifteen dollars and sixty-five cents, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, a hundred and thirteen dollars and forty cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were John Stevenson, Kenny Delmar, Jay Novello, Howard McNear, and Mary Shipp. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. For your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip James, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. James. Got a job for you. I'm available. This is an arson case. We insure the business of a Mr. Lester Matson. Plastics. Old factory burned down. $700,000. Police found definite evidence that rules out accident. How was it set? Some kind of high-octane fuel. Any suspects? No, not yet. 
Lieutenant Ridgeway at New York headquarters will fill in the details. When can you leave? Oh, a couple of hours. Fine. Good luck, Johnny. Mind if I break in here for a moment to say a few words? Just the other day, I was having lunch with a group of newspaper reporters. We were talking about the government and what goes into its operation when a thought struck me. It's a funny thing, I said. They call one branch of the government the State Department when it handles all of our foreign affairs. Can any of you fellows explain that? Well, one of the reporters who writes political news piped up and said, actually, the State Department does more than handle foreign affairs. It also publishes all of the laws that have been passed by Congress and issues all the passports and visas for anyone traveling outside the United States. Well, just then the waitress brought us our coffee and she entered the conversation. Don't forget, she said, if you're ever on a quiz show, you can maybe win a trip to the moon by telling them that the State Department has the job of making sure the great seal of the United States doesn't get lost. And it acts sort of like a governmental Emily Post, too. While she was making out our checks, she added this bit of information. Did you ever hear of the Division of Protocol? That's part of the State Department, too. It's the outfit that makes sure foreign diplomats who visit America get introduced the way they should and get seated in the right places at official dinners and things like that. Well, after she gave us all that information, we tipped her and went back to work. And now I think it's time we got back to our program. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lester Matson matter. Expense account item one, $17.55. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived in New York, registered at a hotel, and rented a car, which I drove to police headquarters. Lieutenant Ridgeway was a tall, nice-looking man with a pleasant smile and a firm handshake. Glad to help you as much as I can, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Thanks, Lieutenant. Now, how much do you know so far? Only that the Matson plastic factory burned down. Not all the way, but nearly. And that you suspect arson? Positively. We made our report to your company, Mr. Uh... James. Yeah. He told me about the high-octane fuel. Mm-hmm, and a ten-gallon can. Night watchman heard the explosion, but by the time he got there, the fire was out of control. He could see the can and the fuel burning. He could smell it, too. No suspects? No, not yet. Any leads? The owner. You think he did it? No, no, he couldn't have. He was with his daughter at a dinner party. Then you think he had someone else? No, 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 I don't think so. But you said he was a suspect. No, no, I said I had a lead. He's it. Something wrong, Dollar. I don't know what it is. First, I just put it down to the natural behavior of a man who just lost his business. Later on, when I talk with him further, well, I can't really put my finger on it, but I think he's hiding something. He knows something about that fight. Scared. And that's it? Yeah, that's it. I'm pretty sure he didn't have anything to do with it. It's too successful. Nice bank account, wonderful home, wonderful daughter. Well, the factory was really worth a whole lot more than what he'll collect on the insurance, wasn't it? Well, that's what Mr., uh... Uh, your boss. Uh, James. Yeah, James. That's what he said. The assets of the business were in the millions. Yeah. Well, if anything, this will really be tough on Matson. Have to build again. Dyes, molds. Well, I think I'll stop out and see him. Yeah. Let me know what you think. I'll do that. The Matson home was across the river in Jersey. A big white colonial with a long circular drive that led up to the front door. A butler showed me into a spacious study, and I was told Mr. Matson would be down shortly. While I waited, I walked around and cased some of the first editions on the bookshelves. Oh. Hello. Hello, I'm Christine Matson. I'm Johnny Dollar, Miss Matson. I'm waiting for your father. Oh? Yeah. I'm uh, an insurance investigator. Insurance investigator? About the fire. Oh, yes. You have a beautiful house. Why, thank you. Beautiful. Wonderful collection of books. Mm, Yes. 
I don't imagine one person could read them all. Not in a lifetime. No, I suppose not. Do you like to read, Mr. Uh... Dollar? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so bad with names. So am I. Yes, I like to read, but I don't get much time. Been playing tennis, huh? Mm hmm. And just got back. Do you? Not anymore. I used to play a little. Well, I. Uh, I guess I'd better get upstairs. Nice meeting you. It's nice meeting you. Will you be staying. I mean, will you be around for any length of time while you're investigating the fire? Well, that's hard to say. I hope so. Hello, Chris. Oh, hi, Dad. How was the game? Fine. Mr. Dollar? Yes, sir. I'm Lester Matson. How do you do? You two have met? Yes. Yes, I was just on my way upstairs. See you later, Dad. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Well, uh, your company notified me you'd be coming down, Mr. Dollar. Uh, you have a seat. You're uh, an investigator. That's right. Well, the police have already made a pretty thorough investigation. Yes, I've talked with Lieutenant Ridgway. Well... I can't tell you any more than I've already told them. You were at a party the night of the fire? That's correct. It's all in the report. With your daughter? Yes. When did you find out about the fire? When I arrived home. I... Mr. Dollar, I explained to you... But you've said that... everything to the police, yes. That's right. There's absolutely nothing I can possibly add... Mr. This... Matson, you're insured with my company for a lot of money. Hmm. Hardly what I lost in the fire. I'm aware of that. But I have a job to do, and this is an arson case. That's what the police say. A night watchman says so, yeah, too. He could have been mistaken in the excitement. He could very Mr. easily... Mr. Matson, what difference does it make? It makes a great deal of difference. Your factory burned. You've suffered a considerable loss. I certainly have. I can understand how that would make a difference. But a fire is a fire. If you didn't have anything to do with it... I most certainly did not. Then why so much concern about whether it was deliberately set or not? Well, wouldn't you be concerned if somebody deliberately set fire to one of your factories? About the fire, yes, but buildings burn down all the time. Fires are started deliberately all over the country. I am sure this one was an accident. Well, accident or the work of a pyromaniac. If you're clear, you'll get the insurance. You, uh, you think this is the work of a pyromaniac? Seems like a pretty reasonable assumption. But you're sure it was an accident? Oh, I... I don't know. I uh, just don't like the idea of a fire like that being started deliberately. I admit it's a little frightening. Yes, yes. You have to understand, a business like mine, so many inflammables, it's a little terrifying to think someone would deliberately start a fire. Well, what if it had happened during working hours? That's not very probable. Well, I've read about fires in hotels, people burned to death. Deliberately started by some madman? Yes, the firebug would have a good chance in a hotel. He wouldn't be seen so easily. Most of the people in their rooms, and he could get in and out easily. And most of those fires are started during the night sometime. But a busy factory in the daytime isn't very likely. Hmm. Well, I... I sincerely hope you're right. I'm just going by the records. Uh, you see, I... Uh, I have two more plants. Let's hope I don't turn out to be the exception to the rule. I doubt it. Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Matson, I've still got to make a full report to my company. Oh, uh, certainly. I'll give you all the information I can. Lieutenant Ridgway had been right. Something was troubling Matson. Until I had suggested the possibility of a fire bug, he was determined to convince me the fire was simply an accident, and he'd been resentful of the impending interrogation. Then the pyromaniac angle had given him some kind of an out because he'd relaxed immediately. While I questioned him about the details of the fire, he seemed actually cheerful, even resurrected a few old bromides that I politely chuckled along with. But he told me nothing I hadn't already learned from the lieutenant, so I thanked him, shook his hand at the front door, and climbed back into my car. As I drove off, I felt sorry I couldn't have seen the daughter again, because it was certainly a sight worth seeing again. And again. I arrived back at the hotel, went up to my room, and put in a call to Lieutenant Ridgway. What'd you think? Yeah, something's bothering him. Yeah, yeah, I know, but what? Did you ever mention the possibility of a fire bug having been responsible for the fire? To Matson? Yeah. No, I don't think I did. Well, I mentioned it to him, and he liked it. What do you mean? 
Until I did, he was determined to call the whole thing an accident. When I suggested a pyro, he made a complete about-face. Oh, he was subtle about it, but he forgot the accident theory. That's right. Yeah. He seemed actually relieved. Oh. What do you think it means? I don't know. It could mean he knows who started the fire. If he thought we were looking for a pyro and not some specific person that could incriminate him, that would account for his letting go of the accident theory. I see. He agree with the pyro theory and hope we do the same. Oh, what can he gain? Financially, he ends up in a hole. Yeah. Insurance doesn't figure. Oh, no, he's loaded. Got all the money he needs. And it's something else. Somebody started that fire, and I'm pretty sure Matson knows who and why. Yeah, now all we've got to do is find the who and why. Well, I don't mind working on the case for a while. Have you seen his daughter? Uh, yeah. Maybe she started the fire. Well, why would she do that? She's the type that could. I just met her for a minute, and I'm still smoldering. Lieutenant suggested a stakeout for Lester Matson. I told him I'd check with him later, took the cold shower, changed, and went down to the hotel bar to freshen up a bit. It was about 4.30, and I was pretty fresh when a page came wandering through calling my name. He told me I was wanted on the phone. Johnny Dollar. This is Christine Matson. Mr. Dollar? Yes. Hello. I found out where you were staying from your company. Well, that's nice. Why did you find out where I was staying from my company? Well, it's very important that I talk to you. All right. Where are you? I don't want to meet you at your hotel. I, I have to be very careful. Well, so do I. That's not what I mean. If certain parties saw me with you, my father's life would be in danger. Is this about the fire? Yes, it is. Would you meet me at the corner of 5th and 115th Street in a half hour? Sure. I'll be in a cab. I'll pick you up. I'll be the guy with the fire extinguisher. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He has been called a lawyer by profession, a fighter by choice, and a politician by force of circumstance. And he was outstanding in all three fields. In 1788, at the age of 21, he was appointed public prosecutor for the region which is now Tennessee. As president, he was the first to introduce the National Convention for the nomination of presidential candidates. During his campaign for the presidency, his opponents attempted to smear him by an unwarranted attack on his wife, Rachel, who never recovered from the ordeal and died just before her husband's inauguration. If you don't have his name by now, here's one more clue. During the Battle of New Orleans, as Major General of the Army, he accepted the help of the pirate Jean Lafitte. Who was he? Andrew Jackson, 7th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. <laughs> And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. As long as the lovely Miss Matson was picking me up in a cab, I left the rented car behind and charged up expense account item two. $1.65 for cab fare from the hotel to 5th and 115th Streets. It was getting dark by the time I arrived. I waited for about 10 minutes until Christine Matson's cab pulled up at the curb and she opened the door for me. Go ahead, driver. Well, good evening. Is this a terrible inconvenience? Oh, not a bit. Where are we going? I just told him to drive around. Mr. Dollar, my father's being blackmailed. In connection with the fire? He had nothing to do with the fire, Mr. Dollar. But he knows who did. Yes. They burned the factory to frighten him, to make him pay the blackmail. You mean someone's shaking him down? Well, about a week ago, he was approached by two men. They demanded he pay them a certain percentage of the profits from his business. In return for the percentage, they guaranteed him protection. So he didn't pay, and they set fire to the factory? That's it. 
Why didn't he go to the police? Well, he was frightened. Well, he couldn't have been too frightened if he refused to pay them. He was frightened for me. He thought maybe he could bluff them by not paying, but he didn't want to take a chance and go to the police for fear they might really do something serious. Losing a million-dollar business is pretty serious. He tried to bluff them, and it didn't work. Now he's really frightened. He knows they mean business, and they've told him if the police ever find out, they'll do something a whole lot worse than just start a fire. Do something to you? That's what Dad's afraid of. And you're not? Of course I am. Aren't you taking a pretty big chance telling me about it? Well, you're not the police. And I have been very careful. I was hoping you could help without it being necessary to start a wide-open police investigation. You're not giving the police much credit. If you'd told them the same story, they'd have kept it completely undercover. Oh, I thought about it, but too many people would have to know about it. And there's always the chance of someone saying something or, or a slip-up. How do you know about all this? Well, my father told me, of course. Just like that? Daughter, darling, two men have been trying to oh, blackmail me? Oh, don't be silly. He said nothing at first. He kept it from me. But you see, my father and I are very close, Mr. Dollar. We've never had any secrets. After the fire, when I saw how disturbed he was, I made him tell me. Does he know you've come to see me? Oh, no, no. He made me promise not to tell anyone. Well, I just had to. He's agreed to pay the men. You know what that means. Mr. Dollar, will you help? Well, I'll do what I can, but it's going to be tough without your father's cooperation. And you'll never be safe until these men are caught. He's afraid of what might happen before they're caught. Why, if they find out... There's no middle of the road in something like this. He's got to understand that. I think he does, but... Well, he'd rather lose everything than lose me. I'm all he's got. And he's pretty important to you, isn't he? More than anything in the world. Without his cooperation, I doubt if I'll be able to do much. And if he gives in to this, a man like your father, it'll keep growing until it kills him. Well, what do you want me to say? Tell the driver to take us to your father. Say it's all right for me to talk to him. All right, Mr. Dollar. She looked as though she might cry, but she didn't. She gave the driver her address, then sat back in the seat and kept looking straight ahead while the cab headed across the bridge for New Jersey. Expense account item three, $11.75 cab fare, which I insisted upon paying after we arrived at the Matson home. The butler met us at the door, and Chris led me into the study where her father rose to greet us. Hello, Dad. Uh, hello, my dear. Mr. Dollar? Good evening, Mr. Matson. Dad, I told Mr. Dollar. I had to. Believe me, Mr. Matson, it's the best thing. Chris? Yes. My dear girl, this... This can be very serious. Dad, it's already serious. I know, I know, but... but tell me, do you intend to bring in the police, Mr. Dollar? I promised your daughter I wouldn't. Unless it was absolutely necessary. I see. Uh, you you know everything? Yes, Dad. I told him everything. But you've said nothing to the police as yet? No, I haven't. Oh. Mr. Dollar, if these men find out that you know... Who are these men, Mr. Matson? Mr. Dollar, I would like to tell you something. In the past, I've always confided in my daughter. This time I hesitated because of the, the possible consequences. But nevertheless, I, I told her. I did so with the provision that she keep the affair a complete secret. Oh, Dad. Uh, I, I'm not angry, my dear. Believe me. I'm sure you did what you thought was best. Unfortunately, you just didn't realize the gravity of the situation. Certainly I realized Dear, it. Dear, you couldn't have. You couldn't have. These men aren't fooling. They've already destroyed a million-dollar business. It was just lucky there wasn't anyone in the building. So you're going to give them what they want? Yes, Mr. Dollar, I am. You can't win. I'm not expecting to win. I'm... Just thinking of my business, my family. What would you do in the same situation, Mr. Dollar? I think you'd do exactly what I'm doing. I don't think so. That's easy to say. Look, Mr. Matson, I know you're in a tough spot. You said these men aren't fooling, and you're right. They'll do anything to scare you into paying their blackmail. 
They'll burn down a building, threaten you and your family, even kill if it comes to that. But you wouldn't do what I'm doing? Maybe. If I had some assurance, it would stop there. But don't you know what happens once you give in to them? Don't you think I've thought about that? Don't you think I've considered every possibility? They'll bleed me and bleed me until there's nothing left. I realize that. But there's no alternative. It's that or... You're or... afraid they'll kill me. Chris. Chris, you're my whole life. Well, then, Dad, consider me a little. Consider? Good Lord, that's what I'm doing. That's all I'm doing. Not now. What about a year from now? Two years? Five years? Well, Dad, if you give in to these men, what will it do to you? What will you have left five years from now? The business doesn't matter. I'm not talking about the business. We can both get along without the business if we have to. We did once, we can do it again. I'm talking about you. What will happen to you if you give in to this terrible blackmail? Well, there'll be nothing left of you. It'll kill you. Mr. Matson, in some states there's a death penalty for kidnapping. But this kind of blackmail is worse than that. These men kidnap the one thing that people like you and me can't live without. Freedom. My daughter's life is worth my freedom seven days a week, Mr. Donner. If that happened, I'd just as soon be dead. Daddy, it would ruin you and that most certainly would ruin me. There'd be nothing left of us, nothing of what we had. We'd just be alive. Makes a lot of sense, Mr. Matson. I hope you'll see it and help me get these men. But whether you do or don't, I've got a job. I'll try to steer clear of the police as long as I can because I made a promise to your daughter. But I'm going to try and get those guys. They have to be gotten. Dad, please. I don't know, Chris. I... All right. Oh, Who are the men, Mr. Matson? <laughs> Shot tore through the window and caught Matson in the chest. It was a swell punctuation point for my pep talk on freedom. Before Matson hit the rug, I was on my way to the study door with my gun in my hand. Outside, I circled to the spot near the window where the gunman had been standing. I stopped and listened. From inside the house, I could hear Christine Matson phoning for a doctor. And from not too far away, toward the front of the house... I heard a car start. I ran out to the drive and spotted the car pulling away about 50 yards from the house. Mr. Dollar! Johnny! Get back in the house, Chris. But Dad's bleeding. I can't stop the bleeding. How bad is it? I can't tell. I called Dr. Phillips. Well, get back in that house and wait. I got the car, but there's a man in that car with a shotgun. He may still be able to use it. Now, go on. I started down the driveway for the wrecked car. It was on its side, wrapped around a big oak. The only thing moving was the right front wheel, still spinning slowly. I reached the car and looked in. The shotgun, twisted by the impact, lay on the floor. The man who'd fired it was halfway through the windshield. His life running out all over the hood. The driver's seat was empty. Don't move an inch. I'll turn around. Hand your gun back over your shoulder. Okay. I'll walk back to the house. Police will be coming any minute. I just want a car. We'll borrow one of Mr. Matson's. How far do you think you'll get? It's not how far I'm going to get. How far we're going to get. You're an insurance man. You're going to be my insurance. You're going to get us just as far as you can. It all depends what your life's worth to the law. I couldn't see his face. He kept behind me with his gun pointed at my back. We went around to the other side of the house to the garage and stopped. He shoved the gun hard into my spine. Open the door. As I started to open the big garage door... A car swung in the driveway, and we were suddenly framed in the glare of its headlights. I knew it was the doctor. The man with the gun in my back didn't. He turned, expecting the police. (laughs) 
Doctor? Yes. Your patient's in the house. Lester Matson lived and later identified both men as those that had tried to shake him down. They both had long records. Both had done time. The man with the shotgun was named Ernie Starbuck. The other, Stan Cole. Starbuck they buried in Potter's Field, while Cole looked unhappy. Not because he'd lost a partner, more because he'd gained a new one. A cellmate in Sing Sing he'd have to put up with for the rest of his natural life. After the doctor said her father was out of danger... I went back over to Jersey to say goodbye to Christine Matson. Do you have to go right away? Well, case closed. Expense account likewise. You, um, you live in Hartford? Yeah. Sometimes I drive up that way. Oh? That would be nice. When does your train leave? 4.30. I don't catch that one. There's not another one until 12.15. Oh, Will you be saying goodbye to Dad? I thought I'd stop by the hospital on my way to the station. Are you going in to see him? Mm-hmm. Drive in with me. We can see him together. Maybe have a quick drink afterwards. I don't like quick drinks. No. Johnny. Yeah? Would it make so much difference if you took the later train? Oh, it sure would. But, uh, I'll take it. Expense account items four and five, $103.75, car rental and hotel bill. Item six, $19.80, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $154.50. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were John Larch, Bill Lillian Bayef, Hal March, and William Johnstone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring John Lund, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Ray Kemper, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Kemper. Are you available? Oh, very much so. We insured a Mrs. William Post, New York City. She was killed last night. Yeah, how? Murdered. A private detective named Paul Sachs and a lawyer named George Simon found her in her apartment. She'd been stabbed to death. Any suspects? 
Yeah, her husband, William Post. Lieutenant Roseman of the 5th Precinct is handling the case. Contact him. He expects you. Okay, I can leave in an hour. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the William Post matter. Expense account item one, $18.90, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived in the afternoon, registered at the hotel and rented a car, which I drove to the 5th Precinct Police Station, where I met Lieutenant Roseman, an old friend. I haven't seen you in a long time, Johnny. How's it going? Oh, can't complain. You're a lieutenant now. Yeah, getting up in the world. Hmm. Well, how about filling me in on this post-killing? Sure. A woman's name is Teresa Post, married to William Post, banker. She was found last night in her apartment, stabbed four times, gag shoved in the mouth, apartment robbed. A private detective named Sachs found her, huh? Uh-huh. And uh, Mrs. Post's lawyer. George Simon. Right. They both arrived at the apartment about the same time. Both had appointments with the victim. They got worried when she didn't show up. Found the janitor and he opened the apartment for them. They discovered her lying on the floor in the bedroom. What was missing? According to her husband, all her jewels, about $15,000 worth. Also a cloth coat. My boss said you were considering the husband. Yeah. Three days ago, they had an argument and separated wife was filing for a divorce. She'd suspected Post playing around for some time, so she hired Sachs, a private detective. Sachs got the evidence, and she confronted her husband with it. He moved out and into a hotel. Sachs and the lawyer were supposed to meet her at 8 o'clock so that Sachs could turn over the evidence on her husband to the lawyer. Well, what makes you think it's the husband? Well, robbery looks phony. The jewel's okay, but the coat, the cloth coat, the only item of clothing that was stolen... Yeah? There was a full-length mink and a stole left in the closet. Oh, mm-hmm. The husband got an alibi? Sure. The woman he was seeing. The one who busted up the marriage. Oh, who is she? Well, the name of Hughes. Jane Hughes. Lives at 109 West 61st Street. And she claims Post was with her at the time of the murder? The victim had been dead about three hours, killed around five in the afternoon. Hughes' woman swears Post was with her all afternoon from about one... Till late that evening. How'd the killer get into the apartment? That's another thing that makes me suspect the husband. No evidence that shows the killer broke in. No way he could get in a window. The apartment's on the eighth floor, and a fire escapes at the end of the hall. Well, I'd like to talk to the people involved. Oh, sure, Johnny. What do you want to start with? The man who found the body. I'm Sachs and Simon. I'll take Sachs first. Roseman gave me the address of the private detective, and I drove over to 52nd Street where I located my man. Paul Sachs was small, with a sour look and a wet handshake. What can I do for you, boy? I'm investigating the Post murder. Uh Uh-huh. So, well, well, well. Insurance man, huh? That's right. She insured for much? I forgot to ask. Yeah, probably is. Old man's loaded, boy. When did Mrs. Post retain you? Oh, about a month ago. Well, the fifth, to be exact. Wasn't too hard. The old man was pretty open about it. 
He was careful, all right, you know, stayed to the more discreet places, but uh, he was... Well, you know how those fellas are. Last one to think someone's checking up, so they aren't as careful as they should be. Want a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I was lucky. Lucky? Yeah. Paid me up in full before the old man cut her up. Sure you don't want a little belt? I uh, know. It's um, a little early. Uh, don't blame the old boy much, though. How's that? I mean, that little bit of fluff he was chasing around with. Mighty nice. Oh, yes, sir. Mighty nice. Hey, I got a couple of pictures here. Cops have got duplicates. I uh, keep these for the family album. <laughs> Uh-huh. You think Post killed his wife? Oh, yeah, sure. He certainly had the motive. Threw him out and was going to take him for everything. I've been in on things like this, boy. You know, a man like me gets mixed up in all kinds of things. Murders like this, cut and dried. I'll tell you what. He made his mistake by taking that coat and leaving the mink. Stupid mistake. Real stupid, boy. The police say she was killed around five in the afternoon. Yeah, that's right. Well, she was cut up something off. Where were you at five, Mr. Sachs? Yeah. Me? Oh, nothing personal. <laughs> You're barking up the wrong private detective, boy. I didn't have no motive. I was right here in my office. Didn't finish work till around six. I got other cases, you know. Can you prove you were in your office? Can I prove? Well, boy, if I got to prove it, I'll prove it. But there ain't no motive, boy. Why would I want to kill her, huh? You ain't thinking, boy. When you've been investigating as long as I have, you won't run around asking ridiculous questions like that. Yeah, I should be ashamed of myself. Well, Mr. Sachs, it's been a real pleasure. You gotta go, boy? Yeah, I'm afraid so, but it's been charming. Good. You need any help? Just give me a call. Oh, I'll do that, boy. My next stop was the office of Mr. George Simon, attorney at law. The surroundings were a little different from Sachs's private pig pen. A big suite of offices with a big suite of secretaries. George Simon greeted me with a professional smile and offered me an overstuffed chair. Yes, I arrived at Mrs. Post's around five minutes to eight. My appointment was at eight sharp. When did Sachs arrive? He was already there, waiting in the hall. He said he'd just come up in the elevator, but that Mrs. Post had not answered his ring. Lovely fellow. You met him? Yes, a few minutes ago. Well, we waited in the hall, thinking that Mrs. Post was late and due to arrive at any minute. Ten or fifteen minutes later, I got worried. I knew how important the meeting was, and I couldn't understand why she'd forget it. I had talked to her that afternoon. What time? Th that I talked to her? Oh, I'd say around three. She seemed, uh, all right? Well, she wasn't particularly happy about the situation. They'd been married for seven years. But other than that, nothing else seemed to be bothering her? If it was, she didn't mention it. All right, you waited for about five or ten minutes. Uh, yes, yes. Then I then I located the janitor and had him unlock the door. We found Mrs. Post in the bedroom. I called the police immediately. Did Mr. Post know that you were meeting with his wife? I have no way of knowing that. Do you think he killed her? No, I don't think he's the type to kill anyone. Mrs. Post was certainly going to get a sizable settlement. She was going to ask for one. And Mr. Post knew that she was. I believe she told him. She mentioned to me that she had. Uh, how large a settlement? We hadn't arrived at any figure. I was supposed to meet her and this private detective. I was supposed to look over the evidence, and then we were to discuss future plans. Uh, where were you at five o'clock, Mr. Simon? Here in my office. I was here all day except for lunch. All right, sir. Thank you very much for your trouble. Glad to help. But I don't think Mr. Post killed his wife. Well, I can't disagree with you. You don't think he did? I can't agree with you either. You see, uh, I just don't know yet. See you later, Mr. Simon. The next person on my list was Miss Jane Hughes, the reason for the marital rift between William Post and his wife. She lived on the seventh floor of an attractive apartment house on West 61st Street. And when she opened the door for me, I could understand how any man might stray a little if Jane Hughes smiled at him once too many times. Hello. Can I come in? You might, if I knew who you were, what you wanted. The name is Johnny Dollar. What do you want, Johnny? Just a little talk. Any special subject? 
William Post. Goodbye, Johnny. And uh, Mrs. William Post. Didn't you hear me, Johnny? I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Lieutenant Roseman thought I should talk to you. I thought you were a reporter. Well, now can I come in? Just put one foot in front of the other. Well, thanks. I'll try it. I didn't mean to be rude, but you understand about reporters. Oh, you weren't rude. Have a seat. Thanks. Why are you investigating me, John? Oh, routine. That's all routine. I'm just going to tell you the same thing I told the police. All right. Bill, Mr. Post, was with me most of the afternoon. How long have you known Mr. Post? About six months. We're just good friends. Yeah. I know. It's not like that at all, Mr. Dollar. We're just good friends. Okay. Oh, that's a shame. I'm afraid you'll have to leave. Mr. Post? Would you mind going out the back way? Well, I've got to talk to him sooner or later. Make it later, huh? Well, generally, I'm a gentleman, but... But uh, this time, you'll make an exception. Might prove interesting. All right. Why don't you answer it? Sure. Mr. Post? Who are you? Johnny Dollar. What are you doing here? Bill? Yes? Mr. Dollar's an insurance man. Insurance? I'm with Columbia or Risk. Oh, uh, don't close the door. He wants to talk to you. At my office, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. That's the way you want it, Mr. Post? Exactly. Now get out of here. You've got no business Mr. here. Mr. Post. Get out! Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. On the police list, William Post was the number one candidate for the killing of his wife. On my list, he was just a wealthy banker with a dead wife, a seductive girlfriend, and a nasty personality. I'd run into many a nasty personality in my travels, so I let the incident roll off my back and drove over to the Park Avenue apartment where Mrs. Post had been murdered. In the basement, I located the janitor, a bent little man who was working on the plumbing and singing a flat chorus of Dixie. Hey, Pop. Yep, Pop. He's not far. Pop. Yeah. Are you the janitor? Mm-hmm. What's your name? It's Pete. You want to do me a favor, Pete? Pete Kellett. Who are you? My name is Johnny. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurry, hurry. When Johnny comes marching hey, Pete, home Pete. again, hurry, Pete. Hurry. Hey, Pete. Pete, I want you to do something for me. I don't know you. I'm an insurance investigator. Yes. You got a pass key to number eight? Well, have you? Number eight? Where the woman was murdered. Oh, I'm busy. When Johnny comes to me, she's home again. Pete, Pete. Oh, Pete, Pete. Pete. Hey, Pete. Pete. I want you to let me into number eight. What for? Because I'm investigating Mrs. Post's murder. Can't. It's all right. I'm working with the police. 
Who'd you say he was? My name is Dollar. You said it was Johnny. That goes in front. It's Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny, that's a funny name. When Johnny comes to my kid home again, Henry, there ain't nothing for you to see in number eight. I just want to look over the place. Why? I just want to take a look around. I don't want to go up there. Well, then give me the key. I can't. I got ten dollars that says you can. Make it twenty and I'll let you look over number three. Folks are out of town for a couple of months. I just want to get into number eight. Okay. Oh. Thanks. You opened the door last night for Mr. Sachs and Mr. Simon, didn't you? Who? How long have you worked here? Oh, I don't know. I guess I worked here. Oh, let me see now. Oh, my. I just worked here. Oh, for just a long time, I guess. That's all. You uh, knew Mrs. Post? Yes, yes, I knew. Have you ever seen Mr. Sachs or Mr. Simon before last night? Uh, who? The men you let into Mrs. Post's apartment. I saw him last night. I never saw him before. Not even once I never saw... Oh, I didn't like that one of them. Oh, he, that one with that squinted face. He squinted it all up and he had those dirty teeth. Sex. Who? The one that squinted his face all up. Oh, I didn't like him. Well, thanks, yeah, Pete. I didn't like Mrs. Post either. Why not? I just didn't like her. She... Sweet, sweet chariot, come and carry me home. I let myself into number eight and took a good look over the whole place. There was still blood on the bedroom floor, but everything else had been cleaned up. And there was nothing that gave me any ideas. The mink coat and stole were still in the closet. I went back downstairs to give Pete his keys, but the funny little man wasn't around. I left the keys on a bench near the furnace, went back out to my car and drove to the hotel. I showered, shaved, wrote the first half of this report... And then started to go downstairs to have dinner. Johnny Dollar. Roseman, Johnny. You got something interesting on the post case. Oh, good. Somebody pawned that cloth coat late this afternoon. You know who it was? No, I'm just on my way down to the pawn shop to get a description from the pawnbroker. You want to meet me? Where is it? 945 East 185th Street. I'll see you there. <laughs> I climbed back into my car and drove uptown to the pawn shop. Lieutenant Roseman was already there, talking to the pawnbroker. And the answers he was getting were very interesting. You remember the man who pawned the coat? Oh, yes, he was a kind of small, funny-looking fella. He didn't say much, just handed me the coat and took what I gave him. You know, I remember the circular, what you sent. Seems strange, a man like that having such a nice coat. I thought, right away, that was stolen. Uh, the man was small? Yeah, uh, kind of stooped over. Anything else? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had a habit of zinging to himself all the time, under his breath. The first good lead. Roseman and I drove back to Mrs. Post's apartment and went down in the basement, where we found Pete Keller to sleep on an old cot. Hey, Pete. 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 Come on, wake up. Yeah. What do you want? You remember me? Should I? I was down here this afternoon. Oh, I guess I do. You remember Lieutenant Roseman? Uh, was he with you? Yeah, come on, Pete. We're going down to the station. Now? Yeah. You uh, pawned a coat late this afternoon. Huh? A cloth coat. Uh, the one that was stolen from number eight. You pawned it. I don't know nothing about no coat. Let's go, Pete. Right now? Right now. Uh, okay, but I ain't had much sleep. That plumbing, it keeps a man awake all night. Uh, just let me get my shoes. I got shoes and you got shoes. Oh, God's children got shoes. I got We took Pete Keller down to the precinct and questioned him for half an hour. But he refused to admit that he'd ever pawned the coat or that he knew anything about it. The pawnbroker was sent for, and we all went down to the lineup for an identification. Pete Kellett was in the first line. Third man. Number three, murder. Number three, step up. Number three, you. Uh, You're number three, aren't you? 
Well, if you'd like me to be... Uh, then step out. Oh, sure. Is this okay? Just answer the questions. Do you mind if I sit down? Just stand right there and face the front, hands at your sides. Oh, I'm awful tired. Plumbing keeps me awake all night. What's your name? Uh, I said, what's your name? Lieutenant. Oh, it's yeah. Pete. That's the man. The Pete he Kelly? is the where one that torn the coat. Oh, what do you mean? You sure? I mean, oh, where's President the place President. Okay. Oh! Sergeant Hanley. Yes, Lieutenant. Number three, hold for interrogation. Okay, you step back in line. Me? Yeah, you. Oh, I thought you wanted to hear where I was Step coming. back. My goodness. We had a positive identification. The pawnbroker had pointed out Pete Kellett as the man who'd pawned the coat. We took the little janitor down to the interrogation room and worked on him for five long hours. But he didn't crack. Pete. Huh? Why don't you save us all a lot of trouble and admit it? What? Bet you killed Mrs. Post. Oh, why should I admit that? You want me to tell the truth, don't you? Oh. Pete. Uh, yes. You did pawn the coat, didn't you? Yes. Okay. Where did you get it? Uh, from Mrs. Post. And you stabbed her? No. Then how did you get it? Well, she give it to you me. You expect us to believe Why, that? sure. Why didn't you tell us this in the first place? Well, I thought if you knew, you'd think just what you're thinking. She gave you the coat? Uh, yes. When? Well, a couple of days ago. You told me you didn't like her. I didn't. She gave you a nice coat like that, but you didn't like her? No. Then why did you take it? Why not? Now, look, you... Lieutenant. Yeah? Come here, man, will you? Can I go? You move a muscle and I'll bust you. Oh. I tell you, Johnny. Yeah, I... yeah, I know. But after all, he's... He's nuts. There's a more polite term for it. He's nuts and he's guilty. You want to find out if he is? I know. I mean guilty. Find out and eliminate all this questioning? How? He's scared of that room. He wouldn't take me up to number eight, although he gave me the key. I think we can scare him into a confession. I'll try anything. Of course, there's a chance he's telling the truth. If he is, I'll eat your shoulder holster. Well, turn him loose. Send him back to his job. Well, what's that going to do? You just hang around and watch. Roseman agreed to continue questioning Kellett for another half hour while I got things ready then release him and take him back to the Park Avenue apartment. I left the precinct and drove to Jane Hughes' residence on West 61st Street. Oh, you'd better leave. Look, this is very important. Who is it? It's me and I'm coming in. Now, Dollar, you listen to me. No, you listen. I don't like you, Mr. Post, but I've got a chance to clear up this mess and get back to Hartford, so I'll be far enough away to keep from belting you in the teeth. Now, we think we know who killed your wife. Who is it? The janitor of the building. Old Kellett? That's right, but we've got to prove it. I'll need your permission and Miss Hughes' help. I can't let Miss Hughes get involved in anything that might in okay, any way... Okay, okay, I'll see you later. Wait a minute, Johnny. What do you want me to do? Jane. It's all right. It's important to me. This hasn't been the most pleasant situation, Johnny, but regardless of what anyone thinks, I'm going to marry Bill. We're in love. I'll send you a box of rice if this works. What do you want me to do? I want you to be Mrs. Post. The dead Mrs. Post. What? Let him finish. I want you to go up in that apartment... Dress like Mrs. Post and call Kellett, the janitor. Tell him there's something wrong with the plumbing. Play it straight, as though nothing had ever happened. Are you out of your mind? Do you think... The police that... will be there. No. Let's go, Johnny. I drove Jane Hughes to the apartment where Roseman was waiting. She got dressed in one of Mrs. Post's nightgowns and a robe, then buzzed the basement. Well, what about my voice? Just keep it low. Pete? Who is this? Mrs. Post. What? what you... There's something the matter with the plumbing. Will you come up and fix it? Pete? Did you hear me? Uh, yes. Will you come right up? Yes. Yes. 
Here he comes. Come in, Pete. Uh-uh. What's the matter? You're dead. No, I'm not. Come in. And didn't I kill you? No, I'm all right. No, no, no. Something's wrong. No, you're dead. Stop being silly. Come in here. Well, if he ain't dead, if I didn't kill you the first time, I'd better do it now. Don't move, Pete. Yeah, well, Snap what? on the lights, Miss Hughes. Put down that knife, Pete. Is it all right? Yeah, yeah. Why, well, you ain't Mrs. Post. No. Well, then she is dead. I did kill her. That's right, Pete. Oh, I feel better. Pete had the jewels hidden in a bucket of paint in the basement. He finally explained that he was in the process of robbing Mrs. Post when she came home, surprised him, and he had to kill her. He didn't take the minx because he thought the cloth coat was prettier. I drove Jane Hughes back to her apartment, where a grateful William Post was waiting with open arms. And that was that. Expense account item two, $15.85 for a late dinner for Lieutenant Roseman and me, after which I retired to my hotel bed and slept for about ten hours. Expense account items three and four, $35.75, hotel bill and car rental. Item five, $16.55, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $87.05. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Jack Moyles, William Johnstone, Benny Rubin, Charles Davis, Mary Jane Croft, Hi Everback, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hanley Conrad, Johnny. Oh, how are you, Mr. Conrad? Fine. Are you employed? Not at the moment. How about catching the next plane for Los Angeles? All right. What is it? We insure a Mr. William McEdwards. His home burned down last night and he was killed in the fire. Who do I see? C.H. Anderson, Beverly Hills Chief of Police. All right, I'll call the airport and make a reservation. The 
The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, World Insurance, and Indemnity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amita Buddha matter. Expense account item one, $193.55. Plain fare and incidentals between Hartford and Los Angeles. I arrived at the Los Angeles airport the next morning, rented a car, and drove it to the hotel where I registered and put in a call to Chief Anderson at the Beverly Hills Police Department. An hour later, we were sitting in his city hall office. Lieutenant Hankins got the call at seven minutes after six in the evening, placed by a neighbor. house was almost completely gutted by the time the fire department got it under control. Hankins found McEdward's body in the bedroom. He'd been alone in the house? Yeah. His wife returned about an hour later, found her husband dead. Swell homecoming. How'd the fire start? We're not sure. Started in the bedroom. One thing's pretty certain... It wasn't an accident. What do you mean? The first cursory examination by the coroner's deputy indicated the victim had burned to death. This morning, we got another report. Further examination at the morgue showed McEdwards had been stabbed. What? Mm Mm-hmm. Also hit over the head. Severe skull fracture. So you think McEdwards was killed first and the fire started to cover the crime? Yeah. That's how I came into it. Ordinarily, Lieutenant Hankins would handle the whole thing. Uh... This murder angle is confidential, Dollar, until the coroner files an official report. Sure. Any suspects? No, not yet. Well, thank you, Chief Anderson. I think I'll go out and talk to the widow. That's all right with you. Sure. Uh, But don't mention the murder angle. I won't. Where's she staying? With her mother in Encino. Yes? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'd like to speak to your daughter, if I may. What's it about? The death of her husband. I'm a special investigator for the insurance company. Well, Mr. Dollar, my daughter's not feeling very well. I know it's difficult, Mrs. Rizzinelli, but if it's at all possible, I'd like to see her. Get it over with. Get it out of the way. Oh, who is it, Mom? Oh, she's up. She was resting. Well, who is it? This is Mr. Dollar, honey. He's, uh... Uh, Is it about Bill? Yes, it is. He's a special investigator, an insurance investigator. Well, come in. Thanks. I was lying down, Mr. Dollar. I'll be in the kitchen. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. Nice meeting you, Mrs. Rizzinelli. Well, won't you sit down? Thank you. You're with the insurance company? Yes, World Insurance and Indemnity. Uh, How can I help? Just answer some questions. I'm sure you've had your fill of answering questions by now. It's all right. Uh, You returned about an hour after the fire. Is that correct? That's right. Where had you been? I'd driven to Pasadena. Bill, he had to work so he couldn't go with me. A few days ago, Mr. McEdwards, that's Bill's father, returned from a location trip to Korea and gave us an antique... An old Chinese Buddha. We wanted to find out about it, so I took it to a friend of ours in Pasadena who collects Oriental art. A Buddha? Yes. Bill's dad found it in Korea and gave it to us as a sort of belated wedding gift. We'd only been married for six months. Uh, When did you leave for Pasadena? Oh, around four in the afternoon. 
I would have left sooner, but I had to clean house and fix Bill's lunch. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but it's still a little hard to talk about it. Just a few more questions. I'm all right. Did anything unusual happen? Unusual? Well, anything your husband might have said before you left. Anything out of the ordinary that happened? I don't understand. Why do you think something unusual might have happened? Is there something I don't know about this, Mr. Dollar? No, no, it's nothing like that. I'm just checking everything. There was a fire. My husband lost his life. Are you considering that it might not have been an accident? I'm not considering anything. I'm just checking. Uh, this Buddha, where is it now? Charlie Wilkins, our friend in Pasadena, has it. He wasn't sure, but he thought that it might be very rare, and he asked me to leave it for a few days. Charles Wilkins? Yes. And your husband's father brought the Buddha back from Korea? Yes. Is uh, Mr. McEdward Sr. in the service? No, he's a production man for international pictures. He was making a documentary film in Korea. I'd like to talk to him. I think he's at the studio now. He lives on Beverly Glen. Well, I'll try to reach him at the studio. Thank you very much for your time and patience. Certainly. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. I left the attractive valley home and drove back to the hotel, where I put in a call to International Studios for John McEdwards, the victim's father. His secretary told me he was at home, but that she'd deliver my message and have him call me. In about five minutes, McEdwards called, and I made an appointment to see him. I drove out sunset toward Westwood Village and turned north on Beverly Glen. John McEdwards lived in a small house in the middle of a lot of acreage. The reason for the acreage met me at the high cross gate. Four giant Great Danes faced me behind the steel fence. Their owner, a tall, wiry, middle-aged man, bounded down the steps of the house and ordered his animals to be silent. Hush! Easy, easy! Come on, Simpson! You, Mr. Dollar? Uh, yeah. I'll be with you in a minute. Come on. Get over there. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. That's it. My name is Mr. Dollar. Uh, wouldn't it be just as well if we talked out here? They won't hurt you. Come on in. Now, easy, Sam. Easy. Well... Ah, nice doggy. They're all right. Just as friendly as they can be. Ah, well, my gosh, they are. I'm McEdwards. Glad to know you, Mr. McEdwards. Oh, easy, boy. Sammy, Sammy, quiet. I'm just shaking his hand. Come on into the house. Fine. Sure hate to run into that pack if you weren't around. They wouldn't do anything unless maybe you tried to break in the house or something. There's an article in the paper not too long ago about some guy trying to break in the house. The owner's great dame spotted him going in the window and broke his neck. Broke his neck? Yeah. No, 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 Samson, you stay out. Samson? <laughs> yeah. Samson, Delilah, Cleopatra. I, I call her Patty. And the Duchess. Sit down. Thanks. The Duchess is the mother. She threw 12 her first litter. I, I, I kept three. Well, you didn't come here to talk about dogs. Can I get you a beer? No, thanks. You want to talk about Bill? Yes, yes. Wonderful boy. Terrible thing. I'm just trying to keep busy and not think about it. It's pretty tough. You raise a boy and see him through all these years? Yes, sir. What do you want to talk about? How long were you in Korea, Mr. McEdwin? About three months. I understand you brought back an old Buddha. Yeah. Why? I saw your daughter-in-law, she told me. How's she taking it? Pretty well, I'd say. Yeah, what a wonderful girl. Never thought Bill would get married, but... He sure picked the right one when he did. Yeah. Tough, isn't it? Only been married six months. Tough on Pat. Mm. Tell me something about this Buddha. Well, it it was funny how I found it. I was helping build a dam. We had to block up a small stream and get the water to rise for a shot we needed. I was digging up some rocks a few yards away from the road, and I uncovered the old Buddha... It was in a box. Nice, neat hole. Your daughter-in-law said she took it to Charles Wilkins. 
that he thought it was very rare. Yeah. Why are you so interested in the Buddha, Mr. Dollar? Oh, just a casual interest. My company sent me out to investigate the fire, and when your daughter-in-law mentioned the Buddha, I got interested. Your company insured my son's life. That's right. You didn't know Bill, did you? No. Nice boy. Easy going. Never thought about insurance or things like that until he met Pat. Then he settled down. Best thing that ever happened to him. Are you sure you won't have a beer, Mr. Toller? Oh, no, really. Thanks, it's the same. Oh, those darn dogs. There must be someone at the gate. Oh, it's Pat. Hi. Hi. Oh, now get that. Come on, come on. Shove him back. Hi. Hello, honey. Hi, Dad. Oh. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello. Mr. Dollar, I just had a visit from Police Chief Anderson. He came just after you left. That's why you asked me all those questions. He told you. Yes, he did. What is it? Dad, the fire wasn't an accident. What? What? Well, Pat, what is it? What do you mean it wasn't an accident? Would you tell him, Mr. Dollar? If you'd like me to. What is it, Mr. Dollar? The fire wasn't an accident, Mr. McEdwards. Somebody deliberately... Bill was murdered. Oh, honey, honey. <laughs> Mr. Dollar. Yeah. But why? Mr. Dollar, do you think it had something to do with that Buddha? I don't know, Mrs. McEdwards. I'm trying to find out. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. John McEdwards walked me down to the gate and through the Great Danes. Then I drove to Pasadena and met Mr. Charles Wilkins, authority on Oriental art. I can't say absolutely. I'm still doing research. But I believe the Buddha to be the original Amita image Buddha. What does that mean? Well, in Buddhism, there's more than one Buddha. Each may have an earthly life, but there is never more than one in the world at any time. And Buddhas come into being at irregular intervals and only when there is a special need for their presence. In the Mayana system of Buddhism, there are 300 million Buddhas. But the Amita is one of the five Buddhas of contemplation. And the Buddha Mr. McEdwards found is the original Amita? I'm almost positive that it is. I, I believe its origin dates back to sometime around 200 B.C. What would you say it's worth? Well, that would depend. To a responsible collector, oh, really no way of telling. Well, let's say you were a wealthy, responsible collector, Mr. Wilkins. Yeah, let's just say responsible. How much would you pay for the original Amita Buddha? Well, if I could buy it for, say, 150, maybe 200,000... 200,000 dollars? I would be getting a bargain... I would go as high as half a million if I had the money. Well, Mr. Wilkins, thank you. This thing is worth half a million? That's what the man said. Well, now, that's what I call a motive. Yeah. 
If the Buddha is really an art treasure, then the U.S. Customs Office is going to be very interested. That's their affair. I'm interested in who killed Bill McEdwards. Well, I don't know where this will take us, but at least it's a lead. Only the real one I've had so far. We questioned all of the victim's associates, and what we could find out, he didn't have an enemy in the world. No love rivals, no discarded girlfriends, no money troubles, nothing. But he had the Buddha. Yeah. Question is, who knew he had it, besides his wife and father? Well, how about the location troupe? Old man McEdwards was with in Korea. Mm Mm-hmm. I'll check with the studio right away. Yeah. But it's not just somebody who knew he had it. It's somebody who knew the value of it. Somebody who's hep to oriental art, huh? Maybe the guy who buried it. Why would anybody stash a prize like that in a hole in the ground? Well, for safekeeping, maybe. There's been a war in Korea. Yeah, thanks for telling me. But say it was the person who buried the thing. Why would he have to steal it? He could just step up and claim his property. If he was the rightful owner. But suppose he stole it in the first place. Yeah. Well, I like guessing games as well as the next one, but it's time I got to work. Where are you going to start? First, the motion picture company, then we'll check all incoming passengers from the Orient last week. Ships, planes, military personnel. That shouldn't take more than a month. You got any better ideas? At the moment... No. Then I want another talk with McEdwards Sr. I thought I'd run out and see him this afternoon. Yeah, do that. If you turn up anything, let me know. Sure. If I do. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I was just finishing some dinner. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, don't be silly. Come on in and have a cup of coffee with me. If you haven't had your dinner, I'll be glad to throw on a couple of chops. No, thanks. I don't get hungry early. Have a seat. Thanks. You want some coffee, don't you? Yeah, that'll be fine. I'm not much of a bachelor. Wife died three years ago, and I still haven't got used to doing things like cooking, keeping house. Usually eat out. You take uh, cream or sugar? Black is fine. Pat was in a... Pretty bad way after you left, but she finally came around all right. That's tough. Yeah, it is. I wanted to talk some more about... Oh, darn. Excuse me. Hello? Well, yes, hello, dear. Uh, yes, yes, she worked. She hadn't. Well, she left here about, oh, I'd say about 5.30, maybe quarter six. Well, she might have stopped off someplace. No, 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 don't worry about it. No, she was just fine when she left. Oh, sure. Oh, uh, I'm all right, dear. Sure, sure, I will. Bye. Funny. Hmm? That was Pat's mother. She isn't home yet. When did she leave here? Oh, about two hours ago. Well, we're all on edge. Oh, I don't think there's anything to worry about? No. She's taking pretty well. When she left, she was fine. I talked with Mr. McEdwards for about another hour. He told me everything he could about the Buddha and his trip to Korea. He looked dead tired. His eyes were beginning to show the strain. I decided to say good night and forget the rest of the interrogation until the next morning when the phone rang again. Hello? Eh? What? I'm sorry, I didn't say... Yes, that's right. Yes. But, but, But wait. Hello? 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 Something wrong? I'm not supposed to say anything. What was it? I think you're a nice guy, Johnny. Can I trust you? Certainly. They said not to tell anyone, but I've got to trust someone. I, I can't think for myself. Too much has happened. You, you won't take this to the police. I can't promise that. Well, I don't think you will after I tell you. I don't know who that was on the phone, but it was some guy, and and he said they've got Pat. What do you mean, they've got Pat? Kidnapped. Now, look, exactly what was said. Good gosh, you, you, you read about things like this, but you you never think they're going to happen. Now, take it easy. Oh, oh, I'm all right. I, I just haven't had much sleep. I, I can't think straight. Now, the man that called, 
he said he had Pat, that she was all right for me not to say anything to anyone, or she'd get hurt. He said for me to get the Buddha. And that is it. They said to get it, and they'd see that Pat was returned home safely. What did they say to do with it? Just to get it, they'd contact me. What are you going to do? Get the Buddha. Wait a minute. Let me go. They might be watching. They'd know I told you about the phone call. They won't do anything to Pat until they get the Buddha. I'll call Wilkins. He's probably in the book. Don't you think it would be better if I went? Yeah, maybe it would. But I'm going to follow you. If anything happens, I want to be around. All right, let's go. Wilkins turned over the Buddha while I waited outside his house, watching for anyone who might have followed. The drive back to McEdward's home was uneventful. No single car stayed with us for any length of time from the freeway to Beverly Glen. While McEdwards opened the gates and drove his car into the garage, I parked in a secluded spot some 50 yards away from the house and walked back, where I met McEdwards at the foot of the front steps. You think you were followed? No, I don't think so. Well, I've got the Buddha. What do I do with it? Wait till you hear from them. They said they'd contact you. Yeah. You think I should call Pat's mother and tell her what's happened? No, not yet. No sense in worrying her until we find out what's going to happen. But, Dad... Pat! Good evening, Mr. McEdwards. John McEdwards had visitors, two men. One rather slight, fairly young. The other an enormous man, a good six and a half feet that must have weighed well over 300 pounds. The slight one held a 38 pointed in our direction. Pat started across to McEdwards, but the big man stopped her. Sit down. What is this? Allow me to introduce myself. Alan Sutka. And this is my friend, Don Roach. We've come for the Buddha. I let him in with my key, Dad. I had to... Sure. It's, it's, it's okay. Who's your friend, Mr. McEdwards? Yes, I warned you not to confide in anyone. This is Mr. Dollar. He's just an old friend. How unfortunate for Mr. Dollar. You've gone to a lot of trouble to get this Buddha. Indeed, I have. Nearly five years, to be exact. Now, what is your interest in this matter, Mr. Dollar? Purely professional. Are you a policeman? Not quite. I see. Mr. McEdwards isn't responsible for my getting mixed up in this. I was here when you called and forced him into telling me. As I said before, most unfortunate. Now, Mr. McEdwards, I'll take the Buddha. Not yet, you won't. Oh? Perhaps you don't understand. Yeah, that's it exactly. Which one of you bums killed my son? Killed your son. He was killed, Sutker. The fire didn't work. The police know all about it. Indeed. Come on, Mr. Sutter. Let's get this over with and get out of here. Patience, patience. You'll have to forgive my young friend. How did you know Mr. McEdwards had the Buddha? Its discovery made the Tokyo papers. I did some checking, found out when Mr. McEdwards was returning to the States, flew here to meet him. Why'd you kill my son? I don't mind telling you. Under the circumstances, I cannot afford to let any of you live. Your son discovered Roach here in the act of burglarizing his home. He protested too much. Roach had to kill him. It wasn't premeditated. We assumed the Buddha was in the house. We knew that Mr. McEdwards here had delivered it to his son the night before. Why, oh, you... Take it easy, take Mr. it easy. Mr. Dollar's right. Should you get out of hand, Roach will shoot you on the spot. Now, if you don't mind, I'll have that Buddha. Oh, Dad. Without hysterics, if you don't mind. Just one more question. How did you know about the Buddha? Mr. Dollar, I've known about that particular Amita Buddha for many, many years. Another man knew about it also. Unfortunately, he was the first to locate it. His name was Wu Sung, an oriental collector. He discovered the Amita Buddha in a Tibetan temple shortly after World War II and stole it, then smuggled it out of Tibet and into Korea. I followed him and made him a handsome offer, but he refused to sell he died under rather mysterious circumstances. But I didn't have the chance to leave Korea with the Buddha. The war. Very astute, yes. The communists suddenly attacked, and there was absolutely no way I could get the Buddha out of the country without someone discovering so it. So you buried it? A few hundred yards from Wu Sung's home. I imagine the house has long since vanished from the face of the earth. I bided my time in Tokyo, waiting for hostilities to cease. But as fate will have it... Mr. McEdwards uncovered my prize. Mr. Sutker, you talk too much. <laughs> I enjoy it, Roach. And after all, what good will the information be to our friends? Come on, let's get the Buddha. Yes. Now, Mr. McEdwards, you will either turn over the Buddha or Roach will kill you immediately. Give it to him. 
care. Thank you. Now, if you'll all lead the way down into the yard, we'll proceed to my car and take a short trip. Oh, Dad. It's all right, honey. Now, if you please. Beautiful animals, Mr. McEdwards. I'm glad they were penned up when we arrived. They could have caused no end of trouble. They still can! McEdwards had belted the big boy right in his enormous middle, and Roach stepped in and swung his gun. As McEdwards dropped, the dogs penned in behind the tall fences went crazy. Samson, the big male, went over the ten-foot fence like it wasn't even there. Before I knew it, I was up to my elbows in great days. Timmy! Timmy, let him in! Timmy, stop it! Hey, Delilah, get back there! Are you all right? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Why didn't they go after me? They knew you were helping. My face, my face, get a doctor, get a doctor. This lung's pretty bad. How's the big one? Huh. You were right about Danes. What do you mean? The one you were telling me about that broke the man's neck. The fat man ran into the same sort of situation. He's dead? He sure is. Well, that's the way it should be. Samson was my son's talk. Expense account item two. $33.85 hotel bill. Item three and four, $299.75. Car rental, plane fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $527.15. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were James Nusser, John Stevenson, Jeanette Nolan, Sammy Hill, Bill James, Herb Butterfield, Robert Griffin, and Edgar Barrier. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's adventure, The Case of the Sanguinary Spectre. 
Well, here we are, Dr. Watson. This time it's a sleet storm we've waited through to reach your cheerful fireside. And the Sherlock Holmes adventure, Mr. Harris. Let's not forget that's the real lodestone that brings you on these periodic pilgrimages. Right, Doctor. Nor sleet, nor snow, nor dark of night can keep this Sherlock Holmes addict from his weekly story, believe me, to paraphrase a much more famous quotation. Very flattering, I'm sure, Mr. Harris. Well, what's tonight's adventure about, Doctor? Tonight I think I'd tell you how Holmes revisited the ancient manor called Hurlston. And how the lady of the manor told a ghostly story which turned out to be more authentic than even she anticipated. What with the blood that dripped slowly out of the wainscoting. <laughs> Dear me, speaking of authenticity and the like, reminds me that you have a word or so to say about one of the few genuine bargains still left in this world of soaring prices and disappearing values. Oh, you wouldn't by any chance be alluding to clippercraft clothes, Dr. Watson. What else, Mr. Harris? What else? Well, it doesn't take the American public long to recognize a fine product. No, true merit always gets a real spotlight. And clippercraft clothes have that kind of merit. Clippercraft's out-of-this-world values are recognized across the country. And for just one reason are these values superior. That reason, of course, is the famous Clippercraft plan. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, providing year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. Not only do you pay less for Clippercraft, but they're sold by your own local independent store where you get friendly personal attention. Think of it, truly fine Clippercraft suits for only $40 and $45, beautifully tailored top coats and overcoats for only $40, and sport jackets for only $26.50. Simply compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to the ghost of Hurlston Manor, Dr. Watson. Hurlston. Say, wasn't that the ancient country home of the Musgraves where Holmes discovered the crown of the Stuart Kings? Correct, Mr. Harris, absolutely correct. But uh, this is another story. And to begin at the beginning, Holmes, as you know, in his uh, cerebral processes, was the neatest and most methodical individual. But in his personal habits, he was the untidiest man that ever drove a fellow lodger to distraction. <laughs> Not that I'm what you'd call painfully tidy myself. Oh, now, Dr. Watson, you're always neat as a pin. With clipper crafts, that's easy. But uh, don't interrupt me. Where was I? Oh, yes, yes. I'm certainly not what you'd call prissy, but when I find a man who keeps his cigars in the coal scuttle, his tobacco in the toe of a Persian slipper, and his unanswered correspondence transfixed by a jackknife in, in the very center of the mantelpiece, I... <laughs> Then I begin to give myself virtue of air. <laughs> I don't wonder, Doctor. Imagine then my surprise when on returning one afternoon from making my medical rounds, I found Holmes in a stiff collar and wearing his Prince Albert. Furthermore, he was tidying up his chemical table and kicking his notebooks, papers, and other impedimenta out of sight under the sofa. <laughs> I'm to be queen of the May, mother, for I'm to be queen of the May. Holmes, what in heaven's name is the... Watson, your overshoes. Kindly leave them outside. Can't have you tracking mud about. Uh, Holmes, have you taken leave of your senses? Aren't you feeling well? Certainly I'm feeling well. Never felt better. But don't stand there with your mouth open like a ninny. Help me clear this litter off the sofa. But what here, here, take this gasogene and the morning papers. And, and here's the microscope and your top hat. Uh, oh, good Lord, there she is now. Who? Mrs. Reginald Musgrave, of course. She's coming to pay us a call. Well, well don't just stand there with that stuff. Put it away somewhere. Oh, where, for the love of heaven? Behind the curtains or, or, or the door. No, no, wait. Chuck it here in the umbrella stand. Oh, Hurry. All right, all right. There. Ah. All neat and ship -shaped. Not a thing out of place. Except your back hair, Watson. Do slap it down. There's a good chap. Oh, go to blazes. Well, well, open the door for Mrs. Musgrave. Open the door. Oh, Holmes, you are the most exasperating man. The most... How do you do, well, Dr. Watson? Won't you come in, Mrs. Musgrave? Why, it's not Mrs. Musgrave at all. It's the Honorable Alice Adair, Lady Maynooth's charming sister-in-law. I was Alice Adair, Dr. Watson, until Mr. Holmes introduced me to his old classmate, Reginald Musgrave, some months ago. It was one weekend last spring when he escorted Lady Maynooth and myself down to Sussex to view the, Sus the Stuart crown. 
Right then and there, I fell in love with Hurlston and determined to become its mistress. Of course, I had to marry Reggie to accomplish my purpose. Hmm. Had a meeting out of her hand inside of 20 minutes. One flutter of her eyelid and Reggie was a goner. And I never knew you even met the blighter. Sherlock, you mean you didn't tell him about the wedding? Now, really, that's too bad of you. Mr. Holmes was best man, Dr. Watson. Oh. Reggie and I were married in a registry office. You know how skittery middle-aged bachelors are about a big wedding. Well, my dear Alice, how are things at Holston? Dreadful. I'm so annoyed with Reggie, I'm hardly speaking to him. If he goes through with it, I shall divorce him, whether I have grounds or not. Goes through with what? He's threatening to sell the estate. Oh, good Lord, no. Why, the Musgraves have always lived at Hurlstone. That's what I keep telling him. Well, besides, it's famous. It's the oldest inhabited building in the county. That's what he keeps telling me. He says it's too old to be inhabited any longer. He has absolutely no feeling for all those darling old mullioned windows and the beautiful old mantelpieces and panelling. Keeps on telling me it's damp and drafty. It's his rheumatism, of course, that makes him so unreasonable. That, and that wretched Stuart crown you discovered for him, Sherlock, did you have to do that? But, my dear Alice, he was delighted when we found the royal diadem. If I'd handed him a million pounds, he couldn't have been more excited. Well, it's turned out to be a regular Frankenstein's monster. People come from all over to see this stupid thing. They come in droves, by carriage and charabar and lorry. They come and bring their lunches. We haven't a moment's privacy. Hmm. Why doesn't he send it off to a museum where it belongs? Because that's what the government wanted him to do in the first place. Well, things have been going from bad to worse. All those trippers tramping through the shrubbery were bad enough. But that dreadful boy yesterday afternoon, that's what really put the pant, uh, the, the petticoats on the queen. What uh, boy are you referring to, Alice? That horrible little urchin we found in the tea garden, pulling up Reggie's prize petunia by the roots. Here, here, I say. What's this? What's this? Oh, it's Alfie, Governor. Picking wildflowers, he is. <laughs> How he do love nature. Well, tell him to stop. Those are not wild flowers. Those are my best imported French petunias. French, eh? Well, what do you know? Here, that's enough, Alfie. Uh, that's enough poses. And uh, now we'll go and see the pretty crown. I don't want to see no crown. I want a big posy. Now stop it, I say. Put that plant back where you found it. I uh, do like the old man tells you, Alfie. Uh, and wipe your nose. Uh, oh, tell him to stop that infernal racket, or I shan't permit you to see the crown at all. Here now, here now. Hold on there. You can't refuse to let Alfie see the crown. It's historic. He's got as much right to look at it as you have. That settles it. I'll sell the place and the grounds and the ruddy crown as well. I'll sell it to Plunkett, the Pickle King. See if I don't. Good Lord, don't tell me old Plunkett has offered to buy Hurlston. So it seems, Sherlock. I told Reggie if he even thought of it, I'd never speak to him again. But that only made him more determined. You've no idea how obstinate he can be. Uh, pig-headed is the word, my dear Alice. Mm, uh, yes, well, perhaps you're right. That's what comes of his staying a bachelor until he was pushing 40. <laughs> Hear that, Watson? That would be a lesson to you. He was probably waiting until you happened along, Mrs. Musgrave. Why, Dr. Watson, what a charming thing to say. You must make Sherlock bring you down for the weekend. Thank you. What weekend? I'm attending no elegant weekend parties at Hurlstone. Oh, yes, you are. You're responsible for this brainstorm of Reggie's. If you hadn't discovered that wretched crown, you wouldn't want to sell the place. And if it weren't for the crown, I'm sure Hennessy Plunkett wouldn't dream of buying it. Hurlstone in the possession of Hennessy Plunkett, the pickle king. It'd be sacrilege. He even talks about putting out a new brand, Crown Pickles, with a picture of the Stuart crown on the bottle. Oh, shocking bad taste, I hope. Mm. I will not have that dreadful old vulgarian strutting around the property. He'd ruin it in no time. Sherlock, you and Dr. Watson simply must come down and help me to save Hurlston from that pickle peddler. <laughs> Mr. Plunkett, but how delightful to have you here for a visit. Never buy anything before I've tried a sample of it, ma'am. Might not be able to sleep here. Get terrible insomnia sometimes in the country. Well, uh, of course, the frogs and crickets around Hurlston are rather noisy. Oh, rot. Divas, take Mr. Plunkett's things up to the blue room, next to the bar. Uh, hold on there, Musgrave. Is that the room King Charles hid out in when he was beating it up north to Scotland? No, the steward room is in the old wing, Mr. Plunkett. You wouldn't want to sleep there. There's, uh, uh, well, there's no plumbing in that part of the house. Oh. Look here, Miss Musgrave. I was a grown man before I even knowed there was such a thing as indoor plumbing. 
Besides, what's good enough for King Charles is good enough for me. Uh, yes, but uh, that is, uh, if you're a light sleeper, well, the ghost might keep you awake. Ghost? Look here, Musgrave, you didn't tell me Hurlstone had a ghost. Why, of course. The steward room has always had a ghost. Well, ridiculous. Charles didn't die there, Alice. He only hid there for a week or so. <laughs> Pay no attention to Reggie, Mr. Plunkett. He doesn't begin to know all the historical facts about this house. Now, since I came here, I've been reading up on all the old documents in the library. This house has had a frightening and gory history, Mr. Plunkett. Oh, Alice, really? Well, what do you know? <laughs> I guess those Britishers were kind of rugged in the olden days. So the place has a ghost. Uh, you know, I've always sort of had a hankering to meet a spook. Don't have any where I come from. Really? No ghosts in Pittsville? Pittsburgh. Oh. That's where I hail from, Miss Musgrave. I was born in a shack in Shantytown. Imagine if I was to end up sleeping in the bed King Charles slept in. <laughs> With a ghost besides. <laughs> it's rather an unpleasant ghost, I'm afraid. Uh, the ghost of Lady Daphne, who shot her lover in the wainscoting. You don't say. Uh, tell me about it. Well, it seems that Lady Daphne's husband was always going off to the wars, leaving her behind with her housekeeping and her needlework. Now, women didn't read in those days, you know, so she had no good books to divert her mind. Suddenly, one morning, a young huntsman, all in green, drove up on a chestnut stallion. Oh, nice color combination, my dear. Oh, don't interrupt, Reggie. Sorry. Uh, well, it, it seemed that he'd been uh, gored by a deer or something, so Lady Daphne put him in the best guest room. Uh, the one King Charles had made famous. Oh, don't be <laughs> stupid, Reggie. No. This was back in the days of the Plantagenets. The Stuarts hadn't even been heard of. Lady Daphne nursed the huntsman back to health and fell in love with him. It created quite a scandal, I guess, because pretty soon, even old Lord Musgrave heard about it and came sneaking back from the wars one dark night. Very unsporting of them, eh, Musgrave? Rather, yes. <laughs> well, of course, you couldn't really sneak very successfully in the armor they wore in those days. So the Lady Daphne and her lover heard him tiptoeing up the hall. And quick as a flash, Lady Daphne shoved her lover into a sort of cupboard in the wainscoting. And when Lord Musgrave came clattering in, she was back in bed, sound asleep. She looked so pretty there, he, he didn't have the heart to wake her. He just called a couple of his serving men, and they boarded up the closet with the lover inside. And the lady and her lover were so terrified, they never said boo. And the poor chap just sat there and quietly suffocated to death. Reggie, I thought you didn't know that story. Mm, yes, I fancy I've read that uh, manuscript at some time or other. Well, finally, after several days, the Lady Daphne couldn't stand the strain any longer. She took out her husband's revolver and fired a shot through the wainscoting. And pretty soon, a slow trickle of blood came out onto the floor. Well, that's a departure I hadn't read about. Lord Musgrave pretended not to notice, but went calmly back to the wars. The Lady Daphne's hair turned completely white, of course, and you can still see her wandering about the room, moaning and wringing her hands. So, dear Mr. Plunkett, I really don't think you should sleep in the steward room if you suffer from insomnia. Oh, don't you worry, Miss Musgrave. If anyone's going to be scared tonight, it'll be Lady Daphne, not me. Pass uh, Dr. Watson the port, Sherlock. That's a good fellow. His glass is empty. Oh, oh, oh. What's up, Reggie? Oh, just a twinge in my left knee. Must be a storm coming up. That knee's a regular barometer. Hmm. Dashed fine port you have, Musgrave. Must be old. My dear Mr. Plunkett, the port in this house was laid down by my great-grandfather. Oh, you don't say. Um, the cellar goes with the house, of course. Well, what remains of it? There are only three bottles left beside this one. I'm afraid all my forebears have been uh, heavy port drinkers. The Musgrave port has always been famous, Mr. Plunkett. Oh, yes, Dr. Watson. Nothing could persuade me to part with the place that we still had the cellar we had in my grandfather's, or even my father's day. Oh, well. Sick chance at Gloria Mundi. Oh, 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 confound that knee. <laughs> it's a reliable weather prophet at any rate. Here comes the storm. Uh, can't say I like thunderstorms. and never have. Got some bad ones in the Alleghenies when I was a boy. I've seen lightning bounce off of those mountains like it was the devil playing nine pins. Always crawled into my old man's feather bed when I heard it coming. Lightning can't get you if you're in a feather bed. Yeah. You wouldn't have a feather bed here at Hurlstone, would you? Why, yes, we uh, have some either down cupboards, I believe. But uh, don't you think it would be too warm? I mean, it's only the beginning of September. It ablazes with the heat. 
You tell Devers to bring me a couple up to my room. I'm going to get into bed right now. Devers, uh, you can light the fire in that fireplace. Yes, sir, but if you're going to retire, now, sir... Now, don't you... give me an argument. Lightning has a habit of coming down chimneys. It's on account of the draft and the cold air. But if there's a fire lit and there's hot air going up, it can't get in. Dear, dear. That was a close one, wasn't it? Sounded like it hit the old oak. Lightning is always hitting the old oak, but mm. it doesn't seem to mind. <laughs> that was the oak mentioned in the ritual, you know. I've been here since the Norman invasion, they say. Well, Light that fire, Dad Blast. Yeah, very good, sir. Very good. Uh, there, there you are, sir. Uh, here, help me off with my boots. Uh, why, you are shivering, sir, and that's a fact. I, uh, I can even hear your teeth chattering. Never mind my teeth. Hand me my nightshirt. Uh, yeah, yes, very good, sir. Shall I bring you some water to wash and brush your teeth in? I don't brush my teeth. I cut them out. Out of the way! I'm getting into bed. Very, very good, sir. Yeah. Uh, anything else, sir? Just get out and leave me to get to sleep. Yes, sir. If you should want anything, I'm afraid you'll just have to yell, sir. There's no bell in this part of the house. Yell good and loud, sir, and maybe someone will hear you. Mm-hmm. Well, sir, I... I'll blow out the candle, huh? Mm. <sighs> uh, uh, good night, sir. Uh, pleasant dreams. Uh, uh. Uh. as cold as an ice box. <sighs> Storm's blowing over, thank heaven. What's that? Hmm. Mice. Must be mice. Whole place probably full of mice. Have to clean them out if I buy the house. Now what? Woodwork creaking. Always does in old houses. Lord, it's quiet. Can't even hear the storm. What's that? Sounds like a woman's skirts. As a draft. Casement must have blown open. It's a curtain rustling. That's what it is. Old houses full of drafts and noises. Um, maybe I should think twice before I buy the place. Still, Plunkett's crown pickles with a picture of the Stuart crown. And Good advertising. It sounds just like a woman's petticoat. Confound it, that fire's dying down. Shadows. Nothing but shadows. That is a woman's petticoat. But I can't see anyone. Oh, rubbish, Plunkett. There's no such thing as ghosts. No such... No such What's that? Ah, wind coming up. Wind in the chimney. Pull yourself together, Plunkett. Wonder what time it is. A light match. Take my watch. It's half a minute to midnight. Midnight. And the ghosts and goblins... Oh, match burn my fingers. Ah, confound that creaking. I'm beginning to imagine things. Funny, I swear there was someone else in this room with me. No, don't be an idiot, Plunkett. Who could it be? Who could possibly be here? Great Scott, a shot. A gunshot. Right here in this room. Help! Help! Someone's shooting at me! Help! Matches. I like the candle. Gotta get out of here. Ah! Oh! Floor is icy. Floor is... Oh! Oh! There's something wet and sticky. I stepped in it. Oh, blasted. 
my hand's shaking so I can't light the candle. Uh, at last. Now let's have a look. There is something on the floor. It's red. It's blood. It's trickling out of the wainscoting beside the fireplace. Help! Help! Get me out of here! Get me out! What's the matter? Oh, you hurt, Mr. Blunt. Yes, shots, Musgrave. You heard the shots. That ghost came in and shot at me. Oh, nonsense. Alice only made up that story. They couldn't... Oh, no, you don't. I know what I've been shot at. You couldn't give me this house now. Where's my pants? Oh, don't be an ass, Plunkett. No one could have shot at you. There was no one in this room but yourself. Maybe no living person. But look over there, next to the fireplace. Someone shot that hole in the woodwork. Oh, rubbish. That's a knot hole. Just a knot hole. Oh, yeah? And what is that stuff trickling out onto the floor? Great heavens, Reggie. It's blood. Of course it's blood. Where's my coat and shoes? But it can't be blood. No one could be behind the paneling. Why, well, this is too fantastic. I'm going to rip open the woodwork. I wouldn't advise it, my dear Reggie. Not while Mr. Plunkett's here. He doesn't look as if he could stand another shock. Better not reveal the Musgrave horror before strangers, don't you know? Oh, you're right, Mr. Holmes. I don't want no truck with family skeletons. I've had enough. I'm getting out. I don't ever want to see any part of Hurlstone again. Wait, Mr. Plunkett, you can't go like that. A place as I can't go by. But you've forgotten your teeth. And now, before Sherlock Holmes and Reginald Musgrave discover what lies behind the wainscoting, may I give you a suggestion? Take an expert like your wife or your best girl along with you when you go to choose your new Clippercraft suit or overcoat. See her amazement when she sees the beautiful tailoring, the clean-cut smartness, and the firm, long-wearing fabrics that are yours at such modest prices. She'll say, how do they do it? Just as everyone else does when they're face-to-face for the first time with Clippercraft. Forty and forty-five dollars for Clippercraft suits. Forty dollars for top coats and overcoats, and twenty-six fifty for sport jackets are low prices that are the result of the famous Clipper Craft plan. They'd be impossible without this wonderful idea that concentrates the buying power of ten hundred thirty-six stores across the nation. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clipper Craft plan. That's why men who know. Insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker's Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now to return to Hurlston Manor, where Sherlock Holmes and Reginald Musgrave are ripping away the wainscoting in the steward room. Oh, dear. I do wish you wouldn't open up that paneling, Reggie. Better let sleeping dogs lie and all that. I had no idea that ghost story I made up would turn out to be true. Well, stop littering, Alice, and hand me that chisel. Oh, I wish I'd never thought up that ghost. I wish I'd never mentioned it to old Plunkett. I never dreamt there would be anything behind that paneling. Now, calm yourself, Alice. It's not as bad as you think it is. As a matter of fact, I suspect that Reggie is in for a rather pleasant surprise. But there was a shot. Two shots. I heard them distinctly. Two explosions, possibly. Shots, no. I rather imagine the heat of the fire caused them. Reggie... How long since you've had a fire in that fireplace? Oh, never. At least not as long as I can remember. And no one's used this part of the house since the other wing was built during the reign of William and Mary. Oh, confound it. This paneling won't budge. Now, there. I finally got a wedge in. Now, here. Help me pry it loose. One, two... Oh, Reggie, I wish you wouldn't. Three. Ah. ah. By Jove, Holmes, there is a closet back of the paneling. But it's filled with bottles. Dozens and dozens of bottles covered with dust and cobwebs. Yes, and two of the bottles have exploded from the heat of the fire. Oh, here. Let's have a look at one of them. It won't be necessary. I can tell you what's in them. Port. Excellent port. I rather suspect, my dear Reginald, that your revered grandfather had a rather special hiding place in this room. But how do you know it's port? By the aroma. My olfactory nerves are rather highly developed, you know. 
The moment I entered the room, I knew that the ruddy fluid Mr. Plunkett had stepped into wasn't blood, but something far more interesting, a superior and venerable vintage of port wine. Good Lord, and to think I nearly sold the place to that old ruffian with all these bottles still in it. I'd never forgiven myself. He'd never have appreciated them, never. Oh, Reggie, then you're not angry with me for spoiling your sale. I just couldn't bear to think of leaving Hurlston. Oh, there, there, my dear, I forgive you. And the next time you think up a ghost story, do try to be a bit more original. Why, Reggie, what do you mean? Uh, if old Plunkett hadn't been a complete ignoramus, he'd have recognized the incident of the lover being bricked up in the woodwork. It's one of the most famous bits of French literature, you know. By Joe, of course, no wonder I thought it sounded familiar. I don't so much mind your swiping your plots, my dear Alice. The best storytellers do, you know. Ask Dr. Watson. Oh, now, really, Holmes. You must try to be a trifle more accurate, you know. Anachronisms are taboo, my dear, in the best literary circles. Why, Sherlock, what do you mean? No Plantagenet lady would go popping at her lover with a pistol. Why not? They hadn't been invented. Oh, oh I'll admit gunpowder was not unknown. Cannon were undoubtedly used at Crecy and Poitiers, but personal firearms for private homicide were quite unavailable. Oh, dear. Next time I'll say she finished him off with a bow and arrow. <laughs> well, never mind the historical inaccuracies. Uh, opening this panel has been dusty work, and I, I'm parched. Uh, what do you say we break out a bottle and see if the uh, contents of Grandfather's private vault is up to standard? An excellent idea, my dear Reggie. An excellent idea. Very well. But I warn you, this is one time the ladies do not leave the table while the port goes round. <laughs> Well, Dr. Watson, that certainly was an unusual Sherlock Holmes adventure. When the stain on the floor turns out to be wine instead of blood. Oh, we had our lighter moments, Mr. Harris. We had our lighter moments. But don't get too relaxed, because next week's adventure is a real old-fashioned hair razor. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I made a very sinister discovery in the ancient burial crypt at Shoscombe Old Place and how it explained the strange behavior of Lady Falder's spaniel. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Meiser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer... Right Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Boys will be Boy Scouts, if an adult will give them a hand. Boy Scout Week now is in full swing, a time when thousands of adults ask you to join them in the game of scouting for better citizenship. Full details from the National Council, Boy Scouts of America, at 2 Park Avenue, New York, 16, New York. <laughs> Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Co. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems. Stay with us for the news reported by Melvin Elliott, which follows presently. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf is busy planning a menu. I'll see if he can talk to you. What's the name again? You want to talk to a dame named Mrs. Collins? Hang up, Archie. Do we know a Mrs. Collins? No. I don't suppose you care, but I think her voice is very charming. Doubtless. Every female has a charming voice to you. Hang up. Okay. I'm sorry, Mrs. Collins, but at the moment, Mr. Wolf is too involved with his digestive system to be interrupted. 
However, if I may introduce myself, Archie Goodwin, uh, Mr. Wolf's assistant, if I can be of any help. Archie. Uh, yes, Mrs. Collins, I'll ask you. Cocktail party. Hang up, Archie. Well, Mrs. Collins, I'm afraid it would be better if you didn't expect Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Cocktails. Fooey. Sad. Very absurd. She says you promised to come to her cocktail party, and why aren't you there? Because you are going to attend the cocktail party and the probable unpleasant ending. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, the most ponderous and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Mr. Wolf and I refer to this as the case of the party for death. Nero Wolf really should have gone to the party since he'd accepted, but I was delegated. I can't complain now since it was there that I met Georgia, the most beautiful redhead. Well, that's my weakness, redheads. Yeah, and blondes and brunettes. And... Well, anyway, Mr. Wolf was adamant about going to the party. I've never been to a cocktail party in my life. You know, I drink nothing but beer. You could take your beer with you, couldn't you? I could not. Do we know a Mrs. Collins whose cocktail party you said you'd go to? The phone rang and I picked it up. Where was I? Exactly. Okay. So a Mrs. Collins with a beautiful, seductive voice conned you into accepting an invitation to a cocktail party that you knew you weren't going to. Archie. Yes, master. Just a little less sarcasm, perhaps. Sarcasm? Call it impertinence, then. Impertinence, master? Exactly. Less of that, much less. Okay. Continue now. Where was I? You were eating the duck recipe. Oh, yes, the duck. Oh, here we are. Dodine de Canard. The Dodine is one of the oldest dishes in the repertory of French cooking, being mentioned in books of the 14th century. Le Grand Cousinier de Tout Cousinier. Hooey, what time is it, Archie? Almost 6.30. Oh, in that case... Uh, you going to get up? Uh, here on this card are your instructions, Archie. If you are still alive tomorrow, you may make your report. I helped the huge bulk that was Nero Wolf out of his specially built desk chair and walked with him to the elevator that would take him upstairs to his orchids. I stepped back to the desk and found the card which bore my instructions. In his small, perfect handwriting, I read, Mrs. Albert Collins, Empire Towers. Arrive at 7, say I sent you. After the murder, telephone me before the police arrive. At exactly 7, I rang Mrs. Collins' doorbell. Mrs. Collins? I'm Mrs. Collins. I'm Archie Goodwin. We talked on the phone a little while ago. Oh, oh yes. Well, uh, come in, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, Mr. Wolf begs to be excused. At the last moment, he was unable to attend. Well, I'm glad you could come. You're not disappointed? No, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm rather upset. I'm afraid, Mr. Goodwin, for my life. That's why I called Mr. Wolf. Oh, oh, just drop your hat and coat there, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, may I tell you something, Mrs. Collins? Well, of course, Mr. Goodwin. Archie will do. Uh, Archie? When I spoke to you on the phone, I thought I knew what you'd look like. And? You do. Well, is that good? It's not bad, Mrs. Collins. Janie will do. Janie will do. Um, Archie, mm -hmm. I, um, I think it would be best if I say you're an old beau of mine. From where? Uh, in Hollywood. When I went to Hollywood High School and you went to USC. Okay, but don't expect me to remember much about it. Well, I'd be flattered if you remember anything about it. <laughs> I want you to keep your eyes and ears open. Observe everything tonight. Well, now shall we join the party? <laughs> oh, Albert, this is Archie Goodwin. Archie, this is my husband, Albert. How do you do? Hello. And this is Joe Boyce, my husband's partner. How do you Boyce? do? Boyce? 
I told you about Archie Albert, but well, I guess you probably don't remember, do you? No, I don't. When I was in high school and he went to USC. Oh. Oh, yeah, sure. What'll you have, Goodwin? I'd like a plain lime and soda. Oh, not really. A teetotaler now? Uh, yes, I, uh... Well, I used to overdo it, uh-huh. remember? So you knew my wife in Hollywood? Quite a while ago, though. Uh-huh. Been here long? Oh, a while. Did you and my wife run into each other again just lately? Yeah. A few days ago? About. Joe Boyce here is my partner, chemical business. Makes this sort of an old home week, doesn't it, Joe? In a way, Al. I guess it does at that. Joe knew my wife back in those days, too. And they're still very friendly. Yes. Yes, indeed. You two have got something in common to talk about, haven't you, good one? Mrs. Collins, you mean? Uh, we never knew each other very well. No? Okay, good one. Let it go. Why, look. Look what I found. A new man. Just what I need. I'm Georgia. Archie. Archie, dear, will you fix up my drink, please? Anything for a lady. Let's go to the bar. Eh, Archie? I'm determined, Joe. If you're only the money, our only Jane, I might listen. Oh, Al, can't we talk about it later? I like talking about it now, Joe. You're going to be sorry about this, Al. I am already. But you'll have 20 years or so in prison just being sorry. I've got the papers you forged right here. You're hysterical, Al. Let's face it. The firm went broke, but I suffered too. So let's forget it. Yes, Joe. The firm went broke, but you didn't. And I don't think my wife did either. The two of you had everything figured for yourselves. Well, I'm turning the papers over to the DA tomorrow. Near Wolf speaking. Archie, what do you know about this expected murder, if anything? Has it happened yet? No, but who's supposed to get killed? I haven't the faintest idea, Archie. Then why don't you stop it? That is impossible. I don't even know who's there. You want me to tell you? Not in the least. How am I supposed to prevent it if I don't know what I'm looking for? You're not supposed to prevent it, Archie. I don't think you could. I don't think anybody could. You want to hear what I found out already? No. I'll tell you anyway. Collins thinks his wife and his partner, Boyce, have been stealing his dough, and he's threatening to send Boyce to the clink. Archie. Yeah? You're wasting our time. Go back to the party. There is nothing you can do to prevent the murder. But I want you to be there when it happens. Now that all the guests have gone, let's uh, sit down here, Georgia. When Janie was in Hollywood, she must have had more good-looking boyfriends. Let's get personal about this, Georgia. Yeah, let's. When you say good-looking, do you mean me? I don't mean anybody else, Archie. You know, I think you're pretty, too. You'd better not let Jane hear you say that. You think she'd care? I thought you knew Jane. Only slightly. You don't like Jane too well, do you? Why? Why? Why what? Why don't you tell the truth about it? No man as attractive as you ever knew Jane slightly. Either they knew her or they didn't know her. Maybe you think I'm getting a little tipsy. The idea never occurred to me. No? Well, it has to me. Refill your glass? I'll come with you to the bar. Well, here's your drink, Georgia. Oh, I find there's no ice left in the ice bucket. Janie? Hey, Janie, no ice. Oh, well, I'll get some. Here, give me the bucket. Uh, Mrs. Collins, uh, Janie, I mean. Yes, Archie? May I use the phone in the bedroom again? Oh, of course. Will you excuse me for a minute, Georgia? I'm coming with you. Uh, why don't you just stay here until Jane brings the ice? Well, why don't you go talk to Joe Boyce? I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce. I don't want to talk to Joe Boyce ever. Now, look, Georgia. I'm coming with you, Archie. Is that clear? Okay, come on. Here's where the phone is. I could have found it myself. You don't want me with you, do you? Just sit down here on the edge of the bed and listen, if that's what you want to do. Mr. Wolf speaking. Archie, boss. Well, Archie, what? Just a bit of a report. Go on. At this moment, I am sitting on the edge of one of two twin beds in the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Collins. Sitting next to me is a gorgeous redhead named Georgia. Georgia what, dear? Boyce. You mean you're the wife of Joe Boyce? Of course. Didn't you know? I am sitting next to the gorgeous redheaded wife of Albert Collins' partner, Joe Boyce. Archie, you annoy me. 
From what I just learned, I can see there's another friction going on. You mean George and Jane? Yep. Fireworks between them. This one, no like other one. Have you anything more to say? When I called, I was going to ask if there's any reason why I shouldn't come home now. I wrote your instructions for you, Archie. After the murder, call you. Yeah, that's perfectly clear, isn't it? But what if there isn't any? Don't call me. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Hello. He hung up. Archie. What? It was a strange conversation. Do you want me to explain it to you, honey? What was that business about murder? Shall we join the party? Murder. Archie, wouldn't you be surprised if there was one? Yeah? Who's going to do what and to whom? I don't know. Maybe I will. Elucidate, honey. Do you intend to figure as the killer or the corpse? I don't intend to figure as anything. But you never know. Archie, do you think Jane Collins is better looking than me? Nope. Honestly? Honestly. Then what's the matter with me? Nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, yes, there is. Look. Do you want to kiss me? Uh, I... Well, I'll tell you. When I graduated from Sunday school, I took a vow. That's what I mean. But if I were Jane, you'd want to kiss me, wouldn't you? No, frankly, no. Why not? Well, when I graduated from Sunday school, I... Okay, Archie. Let's go back. You boys have such happy faces. Where's Jane? In the kitchen getting some ice. Where have you been? With Archie. Is he an old school chum of yours, too? Do you care, Joe? No. Mr. Boyce. What? How much do you weigh? 187. Why? Then I'll be giving you five pounds. Shall we step outside? This I have got to see. Shut up. Mr. Goodwin, you seem angry. Just terribly, terribly hurt. Would it do any good if I apologized? Today I'm a little upset. If I said anything to offend you, I do apologize. Now, um... If you still want me to give you a boxing lesson, I'm at your service. Let's forget it. I'm sorry, too. Jane Collins came in from the kitchen with a bucket of ice cubes, a tray of fresh glasses, and the strapless gown she'd been wearing. <sighs> there. I never thought I'd make it. Now I'm going to mix my own drink, and you can take care of yourself. Iceberg. Huh? Whiskey. And soda. <laughs> The simple recipe, isn't it, Archie? All it needs is the ingredients. Well, I drink to the ingredients. Mmm. Ah, nice. Janie, darling. What, dear? Would you mind very much if I took Archie away from you? Uh-huh. Haven't you done that already, dear? To listen to those girls, you'd think. Wouldn't you, Goodman? Me, I never think. What do you do, Archie? I concentrate. On what? On not thinking. I did some serious concentrating on not thinking about Nero Wolfe or about the conflict of the partners, Albert Collins and Joe Boyce, about the jealousies of Jane and Georgia. The next five minutes hardly seemed an hour. Jane and Boyce murmured to each other. Collins drank gently but firmly. Why can't you be honest, Archie? What's the matter with me? What, Georgia? You weren't listening, were you? To every gorgeous word you said. What did I say? I want to hear it again, just the way you said it before. I said... Why shouldn't there be a murder? Why not? It's an order. It's just not considered the thing to do. Thing to do. Can you think of anything better? No, frankly. I can. My glass is empty. My glass is empty, too. Jane. Jane! Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not much of a hostess, am I? Oh, don't answer that. Oh, you're all empty. But I've only drunk half of mine. You don't usually drink so slowly, Jane. Well, I'm just not in the mood tonight. I usually drink faster to keep you from drinking mine. <laughs> See, Albert always gulps his and then reaches for mine. What's the difference? Well, I'll fix you some fresh drinks, but uh, put my drink over there by you, Georgia, and lay off, Albert. I only had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more. I suppose we know what dear Jane is going to do, don't we? Lay off, will you? Lay off. It's my husband who said that, Archie. Archie, meet my husband, Mr. Boyce. I will now explain why dear Jane took our glasses away to the kitchen when she could have bought a drink right here. Listen, George, will you... Mr. Boyce is speaking, Archie. What, Mr. Boyce? Uh, ah, uh, nuts. Mr. Boyce says nuts, Mr. Goodwin. What do you say, Mr. Collins? I think Joe has covered the field. We were talking, weren't we, Archie? Possibly. We were talking about dear Jane. She's got to be always the prettiest, always devastating. Right now, she's putting on a completely new face. And in about 20 minutes, when our tongues are hanging out, she'll come back. 
all horsed up and bright and smiling with another tray of drinks. Yes, you'll take all night to fix them. Well, I'm going to get some air on the balcony. Don't jump off. Al, you're drinking too much lately. I shouldn't worry you, Joe. Especially now. When you start drinking not only your drinks, but everybody else's too, well... Ah, Jane's right. Is that what worries you? Slide Jane's glass down. Hmm. The ice is all melted. You see what I mean? Okay, Joe, let's not be nasty until tomorrow. That gives me an idea. Think I'll propose a toast. Until tomorrow. You know, it may be rather fitting that I should drink a toast from the glass that Janie left. Until tomorrow. Go! Al. Al? Jane? Janie! Albert! Oh, Albert. Nero Wolf speaking. May I come home now? Oh, hello, Archie. I said, may I come home now? Have you sent for the police, Inspector Kramer? Of course. Who was killed, Archie? Albert Collins. How, Archie? I don't know. You were right, though, weren't you? Actually, about what? Murder. Oh, that. We can talk about it tomorrow. Good night, Archie. Come home when you can. What do you mean, come home when I can? You'll be held as a witness, won't you? <laughs> Try not to wake me with the elevator when you come in. Well, Inspector Kramer, you've had me here at headquarters for a long while. For quite a long while. Haven't you asked me enough questions? Goodwin, you say you never saw these people before, Collins or Boyce or their wives. Yet when all the other guests had gone, you were still there. I guess I just don't know how to say goodbye. You didn't know they were partners in a chemical company. You didn't know that Boyce had forged a lot of papers with Collins' name. All I know is what you tell me. Goodwin. Yes, sir? I'm trying to be nice. Yes, sir. Now, I know, of course, that you went to that party because Nero Wolf told you to. Do you? My question is, how did Wolf know it was going to happen? Why don't you ask him? I already have. He told you? He says he never heard of Collins or Boyce. Did he say he'd ever heard of me? He says he isn't responsible for you or your shady friends. Maybe he knows I found a poison pellet in George's bag. Inspector, may I make an important call? Go ahead. Argy, Argy. Ugh. Confounded light. Hello. What time is it, Master? Confounded, Archie. I'll tell you what time it is. It's a little after 4 a.m. I'm at Central Headquarters, and Inspector Kramer has been chatting with me about my shady friends. Kramer is a jackass. Just a second. Uh, pick up the other phone, will you, Inspector? Uh, sorry, Mr. Wolf. What was that you were saying about Inspector Kramer? I said Kramer is a jackass. Thank you. Wait a minute. Wolf! Oh, eavesdropping, Inspector. I was just talking about bringing you down here for a little questioning, Wolf. Fooey. What's that? Fooey. It can be spelled in several ways. I spell it P-F-U-I. Fooey. You think I won't bring you down here as a material witness? Yes, I think you won't. I think you'd be making a great mistake if you did. A great mistake? Why? Because I might not tell you who killed Collins. Then you wouldn't know which one of these people to prefer charges against. Now send Archie home. Even he needs an occasional night's sleep. <laughs> what do you think of that? He hung up. So it seems. Busy? He's probably left the phone off the hook, Inspector. By now, he's probably asleep again. Well, you know I can go out there, don't you? Sure you can. More important men than you have tried it. And where are they now? Goodwin? Yes, sir? I'm going to let you go. I'm sure Mr. Wolf and I are very grateful, Inspector. You want to know why I'm letting you go? I know why. Why? 
Because if you're nice and cooperative and don't make too much trouble, Mr. Wolf will solve this case for you and tell you whom to prefer charges against. Goodwin. Sir? Get out. Thank you, Inspector. Good morning, Inspector. At three o'clock the next afternoon, I was rearranging the furniture in Nero Wolf's office while the great man sat behind his desk watching me perspire. Are you finished now, Archie? I guess so. And tell me where they sat. There were two couches, like this, in front of a fireplace. Collins and Boyce were sitting together on one couch. When Georgia and I came in, they were looking at some canceled checks. Where was Mrs. Collins? I told you she was getting ice and fresh glasses. Why was she getting fresh glasses, Archie? Where were the empty ones? I don't know. Maybe they were the same ones she brought back washed and polished. Archie, I trust your powers of observation absolutely. That's why I sent you to Mrs. Collins' cocktail party. Okay, how did you know there was going to be a murder? If it was a murder. It was a murder, Archie. But isn't it obvious? How is it obvious? Suppose Colin slipped a few drops of the poison into his drink himself. It's very strong, very deadly poison, with a remarkably strong odor. Like almonds, I know. I smelled it when I picked him up. Archie, was anything found on the body that might have contained the poison, a fountain pen, whatever? Not even that. Inspector Kramer found a poison pellet in Georgia's handbag. He thinks she poisoned Collins's drink. Say, could be. But it wasn't his drink, it was his wife's. Then Georgia was trying to kill Jane, and Collins got it by mistake. We shall soon see, Archie. I was expecting a murder because you told me to expect it. I watched every move that everybody made. There is no possibility that Jane's glass, the glass with a poison in it, was tampered with by anybody. Yes, I believe. Okay. Archie, you're sore, aren't you? Have you ever spent the night with Inspector Kramer? He's really a good man, too. Why did you say he was a jackass? Because he didn't know who killed Collins? Do you? Of course. Is there ever any question about it? Just a moment, please. The only trouble is it may be difficult to prove. That's why we are giving this little cocktail party this afternoon with the help of Inspector Kramer. By the way... Yes? Call Mrs. Collins and tell her to bring a bucket of ice from her refrigerator. Why? Because our refrigerator's broken down. No, it hasn't. I was just out in the kitchen a minute ago. Our refrigerator has broken down. And it would be very helpful if Mrs. Collins would bring a bucket of ice cubes. What makes you think she'll do it? She will. Call her. 6.45. There we were in Wolf's office doing a repeat performance of last night's smash hit. Two couches faced each other, a cocktail table between them. On one couch, red-headed Georgia and me. On the other couch... It was a big one. Joe Boyce, Jane Collins, widow of the lately defunct Albert, and Nero Wolf. Jane had been drinking a little slower than the rest of us. Our glasses were empty. Hers was still half full. Wolf said... Archie. Yeah? At this point in last night's party, Mrs. Collins got up and left to get some fresh drinks. Repeat what she said. Approximately. Approximately will do. I think she said something like this. She said, um... Put my drink over by you, Georgia. Lay off, Albert. I've had about three swallows of it. Besides, you don't need any more, Albert. Am I right, Jane? Close enough, Archie. But what of it? No. What is this nonsense all about, Wolf? Uh, Mr. Wolf is trying to make something out of nothing. I think Mr. Wolf is going to turn up something mighty interesting. Don't look so perturbed, Joe. Since I am playing the part of the late Mr. Collins, pass me Jane's glass. I'll keep my glass, Mr. Wolf. I haven't finished my drink. You're a very clever woman, Mrs. Collins. Would it be too much if I ask what this is all about? What worries you, Archie? You make it sound as if that drink she's holding is poison. But it can't be, because as yesterday, she's already drunk half of it herself. When our freezer broke down, she was more than willing to bring a bucket of ice cubes, wasn't she? So? What would happen, Archie, if you froze a gelatine-coated pellet of poison in the center of one particular ice cube? Mrs. Collins hasn't finished her drink. Notice the ice is all melted now. She hasn't taken one sip since the ice melted completely. She came prepared in case she was exposed. Smell it, Archie. No, Archie, stand back. I can easily swallow this before you can reach me. Mr. Wolf, in a few seconds, I'll drink it. But tell me something first. 
Tell me how you knew. Jane, Jane, listen to me. I knew there was going to be a murder last night because you said so. I knew that it was you who would commit the murder because it was you who invited me. You hoped an expert witness would prove that you couldn't have killed your husband. So I sent Archie Goodwin, whose observations are always exact, even when he doesn't know the import of what he's observing. She brought back clean glasses. She poured the drinks out of bottles already open. And if anybody had put anything in or touched one of those glasses, I would have seen it. Exactly. The poison pellet was frozen in a certain ice cube. Mrs. Collins put that cube in her own drink, drank it until the ice had almost melted down to the poisonous pellet center. And then, then she took all the other glasses away, leaving only hers half full. And as usual, her husband drank it. No, no, Jane, don't, don't! Too late, Joe. (laughs) Too late. Well, boss, Jane didn't get away with the suicide try. That was clever thinking you did. I prepared a cube of ice in which I had frozen a gelatine capsule containing nothing more than a vitamin compound. I substituted for the cube in which Jane had placed the poison for herself. wonder why Jane Collins wanted to have Joe. He'd stolen practically all the money in the company. He was just a crook. Birds of a feather, Archie. I don't believe Joe Boyce had any idea that Jane was planning a murder. And he still had all the money. Well, the forgeries will put him away for a long time. And poor Georgia could have had it pinned on her if it hadn't been for me. Yes, yes. You knew all along, didn't you, that Jane had planned to have Georgia accused by planting another pellet of the poison in Georgia's handbag. Jane would have gotten rid of her husband and Joe's wife in one stroke. You knew all that, didn't you? Well, I... Um... How about a bottle of beer, boss? <laughs> Could you spare the time? Uh, Georgia. Beautiful redhead. Wonder where she is tonight. I'm sure I haven't the slightest idea, but in case you do... <laughs> well, just be quiet with the elevator door when you come in. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Gigi Pearson, Herb Butterfield, Peter Leeds, Evelyn Eaton, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Malevolent Medic. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, transcribed in 30 seconds. Tomorrow, you're invited to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. The orchestra will be under the direction of Bruno Walter for tomorrow's performance, and celebrated violinist Joseph Zagetti will be featured soloist. Selections for tomorrow include the overture to Mozart's Marriage of Figaro and the same composer's brilliant concerto for violin and orchestra. You're invited every Saturday to a concert by the NBC Symphony. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Mr. Hal Horton, United Industries? Oh, I see. Well, I must warn you, Mr. Horton, Mr. Wolf doesn't take kindly to big industrialists. Says their great wealth upsets his digestion. Why do you want to see him? The connection's bad. I don't hear you. Who? Who? Mr. Horton, who? Hmm. We're cut off. What is it, Mr. Goodwin? Mr. Hal Horton called. I understand that. I won't see him. Tell him what money I have to invest I put into orchid plants. Mr. Horton wasn't promoting anything. Then what did he call you for? The great Horton needs a detective. Maybe just my occupational reflex, but I thought he said somebody had been murdered.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's that genius who is the bulkiest, balkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chairborne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. It turned out that what Horton had said had been murder, which became celebrated in the case of the malevolent medic. But its solution wasn't a simple matter of following up his accusation. It had false clues mixed all through it like raisins in a pudding. The man we came to know as the malevolent medic was young Dr. Benjamin Sloan. The case began on the sunny afternoon when Grace Banks, his nurse, came into his private office. Oh, waiting room's finally empty, I take it. Well, there's one more patient, darling. I'm sorry. Doctor, hmm. Mrs. Horton's here for another of the thymine chloride shots you ordered for. I said you could give her those, Grace. She doesn't have to wait to see me. Oh, well, she's hung up her mink coat, parked her orchid and her alligator bag, and filled up all the ashtrays with lipstick cigarette stubs. Mrs. Horton prefers to wait for you. She seems very upset. I hoped she'd get hold of herself. Mrs. Hal Horton, with all that money, whatever gives her such jitters? <laughs> Darling, if I ever get in that condition after we're married, please shoot me. I've advised her to go to a specialist. Hers isn't a true medical case. Well, I'll do what I can. Get a needle ready, will you, Grace, and show Mrs. Horton in. Yes, darling. I mean, doctor. <laughs> Mrs. Horton, will you step in now? Been in that waiting room for hours. Ben, I wrote you every day this week. Why didn't you answer me? You say your health hasn't improved, Leslie. I'm worse. Much worse. Still chain smoking? Drinking? And the sleeping pills? I have to take something. I can't walk the floor all night, can I? Thinking, thinking. Why are you so unhappy, Leslie? You have what you always said you wanted. Money, clothes, excitement. You have the right to say that. But don't. Please don't. I'm only pointing out facts you should face. I told you from the beginning you need a nerve specialist. I need you. Nobody else can help me at all. Leslie, you went over this the last time you were here. And in all those letters you've been sending. Now, let's cross it off for good, shall we? Don't talk like that. You don't mean I'm it. no longer a lovesick dope. And you're the wife of one of the biggest industrialists in the country. Yes, Hal Horton. I despise him. He thinks his money makes him God. He thinks he can buy anything that he bought me. He made me think I was getting the world with a fence around it. Everything I want is on the other side of that fence. You don't know what you do want. I want us the way we used to be, happy in love together. Leslie, please be quiet. Why? Miss Banks is in the laboratory. She can hear you. What of it? I'm not ashamed. I'll tell her. I'll tell everybody. Imagine Hal's face when he finds out I'm leaving him. But I'm coming back to you. He already knows about you. I told him you were in love with me, that you're jealous. He doesn't like Leslie, it. Leslie, you're raving. Now, stop it. You always said I was the most attractive woman in the world. You made your choice. Now, get this into your head. I'm really in love now. In a few weeks, I'm going to be married. Now, I'll get your medicine. So it's really true. You are going to be married. Yes. I'd heard it, but I didn't believe it. Going to marry a nurse. All my friends have known and been laughing at me. Please, now that's enough. I made a plan, a wonderful, beautiful plan about us. Ben, you love me. Ben, say you love me. Mrs. Horton, that is all over. You don't love me. No longer. You're here as my patient, and that's all. After this treatment, I must ask you to get another doctor. A wonderful, beautiful plan for us. And now she threatens to step in and spoil it. Well, maybe I'll spoil a few plans. How would you like that? Threats will accomplish nothing. I can ruin things for you, Ben. All those fancy ideas of yours about having a fine practice, being a great doctor. Do you want to give those up? I can arrange it so that maybe there won't be any wonderful future for you. Are you prepared to face that possibility? Because I'm prepared to make it a reality. And I mean it. You'll regret this day as long as you live. I'll get your medicine, Mrs. Horton. Hand me my bag. Thank you. Oh, I hate you, Ben. I hate you both. <laughs> Mr. 
Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mrs. Horton. Miss Banks had to do a repair job before she could use the sterilizer. Alcohol, Miss Banks? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Now, Mrs. Horton, may I help? Thanks. So nice of you. There. Right side for the hypo this time, isn't it? Just touch with this cotton. Ready now, Doctor. Oh, I... What's the matter, Mrs. Horton? I'm just cold. Alcohol. After this, I advise you to go home and rest. These massive doses are a little painful, but they give results. There. That's all. Just relax here and you can leave in ten minutes. Come, Miss Banks. I want to talk to you. Might as well stop acting. I can't get up. My feet. Ben, look at her. Something's happened. Hysteria. No, her face. Oh, ben, she's falling. Mrs. Horton, hold on to me. I've got you. Hold her up. Leslie, what is it? Pain. Terrible pain. Where? What from? Sick everywhere. Pain, everything. Pain. Pain in my head. Pain in my feet. My feet. My feet. Doctor, she... she's dead. Yes, Grace. Get a card from the files. I, I want to study it. From the first day Mrs. Horton came here. What was it, Ben? What happened to her? Symptoms are of a heart condition from which it seems the patient has just expired. Then you must call her husband. Grace, did you hear me? Yes, Dr. Sloan. Well, I discourage your visit here, Mr. Horton. I do have a sort of curiosity about the operation of so-called big business. May we offer you a glass of beer and hear an explanation of the rise and fall of this morning's stock market? You don't think I've come here socially? <laughs> I wish to engage your services for... Not available. You're a detective, aren't you? Specializing in cases that interest me. Sherry, Mr. Horton? I don't need it, thank you. But Mr. Wolf says he specializes in cases that interest... I've just got here. I haven't told my story. I don't believe you even know who I am. Oh, yes, we do. We do indeed. A millionaire. Did I offend you by speaking of a fee? No, on the contrary. It is that portion of your conversation which interested me most. Frankly, I plan to spend the evening examining the first edition of Henry James I'd like to purchase. And the word fee suggested a possible way. Now, what have you done, sir? What have I done? <laughs> One doesn't have to be a detective to recognize you're in trouble, Mr. Horton. Look, Mr. Wolf, I have done nothing. But I've got a question I've got to have answered. I need facts. They tell me you're the man who can give them to me. If Nero Wolf can't get them for you, they're not facts. They're fancies, Mr. Horton. My story's involved. But the gist of it is, uh, your beautiful wife, a former model, died last week. The death certificate indicated a heart attack. You suggest she was murdered. How did you know? Never mind how I came to my conclusions. How did you come to yours? Leslie had been going to a Dr. Benjamin Sloan. She said he was a specialist. Some friend had recommended. She'd been upset. He was giving her vitamin B shots, she told me. You doubt that was true. Dr. Sloan informed me uh, after she died in his office uh, there'd been a heart condition from the beginning. Well, I don't believe it. Leslie was a very emotional girl. She'd have been quite frightened of a heart ailment. She'd have told me about it. Maybe she didn't comprehend its seriousness. Dr. Sloan did. Why didn't he get in touch with me at once about it? Then, when I went to clear up Leslie's room, I discovered something. Leslie didn't go to Sloan through a friend. She'd known him when she was a model and he was a hospital intern. She'd kept letters he'd written to her then. Love letters. Indeed. Well, doesn't that give you an idea, Mr. Wolf? Sloan lost Leslie to me. No man who'd been in love with Leslie would ever get over it. Would a man be jealous enough, kill a woman he loved, rather than have her belong to another man? An interesting theory, Mr. Horton, one frequently advanced in fiction. Shall we investigate and see how it works out in fact? Ah, you'll take the case, then. The intricacies of the feminine nature are challenging if you do not have to come in contact with the creatures. The uh, practical research in such matters I leave to Mr. Goodwin here. It is a field in which he specializes. But it's you I want. Our method of operation is not under your control, Mr. Horton. You'll be so kind, Archie. Get a first-hand report of Dr. Benjamin Sloan and the women in his life.
Just came to ask a few routine questions, Dr. Sloan. I don't understand your interest in the Horton case, Mr. Goodwin, is it? That's right. The death certificate was signed and a report made to the medical inspector. Detectives are a snoopy lot. Detectives? Are you from the police department? No, I'm employed to note some details before we close up the Leslie Horton estate. Sudden deaths have to be double-checked. I'm afraid I can't add a thing to what I've already reported. Well, thanks for seeing me anyhow. Been a pleasant visit. Ever have a patient die in your office before, Dr. Sloan? No, but I've seen similar cases in the hospital, of course. Was Mrs. Horton warned about her heart condition, Dr. Sloan? I discussed her case with her fully and frankly. And her husband, wasn't Mr. Horton alarmed? He didn't know. Mrs. Horton's ailment was... Well, not to bore a layman with medical details, was not a fatal one necessarily. She might have gone on for years. Just played in bad luck, huh? The worst. Mm -hmm. When did you first meet her? Several weeks ago. And you saw her how many times? It's all on the record. She was nervous. I prescribed thiamine chloride. Her medical report card shows that. You read it for yourself. Well, I guess that's all, Dr. Sloan. Won't bother you further. Miss Banks will show you out. Yes, Dr. Sloan? Sort of a modern Aladdin arrangement, isn't it? Wish I could press a buzzer and have a beautiful girl like you appear. Mr. Goodwin is leaving. Oh, this way, Mr. Goodwin. You can use the side door. The waiting room's full of patients. So long, Doctor. This way, through the lab. There's a door from it into the corridor. Cozy place, all those bottles. I suppose there's enough stuff in here to kill an army. To cure one. Miss Banks, may I say that you're the kind of a nurse that patients dream about? Make it a pleasure to go to a hospital. Blonde hair, blue eyes, winkers an inch long. Are they real? If you'll excuse me. Who do I have to come down with to persuade you to take care of me? Huh? I don't take cases. I'm a technician. Good day, Miss. So Dixon. you work just for Dr. Sloan? That's too bad the way he's involved in this Horton case. It looks serious. Mrs. Horton simply died of a heart attack in Dr. Sloan's office. If you wanted to help your boss, Miss Banks, you'd stop rushing around and answer a few questions. I'm sure Dr. Sloan gave you the necessary information. Guess he doesn't realize the trouble he's in. If you can supply any details that'll change the picture, you'll be doing him a great favor. He's a nice guy. I want to help. What is there to say? The report... Let's get it in your own words. Just what really happened here that day? Well, Dr. Sloan gave Mrs. Horton the vitamin B shot. That was routine. Mm -hmm. But she didn't get up afterward. She said she was sick. And then she fell and I caught her. And Dr. Sloan administered emergency treatment. What did that consist of, Miss Bank? All that is in the office record. What would bring on such an attack? It could have been several things. Could it have been something she ate? Acute indigestion affects the heart. Maybe Mrs. Horton would be here now if the doctor thought to use a stomach pump. He did use one. He did everything there was time to do. She certainly went in a hurry. Suffer a lot? She said she was in pain. Where, her stomach? No, not her stomach. Where then? She seemed to be in pain all over. Reflex, maybe? When it was over, what did you do, Miss Banks? Called Mr. Horton. Must have been a blow to the great man. I understand she was younger than he is and quite a sultry gal. I've talked to you professionally because you said it was necessary to help Dr. Sloan. Is that all, Mr. Goodwin? I guess it is for now. Unless you'll have dinner with him. Thank you, no. I'm handsome, hardworking, and harmless. I'll bring you references from my employer. What do you say? The express elevator's the one on the right. Must be there's another man. Wouldn't be the doctor, would it? Well, you'll fit better in a Pullman kitchen than here among the test tubes at that. My reluctant congratulations. The verdict, Archie? Innocent as lambs, both Sloan and the nurse. Evidence to prove it? My unfailing sensibilities, not the murderer type. Nice couple, doctor and the nurse, I suspect they're engaged. She's so much in love with him, I could have been you and she wouldn't have known the difference. Very flattering. Records? The usual medical record, Mrs. Horton's first visit, symptoms, subsequent visits. Here are the notes on it. Hmm. Vitamin B shots. No chance they brought this on, huh? Dr. Sloan says absolutely not. I checked that with other doctors. But Mrs. Horton did go into this right after the hypo. There's the story, Jives and Sloan? Mm hmm. A little more detail. She says he did everything, even used a stomach pump. The woman was in pain? What's this? Head to feet? My way of saying pain all over. What other papers did you examine? Only the medical record. Get back to Sloan's office late tonight and examine all the papers in his desk. Can't you trust me? I tell you, there's no reason even to suspect these two. When you have one of your adolescent's infatuations on, blood dripping from a dagger in a girl's hand would look to you like crushed rose petals. 
But this grace bangs out of the way, maybe you can recognize evidence. Uh, sounds like a long, bleak evening. Hand me that medical book, and then be on your way. I want to think. Mr. Goodwin. Oh, good evening, Dr. Sloan. This is a surprise to us both. I didn't anticipate that you'd be keeping office hours after midnight. What are you doing in my office at two o'clock in the morning, Mr. Goodwin? Reading your mail and having a ghoulish time surrounded by all these shiny instruments of yours. You've been rifling my desk. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I've put things back very neatly, even the letters from this little secret compartment, which isn't secret at all to anybody who knows about desks. I've kept only Give one. Give me that easy. Let... It's the my darling mine first shan't ever give you up one way or another one. You remember? I'll bet that nice little nurse you're engaged to never wrote that, did she? What do you intend to do with it? Mark it Exhibit A in the Horton murder case. Maybe you'd like to come with me and explain it to Nero Wolf. Very moving, very flattering, very interesting if you like women. But also very incriminating, Dr. Sloan. What does it prove? A silly woman with a nervous breakdown imagined she was infatuated with me. A woman who is now dead, you must remember. Under, uh, shall we say, unusual circumstances. You signed a death certificate which stated Mrs. Horton died of a heart attack. As you signed it, Dr. Sloan, did you remember she had threatened you... And heave a sigh of relief that fate had done you such a good turn? I didn't bear Leslie any ill will. I was sorry for her. You felt adequate to the situation. You called no other doctor, though there are several in your building. My first thought, of course, was that it was some extraordinary allergic reaction to the vitamin dose. It was not until an hour or two after she was dead you decided she expired from a heart attack. Yes. How did you explain the pain? I... I reported no pain. Miss Banks said Mrs. Horton had pain from her head to her feet. Grace said that? Well, not in those words, but that was the general Dr. idea. Dr. Slow, why did you use a stomach pump on a heart case? Why, I, I, I told you I tried everything, sometimes an acute digestive disturbance. But... I suggest you did it because to you, as to any qualified physician, the pain in the feet suggested poisoning, a particular kind of poison, an inorganic poison. There wasn't any in her stomach. You maintain that? Archie, get the medical examiner on the phone. Tell him the body of Miss Hal Horton must be examined for any evidence of poisoning. I know you think Mrs. Horton was murdered, but it's impossible. There'd been no one near her. Miss Banks? Miss Banks couldn't have done it. She was working with me constantly. That's what I thought you'd say, Dr. Sloan. Mr. Wolf, I had to see you. This is the most dreadful thing I've ever heard of. Trying to accuse Dr. Sloan of murdering a patient. It appears he had a reason to want Mrs. Horton dead, Miss Banks. She was that thing the poets write about, a woman scorned. She had sent him this hysterical letter, threatening scandal, and if he rejected her, he couldn't control her. She kept coming back to his office making scenes. He gave her nothing but thymine chloride. I know, I fixed the shop myself. Well, don't start covering for her. I'm not. I tell you, I fill the needle. And I didn't put anything but thymine chloride in it. You haven't any reason to think anybody did, except for that letter you stole. If it wasn't for that letter... Give it to me. Give it to me. Stop it, Archie, quick. Now drop it, baby. Come away from that fireplace. Why, you little tiger kitten. I didn't think you had it in you. Come on, let go of it. Let go. Give it to Papa. Now, look what you did. You almost got Nero Wolf out of his chair. Destroying evidence is a serious offense, young woman. She kept coming to the office, writing and pestering him. I heard her from the laboratory. You read her letters too, didn't you? You knew if something didn't stop her, Dr. Benjamin Sloan was a ruined man. But he didn't kill her. I know he didn't. I don't believe he did. You... You don't? Well, then who? You've just provided an excellent motive for having done it yourself, Miss Banks. White wine, cold, luscious, exotic. Excellent, Fritz, excellent. Best thing that's happened today. I don't like this Sloan case. If you ask me, I think that Horton Dengawa was coming to it. Those are not the words of abstract justice, nor the phrases of a gentleman of culture. A good detective never plays favorites. Good night's rest, and you will find your attitude more normal by morning. You expect to have this case solved by morning? 
And so have now. Thanks to the expedition I sent you on this afternoon. The arrest can wait. No one will escape. I feel like a murderer myself. If I hadn't wormed it out of grace about the Horton woman complaining of pain, and if you hadn't jumped at the word feet... That, Archie, my dear fellow, is the purpose for which you exist. To discover pertinent facts. Have we quite finished? Copy in the study, then. Here's the door. I'll go. Mr. Wolfin? He isn't seeing anyone this evening, Mr. Horton. Well, he's seeing me. Archie, if that's Mr. Horton, I'll see him. You'd better. Sorry you found Mr. Goodman so impossible, Mr. Horton. He, uh, he came to pay you a call this afternoon. I sent him, but he didn't find you in, did you, Archie? No, but I made myself at home. I knew anything that would help to solve this case you'd want us to have. What do you mean? You were in my house? What did you take? Nothing of monetary value, I assure you, that will not be returned in due course. But before I announce the solution of a case, I like to have all my little props in place. I appreciate a well-rounded performance. Mr. Wolf, I've had enough of this foolishness, this, this delay. I hired you to convict Sloan, not to play parlor games. You must be patient, Mr. Horton. Don't force me. I want action. Well, I had planned to wait until the morning, but if you insist... These papers here may interest you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Goodwin here collects them, your wife's letters. Leslie's? You recognize the script? These are addressed to Dr. Sloan. Do they, uh, they prove anything against him? A lady's correspondence should be kept private. This other letter, however, was sent to you. D- to me? Leslie's? What? Give it to me. Easy, Horton, easy. Don't grab. Oh, but that letter's mine. You stole it from my desk. There is a point in a case, Mr. Horden, where letters cease to be personal property and become evidence. What evidence can that letter provide? It seems you had reason for wanting to kill your wife, Mr. Horton. A man can get annoyed by a note saying his wife never loved him, that all his money isn't enough, and that she's going to another man. You accusing me of murder? It could have been the perfect crime. Poison in one of those pills she was forever taking, or on the tip of the cigarette she chain-smoked, and a doctor's office to die in. If you hadn't been fool enough to try to pin it on Sloan, you might have gotten away with it. If I had known while she was alive what Leslie was, I might have done anything. But that letter you stole from me was one she left under my pillow. I didn't find it until after she was dead. I didn't kill her. Sloan did. You hired me to prove that, Mr. Horton. Suppose you let me go about my business. Nero Wolf's office. Yeah? Oh, you did? Good boy. We'll expect you. I'll tell Mr. Wolf at once. Medical examiner's officer, just as you thought, they found poison in the body. Listen to me. Inspector Kramer's picking up Dr. Sloan and Grace. They'll be here any minute. Kramer's set to make an arrest. I told you. The police know it's Sloan. Put the letters in Mrs. Horton's bag on my desk, Archie. Leslie's alligator bag? You stole that from my house this afternoon, too. Those things are mine. Inspector Kramer will want to take them with him. But you think I want it made public what Leslie did to me? Kramer can't have them. Maybe the inspector will want to take you, too, Mr. Horton. Let them in, Archie. Come in, Inspector Kramer. Oh. Dr. Sloan, Miss Banks. Wolf asked me to bring them here first before I locked anybody up. Mrs. Horton was murdered, all right. I'm sending a man for Horton, too. You won't have to. Mr. Horton's waiting here to join the party. Come into Mr. Wolf's office. Good evening, Inspector. Good evening, Wolf. Uh, will you all please range yourselves around the room as I indicate? Miss Banks here. Dr. Sloan, Mr. Horton. Archie, you stand between the two men, if you please. Mr. Wolf, this is a dreadful mistake. I swear the doctor didn't... Stop thinking about the doctor. What about you? If you're accusing Miss Banks, I might as well tell Hold you Hold it, Dr. Sloan. From here on, anything you say will be held against you. That's what I want. Let Grace go home and well, I'll... For t- heaven's sake, why don't you arrest the man? Isn't it obvious he's guilty? You and your trumped-up charges against me. I'll do the talking now, Mr. Horton. Mrs. Horton died from a certain inorganic poisoning. Poison administered in your office, Dr. Sloan, with a hypo syringe. Let's get it over with. I gave her the hypo. But I fill the needle. There you are. They're both guilty. Which would solve the case if they weren't lying. Miss Banks believes Dr. Sloan killed Leslie for her sake. Dr. Sloan thinks Miss Banks put poison in the hypo to save him from professional ruin. They're trying to protect each other. The fact is the hypo they gave was perfectly harmless. It did not kill Mrs. Horton. But- Then what did? Mrs. Horton came to your office in desperation, Dr. Sloan. But she came prepared for the worst. You see this handbag? Can any of you identify it? Yes. It's hers. Is it Mr. Horton? It's Leslie's. The bag she carried to the office the day she died. Open it, Archie. 
You will see it contains her change purse, billfold, cigarette case, matches, her handkerchief, nothing more. That is, not unless you look closely. Then you will observe this lining has a double fold. A secret compartment. Exactly. We open it this way, and there we find it. A hypodermic needle with which the unhappy woman committed suicide. Miss Banks, Dr. Sloan, you can stop protecting one another. Mr. Horton, the world need never know you were a betrayed husband. Mrs. Horton killed herself while in a confused state following a mental breakdown. The case of the malevolent medic is closed. How did you ever get the hunch about the handbag, Mr. Wolf? I know nothing about women. But on my occasional trips abroad, I have been forced to observe their handbags. Monstrosities. They hold anything and everything. <laughs> Now that our guests have gone, Fritz is bringing coffee to the study. Would you like some beer? I believe I would. Somehow I feel I've earned it. Ah, here you are. Poor fellow, I'm very sorry for you. How so? This is one case in which there is no falsely accused, unattached young lady for you to squire about. (laughs) Well, here's to your better luck next time. Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Ruth Adams Knight was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Vic Perrin, Bruce Payne, Bill Johnstone, and Mary Lansing. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Hasty Will. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and mystery for you every Saturday evening on NBC. For music tomorrow, your hit parade brings you the top tunes of the land with Snooky Lanson, Eileen Wilson, and Raymond Scott's orchestra. And for mystery, Herbert Marshall stars as the man called X, a man in search of adventure who travels wherever there is intrigue, danger, and romance. More good mystery at Sam Spade next on NBC. Any more speed out of this thing, Tommy? Not without wings, boss. Are we shaking them cups? They're not gaining on us. Take this corner in case they get ideas about shooting. Hold on. What now? Shall I head for the hideout? Not yet. Just keep the wheel steady. Your arm okay? Well, it hurts where that bullet went in, but it ain't bleeding much. Good. We're only a couple of blocks from our place, but the cops don't know that. I'm going to try and shoot one of their tires. Go to it, boss. I ain't got no desire to get grabbed right now. All right. Here goes... I got it, Tommy. I got it with the first shot. Take a look at the mirror. Look at that patrol car wobble. Wow, that was close. All we had to do was get nabbed with this loot we're carrying, and they'd throw a library at us. You're not kidding. Okay, slow down right here. We're out of trouble. Ah, we're lucky to get away, Tommy. But the next job we pull isn't going to have any risk attached to it. A lot of dough, no shooting. We don't even show our faces. <laughs> How does that hit you? Like a crossword puzzle. Unless... Hey, boss... We ain't going to work, are we? Nah, nah. We aren't going to do anything at all. Somebody else is going to do it, and our job is simply going to be sitting back and collecting a hundred thousand dollars. A hundred grand for doing nothing? Yeah. You feel all right, boss? Sure. Hey, what's the idea of stepping on it, Tommy? What's the idea? What do you think the idea is? 
If we're going to have to wait for a hundred grand, I want to get over to the hideout and start waiting as soon as possible. Ellen, listen to this. It's from this morning's Herald. It says... J. Henry Wheeler, executor of the will of Donald Burke, retired shipbuilder who died last month, says that he is satisfied that one of the missing Burke's sons, heir to the fortune left by the deceased, has returned. Wait a minute, Vance. I don't get it. The lawyer is satisfied that one of the sons has returned. What does that mean? It means that Burke had two boys. Yeah. Both of whom left home years ago and were never heard from again. As I understand it, the old man was kind of a tyrant. The kids couldn't take his abuse and ran away from home. Mm Mm-hmm. Burke left all his money, about a quarter of a million dollars, to the boys in the event they returned. How is anybody to know that the son who came back is Burke's son? Well, Wheeler, the attorney, is apparently satisfied that the man who claims half the inheritance is the missing Fred Burke. The article in the paper goes on to say that he's been in China for ten years and has no idea where his brother Ben is, but believes him dead. That's all? That's right. That's all I wanted to know. The whole thing sounds rather dull, Vance. What you need is District Attorney Markham to call up with news of a murder. Said he'd call back, didn't he? Yes, only that was about a will, not a murder. Whom would you like to find murdered? Mm, The guy who wrote the newspaper piece. Now, Vance, please. Oh, don't go away. Hello. Hello, Ellen. This is Markham. Vance there? Oh, hello, D.A. Yes, he's here. Just a minute. Mr. Markham, Vance, here you are. Thank you. Hello, Markham. Uh, Vance, this call is in the nature of a disappointment, I'm afraid. No murder? No murder. Merely a combination of circumstances that I don't like. Too much coincidence. What is? Have you been reading about the will of Donald Burke? Well, you asked me to, and as a matter of fact, I've just been reading the story to Ellen. One of his sons has returned, I understand. Yes, that's Fred. But Ben Burke has now made an appearance. Wheeler, the lawyer entrusted with the inheritance, just called me. He doesn't believe this Ben Burke is a legitimate brother at all. Well, can't Fred identify him? After 20 years, Vance? Well... Fred says he may or may not be his brother. The man who claims to be Ben knows all about the family and childhood of the Burks, but then that's been in all the papers. Yes. Wheeler is afraid that if Ben is not the legitimate brother, he'll be turning over $100,000 to an imposter. No question about that. Well, thanks for calling, Markham. I'll look into this. Good. I thought you'd want to. Bye, Vance. Bye. Going out, Vance? Yes, I'll phone you later, Ellen. Uh, anything to say to me? Mm, Just this. Well, Vance? Do that again, Ellen. On the desk this time. (laughs) Goodbye. Oh. Look, let me tell you this, whoever you are. This business of you pretending to be my brother isn't going to work. Can you prove I'm not your brother, Fred? How can I? That's all there is to it, then. What's the matter? You want the whole quarter of a million that the old man left for yourself? Maybe. Maybe I'm just sure you aren't, Ben. And maybe I'm getting a little tired of this conversation. Suppose you get out of here. Suppose I don't. His house is half mine. Will be in a couple of days, anyhow. If you don't get out, I'll throw you out. Get somebody to help you and make it an even fight. I don't need any help. Start something and you find out. All right, I will. Come on, you. Get out of here. All right. You. Well, I wonder nobody heard me knock. I'm Philo Vance. I wouldn't care if you were Dick Tracy. This is a private house and a private fight. Keep out of it. Vance, I know you. I'm Fred Burke. This is the man who claims he's my brother. Claims? Is he kidding? Well, you're no more my brother than, than Vance here is. I'm going to call the police and have them throw you out of here and into jail. Twenty years hasn't changed you, Fred. You're still a kid, a dumb, selfish, willful child. Yeah? Vance, listen, if you want to leave here, I'll go with you and tell you a couple of things on the way. I wasn't thinking of leaving yet. As a matter of fact, neither was I. This is my home. I'm staying here. You're getting out of here. And if you don't, I will. In a couple of days, when I prove you're a phony, they'll throw you out of here. Now, wait just a minute, Fred. If you're leaving, I'll go with you. You're the one I came to see. Well, I'm leaving, all right. And if you're coming, come with me now. Well, I'm ready. I'm with you, Fred. And Ben, or whoever you are, I'm making you a promise. I'll be seeing you. Be seeing me, Willie.
Yeah? Joe? That's right. Just want to give you a little report. Your idea is great so far. Sure it is. This is the way I planned it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to know you aren't the real Ben Burke. What's with this phone call? Just wanted to tell you that you'd better have some more answers ready. Philo Vance just left this house with my brother, Fred. Think he's going to go to work on me, Joe. Oh, he yes, is, isn't yeah. he? Well, we'll take care of him. Okay. You better hop back here so we can make some plans. I've got a hundred thousand reasons for not wanting Philo Vance to investigate you. Well, Joe, you got any ideas? A couple. The afternoon paper gave me one. What's in it? I'll tell you in a minute. Right now I'm thinking about Vance. Let's see now. You're supposed to be the missing brother. Fred can't prove you're not, but maybe Vance can. All I know is he don't know a thing about me. Nobody does. I've been out of town for 15 years. I know that. That's why I sent for you. Should be a pushover for you to claim you're the missing brother. Anything you want to know about the guy you're supposed to be was in the papers. Nah, I read up on it. Well, what about the newspaper you're talking about? I want to give you an idea. Oh, man. Look, boss. Boss, help me. Help me. Tommy, what happened to you? A guy bumped into me in a crowded movie. Knocked a bandage loose from my arm. You know where I got shot. Help me, boss. I'm bleeding to death. Uh, get his coat off. I gotta work fast. Okay, I'll help. Uh, Give me that shirt of his, will you? All right. Uh, I'll take this strip and tie it above the bullet hole. Now, stop, stop, stop whimpering, Tommy. You were stupid enough to get into a crowd. Be quiet so I can fix you up. Tourniquet, Joe? Sure, what else? It'll stop the bleeding. Don't do it, boss. Don't do it. Don't put no tourniquet on my arm. It'll kill me. Shut up. You know what a tourniquet is? No. Ah, that's what I thought. Oh. A couple more twists of this shirt. Stuff around your arm. The bleeding will stop. Hand me that coat hanger there, will you? Okay. Here you are. Uh-huh. And just twist it around a couple of times. <laughs> hey, that hurts. <laughs> yeah, it hurts, but it'll stop the bleeding. All right, go on in the bathroom and get cleaned up. Okay. And get a rag and clean this blood from the rug. Okay, boss. Anything you say. Uh, that's what I like about this place. Always so nice and quiet. Now, let's see, where were we? We were trying to dream up a way to convince Vance that I'm really Ben Burke. Something about today's newspaper. Yeah, that's right. Have you seen the afternoon papers? No, I've seen them. Only one thing we care about. Yeah, yeah take a look. The story here. A reporter says that old man Burke left some word as to how to identify the older son. That's who you're supposed to be. And whatever it is he left is in that lawyer's safe. Wheeler's safe, huh? Yeah. Hey, how come the reporter knew about it? He interviewed old man Burke just before he died. It's logical enough. Yeah. Friend, how much out of practice are you? <laughs> You want me to open Wheeler's safe? <laughs> That's right. We get a look at that paper, shut the safe, and Fred Burke's mouth at the same time. Do you think this will work, Vance? I don't know. When you're trying to anticipate human reactions, Markham, you're never sure. You can only try to lead people on to committing themselves. That's why I had that phony story planted in the newspapers. And that's why we're en route to Mr. Wheeler's office right now. It's your theory that the man who pretends to be Ben Burke will try to get at Wheeler's safe and learn just what it is that will positively identify him. Mm-hmm. Ninth floor, Mr. Wheeler's office, 928. Watch your step. Thank you. In 928, he said. Yes. That's right here. Yes, there's a light on in the office. But he's working late. I hope that's what it is. Come on, Markham. Right. Bats, look. I see. It's Wheeler, the lawyer. Help me untie him, Markham. I will. I'll take his gag off while you're working on the ropes. There, Mr. Wheeler. I'm District Attorney Markham. Tell us what happened. Mr. Wheeler... He doesn't answer, Vance. Probably stunned. Apparently, he was hit on the head by whoever it was that tied him up. But look over there by the safe. It's a man lying on his back and shot through the chest. Yes. Take a look at that fellow, Markham. Ever see him before? No. I have. It's the man who wanted to be known as Ben Burke. Oh? Apparently he came up here to rifle this safe, which is just what I figured he'd do if he were a phony. Vance, I know what happened now. 
This man, whoever he is, came up here with a confederate. Yes. He went to work on the safe. Wheeler came in, saw him, and shot him as he was bending over the safe. Uh Uh-huh. This man's confederate then hit Wheeler over the head and tied him up. Oh, Oh, look, Vance, Wheeler's moving. Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler. My head. My head. Mr. Wheeler, this is District Attorney Markham, and I'm Philo Vance. Tell us what happened. Came in office. Man at safe. Saw his back. Shot him. Got hit on head. That's... All I remember. You see, Vance, I was right. I told you exactly what happened, didn't I? This dead man isn't Ben Burke at all. He's an imposter. Our case has ended. You told me what you thought happened, Markham. And apparently what Mr. Wheeler here says bears out your story. But actually it doesn't. Wheeler didn't kill this man. And because he didn't, our case is just beginning. This is District Attorney Markham. The brotherly murder case concerns the killing of a man who pretended to be Ben Burke, one of two brothers who, after having been missing for 20 years, returns at the death of their father to claim an inheritance. Vance has planted a newspaper story which indicates that positive proof of the older brother's identity is in lawyer Wheeler's office safe. And it was in front of this safe that the alleged Ben Burke was found, shot. Vance has gone back to his office after stating he doesn't believe Wheeler has killed the man who claimed... You see, Ellen, the lawyer couldn't possibly have shot the man. The lawyer's story was that he came in his office and saw a man standing over the safe. He saw only the man's back and he fired. But the man we found had a bullet wound in his chest. There was no mark on his back. In that case, what happened to Wheeler's bullet? Or did he just make up the whole story? Wheeler missed when he shot. We found the bullet he fired in the wall of his office. Now, let's start with the knowledge that the dead man was not Ben Burke as he claimed. Who could have shot him? First, let's find out who he was, Ben. We know that already. He was an ex-safe cracker, missing for years. Oh. His fingerprints were on file at headquarters. In that case, I know the whole story. Well, I hope it's more accurate than Markham's idea of what happened in that shooting. You want to listen or you want to talk? Go ahead. Well, this ex-safe cracker was brought out of hiding to open that safe. And as soon as he did the job, whoever hired him killed him. And whoever that was now has the proof of how Ben Burke can be identified. Simple? That's very cute. Only two things wrong with it, Ellen. What? One, there was no proof in the safe. And two, whoever hired the man to pose as Ben Burke wouldn't kill him after hiring him. In that case, either the lawyer or the legitimate brother Fred Burke killed him. Well, what would you suggest we do about finding out? I did my share. From now on, it's up to you. You take it from here, Vance. This the room where you doctor up accident patients? Yes. You'd better sit down, young man. We'll take care of that arm. I ain't got no time to have no arm taken care of. Just fix it so it stops bleeding. Of course we will. Now, please sit right where you are while I take a look at it now. Okay. There we are. Hey, Doc, don't... Hmm? Don't take off that bandage. I'll bleed to death. Well, how did you get this wound? I'll fix it up. Don't ask no questions. But I've got to ask a few. We've got to report this to the police. Oh, no, you don't. I don't want anything to do with no cops. Huh? They'll tie me up to that Ben Burke murder. Get your hands no, off no, me. Wait. Get them off. Now, no, look, you've got to sit there until I can... Get... I said let go. You should have let go. Now i got to get out of here and get a phony doctor to take care of me. You're not going to leave here until I can... Oh. Look at me. I only got one good arm and I knocked this guy stiff. Of course I want to help you, Vance, but how can I? I've told you a hundred times that I don't know what my real brother Ben would look like. I knew what he looked like when he was 16, but, well, that's the last time I saw him. The man who claimed to be your brother was found shot to death in the office of your father's lawyer. You know that. Yes, the district attorney phoned and told me. I knew he wasn't my brother, and I know why he went up to Wheeler's office. Yes? He wanted to find out what identification my father left. Identification that was supposed to be in Wheeler's safe. Weren't you interested? Why should I be? My father left no identification. And even if he had, it wouldn't concern me. It was to the other person's advantage to find what was in that safe. Well, the newspapers plainly said the identification concerned Ben Burke. Yes, I know. 
You realize, of course, that you're a suspect in this murder. Me? Me? Yes. Well, why would I kill this man? For what reason? To avoid splitting the inheritance. As it is, the entire quarter of a million goes to you. The money goes to me anyhow. I knew it would go to me. I knew that man wasn't my brother, and eventually I would have been able to prove it. Well, perhaps that's right. I'm glad I was able to track you down. Oh, hello, Markham. Come in, will you? You know Fred Burke. Of course, hello. Vance, we have a lead on the Ben Burke killing. Have you, Markham? Tell me about it. A fellow showed up at the Harrison Hospital a little while ago with a bullet wound in his arm. He broke away from the intern who was trying to treat him when the intern said he'd have to report the wound to the police. How does that tie up to the murder case we're on? As he was struggling with the intern, he said something about not wanting the police to get word about him because then he'd be tied up with the Ben Burke murder. Oh, I see. Where is this young man now? It was simple to track him. He got in a taxi parked in front of the hospital. We checked all the cabs and found out where he was taken. It's a shack down near the waterfront. I thought I'd report to you before we closed in on it. I'm glad you did. Because you realize, of course, that you have no proof against this fellow. Yes, I know. Well, let's go get him. We'll worry about the proof later. Uh, Vance, I'd like to go with you. You, Mr. Burke? Why? Excitement. I'm bored to death sitting around here. Take me with you. Have you a gun? No, but I've got a pretty good pair of hands. Well, what do you say? All right, Fred. Before the night's over, a couple of hands may come in mighty handy. <laughs> Hold still. All right. How's that feel now, Tommy? Better. Better, Joe. You ain't sore because I ran out of here and tried to get in the hospital, are you? It's okay. I got scared. I got real scared. I thought I was going to bleed to death, boss, but when they wanted to report me to the cops, I scrammed. I done right, huh? Yeah, you did. Now that arm better heal in a hurry. Yeah. We've got to go back to doing stick-ups, and I need you to drive the car, and you need two hands for that. I'll drive it one eye for you, boss, if you want, but... What happened to this gimmick of yours where we were going to make that hundred grand doing nothing? Ah, that blew up when Pete got shot at Wheeler's office. Oh, so that's what it was. You got him to pretend like he was Ben Burke. In that case, why did you kill him? Don't move, either of you. What? What Come on in, Vance. Burke. That question your friend just asked you is one thing I'd like the answer to. Why did you kill this fellow Pete who was masquerading as Ben Burke? Hey, Joe, who's this? That's Mark. I'm district attorney next to him's Philo Vance. The other bum, I don't know. He's Fred Burke, but I'm still waiting for an answer to my question. We heard enough outside the door to tie you two up with the murder, but I thought you might tell us why you did it. Who said I killed Pete? Well, your friend here just asked you why you did it. That seems to imply you did it, doesn't it? Does it? <laughs> Tommy, listen to this, huh? Yeah, boss. Tommy, why did you shoot Abraham Lincoln? I shot Abe. You hear that, Markham? I just asked Tommy why he killed Lincoln. <laughs> that means he killed him? Just a minute, my cute friend. All right, Vance, what's with you? You hired a safe cracker named Pete to impersonate the missing Ben Burke. You told him to go to Wheeler's safe and get the identification papers you thought were there. But you found out he was going to double-cross you, and so you killed him. If you say so, Vance, you must have proof, and that's enough for me. Come on, you two, you're coming with us. Oh, no, we're not. Come on, Tommy, they won't shoot. We'll make a break. You'll make a nothing! Well, quite a right hand you have there, Mr. Burke. Yes, isn't it? You flattened our friend very nicely. Look, nobody clipped me here. I don't don't know nothing. I didn't see nothing. Besides, look look at me. I'm I'm wounded. See, my arm, wounded. We won't hurt you. However, we will take you downtown with us, you and your friend here, when he wakes up. Well, Vance, that's that, I believe. Are you indicating that we've reached the end of the brotherly murder case? Of course. You yourself said I just wanted to see what reaction my words would have, Markham. This Joe individual didn't kill the man pretending to be Ben Burke. He didn't? Well, then who did murder the man who claimed to be my brother? You did. Me? Uh, Are you kidding? Why would I kill him? How would I kill him? And even if I did, how could you possibly know? You told me. I? Not in words, but you told me just the same. You actually told me something just as important when you did. You told me that you aren't Fred Burke. What? That you too are an imposter. Why, you... Arrest him, Markham, for murder. And for not being half as clever as he thought he was. Go ahead, Vance. I'll take notes while you dictate. All right, Ellen, but not on the typewriter. 
You always play games, and it's very distracting. <laughs> More distracting than uh, I am? No. But you don't make any noise while I'm talking, uh, generally. Generally. And let's keep it that way, okay? Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Notes on the brotherly murder case. I knew the man pretending to be Fred Burke was not Fred Burke because I knew it was he who killed the man pretending to be his brother, Ben Burke. Oh, brother, does that make sense? <laughs> it will when I cut it down like this. Fred Burke told me that there were no papers in Lawyer Wheeler's safe that could identify his older brother. Uh-huh. Now, how could he know there were no papers unless he went through the safe? No way. Okay. Then that's cleared up. Now, why did he go through the safe? <laughs> Don't look at me. I'm just taking notes. He did it because he was afraid the man posing as his brother was the real Ben Burke. And if he were, and if he found the papers establishing his identity, he might also find the papers that could have identified the real Fred Burke. Yes. All this was on his mind when he crept up to Wheeler's office, only to find our friend Pete there before him bending over the open safe. Well, but where does Wheeler come into this? Now don't rush me. The phony Fred Burke shot Pete as he knelt before the safe. Then he went through the papers in the safe and was there when Wheeler walked toward his office. Pete was dead, but Fred propped him in front of the safe and hid behind the door. Uh-huh. Then Wheeler came in, saw somebody at his safe, and fired. Fired and missed. The man who claimed to be Fred Burke didn't give Wheeler another chance. He hit him on the head and tied him up. Phew. And all this happened because you gave the newspapers a phony item about there being proof of identification in Wheeler's safe. Well, I had to do something to force a move from the bogus Ben Burke. I'll tell you honestly, I didn't know that Fred was an imposter. But it all came out in the wash. It sure did. That the end of the notes, Vance? Yes, Ellen. Good. That means it's also the end of the brotherly murder case. <laughs> My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the time before dawn, Broadway is an island of silence torn from the blazing neon, the midnight sun of the spectaculars. The river mists mingle with the vapors rising from manhole covers. Through them move the rejects, the stragglers, the wanderers, the men without sleep. One detaches himself, scavenges in a trash bin choked with the remnants of night, finds nothing, moves on to the next. It's the time of the endless search, the restlessness of an anguish you can't understand, on the street built for the purpose. You walk it, and a shadow whimpers, and you hurry on, close your heart to it, because the whimper was yours. And finally, you must put aside whatever it was you were looking for, because on a side street, a man waits for you to give you the nighttime's departing gift. The boy 
lying dead against the iron gate of the tenement's basement court. Pablo Molari, Danny, from uptown, West 109th Street. Carried one of those handwritten identification cards. Find anything else on him? Not much. Five dollar bill in his wallet. His saint's medallion he's wearing on a chain around his neck. That's about all. Now, you question the people in the... Yeah, Danny, every door. No one ever heard of the kid. Had nothing to do with him. Didn't want to talk about him. You know, most of them were trying to sleep, the heat, the kid's squalling, you know. Yeah. Beaten. Jaw broken. This bruise on his throat... Must be the one that killed him. Here, come down here, Danny. Huh? What? Take a look at the sign on this door. Hudson Club, Johnny Hammett, president. I guess it's one of those street clubs the kids make up for themselves. This neighborhood's loaded with them. You think what happened to this kid is part of it? Yeah, I think. What do you think? Maybe. Check it, Muggerman. I'll get back to you. And wait now for the decent hour. Give to someone a few more hours of sleep before breaking the news about the death of a young man. And at 8.30, to an address on West 109th Street. Climb four flights and be careful of the rotting steps and the three-year-olds at play. The door opens to your knock. And the woman who pinches her shawl close to her throat doesn't understand what you're saying. And calls a neighbor who understands. Who explains to the woman, the mother of a murdered young man, explains what must be done. Accept the fact of death. Identify the body. Bury her son. Then walk away from all of it. You've started a new day. Call headquarters. Detective Muggerman gives you an address. Looked for and found and checked by the night shift. Johnny Hammett, president of the Hudson Club, a tenement on West 43rd near the docks. Johnny's glad for the company. I dislike having my coffee alone, Mr. Clover. You work, Johnny? Yeah, here and there. Mostly on Broadway, sir. People always want things done. You mean you run errands? No, if you think all it is is running down to the corner drugstore, no. Broadway, Mr. Clover. It's full of tourists. Anybody else live here with you? Yeah, my father. I think he still does. I hardly ever see him. How's the Hudson Club coming along? Oh, fine. Fine, thank you. What kind of club is it? Oh, a little bit of everything. Sports, dances, beach parties. The girls do most of the arranging. Girls? <laughs> Isn't that funny? About a month ago, I mentioned girls to my father. He had the same expression on his face as you do. Yeah, girls. I'm 19. I don't chalk walls anymore. Johnny, a member of your club was murdered last night. A boy by the name of Pablo Malari. Oh, is he dead? Nah, he wasn't a member of the club, sir. He just hung around. What about him, Johnny? Who killed him? I didn't. And no one's come up to me since last night and said he did it either. Where were you last night? We had a meeting at the club, a special one. Initiations, plans for the summer. Broke up about two. I came right home. I want a list of your members, Johnny. Names, addresses. No, sure. And before you go. Look, where was Pablo found? Outside your club, in the vestibule. Nelson might know. Nelson? Toby Nelson. We had him in front of the door last night to keep away undesirables. Where can I find him? Works at a cigar and magazine counter in the Flick Building lobby. I wish there was more I could tell you. I really do, sir. Hey, sis, don't forget your change. There you are, baby. Good luck at the track. What's yours, Buster? Your name, Toby Nelson? Someone send you to ask an important question? Police. That buzzer could stand a little metal polish, mister. Don't worry about it. Oh, sure not. Uh, tell me what I should worry about. About a boy named Pablo Molari. Uh, yeah, I've been reading him in the newspapers. What's he to me? He was found beaten to death in front Hudson of... Hudson Club, I know, I know. It says so in the papers. What went on there last night? I'll have to read the minutes of the meeting. I was outside making these two big muscles that Tots who wanted in and couldn't get in. What happens at these initiations, Toby? Ah, kid stuff. You swear to do this and that and be a nice Hudson. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I was embarrassed for the kid. Who are you talking about? Paula. Paula got taken into us last night. Johnny Hammond wanted it, so I arranged it. Paula Chopak, which makes us fellow members, which makes me happy, happy. This Paula's your girl. Manicure's my pinkies. Look. 
Pretty job, huh? Gives me locks of hair, knits me argyles. Oh, it's a nice thing we got. Tender. Paula Chopak. Uh-huh. I've got her name on my list. She was on top of the grocery store, corner 11th Avenue and 46. Yeah, thanks a lot, Toby. Anytime. Oh, here, take a scratch sheet, mister. For free. Go ahead, take it. It's last Monday's. And bring to the top of the list Paula Chopak. Climb the stairs, knock on a door with the curtain panels of glass, and hear the furtive scurrying behind it and the slam of another door inside. Then hear a woman's steps approaching, and an instant of silence. Then the fumbling with the catch, and the door opens. And the woman had not finished making herself presentable to the caller. The wrinkled cotton house dress needed another smoothing. The graying hair needed to be pressed back again from the forehead. And the tired voice, there was nothing to be done about that. Yes, something. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. It's good you're here. We not think police come so soon. Please to come in. Please, that chair. I sit by window in it by evening. It's comfortable, clean. You be cool. Please, mister. Thank you, but I'd like to... to... By my daughter to speak. By Paula. Paula, is she here? Yes. By room, listening to records. But uh, first, please, mister, first. You want to tell me something, Mrs. Chopak? About Paula. You, you see what I am, mister. But Paula, by her is great beauty, by the face, by the rich black hair. Mrs. Chopin. Like crown she wears it, my Paula, my baby. I comb for her, brush, wash, put in braids by night for sleep. My Paula is good, clean. Respectful to me, to such as you, never trouble. Never bring me tears. Will you call her, please? Go to her. She wait for you. She say me, policeman, come this afternoon. I have much thing to tell him. My Paula say this to me. <laughs> what my Paula got to say to policeman, mister? <laughs> what? In that room? Yes. You see... My Paula tell you her thing. Then you, policeman, go away from us. Ah, huh, mister? Paula, I'm from the police. I know. I heard. Your mother said you had something you want to tell me. Mom's wrong. I don't think so. Tell me, Paula. Mom can hardly speak English. Sometimes she doesn't understand the things I say to her. I've got nothing for you. Besides, I'm busy. Brushing your hair? Let it alone for a while, Paula. Talk to me. A boy was murdered last night in front of a club where you were initiated. Pablo Molari. Is that what you wanted to tell me about? What's the matter, Paula? Scared? Look at me. You think you could scare me? Toby Nelson talked to me. He said... He told you I was sweet to him, maybe. Told you I joined the Hudsons because he asked me. Because I used to jump when he asked. That he told you? That too. Well, next time you see him, explain to him it's finished. Through, wiped off my memory book. Is it last night? What happened last night? I got initiated in a club. What else can happen to a girl? Murder, maybe? A murder she saw being committed, maybe? Something she's afraid I of? said it once. I got nothing to tell you. So go tell Mom I got nothing to say to a policeman. It'll cheer her up. I hope you're right, Paula. For you. For your mother. I hope you're right. Danny, I give you the evening's greetings. Thanks a lot, Gino. Hey, you're here so late tonight. Why didn't you go home after you saw the Chopak girl? Mm, I had some work to do. Uh-huh. Uh, Danny, would you mind very much if I regaled you with a tidbit that happened early this evening at the house of Tartaglia? Please do. Cousin Stanley from Gay Paris showed up after ten these many years. Not him. Oh, him it was. And with arms akimbo with goodies. Nicks for Mrs. Tartaglia, knacks for the kiddies, and for me, a great big bottle. <laughs> Champagne, huh? Had a call, Danny. Fifty-one. From Paris? <laughs> Those continentals know how to live. 
Gino, did you have that list of the Hudson Club checked? Indeed I did, and each and every member swears on the bylaws of the club that they know nothing of the murder of Pablo Malari. Danny Clover speaking. Squad car's downstairs for you, Danny. Paula Chopak was washed up on the beach at Far Rockaway a little while ago. Maybe an accident, maybe homicide. You going, Danny? Right away. The night wind off the sea was soft, warm. It sighed against the flames of the beach fire strung along the coast, riffled the sand across driftwood, across the litter. It brought close the far-off sounds of a summer beach at night, the laughter from behind screen porches, the siren call of the ukulele gently strummed, the distant screeching of gulls, and closer, the other sounds, the lash and wash of the surf, the opening and setting up and adjusting of the mechanical devices that attend the dead. And then the trembling voice of the boy who tries to tell you about the girl lying there. How it was, why it was. We were swimming, sir. Lost her someplace out there in the dark. And I heard her kind of scream. Just you and Paula, Johnny? Yeah, it was a beach party, like the ones I told you about. The other members left. Paula wanted to stay. Asked me to stay with her. You said she screamed. Why? She hit her head on one of those rocks out there. The high tide covers them up. I didn't know I hit the beach. She was dead. I tried to dead. She is, isn't she? Look at me. I killed Paula. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Tonight's the night. Yes, beginning this evening, there'll be a new host on Songs for Sale. He's affable Steve Allen, a young comedian whose likable personality you're really going to enjoy. Steve Allen becomes head salesman on Songs for Sale, introducing new songwriters and their tunes tonight over most of these same CBS stations. On an early summer's night, Broadway stands on a corner, leans against the orange juice stand, and sums up the day. Some days are better than others. Some days you break even. You only had one end of the daily double, but the new blonde in the office looked over her shoulder at you and smiled. And later, when she dabbed on her lipstick with a finger, she smiled again. Oh, it was quite a day today. The Dodgers passed a miracle. You forgot to pay the check at the cafeteria and got away with it. And a girl... The song of a girl was washed up on the beach at Far Rockaway. Here is maybe a tragic day, but here is a day. It was 11.30 toward the end of it when we got Johnny Hammett back to headquarters. Sit down there, Johnny. Cigarette, kid? No. No, thank you. Well, maybe you'd rather have one of Danny's. Yeah, here. Here, have one, Johnny. I don't want one. I guess Johnny doesn't like the brands we smoke, Danny. I just don't want to smoke, that's all. Can a man not want to smoke? Take it easy. Sure. Sure, relax, kid. Am I under arrest? You said you killed Paula. It was my fault. I shouldn't have let her swim out that far. Did you kill her or didn't you kill her? It was my fault. Who killed Pablo Malari? You think I did? Did you, Johnny? You think I killed him, don't you, Mr. Clover? There you go again, Johnny. Look, look, kid. A couple of your friends were killed. We're police. We're asking. I didn't kill anybody. You don't have to explain it, Johnny Muggerman. He knows why he's here. He knows we need his help. Help, Johnny. That's what we want. We're not asking for a confession. (laughs) Who's kidding who? Were you in love with Paula? She wasn't around long enough. She was around tonight. What happened tonight? You know what happened. What's the matter with you? Look, Johnny, I'm going to tell you something. You're not talking to your little hoodlum friends. You're talking to a policeman. Nobody's trying to intimidate you. Nobody's trying to make you say things you don't want to say. You're talking to a policeman that's trying to do his job. What happened tonight? We had a... Beach party. The Hudson's? Yes, sir. That's better, Johnny. Paul and I came late. The others were already there. Toby Nelson? Yes, sir. Toby wanted to take Paula home. Paula wanted to stay. So we stayed. Paula and I. We were the last ones there. What made Paula want to stay? She'd never been swimming at night. And she swam out past the breakers and a wave washed her against a rock. Is that what happened? Yes, sir. All right, Johnny. Can I go now? Uh Uh-huh. Good night, Johnny. Thanks. What do you think, Muggerman? 
You believe him? I don't know. I'm going to check. I'm going to talk to Toby. Toby? Toby? Who wants me? Oh, you've got a long nose, mister. Your landlady told me you were up here on the roof. Hers is even longer than yours. What's the guy have to do to get a square foot of air to himself? Your girl's dead, Toby. Paula's dead. You're stale, mister. The smooth voices on the radio have been telling me Paula's dead. For an hour now. Up here, I thought I couldn't hear him. I hear him. Johnny Hammett says it was an accident. That makes it an accident. You were at the beach party, Toby? Never miss it. Gives me a chance to show off my muscles to the members. You did that. Then what happened? Well, let me think now. Uh, yeah, after that, I roasted the hot dogs for the group. We all ate hearty, then it broke up. I came home. And left Paula alone with Johnny? Yeah, that's the other thing I did. Paula was your girl. How come Johnny took her to the party? If she was alive, you could ask her. I wouldn't know. Johnny says you wanted to take her home. Why didn't you? Because she slapped me across the mouth when I asked her. They all laughed. Johnny, too. Then she laughed harder than anybody. That's how I got the message she didn't want me to take her home. She wanted Johnny. Up to the night of the initiation at the Hudson Club, she was your girl. What happened there to make her turn on you, Toby? She's dead. Paula's dead. What else do you want from me? What else do I have to give you? How much can you... She's dead, mister. That's all I got. All right, Toby. And leave the boy alone. Give him the time and place of his grieving and the quality of it that's bled out of a tenement rooftop in a city stretching into the hours after midnight. Go away. Resign yourself that another day is over. The next morning, and the legwork, going out to a corner of the city where the sign says 11th Avenue and 46th. Climb the steps and stop at a door. Intrude upon two rooms newly filled with grieving. Please. Please come in. Of my daughter? Mrs. Chopak, the police are not satisfied that Paula... Of my daughter, Paula? There's a possibility that it wasn't an accident. Paula is in another room. The others. Neighbors by me. We have only boxes to sit on. I want you to try to understand what I'm saying. Nothing. Nothing I understand. Only up to yesterday. To yesterday when Paula said to me, Mama... I'm going to swim with this boy, this Johnny. Johnny Hammett? Johnny. He called for her? At first, my Paula, she said she would want to stay home, rather. Then the boy said something to her. Then down low over her ear. Paula took her suit for swimming, her cap not to get her hair wet. Then she said what I said to you. I see. Just one more thing, Mrs. Chopak. The night before last, your daughter went out. Do you know where she went? To some place. To party. My club has party. What time did she come home? Late. I don't know what time. Did you talk to her when she came home? Only when I tried to give her help. Help? White. Like ghost. I'm sick. I hear this. I get out of my bed. I come to her. I say, Paula, you're sick. Mama, get something. She tell me, go away. Like I'm someone she never see before. Was she drunk? Sick. There's no whiskey I smell. Sick. White. Sick like ghost. I see. She's dead now. Paula is. And the neighbors by me. They're in next room. They sit. They cry. They touch my shoulder. They don't talk. They don't know what words to say to me. Then walk the tenement street 
and have your passage greeted by the sudden silences of the yelling kids, the turning of backs after the furtive gesture of insult, because somehow you were guilty of that anguish over the corner grocery store. Once you had been welcomed by a mother, and for that you had left her a dead child. And on that street the guilt was yours. So I got away from it. At headquarters, read, reread the file on Mullary, dead of a beating. On Paula Chopak, dead of a head wound while swimming at Rockaway. And finally, read away the daylight and sit in darkness till a man comes in, looks at you for a moment, and turns on a light. You don't mind the light, huh, Danny? It's all right, Gino, thanks. And I agree with you that this killing, this dying of kids, makes one wish to sit alone in the dark. However... You... Got something for me, Gino? Danny, all I can give you is a comment upon the children of today. The clubs they must make for themselves. The things they do in said clubs. The hurt they bring upon themselves for so doing. Go on, Gino. Well, it's in all the papers, Danny. How they go out of the way for new thrills, new sensations, new emotions. Only this morning, while shaving, I was bending an ear to the comment from the radio. I called in the Tartaglia You got crowd something, to... Muggerman? I don't know, Danny. Maybe yes, maybe no. What? Gordon and Technical gave it to me to give to you. See if the big man can figure it, he says to me. I got news about Gordon. I actively dislike What did he give man. you? Now, he's been studying the bathing cap Paula Chopak wore at the beach party. He says it's curious. Why? He says the girl didn't have the cap on when she went into the water. Paula was proud of her hair. She'd have worn the cap. Why does he say she wasn't wearing it? Because there was no blood stain inside it. Gordon says if she was wearing the cap when she hit the rock, it would have held some of the blood. Which means, he says, that the cap was put on her after she was carried to the beach. It means another thing, Marvin. What? Paula was murdered. Get me a squad car. It's the police. What do you want? Let's go inside, I'll tell you. Inside, Toby. Are you the only Hudson here? Hey, Johnny, look what's here. We got a call it, Johnny. Good evening, Mr. Clover. Nice clubhouse you've got here. Uh, can I show you around? Where's everybody? I thought you had quite an organization. They'll be around. When you leave, people will start swarming in here. I'm glad you came, Mr. Clover. Thanks. Hey, what's with you, Johnny? You buy a cop for a friend? Don't pay any attention to him, sir. He doesn't know about policemen. He doesn't know they have a job to do. You understand all about that, though, don't you? Hey, what's going on? Too bad about you, Toby. Huh? I said too bad about you. Your muscles, your temper. The mad you had on the other night. Hey, Johnny, what's he... You never saw Toby work over a guy, did you, Mr. Clover? No. Tell me about it. Once, a boy tried to get in here. Tried real hard. Toby was in front of the door. The boy never made it. Pablo Molari? Johnny. It wasn't premeditated, Mr. Clover. Toby didn't mean it. He was just angry about something. You're under arrest, Toby. Put out your hands. Gotta do something first! Don't be a fool! Take him off me! Yeah, yeah! Take him! Oh. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Clover. That's just the way he went after that boy. He would have killed me. Toby will rest a while. What are you doing, Mr. Clover? Frisking him. Nice cigarette case. Cigarette, Johnny? Are you kidding? I don't smoke those. Don't blame you. Marijuana brings you grief. That's what it brought Paula. Paula? Uh-huh. Paula was a sick girl after she got home from her initiation. You have to smoke this stuff to become a member of your club? Oh, now look. You look, Johnny. Paula was Toby's girl. You wanted her. That's why you insisted she become a member. Put her on this stuff, she'd lose her sense of values. You think I'd do anything like that? Yes, I do. You know me better than that. I know you killed her. I told you what happened out there on the beach. You forgot to tell me why she went there with you. 
What were you going to do, Johnny? Tell her mother she was smoking marijuana? Is that why she went with you, stayed at the beach after the others left? I don't know what to say to you, Mr. Clover. You're wrong. And I think you ought to take care of Toby here. Paula had beautiful hair, Johnny. I'd go along with that. She'd have worn her cap into the water. You killed her before she went into the water. How, Johnny? With a rock? Mr. Clover... Then you threw her in the surf, saw her suit to be wet. Pulled her back, remembered about the cap, put it on her. Why did you murder her? She was so beautiful. She was so beautiful, Mr. Clover. She refused more of your cigarettes? Funny. Worked before. Let's go, Johnny. It always worked. You know, it got so they'd come around here begging for the stuff. A young man like me, connections, is like a king. I'll tell you another funny thing. I wouldn't touch this stuff. Come on. Yes, sir. Broadway looks clean. The winds of the evening have swept away the litter. Everything looks sharp, sharp, like a knife at your heart. You walk against it, and it plunges deeper, deeper until there's no pain at all. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Dick Crenna was heard as Johnny Hammett, Bill Tracy as Toby Nelson, Peggy Weber as Mrs. Chopat, and Michael Ann Barrett as Paula Chopat. On July 8th next week, Broadway's My Beat will be heard on a new day, Sunday. Beginning a week from tomorrow, be sure to listen to Broadway's My Beat and the adventures of Danny Clover, starring Larry Thor. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where Phil Regan brings you the serviceman's own show every Sunday on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So, indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing, delicious. When it's July and the heat puffs up from the river, Broadway is a place of regret. The winter dreams made for the summer are blurred. The golden girls fan themselves with newspapers. It's the time of the salt tablet, the fly paper, and the sullen sleep on the fire escape. The mornings are filled with a thousand hours and the bleary talk and dead cigarettes in the bottom of paper cups. It's summer, the poet's time, 
the lover's time. And if you can afford an ocean voyage, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Which is equally true for a policeman if he's retired, if he's come into a fat inheritance from Uncle Ned, ex-wonder boy of the oil fields. Not me, nor Detective Mugovan. We were still working to pay off the bills. Current job, stakeout in front of an apartment house in the West 80s. Stakeout for an armed robber who had shot a bystander to death. Ran across roofs, down alleys, finally trapped. Let's hold up on the second floor, Danny. Empty apartment. Ready? Let's go. All the other tenants cleared out? Uh Uh-huh. Had a little trouble with the people in 2B. How come? People named Morgan. Their grandmother died. A funeral. Got all the mourners out. Apartment right next to one of our killers in 2A. You sure he's in there? Probably him, Danny. Description fits. Let's find out. Open up. Open up. This is the police. Mugovan? Yeah. Hey, those windows over there, Danny, open. The screen's been kicked out. Come on. The killer left this apartment in a hurry. Uh huh. Hey, these windows lead to a fire escape. He could have gone out this window onto the fire escape into the next apartment, Danny. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah. Must have done it this way. The screens on this apartment have been knocked out, too. Let's go see them. Huh? Yeah, this is the Morgan apartment, Danny, where the Morgan grandmother. Want me to look around? For appearances, Mugovan. I'm guessing our man walked out with the mourners and got lost. Must have made him happy. Greetings, Danny. Well, looks like we made the boo-boo. It amuses you, Sergeant? Well, Danny, it is only that I am trying to tickle your funny bone with what otherwise could blossom into a severe headache. You got out the all points on the killer? Goes without saying. The bulletin is out, but the puzzle lingers on. Oh, that Mugovan and I were on him and he got away from us? No puzzle, Gino. We lost it, that's all. Ah, be friendly with yourself, Danny. Such things happen. The puzzle to me is that a burglar in his chosen line of duty should so overstep himself as to enter the ranks of the killers. <laughs> Overambitious type, huh? Try to beat his way into Mrs. Conlon's apartment on West 76 with a gun. It bothered a neighbor. The neighbor tried to stop him, tried to beat him off. The neighbor got killed. You got any other troubles, Gino? Well, nobody's got troubles compared to the way Mrs. Conlon's got troubles. A man with a gun tried to get to her. He didn't make it. If I were Mrs. Conlon, it... What'd you say? About Mrs. Conlon? Oh, when your call came in, Danny, the name Conlon registered on my gray matter. So I nudged it up a notch by referring to a file and flash. It came to me that like a year ago, a Mr. Hugh Conlon was found shot dead at the side of an unidentified woman, also shot dead. Verdict? Murder with suicide. This Conlon was the husband of the said... Hey, yo, yo, to see Danny Clover, permission must be obtained and granted. Don't try to stop me. Don't anyone. Who are you? Now, don't try to bypass me, sir. You have spoiled the plans of Lucian Cobb, funeral director, after we'd rehearsed and rehearsed. This is a new type show business, Danny? Sit down, Mr. Cobb. Tell me what I've done to you. I'll not sit, sir. While bearding a criminal, you this morning did destroy the careful staging of a month. We rehearsed the old woman, Grandmother Morgan. How the little old lady would lie in her coffin, her pose, her attitude. And when death took her, we were ready for it. And now... You're saying our trying to take a killer ruined your carefully planned funeral. How? Twenty minutes ago, the granddaughter of the deceased phoned me, told me tearfully she'd opened a clothes hamper, and there was her grandmother folded in with last week's wash. I'm sorry, Mr. Cobb. Death has a dignity, Mr. Clover. You... I'm aware of it, Mr. Cobb. Gino? Yeah, Danny. That's how the killer got away. Climbed into the coffin himself. Get on the phone. Find out what happened to that funeral. Tartaglia did very well. He lifted a receiver and dialed and asked a question. He got an answer and replaced the receiver. Hey, Danny, the hearse took off for parts unknown. Deserted the rest of the funeral. 
and make some more calls to traffic and to highway patrol and wait. And finally a call comes back, one hearse located on a side road off Queens Highway, driver recovering from pistol whipping but still bewildered by the strangeness of it all. Go there and talk to him. Look, mister, the first thing I want you to understand is I'm not lying to you. Just tell me what happened. We were cruising along through the streets, uptown toward the cemetery. It happened at 180th Street. What did? There's a glass panel between my driver's seat and the, you know, the coffin, the flowers. That's where the tapping came from. Tapping? Yeah, with the butt end of a gun. The coffin was open and this guy was kneeling there with the gun. Then he busted through the glass, pointed the gun in my ear. Says, take a right here. I took a right. Wouldn't you? Go ahead. I took a right. I took off from the rest of the funeral. A long nose, a head full of red hair, and a big gun. When we got to where we are now, he tells me to stop this hearse, to get out. I get out. He slugs me. Is that all? Is that all? You think this happens every day? And phone it in and check out for the night. And go home. Find the heat piled high in your room, waiting for you. And take the blanket and the pillow to the roof. And step carefully past the sleepless child, his eyes wide with reflection of nighttime. And hear the whispered, tired scolding of the man at his side. And the rustle of the woman's cotton robe as she pulls it tight to her throat. And find an empty place. And consider there the pattern a killer has scarred across the summer's day. Consider it. Then make your way back downstairs to the hall phone. Ask Mrs. Conlon to meet you at your office in the morning and go back for the sleep you left on a brownstone's roof. In the morning, she was already waiting for me. And with her, a young woman who took a cigarette from a plastic case and waited for me to light it for her. Thank you. You're sweet. Uh, my daughter, Mr. Clover. Uh, Myra. Hi, and hello. Uh, well, Myra insisted on coming with me. She said she didn't want me to be alone with you. Don't lie, Catherine. Myra, the reason I came, Mr. Clover, it was a chance to meet a new man. I told Catherine that. The poor thing's trying to cover up. <laughs> she doesn't mean that, Mr. Clover. Myra's a child. All the excitement, that man trying to break in, your call last night, a, a child's mind. It, it can be too much for... You through, Catherine? Because if you aren't, Mr. Clover will never have the chance to tell us why we're here. The man who tried to break in, Mrs. Conlon, had you ever seen him before? Why, no, I never... Uh, I told you that yesterday. Why do you ask again? Maybe the attractive man doesn't believe you, Catherine. Myra, what are you trying to do to me? You come in here, make a show of yourself before this man, talk fresh... Mrs. Conlon, had you ever seen the man before? No, I told you no. Yesterday was the first time he beat at my door. When I wouldn't let him in, he threatened me with a gun. And then that nice neighbor from across the hall. He's helped Myra and me so many times, and now Mrs. He... Conlon, try to understand why I'm going to remind you of... Of what? Remind me of what? Of your husband's death, of What's how... he got to do with it? What's my husband dying a year ago with that nameless woman got to do with it. Patience, Catherine. Let the man tell you. It's only that the killer we're after might have had something to do with this other thing that happened to you. It's the only way I can figure it. Why should he beat on your door openly with a gun? Why He's should... a thief. He wanted to rob me. A thief who stands in a hall and knocks and asks permission to... What are you trying to do to me? Hasn't there been enough? Haven't I had enough? Oh, Myra, tell him... Danny Clover speaking. There's a man sleeping in my boarding house. Answers the killer's description you got in the papers. You want him? I give him to you. Where? Boarding house. 1756 West 61. You come from right away, huh? So I can put my room to let sign. Back in the window. Quick turn over. You can go home, Mrs. Conlon. I'll ask the killer my questions. <laughs> I'm telling you, mister, when I give this man a room, I thought there was something funny. Why didn't you call the police then? Just because he was breathing hard, like he'd been running? Well, that ain't no reason. The reason was this morning. Oh, when you saw his description in the paper? Yeah, yeah, the bright red hair, you know, and the nose. He registered last night, and he hasn't gone out since, is that right? He had a caller late last night, late. Who? 
Oh, I don't know who. I don't peep. He made a phone call from the hall phone, went back to his room, and later I heard someone go into his room. How long did the caller stay? I went to sleep. I don't know. Where's his room? Uh, 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 down on the right. I'll take you. Here it is. This one. Give me the key and step back. Hey, he's that dangerous? You got to use a gun? Don't worry about it. Ooh. All right, you. Wake up. On your feet. On... Deep sleep already. He really sleeps, huh? <gasps> What's the matter with him? What's the matter? He should have peeped at his collar. You would have seen what a murderer looks like. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The July twilight bleeds the color out of Broadway's neon, and the street is a summer's sigh done in pastel. The delicate cottons cling to the visitor's shoulders, and their husbands shoo them away from Broadway's kindly folk. And Broadway's forced to other summer delights. The boat ride to Coney. Try that, kid. The quick shipboard romance. And at the end of it, the guided tour through the Hall of Mirrors. Or the rendezvous at the coffee pump in the automat. Or just stand on the corner and sniff the cool air from the Catskill sent in the open envelope from the wife and kids. And compare its message with the one in the headlines. Fugitive killer found murdered in boarding house. And decide, it's better here, kid. Happiness is where the heart is. It's better here. And at headquarters, feel the twilight slip from your fingers as the door opens. And the night time is brought to you in the capable hands of capable Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. I come to sound the hour, Danny. At the sound of the bong, it will be late. And even now, the aroma of the cacciatore that awaits at Tartaglia's house is being wafted from uptown down Center Street to tickle the nostrils. Bong. Give me what you got, Gino, and then you can go home. Thank you, Danny. You are indeed a kindly, generous employer. Did the ballistics check the gun that killed Joe Gruber? No, it is the same with which this Joe Gruber murdered an innocent neighbor in the to-do in front of Mrs. Conlon's apartment which proves to all concerned that this Joe Gruber was indeed the murderer of the innocent neighbor. Uh, anything else? What is else is that the take of Mugovan has compiled for you the criminal record of the aforesaid Joe Gruber, which I will bring. It seems that in his this past, Joe Gruber Danny, was... I got the record on Gruber. Detective of Mugovan. I'm surprised at you. What's the matter with you, Gino? Well, I was about to parlay the information you have gathered. Efficiently, I grant. But I was about to parlay this info into the ear of Lieutenant Clover with my own mouth. When you were so rude... Oh, you did good anyway, Gino. You can go home now. Mrs. Tartaglia will be waiting for you. She'll... She at least appreciates the endeavor I make to... <clears throat> good night, Lieutenant Clover. Detective Mugovan. Good night to all. Good night, Gino. Tell Mrs. Tartaglia you were fine today. Tell her I... What's eating him? Call him up in a little while. Tell him you're sorry. What for? What'd I do to him? Oh, just do it, my woman. Okay. What have you got on Gruber? Oh, technical's got the knife that killed him. Trying to trace the make, manufacturer, distributor, retail outlets, etc. You, uh, you said you had a record on him. Yeah, 20 years long. Gave it to us when an officer booked him up for disturbing the Pell-Mell Rotisserie and Bar on 3rd. Got in a beef with some woman, mauled her. She yelled police. Happened five days ago. Oh, who was the woman? No, we don't know. She didn't show up to make complaints, so we released Gruber. You want the rest to run down on him? If it means anything. Well, it's up to you. Uh, Gruber began 20 years ago in San Francisco. Car heists, filling station holdups. They finally got him good on a negligent manslaughter charge. Fifteen years in San Quentin. Released six weeks ago. Next heard of it, the Pell-Mell Bar. 
then released to murder Mrs. Conlon's neighbor, then dead on arrival. That all of it? Yeah. Anything, Danny? Not much, huh? It wasn't much, but it was all I had. Joe Gruber had been mixed up in a disturbance at the Pell-Mell Rotisserie and Bar, which was on 3rd Avenue, which took up 40 front feet of sidewalk, and whoever was thirsty enough to dare what was inside. The inside was all bar and three fellas deep, the rotisserie part of it being a cheap hot plate burner that melted things upon occasion. It took a few minutes to get close, but I finally made it. You know what's yours? Talk. I'm from the police. Here, Batch. Was something wrong? No, no, just talk. Oh, sure. Hey, Ed, come here, take over, will you? I gotta talk to a guy. Yeah, scooch down to the end of the bar, mister, so we won't get our talk mixed up with people. Uh, better, huh? Hey, uh, can I give you something from the shelf, some Johnny Walker? About a week ago, there was a little trouble in here. At least I keep the trouble inside, off the sidewalks. Uh, take a look at this picture. Yeah. You ever see this man before? Well, who is he? Name's Joe Gruber. His eyes are closed because you took a while he was on the slab, huh? That's right. Yeah, I seen him. Like you said about a week ago, trouble with a dame. What dame? I don't know. I didn't see much what happened. I got told. Had you ever seen Joe before? The first time. He was in here, picked up one of my customers. You know, throw the arm around the shoulder, I'll buy you a drink, pick up. Friendly, buy drinks. I ask him to pay. He says, sure, sure, my sister will be in a minute and pay. He looks serious, so I fed him drinks. Later, I was back in the storeroom, I hear yelling. I get back in time to see a cop off the beat, hauls this guy away. Leaves Mal standing there. Drinks unpaid. Mal? Mal who? The armor on the shoulder pickup. Mal! Hey, Mal! Mal, come here! Yeah? Well, what do you want? Yeah, my friend here's a cop. A very nice a cop. Out of my way. Hey, come back here. Let me through. Let me through. Let go of me. Let go. If I'm going to have to take it down on the floor to talk to you, that's where you're going. How'd you get here so fast? It ain't been five minutes I opened up that pay phone. But it was only because the operator got snippy. A man's got a right. Let's go. Look, I'm booked, ain't I? So give me my shower and a cell like always. What, am I different or something? I want you to look at a picture, Mal. Here. You know that man? Must have been a lot of long-distance calls from that pay booth you tumbled, Mal. That change could add up to grand larceny. It was that much, huh? I guess I was just born lucky. It's going to be a hot summer in that jail yard, Mal. Sit down, Mal. Cigarette? Your friend's got a cigar in his pocket. Margaret? Yeah. You want a light? Here. My feet are killing me. Put him up on my desk. <sighs> Comfortable? Well, what's your trouble, fellas? What about the picture? The guy's name is Joe. Bought me drinks. Nice fella. Very nice. My cigar went out. <sighs> now let's, let's hear all about it. He buys me a lot of drinks, tells me the story of his life. Now, how he did a lot of time on the coast. You know, mm -hmm. a lot about his sister Mildred. He liked his sister Mildred a lot. Go on. You know, he says his sis Mildred ran away to New York, got herself married. Uh, this is about 20 years ago when she was a youngster. And by the time sis Mildred got back to Frisco with her hubby, Joe was in stir. His sister Mildred come to visit once, then he lost track. Ain't seen her since. Well, how'd he happen to find her in New York? Phone book. Looked up her married name on the off chance, and there it was. He called. Did he tell you what her married name was? Might have. Uh, slipped the old mind if he did. He called her, said he'd wear a red posy so she'd recognize him. But the dame shows. Guess what happened? Danny. Leave him alone. She walks over to Joe and asks, is he Joe who called? Joe says, I am he, only you ain't my sister Mildred. My sister Mildred had red hair like me, he says, so they walk over in the corner, they start to talk. Then the lady raises a roof about something, starts to hurry up. Joe runs after her right into the arms of the law. What did this lady look like? Frankly, Joe fed me too many drinks to remember clear. Huh? That's about it, boys. Uh, light my cigar again, huh? Muggerman picked the nickel thief up by the frayed collar and carried him off to the showers, which left me alone to sift the pleasant time we'd had together, come up with a name, 
Mildred, Mildred Gruber, the sister who had run off to New York 20 years ago to marry. And wonder why it wasn't Mildred who showed up when Brother Joe phoned her. And wonder why it wasn't possible to go and ask her herself. But for that, you needed her married name. The name only Joe Gruber could tell you. The dead Joe Gruber. And remember that the city has a hall of records. And that girls' names are entered there for births and deaths and marriages. Go to the hall of records. Be handed over to a man named Franey. Wait for Mr. Franey to come back from the long voyage into the files. And finally he does, waving his find under your nose. I found it, Lieutenant. Found it. Thanks. Let me... Uh... Uh, I'm afraid you couldn't read my scroll. I'll translate for you. On May 12, 1931, one Mildred Gruber applied for a marriage license. Age 19, height... Who'd she fi- apply with? Uh, got that, too. Uh, Mr. Hughes Conlon. Age 27, height... Conlon, fi- eh? Uh... Look up what you have on Conlon. Please, Mr. Franey, do that. Wait again. And know somehow Mr. Franey would look just like that when he came back. And you got something this time, Lieutenant. Conlon was married again, just three years after the first time. And I looked and looked, and there's no record of a divorce. The penalty for false statements is clearly stated on the bottom. Sure it is. Thank you again, Mr. Franey. Oh, hi and hello, Mr. Clover. Come on in. In here, the living room. Say, I've been trying to make Alexander's for years. Can I try one on you? How old are you, Myra? Seventeen. And I won't breathe a word of it. Is your mother home? Let's chip in and send her to the movies. Get her. Are you kidding? Get her. You're a fool. You could have had an Alexander. Did someone come in, Myra? Do you want me to lie to her, Mr. Clover? I most always It's the police, Mrs. Conlon. I want to talk to you. Hello. I was about to go to bed. I... Maybe you won't make it, Catherine. Will she, Mr. Clover? Myra, I'm sure there's nothing here to concern you. Will you please go? No. Myra... You heard me. No. When you were in my office, Mrs. Conlon, there was a question we never got finished with. It concerned your husband and the woman with whom he was found dead a year ago. And a man named Joe Gruber. I I don't at all understand what you're talking about. Mother. Mama. Mom. Don't you have a date tonight, Myra? Every night. It'll keep. They always keep. All of them. All the time. You still haven't told me what I want to know, Mrs. Connell. Well, my husband shot himself. Because of me. Because of my child. He was ashamed of what was going on with that woman. He killed her and then shot himself. That's Daddy. That's my pa. Shut up, Myra. Shut up. I've never laid a hand on you, but I... Mother. Mother, dear. You're talking like a mom. Never talked to me like this before. The woman found with your husband was his first wife. Did you know that, Mrs. Connell? My husband's first wife? That's not true. When did you find out he wasn't divorced? Why, it's not true. When Mildred Gruber showed up? Daddy had such bad taste in women. Myra. Myra, I'll... You'll hit me? Go ahead. You... I'll... Myra, Myra, please. You found them together, your husband and Mildred. Killed them. Made it look like murder and suicide. Why? Listen to me. Then Joe Gruber showed up. A long-lost brother looking for his sister. Looking for Mildred. Found the name Mrs. Hugh Conlon in the phone book. Thought his sister was you. Please, please, listen to me. When you met Joe at the bar, and he saw that you weren't Mildred, he began to figure, and it started to build into money. That's what he wanted when he tried to break into your house. Myra, child... Try to understand what I wanted for you. Gruber got away from us. Hold up in a room. Called you for money. You came to his room. Stabbed him to death. You did all that, Catherine? For me? Just because Daddy was a bigamist? Just because all these years you haven't really been married to him? For you. For you, darling. For your name, darling. Wait. When you're married and have children of your own. Wait. Wait. Mother... All for you, darling. Don't you see? I, I couldn't let that woman destroy what I built for you, or that man, or your father. The years, the good name I wanted for you. I... Wait till Charles hears this. Myra! <laughs> Charles will die laughing. Wait till I tell him I'm just nobody. <laughs> He'll float the evening in champagne. He'll be here any minute. Wait till I tell him. I'll marry him, Mom. His last name is Tobin. Then I'll have a name, Mom. Myra Tobin. 
Midnight's a happy time on Broadway. It's a place strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley. And they're heaped there. The bright-eyed kid. The voice that whispers from a doorway. The poet. The dregs. It's crowd and it's laughter. And a Nickelodeon where you get pie in your face. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint gum. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story. And that you're enjoying Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this same time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia, and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. In tonight's cast, Barbara Whiting was heard as Myra and Irene Tedrow as Mrs. Conlon. Featured in the cast were Lou Krugman, Martha Wentworth, Norman Field, and Jerry Hausner. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment... Presents for your listening enjoyment. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat. The thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing, delicious. In July, the night slips down over Broadway like a black silk stocking. And you drift to it, because the other promises you made to yourself never happen. The part of your life that never counted is left behind. You stand on a street corner, beating down the scream in your throat. The shadows start at 7 o'clock and deepen into night. You hug it close, because it's your chance that something will happen to you outside of the movies. And the tap on the shoulder starts it, or the laughter that floats down to your end of the bar, or a smile, or the man who runs down the hall after you. Danny! Hey, Danny. What's the matter, Sergeant? Glad I nabbed you before you took off for the day. Phone call, Danny, from a hysterical woman. You know, I had a hard time Come piecing on. it all. Uh, 1647 East 56, Danny, fourth floor apartment. That's where her fiancé lives. The guy's threatening to blow his brains out. 
Hey, here, the names and such I jotted on this paper. Squad car, Gino. Waiting for you downstairs. Muggerman's with it. Yeah, that's it, Danny, 1647. Uh, who'd you say was doing all this threatening? A man by the name of Blaine. The first name is, let's see, David. <laughs> Try the buzzer, Muggerman. Yeah. He did it. Miss Carroll said he was going to do it, and he We're did. We're from the police. It happened up there on the fourth floor. Mr. Blaine, it happened just now, not more than... Who's that crying? That's her, Miss Carroll. See her? See her? Hugging the banister up on the third floor landing. And that's Mr. Fallon at the rail on the second Let's floor. Let's go, Muggerman. Dead. The gun's here, Danny, by his chair. It looks brand new. Looks like Mr. Blaine had his choice. Uh-huh. It's quite a gun collection, from Derringer's on up. Complete equipment for a young arsenal. Margolin. Yeah? Those people we passed on the landing, that boy on the second floor, Mr. Fallon, and Miss Carroll on the third, I'll want to talk to them. Yeah, Miss Carroll's still crying, Danny. You hear her? Poor woman. <laughs> And stand for a moment and consider the virulence of death. How it is not content with its own, must reach out to slash the livid scar into the heart of those crowding its edge. The woman crying softly. The other tenants whispering, moving restlessly in the lower corridors, and then hugging the wall because the attendants on violence must pass. The photographers, the interns, the technicians. And the moment is gone. It's routine now, official. The first entry in the file of night. <laughs> The next morning, gather it into a neat stack on your desk and sit down to it and be surprised at the opening door and the quick presence of the woman you had marked for later interrogation. The, the man who was with you last night, he said you wanted to talk to me. It could have waited, Miss Carroll, until you felt better and until you... It'll not be forgotten that easily, Mr. Clover, if that's what you mean. If you have something to ask, ask. Only don't prolong it. Don't make me wait and wonder. Sorrow is enough by itself, don't you think? Yes, yes it is. And you, try to understand us, Miss Carol. A man I loved, who loved me, is dead. By his own hand, by his own will. He could have lifted his burden onto me, whatever it was. But he didn't. And now he's dead. You want more than that? Maybe. Because this is my job. Because I can't rule out the possibility that David Blaine was murdered. Awful. How ugly of you to think a thing like that. That anyone could have wanted my David dead. What if it's ugly? Tell me about him. He loved me. He was going to marry me. He was polite and gentle. Sometimes he'd forget himself. Then he'd beg my forgiveness. Wept sometimes. Showered me with gifts, so I'd be quicker to forgive. This watch, he called it an engagement present, but it was really an atonement for... Look at it. See how he loved me? It's a beautiful watch, Miss Carroll. See? Listen to it. And it ticks, ticks, ticks away my life with David. Softly, gently. Listen to me, Miss Carroll. Why would David kill himself? You were in love, you were going to be married... Why? He had a secret. That's it. He had a secret. He didn't want to stain me with it. Isn't that it, Mr. Clover? Isn't that why a man kills himself for the girl he loves? Oh, I'm sorry, Danny. I thought... But it's important... It's all right, Dr. Sinsky. You can come in. Well, that'll be all for now, Miss Carroll. Thank you. All? You helped a great deal. Thank you. You have nothing more? Nothing. Not now. Then I'll go. If you should want to talk to me again, I promise I'll be... Goodbye. 
Uh, it's not easy, huh, Danny? To pry into grief, to scavenge. You got something, Doctor? Just tell me. Oh, forgive me, Danny. Sometimes my mouth gets the better of me. I studied it, Danny. I put it on your desk for you to study. Read it sideways, upside down, still comes out suicide. Then it's done. Finished, huh? Nothing to bother our brains about. Like you say, Danny, finished. Except when a man who dies as Blaine did in shock spasm, arms rigid at right angles to his body, fingers clenched, how is it the gun was not found in his hand but on the floor? It's just a small question, Danny, to gnaw at the brain of a medical man. Sometimes it happens so, but... Yeah. Go practice medicine, Doctor. Maybe I can bring you back an answer. Maybe where a man died, someone has an answer. I'm busy right now. Your name Richard Fallon? I'm from the police. I guess that gives you a right. Come on in. You want to sit? Over there. Move those papers off the couch. Just put them on the floor. You a writer, Fallon? You interested or curious? What do you write about? About your city? About how it's not like my part of the country? About your many-faceted city? About your stinking city? Your people? Your small people? Your hurry-up people? Your no-place-to-go people? The No Tears City, the Rat Hole City. That's what I write about. Any material up on the fourth floor? I figured that'd be your gambit. Uh uh, nothing. Your city caught up with a man and he shot himself before it drowned him. I'll think about the man and smile and wish him well. Know anything about him? His name was David Blaine. He walked arm in arm with a third floor woman, Miss Carroll. Last night I heard a shot. I ran out into the hall. Mrs. Galvin downstairs ran out into the hall. Miss Carroll upstairs ran out into the hall. We looked up the stairwell to the fourth floor from where the shot came. David Blaine was dead. I know that about him. What else? Uh Uh-uh. Nothing. Sit there if you want, but don't stare at the back of my neck when I write. Makes me self-conscious. My gratitude for permitting me my ten minutes at the water cooler, Danny. Feel better, Gino? Goes without saying. And now to the toils of the day. It comes to that part of the rundown in which I proffer you your daily piece of resistance. In two parts. To wit, <clears throat> gun found that side of deceased David Blaine is indeed gun with which deceased did do himself in. Now, Gino, that hasn't been... Patience, a... Danny. Part two will settle the question itching in your brain of suicide versus murder. Scratch it for me, Gino. Delighted. Part two of report from technical states. Impossible for any tenant to have shot said deceased, make an escape down the fire escape, arrived in the hallways in time to look up and yell, man dead on the fourth floor, in your presence. Add to this the double whammy I have held out on you. Give it to me, Tartaglio. Peaks you, and Danny. The legman assigned to such duty I've come up with that David Blaine did indeed lose upwards to 50 grand by sour bets in the stock market. This in the period of the last month. Fifty grand in thirty days. For this, guys kill themselves, Danny. For a lot less yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Gino, close the file on Blaine. There's nothing more than... Danny Clover speaking. They switched me to you. You the man on that Blaine thing? Yes. What about it? Who are you? Blanche Hemby, mister. 1834 East 59. Room 11. You said Blaine. What have you got? Huh? Uh... What have I got? I got he was murdered, mister. And go there, and walk the hallway mottled with shadows and scuffings, the short corridor that ends in the door with the tin numbers and the pull-down bed and the basin in the corner. Knock on door 11, and get no answer. And go in, because there was urgency in the voice that said, Come here. And the bed was pulled down, the rug was frayed, and the splotch of blood trailed off it onto the floor. The girl was behind the couch, huddled, her knees drawn to her chest, and only the fat summer fly pinging against the window made sound. That and the lonely room silences that intruded upon the dead girl. The murdered girl. Four.
for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the glittering midsummer's day, Broadway takes time out to shimmer. The chrome is polished high, the better to reflect the passage of women who lean for a moment against the summer's heat and then walk slowly on. The mouthpieces of the payphones glisten with the moist whispers of an empty summer afternoon. A money clip glints through the dark of an alley, and you know that someone has gotten odds on a piece of the day. There's the drone of the neon, and the tired wind nudging a headline in a shining trash bin. Cop finds murdered girl in tenement room, and the wet shirt pulled from your back. Like other summers, other days... Where I was in the corridor between my office and the show-up room, that had happened before, too. Only the names of the dead were different. Blanche Hemby. I got the rundown on her you wanted, Danny. What'd you get, Muggerman? Oh, I'll have to slice it off fast, Danny. I'm due at the show-up. A woman there, Mrs. Westfall, real eager to identify a prowler she dreamed last night. I'll walk you down. Uh, This girl, Blanche Hemby, frequent visitor. Hmm? Got her name on her guest book uh, maybe five times. For what? Oh, nothing sensational. Brawl over a hairdo with another dame in a bar. Phonograph screaming. Her screaming, disturbing the neighbors. Beat a guy's head open with a bottle because he called her a gimme gimme girl. Things like that. Any tie up with David Blaine? I noticed around the bars where she had the trouble. The tenement where she lived, the place she was working at two weeks ago. They fired her? Uh uh-uh. uh. No, she gave notice, Danny, two weeks ago. Said she was sick and tired working for nickel tips behind a hamburger counter. She had better, she told him, a lot better. Bit a hole in her time card, threw it on the griddle, walked out. Work anywhere else? See anyone else? Mm-mm. No, I checked that, too. Blanche slept away the days in her room. Three times a day, she got up to phone for beer, once a day for sandwiches. Uh, here I am. I'll check with you later, Danny. Yeah. I don't I know where I got it. Why don't you leave me alone? Muggerman. Stop making a show. That kid up there. What about him, Danny? Some punk problem. That's the boy who was the tenant on the second floor where Blaine was murdered. Get him, Muggerman. Bring him up to my office. Sure, Danny. Right away. Not anxious. Jerry hands off me, your scum, all of you. Take it easy, kid. What happened? The city trying to drown you the way you said it does to people? I hate it. I get drunk at night because I hate it. That way I see it for what it is. And you can't stand that when someone like me sees you for what you are. You hate me. And you kick me, you throw me in jail because I'm better. Even drunk, I'm better. He's right, Danny. He's a lot better than us. He goes around with a pocket full of watch. Like this. Because he's so much better. That's it. Where'd you get this watch, Richard? (laughs) I held out my hand and I begged, and a kindly person dropped it right into my begging hand. Where'd you get it? I told you. I walked the streets and it fell into my hand because I was crying and lonely. And sick for home. Miss Carroll, your neighbor has a watch like this. You steal it from her? You steal it, Richard? Lock him up, Mother. A watch exactly like the one Regina Carroll owned. Her engagement present from the man now dead, presumed to suicide, suspected, murdered. If it were Miss Carroll's watch, what was Richard Fallon doing with it? It was a simple question, and Richard couldn't answer it. So call Miss Carroll. Get no answer. So open the plush box that held the watch. Levante, jewelers for over a century, that's what the satin ribbon said, glued against the inside top. Stolen from Levante, jewelers for over a century? Go there. Ask Mr. Levante. Oh, no, not stolen. Purchased. By whom? A policeman you said you were? Let me see, please. Sure. Here. Yes. This watch was purchased. You've already said that. Apologies. I'm temporizing, you see. I'm trying to gather my forces together. Now, as to who purchased this watch? 
perhaps to a Miss Carroll, my old friend, Miss Regina Carroll. Of course, it's impossible to tell. What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Levant? You see, this is quite an unusual watch. We rarely sell more than one a year. Our own design with a foreign mechanism. However, we sold two in the last few months. Remarkable? Who did you sell them to? Even more remarkable. A few days ago, Miss Carroll purchased such a watch. A few months ago, a fiancé. Now dead, I've heard, a few months ago. This gentleman also purchased such a watch as an engagement gift for Miss Carroll. That makes two watches for Miss Carroll, both the same kind. Is there an explanation for it, Mr. Levante? Well, Miss Carroll said she lost her engagement watch. Thus, she purchased another one. She cautioned me not to mention it to her fiancé, or to anyone for that matter. But now, you, a policeman, Mr. Blaine, dead? Well, you don't think I'm going back on my word to an old friend, do you? Miss Carroll is your old friend? Her dad and I were close. I toddled, Regina. Poor woman. You mean about her fiancé? About all of them. What do you mean? There were four of them, you know. Two at college, one when she was a sophomore, one when she was a senior. Then about ten years ago, a young man, since quite successful in groceries, has a nice store for select customers on medicine. Chap named Mason, I think. Miss Carroll was engaged four times, huh? Well, she's 37, you know. She doesn't look it, does she? Still a beauty. A bygone day kind of beauty, if you know what I mean. Victorian? Would that be it? Oh, I often wondered why she never married any of her young men. Why they backed out on their marriage. I wonder why, too. <laughs> You need some help, sir? Uh, I'm looking for a Mr. Mason. All right, I'm Mason. I'm Danny Clover. Police. The first name's Pete, Danny. You got a couple of minutes? Any time for you, fellas. I need a couple of minutes to recuperate anyhow. Mrs. Smythe just had me on the floor. Oh? She comes in here with her French poodles, three on a leash. Maid and chauffeur trailing in back. Orders a dozen... Well, did you ever hear anybody say bagel with a broad A? She wants a dozen boggles. <laughs> I don't understand her. Finally, she tells me what she wants is receptacles for a delicacy known as locks. How did she say locks? Locks, the chauffeur said. What can I do for you, Danny? You were once engaged to a Regina Carroll, weren't you? It was an experience. I'm not sorry for it. Who broke the engagement? You've got to ask that because it's important for the police to know, right, Danny? I broke it. Why? Why? That's a question I often ask myself. Sometimes my wife asks me. And I'll tell you what I answer. Go ahead. Regina was a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. Close to the wedding, I discovered this is not the type of girl I wanted. Personally, the girl that married my dear old dad, my mom, nagged my father to an early grave. Mom and Regina, two peas from the same pod. Go on. I'll tell you about Regina. I figure she has a picture in her head of a husband in a smoking jacket with satin lapels and a curved pipe in a fireplace. I don't fit the requirements. Personally, I like polka better than cribbage. Uh-huh. What else? Well, Regina, how she dressed. Pretty, you understand. But she made her own fashions, which she never changed. Ribbons, dresses choked against the throat, and always a little too long. She slipped on the ice once, and I told her she had pretty legs. She slapped me. That's what about Regina Carroll, Danny. That enough? Plenty. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Gordon? Oh, uh, Danny Clover. <clears throat> I couldn't be more charmed if I tried. A quiet evening in technical, huh, Gordon? It was. Now the place screeches at me. Did you do that, Danny, just by walking in here? You mix yourself bitter pills in those test tubes? I don't have to. I have company. <laughs> no offense. The gun that killed David Blaine. Get it out and go over it again. Well, I've already examined it thoroughly. My report was placed on your desk. Get it out. Well, I can recall it to you if memory fails you. Thirty-two caliber Smith & Wesson fired once. Get it. Examine it. Oh. All right, Danny. 
See? I'm examining. It's still as it was when Blaine held it close to it. The barrel. Put it on a slide. Hold it up to the light, whatever you have to do. If you ask, Danny, I'll do better. Perhaps this will amuse you. The spectral micrograph enlarges 45 times. Uh, and there. Have a look, Danny? You look. All right, Danny. All right. Hmm. Wow. Wow. What? These infinitesimal scratch marks on the barrel. Fascinating. And a new quirk. It didn't register on me before. I checked the rifling in the barrel against the slug, which we call standard operating procedure. I didn't think of looking at the outside of the barrel. Why should I with a suicide? I guess I should have. Huh? And what would you have found out, Gordon? That the man killed himself with a silencer on his weapon. Now, <laughs> that's what I call taking quiet pleas a shade too far, huh, Danny? <laughs> Oh, Mr. Clover, I knew you'd come back. Knew there'd be more things you'd want to know about David. Did you come in? Thanks. You may sit down in that chair. No, thanks. What makes you think I wanted to find out any more about David? I assumed it. Suicide. Files to complete. I realize it's my duty to be cooperative. Miss Carroll... I can tell you so much about him. He was generous. He was a gentleman. Rare thing to find out. He was murdered. You suggested that before, Mr. Clover. I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now. Murdered. He was dead minutes before we got to him. That's stupid. Listen to me, Miss Carroll. Stupid, because I heard the shot. We all heard it. We all ran out into the hall. Do you have a gun, Miss Carroll? Yes, I have a gun. David gave it to me. Woman alone. Did he show you how to fire it? Of course he did. He loved guns. I interested myself in them. Shall I get the gun? It isn't necessary for now. You don't have to get the silencer, either. What are you talking about? The gun you shot David with, his own gun, was equipped with a silencer. Mr. Clover, I don't understand you at all. I'm a lonely woman. And I admit it, I, I'm a helpless one. How could I have killed anyone? Someone I loved. Hmm. Nice view from this window, Miss Carroll. You could stand here, see Detective Mugovan and me coming, fire a blank cartridge from your gun, run out into the hall. Look up, and everyone thinks the shot came from the floor above, from David Blaine's apartment. Mr. Clover. Do you admit it, Miss Carroll? No. No. I want to show you something. Here. Look at it, Miss Carroll. A watch, just like the one you're wearing. I didn't kill him. David Blaine broke his engagement to you, didn't he? I didn't kill him. The kind of woman you are, proper and proud. You gave him back the watch. But what to tell your friends? Tell them that someone else walked out on you the way three other men did? A proud woman like you? So you bought another watch, just like it. The one you're wearing. Please, please. Because I have the one you gave back to David. The watch you had that boy, that writer, Richard Fallon, steal from David's apartment. So the police wouldn't find it there and ask questions. You told him to get rid of the watch. He got drunk instead, got picked up. Look, look. David jilted me. But I didn't kill him. You did. You couldn't live with the thought of another man's walking out on you, like the other three. That's why you bought the watch, so your friends would think you were still engaged. Mr. Clover. So your friends would think David died because of the money he lost. And Blanche Hemby, the reason why David walked she out on you. Filth. The woman David loved. Filth! Beat her to death. Beat her, beat her! Let's go, Mr. Like David, it was filth! Instead of me, a woman like that. Miss Carroll. It's not true what you said. Those men didn't turn me down. I turned them down. College boys. A grocer. Not good enough. It isn't true. It isn't true. They did walk out. Why? Why? Take me away. Put me someplace. I don't want to look at anyone. I can't look at anyone.
Broadway's deserted now. Maybe it's the heat. Maybe it's just that people get tired and want to go home because Broadway threw sand in their eyes. Maybe you found what you were looking for and couldn't stare it in the face because it's a street that'll give you anything you want, any way you want it. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment any time, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for chewing any time, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story and that you're enjoying Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Prussian as Mugovan. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Bob broadcasting from Topeka, Kansas, Hope, and thanking the sponsor of your regularly scheduled program for this two-minute interruption. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last ten years, I've visited many dramatic spots in this world, but just a few minutes ago, I returned from a tour of what was once North Topeka, Kansas. I've just seen block after block of total destruction. Streets caved in, buildings undermined and flattened. Entire new housing developments a shambles, with the houses jammed together like battered boxes. As we toured this sickening area, I thought of the heroics that must have accompanied this disaster as it happened. The emergency operations of the Red Cross, Salvation Army, Air Force, Coast Guard... Veterans organizations and the thousands of civilian volunteers, all striving to hold this hungry call river within its banks. Then the complete frustration when it crashed into the streets. But the excitement of that time has passed. Today, it's a dismal task of dirty drudgery. Imagine the heartbreak of returning to what was once your home and finding three feet of dried mud on the front porch. After scraping and digging for hours, you finally get the door open only to find dried, drifted mud bank throughout the house with everything in it destroyed beyond repair. Countless of the heartbreaking stories of human despair this great flood of 1951 has written. But you and I, neighbors of these Call Valley folks of Kansas, can help. And I mean help with dimes and dollars. The Red Cross and other agencies have done a magnificent job taking emergency care of 10 to 15,000 refugees, and they're still doing great work in helping the needy with rehabilitation. But that's a far cry from the tremendous job that lies ahead. In Topeka alone, the loss is $100 million. That amounts to $1,000 for each and every person in this city. I'm appealing to that great heart that has made America. It's never failed before. Won't you send your contribution, large or small, to Flood, Topeka, Kansas? That's all the address you need. Flood, Topeka, Kansas. And join me, Bob Hope, in bringing new hope to thousands of unfortunate American folks. Thank you. The William Wrigley Company has donated the time for this message from Bob Hope. Now, after a short pause, we switch to Hollywood for your regular program, Broadway is My Beat. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the exciting drama of mystery and murder and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment any time, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint Gum. Wrigley Spearmint. Refreshing, delicious. When the summer becomes August, Broadway pauses for a while, considers. What happened to the springtime dreams to be fulfilled in the middle of July at the very latest? And what of the blonde on last month's snapshots, the one with sunny legs, the one you tried with poetry and she touched your cheek, the fawn of Camp Never Care, jewel of the Catskills? She's back in the Bronx shoe store, kid, and the last time you walked by, she didn't look so good. And walk the streets furious with people and heat, and feel your throat tighten when it suddenly comes to you. Another summer's rushing away. Maybe next year, kid. Maybe. And uptown, east of Broadway, where I was, in the outdoor swimming pool, catering also to the seekers after something or other, the crowd was divided into swimmers, non-swimmers, sand sitters, ukulele players, and miscellaneous. And the man in the swimming trunks, lying on the concrete walk, the man who had drowned... And the police emergency crew working over him with a respirator. And the man from headquarters who had gotten there before me. They've been working on him for quite a while, Danny. Why'd you call me to come down, Muggerman? I asked the same question of Patrolman Kenny. It's like this, Danny. Kenny was flagged off his beat when this man was dragged out of the pool. Took off the man's locker check, went to the locker. You know, for identification. The locker was empty. Forced? Uh-uh. Now, those locks answered with dime store skeleton key. Robbery gets a dozen calls a day from these pools. So you figure that man's drowning and his locker's being robbed had something in Maybe a coincidence, Danny. Maybe something else. I don't know. I wanted you to be here in case. Yeah, let's take a look. One of you men call the morgue. A lifeguard who pulled him out is that one, Danny. You want to talk to him? Uh-huh. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Uh, Russ Gavey. What happened here? Well, I was on my stand. Hear me, started to yell. I went in after him. How'd you get those scratches on your shoulder? He fought me. Had to take him under to break his hold. And when he stopped struggling, I got him out. By that time, he needed artificial respiration. I gave it to him. Until your man came. All right. Did Detective Muggerman here tell you this man's clothes are gone, that it's going to be pretty difficult to identify him now? Yeah, he told me. Any ideas about it? Nope. Okay, Russ. <laughs> Back to the office at headquarters and sit with it. A man had been drowned in a public pool. From a policeman's point of view, worth only a quarter-page form in triplicate. However, the fact of his lockers being robbed may be something else again. Probably not. More forms. Then a couple of hours later, when the office gathers up its private shadows, a door opens. A man walks in. Uh, Danny, you busy? Come in, Dr. Sinsky. Sit down. Thank you. I just came from the autopsy room, Danny. And? Uh, has that man brought in from the swimming pool the drowned one? Has he been identified, then? Not yet. What's in your mind? He was murdered. Murdered? How? Whoever administered artificial respiration to that man killed him as surely as if he had driven a knife into his heart. Dr. Sinsky... Gently, did... Danny, gently. I'll explain. Inside of the chest, Danny, is a delicate system of balances. Balances which cannot be upset. Else a man's heart will be affected in his lungs. What's that got to do with murder? Simply that the autopsy I just performed on the drowned man revealed small internal hemorrhages. Bruises of the muscles and bones of the chest from too active a manipulation. You mean that lifeguard didn't do I mean he did a very bad job of artificial respiration. And that's why you call it murder. Not premeditated, of course, Doctor. This is not the question in your mind. You wanted to ask if it was premeditated. Didn't you, Danny? And let the question take over the room. Add the weight of its violence to the oppressive night heat. The stifling remembrance of other such questions posed in the same room, quietly, fearfully. Because a policeman, too, reacts to the touch of death. It fills the room, and against its pressure, you lift the phone, make the call to the Department of Public Works, have them check personnel files, come up with an address for Russ Gavey, lifeguard. Go there, to the hall bedroom furnished in the style of brownstone, East Twenties. 
find it empty of Russ Gavey. Be told on the way out by the woman spread wide on the stoop you should have asked before. Russ was across the street in the park, on that bench, fighting for his share of the night air. Walk up to Russ. Let him chew the last fiber of a matchstick. Yeah, I'm taking my well-earned rest. You want to help, Mr. Clover? Sure. Mind if I sit down, Russ? Yes, sit down. You were almost a hero today, Russ. You're kidding. That's how I make my daily summer bread, 50 bucks a week. Ogle a girl, save a life. How long have you been a lifeguard, Russ? Oh, six, maybe seven summers. Time out for a frolic on Anzio Beach. Then you've uh, had a lot of experience saving people from drowning. Am I a lot of cheer? The medical examiner down at headquarters says that man you try to save... Yeah, I remember. Our medical examiner says he was murdered. Oh? How come? Our man says it was murdered because artificial respiration wasn't applied properly. Well, your man is a smart man. But a a four-bit-a-week lifeguard does the best he can. He studies in classes, he follows a first aid manual. (laughs) You call him a murderer because he didn't make out with one poor slob. You tell me, Russ. You murdered the man? Now, considering the percentage of lives that are saved and not saved by such as we, that's a question you may never be able to answer. How come? I'll keep trying, Russ. You won't mind, huh? Danny, why don't you never turn on a light? You sit like this in the dark by yourself. It's... I got one of the Tartaglia kids to home does the same thing. You both make me feel the same way. And you've got your problems, haven't you, Gina? I could do without them. You in the mood, Danny? Sure, for whatever. What have you got? Nothing. No progress on identification of the drowned man. No progress on a connection between him and that lifeguard, Russ Gaby. Reports on Gaby State, he is looked up to at the pool by girls and ladies-sized swimmers. Occasionally, he buys for one or the other a beer at the concession stand. Occasionally, he escorts one or the other type to her home, deposits it, goes to the newsstand, buys super-type magazines, goes to his room. Healthy, normal muscle boy. Maybe a murderer, Gino. Oh, pardon me, Danny, but I must take odds. Sergeant Artaglia speaking. Yes? Yeah, I got it. Hanson's Pawn Shop, East 34th. I told you I got it. <sighs> they bother us with such... Such what, you know? A man with a pawn shop got the new just in the midst of a nice conversation because somebody who works in a pool hocked a suit of clothes. <laughs> valuables. Look to this Mr. Hanson like stolen goods. On East 34th? Yeah. Then why bother yourself with it, Danny? Because maybe it'll give me the name of a murdered man. might ask me why I called the police, Mr. Clover, after so many months of abstemiously staying away from you fellas. All right, Mr. Hanson, why? Because there was something fishy about it this time. Hmm? Uh, This suit, this watch, ring, money clip was brought me by a boy who's an attendant at a public pool. Pool on Upper Broadway? Inevitably, that pool where that unidentified man was drowned, his things stolen, you read about it, of course. Who brought these to you? A boy. Know him well. I've had dealings with him intermittently. Who's the boy? Bobby Kent. He's got a room in one of those crates on East 37th, uh, uh, 1654, East 37th. Just ask for Bobby. We all know him. And you think these things belong to the drowned man? The man was robbed where Bobby works, died where Bobby works. Bobby pawns things that obviously don't belong to him. What is there left for a decent man to think, Mr. Clover? <laughs> Then the three walk to the languid summer night, the city-bound and the dream-bound people on the sandstone steps who find their delights in a pop bottle, or by taking possession of a star in the sky, or by cooling themselves with a fan, courtesy of Swanson's chicken fricassee. Pass them and mind the kiddies at their nighttime play, the patter of little feet up an alley, and arrive at the address on 37th Street. And over one of the bells, see a name, Bobby Kent, apartment three. The sound you hear is the far-off thunder made of heat and air currents and stratosphere. And the lightning through the window at the end of the corridor lights up the number three on a door. Briefly. Then again. (laughs) 
Bobby. Bobby Kent. This is the police, Bobby. Open up. I'm coming in, Bobby. Bobby was in. His shirt was ripped, his face bloody, hands tied behind his back, belt around his neck, and the belt was strung over a pipe near the ceiling. When I brought over a chair to stand on, there was lightning again, and the whole room was stark white for an instant. It took a while to get Bobby down, but it didn't matter. Bobby had been dead when I got there. Bobby had been murdered. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway leans against a doorway, flips a coin, and makes odds on the 31 days of August. This month, kid, it'll come in. The filly in the third, the dreamboat. The oil on that little piece of property you leased in the Texas Badlands. Gotta come in. Otherwise, what have you been building, kid? Gotta come in. So you can indulge the whim of the hour. Enjoy it. Own it. All that neon. Yours to turn on or off. That music of the dance calling to you from basement dance lands. Yours to play soft or loud. Or cut off like that. Dance in dark and in stillness if you want. The traffic signals pushing back the people. Yours to make say stop, go... You're a king man with headlines at your feet. Boy murdered, hung by belt in tenement room. Unknown man drowned in public pool. All yours, kid. Clean shuffle, a minute of luck, and it's all yours. And the next morning at headquarters, consider your share of it. Yours and Detective Muggivans. You still stick with that, Danny, that the man in the pool was murdered? Yeah. You don't like it? Oh, it's not that, Danny. It's only so many people drown, so many can't be saved. You going to go back and call everyone that wasn't the murder victim? Russ gave you as a trained lifeguard. He told me the man fought him, had to be pushed under. Happens that way sometimes, Danny. Could have been the other way around. Could have been Russ wanted the man dead. It could have been he fought the man, drowned him, finished him with his own brand of artificial respiration. Could have been. But where's the string that knots it, Danny? What connection that is That kid there? that was hung, Bobby Kent, the attendant at the pool. That could be a connection. Because he stole a man's clothes out of a crummy locker? We're not even sure they belong to the drowned man. What do we know about them, Muggerman? Well, from the cleaner's marks, they belong to a man named Howard Crawford. Married. I checked his wife. Should be at the morgue to identify in a half hour. Would have come sooner, wanted to go out and buy a dress first. I let her. I'll go down and meet her. You get whatever you can on Bobby Kent. Friends, people he stole from, whoever wanted him I'm dead. working on it. But put a tail on Gavey. Every breath he breathes, I want to report. Got it. Anything else, Danny? Yeah. Why does a woman need a new dress to look at a dead man? Well, I don't know. Ask her when you see her. Are you ready, Mrs. Crawford? Waiting for you. All right. Just look at this man and tell me if he's... Okay, your... okay. Put him back. He's mine. Can we get out of this place now? Of course. I'm through this door. You want to sit down on this bench for a minute? Or else, huh? Sure, I'll sit. What do you think of my husband, Mr. Clover? Can you imagine it? Howard getting himself a piece of marble in a police morgue. When did you see him last? I got out of a warm bed yesterday morning on account of the phone ringing. It was for Howard. He pinched my cheek, said, Goodbye, honey, I'm going out of town. This happen often, his going out of town? 
in his line, salesman. And you didn't see him after that? Look, boyfriend, I was in the middle of a beauty exercise, bendovers for the figure. I was grabbing my ankle, so I looked back. There he was, going out of the house. Doesn't it seem strange to you that he didn't go out of town, that he was it's found? strange to me he's dead. But I'm going to get used to it. Who do you know had a reason for murdering him? Murder? thought you said he drowned. Do you like to swim, Mrs. Croft? You see this sunburn? You think I got it standing under a hot iron? Look at it, see? How you like it? Did you get it at that swimming pool uptown? Coney. I know a part of Coney where they carry a pretty good crowd. That's where this burn came from. There's a lifeguard at that pool. I go to Coney where they carry a million on a weekend. I don't confine me to public pools uptown. Did you have anything to do with your husband's death, Mrs. Crawford? Now, I'm a girl who's going to tell you the truth, boyfriend. Every time I've thought of it, I've wished Howard dead every hour on the hour. I'd have wished him dead on the half hour, too, but that's when the race results come over the radio. Howard, things have come true. I've wished for him. That's all, Mrs. Crawford. You can get out of here now. You watch her reapply the lipstick and readjust her clothes. And walk away from her dead to a summer rhythm that no longer held any part of him. A woman starting the new day fresh. The memory she had submitted to, now happily dead on a marble slab. And at the end of the corridor, the street sunlight touching her face for an instant, darting away, leaving only pallor and the smear of scarlet on her lips. Back in the office, order a shadow for Mrs. Crawford. Then a telephone report from Muggerman. He had found a girl who was the girlfriend of Bobby Kent, a box office girl at an all-day, all-night movie on East 125th. Lucille Lang, on duty for the rest of the day and night. How many? Police, Miss Lang. Take back your badge. It don't buy you nothing. You were a friend of Bobby Kent's. Look, you, you want to lose me my job? All we want, Miss Lang. All is... you want is to mark me lousy with the management. A sweaty cop snooping around where I live. I know my girlfriend called me. Told me he had his nose in my affairs, asked questions. She had to tell him I was cozy with Bobby. All we want is something that'll give us Bobby's killer. Search me up and down, you won't find Bobby's killer. Then maybe someone who wanted him dead. All the kid ever did was steal a buck here and there. So he could make an impression on me. On my girlfriend. Boy has to die for that. He was a thief. Ain't everybody kiddo one way or another. To sweep out the locker room in a public pool. To empty the foot bath, scrub them out. You think that's the end of the rainbow for a kid? Did you know about the clothes he stole from the pool? The watch, the ring, the money clip? Sure, I know. He told me. I even know about the 500 bucks that was in the suit. 500? We were going to take it and go off to faraway places. Do you know something, kiddo? What? Bobby's dead from hanging, and I'm cooped up in a cage. So I ain't going to make it, am I? Danny? Well, come on in, Margaret. What do you want? An opinion. About what? About how soon we should pick up Russ Gavey for the murder of Crawford and that pool attendant? If we pick him up, how long do you think we can hold him? A killer, Danny, he's... How are you going to prove premeditated murder by artificial respiration? Now, maybe we shouldn't start from there, Danny. Maybe we should start from the attendant. Now, he killed Bobby Kent because Bobby stole the clothes. Because Bobby would learn that the clothes belonged to Howard Crawford. Bobby was a sneak thief. From there to blackmail him, one easy lesson. So we get back to Howard Crawford. You know what we need, Mugovan. Yeah, motive. We gotta find our wife. Danny! We got something, Gino? Officer Ratchie just called from a gas station on Queens Highway. Mrs. Crawford just rest registered at the Ritz Lodge Motel, about ten miles out of the city. Thanks, Gino. Mugovan. Yeah, Danny. That shadow you got on Russ gave you, get him off. I don't want him followed. All right. Where are you going? To find out why a widow wanders far from home. <laughs> Wait till you see. 
Bought some new clothes. You'll like them. Oh. You'll like them too, lover. You like them? Is that your going away dress, Mrs. Crawford? It could be for that, too. You've got a home in Manhattan, Mrs. Crawford. What are you doing here? Where is your home, boyfriend, and what are you doing here? I wanted to talk to you. Well, me and my sunburn made an impression, huh? So you got a flunky to follow me. You could have done it yourself. No uproar would have happened. Well, here we are. You still haven't answered my question. What are you doing here? Girl likes to get away sometimes. You'd be surprised how many phone calls I've gotten since Howard drank all that water. Here's a dime. Throw it in the radio. No? Then I'll throw it a dime. Yep. Phone calls all day long. No. It's your turn. Just to talk. To kill some time. Ah, that Kenton. Yeah, oh, what'd you say, lover? Nothing. I didn't say anything. Look, be a doll. Will you go away? Come back another day. I'll be here. Let's pick a Tuesday. Make it definite, huh? Why don't you go right now? Out the back way, through a window? Just get up. Hi, Russ. Got a little trouble. Come in, Russ. Close the door. I'll bet the lady told you to get out of here, Mr. Clover. Uh huh. You two know each other pretty well, don't you? Yeah, a swimming pool romance. I saw him in those California feet flippers and it twisted my heart. You two planning on going away together? I only ask because the back of Russ's car is loaded with suitcases. We're going to get married in Maryland. Is there a law? Yes, there is. There's a whole section in the penal code about murder. Oh, back to that, huh? I could have picked you up before, Russ, but I needed a motive. I had to find out why you murdered Howard Crawford. There she is. How did I kill him? By drowning him. You made sure the resuscitator squad wouldn't revive him. You crushed out whatever life there was in him. Listen to him, Edith. Yeah, listen. You killed Bobby Kent. He was a petty thief. He took the clothes you'd stolen from Crawford. Sooner or later, he'd put two and two together. Probably would have blackmailed you. You couldn't afford to let that happen. You ready, Edith? I'm ready. Only one thing, Russ. What? I'm a happy girl, Russ. I like to live happy. From just now on, you're going to be a burden. As long as lover here's got you, I don't want you. Both of you. You're an accessory, Mrs. Crawford. Well, that changes things right away. Russ. Yeah. Don't be a fool. Okay, your way, Russ. You'll never be the same. Ready to go back to town, Mrs. Crawford? It's the time on Broadway when the crowd gives up, goes home. Then it's the street of the dim moonlight and the dark whispers. The wind of the night. The wind that scatters everything. Yesterday's headlines. Yesterday's dreams. Yesterday's people. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum.
The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at the same time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Prussian as Mugovan. In tonight's cast, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Edith Crawford, High Averback as Russ Gaby, Stan Waxman as Mr. Hanson, and Michael Ann Barrett as Lucille Lang. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The House by the Sea. This is the way it started. I walked in the office about 11 o'clock that morning. It was a nice warm day and I didn't have much on my mind. That's the trouble with nice days. You take a couple of easy breaths, open somebody's door, and it's just like peeling a wrapper off an atomic bomb. The lion was in his den, sitting behind his desk. He couldn't tell where he left off and the desk began. He was talking to a girl with a flock of black hair. She was the kind you see driving a Cadillac convertible down Sunset Boulevard on hot Sunday afternoons. No wonder the lion's cigar was out. It was wet on both ends. Well, well, come in, Regan, come in. I was just about to call you, but now that you're here, it makes things simpler. Miss Carmen, this is Mr. Regan. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Mr. Lyon tells me you're just the man I want. You said the same thing to a mortician last week. He is the man I want, Mr. Lyon. Well, well, that's fine, Miss Carbon. I knew you'd be pleased. I'm very proud of Jeffrey. As long as I'm in the cast, how about a look at the script, huh? Miss Carmen is associated with the famous psychic consultant, Prince Carew. I help the prince look into people's minds. Well, that ought to be real fun if all your customers are under six. (laughs) You don't believe in thought transference, Mr. Regan. Do you? I said I help the prince. Prince Carew sent Miss Carmen to retain an operator, Jeffrey. It's a very delicate matter, and I'm placing the entire case in your hands. Why didn't he come himself? Do you disapprove of me? I just want to know what's what. Prince Carew never appears in public. He prefers to spend his time in meditation and thought. Yeah. I handle all of his outside contacts. So, Jeffrey, you just drive on out to Prince Carew's home in Ocean Town with Miss Carmen and speak to the prince. What kind of a retainer did he send? Uh, How much did you get? Now, see here, Regan, we don't discuss finances in front of clients. Oh, stop it, will you? This is another blind spot. You don't know what it's all about. All you know is she waltzed in here with a check, and you'd sell your grandmother to a glue factory for two bucks. How do I know I won't wind up being a patsy again? Is there any way I can reassure you? Buy me a battleship. Jeffrey, have I ever involved you in anything that I wouldn't undertake myself? Have I ever knowingly imperiled your life? Yeah. Jeffrey. Come on, lady. What's it all about? You work for the guy. Well, I really don't know. He was excited this morning, called me in, gave me this address, and told me to make arrangements. He must have told you something. He never tells me anything. As you say, I... I just work for him. Well? All right, I'm hired. Good, good. Now call me, Jeffrey. Call me if you run into any trouble. Well, I asked her how about lunch... She said no. I asked her about dinner. She said something that meant no, so I gave up. You know, it's like that sometimes. The flag's up, the meter's ticking, and you're not getting anywhere. But from a couple of things she told me, I got the idea she was doing more than just helping the prince read mine. Well, his place turned out to be a good hour from downtown Los Angeles, up 101. It was a couple of stories of glass and concrete leaning out over the ocean. It was high and dry and quiet up there. 
And you got a feeling you should be hearing things and feeling things when you looked down and saw that water banging around the bottom of the cliff. She unlocked the door, and a guy in a white turban and some pants that looked like oversized diapers and a pair of tennis shoes was standing there. He had a big curved knife hanging around his waist, and he put his hand on it when he saw me. Right this way, Mr. Regan. Who's he, the butcher? Oh, that's Telly. He works for the prince. Manservant. He's from India. Yeah, I'll bet the Indians were glad to get rid of him. <laughs> Telly's harmless, tongueless, and he doesn't hear. I like you, Mr. Regan. Come in, come in. Ah, uh, Thelma, my dear. You've returned with spoils. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Mr. Regan, this is Prince. Carew. Regan, ah, uh, the lion's eye. I've heard of you, Mr. Regan. I'm honored. Sit down. That'll be all, Velma. Charming girl. Hmm? She handle all your outside contacts? Most efficiently. Except, of course, for matters that I must handle personally. What kind of matters? I'm in trouble, Mr. Regan, and I beg your assistance. That's well, all paid for. Correct. But there's a personal bonus in this for you. Why? Because, sir, uh, I want you to save my life. You look healthy to me. I am healthy, let me assure you. But my life has been threatened. Well, that would come under police business, wouldn't it? Normally. Uh, didn't Miss Carmen explain that this was a delicate matter? Yeah, she did. Why didn't she call the police? <laughs> I'm hardly in a position to ask the police for assistance, Mr. Regan. It is a delicate matter. Outside, it says you're a mind reader, all right? What am I thinking now? That I'm a charlatan, a faker, and that I'm trying to hide something from you. That gets you the cigar. <laughs> it's been a very lucrative arrangement for the most part and very satisfactory. Except, of course, for the annoyance of having my life threatened. Who's the guy? It would be of no consequence if it were a man. It's a lady, Mr. Regan. A very beautiful and lovely creature. And she'd like nothing better than to see my carcass go out with the tide. Why does she want to kill you? A matter of confidence. Uh, suffice it to say that she is thoroughly capable of doing just that. How do you know? One, she is erratic, ill-tempered, ruthless. Two, she called me this morning and told me what she intended to do. She giving you a chance to reach for your gun? To reach for you, Mr. Egan. What do you want me to do? I feel the entire matter could be settled amicably if you were to call on her. Inform her that you are my personal bodyguard and that you are here to protect my life. You think she'd go for that? I'm positive. How long have you been blackmailing her? What? Well, your racket might last six months or a year, but not long enough to pay for a place like this. The answer is blackmailing her. Okay, okay, okay. I should have told you. How do you do it? I can slip him into a trance. They spell a family secret. Or do I push a buck that way? That's nice. If you want the mines red, I read them. Twenty-five bucks a parade. And shake down. The guy's got to eat. You put the squeeze on her. She's an actress. She was in on a deal at the studios. She wouldn't shake? At first, I just told her I had to have a larger fee. Then they come out with it, cold turkey. Well, she said she'd blow your head off. Yeah, she's the kind. I went wrong on this one. I'm in a spot. Who is she? Grace Nichols, movie actress. Ever heard of her? Redhead. Makes you want to go home and kick your wife downstairs if you got one. That good? Better. But she means this business about bumping me. And I won't look good dead. All right, where she live? Over in the Palisades. Here's her address. Uh, you going over there now? Yeah. Be careful. She isn't gunning for me. That isn't what I mean. There's a skinny boy there. He's nasty. No callers. Name of Tim Rogers. I remember that. I hope you can talk her out of it. I've been sweating. I don't want to shake her down. I just want to get a little sleep at night. I left him sitting there, scratching his bald head under his turban. He looked about as happy as a guy who just ate a Vaseline sandwich. Well... Grace's place was too big for a marble game and too small for football. I think I remember reading something about how she got it from her third husband. There was a big wire fence all around it and a sign every 15 or 20 feet telling you not to trespass. So I parked my car outside the driveway and walked up to the front door. A guy in a chauffeur's uniform was standing there. He looked like a razor blade with arms. He gave me the fish eye and blew smoke in my face and kind of nudged me with his shoulder. Move on, Pilgrim. No handouts here. I came to see Grace Nichols. Yeah. I got business with her. Yeah. So tell her I'm here. Blow. You always like this, or did you miss lunch today? I don't know who you are, Pilgrim, but I don't like you. Beat it. I know you. There's something about a guy in a lineup. 
Yeah? He memorizes real easy. Copper. Investigator. Private or city, I don't care. You all smell the same. This isn't hunting season. You always carry a thirty-eight. Does it show? Maybe you got a broken rib. A real funny guy. I met all kinds of funny guys. Drift. I said I wanted to see her. And I said she wasn't in. All right, I'll tell you once more. I got business with her. So do a couple of hundred other guys. Watchdog? Ah, you're getting smart. You weren't. What kind of a crack is that? I want to see her, I'm going to see her. Trick I learned a long time ago. Shoot a guy in the knee and he'll never walk straight again. You ever done it? Oh, yeah. That's how I learned. Ow. That's when I learned, baby. Well, I might have to get a new chauffeur. You looking for a job? I already got one, lady. Timmy's going to be awfully upset when he finds out what happened to him. When someone works for me, they have to be perfect. Want his job? They wouldn't let me in. I'll let you in. You, uh, do that kind of thing often? When I have to. I suppose you have a name. It's Regan. I'm a private investigator. All right, Mr. Regan, you've ruined a perfectly good chauffeur and bodyguard, and you're in my house. What have we got to talk about? A guy named Kru. The prince? Must we talk about him? He thinks you're dangerous stuff. So do a lot of people. Tell me, Mr. Regan, what do you think? About what? Me. Right now or when I'm a couple of feet away? Right now. Look, remember, I just got here. I know. You must have a first name. What is it? Jeff. Oh, Jeff, we'll get along. It's in the card. Pretty fast deal. I like it this way. Fast. Might be a bum deck. Never mind. Deal. That's the bell. How much time between rounds? Uh, well, you know me better. Hello? Yes? Yes, right here. You know a man named Lion, Jeff? Uh-huh. He seems to be roaring. Give it to me. Yeah. Regan, is that you? Well, now, how do you figure it? Now, don't be smart. Who's the name who answered the phone? Our client's friend. Sounds like she's a friend of yours now, or maybe you have been doing some road work. Did you have something to say, or is this the day you turn scoutmaster? I'm busy. Well, you can stop being busy, lover. It's all off. Don't tell me you're passing up a fee. I'm passing up nothing. Prince Carroll called me ten minutes ago and told me to forget the whole thing, and that's what I'm telling you. How'd you know I was here? The prince told me, so it's all over. Finished. Forget it. I've already started something. I don't care what you've started. I just remember, you finish it on your own time and expense sheet. <laughs> You look worried, Jeff. Anything I can do? I'm called off. You mean you're out of a job? I got one. Remember, you put my bodyguard out of commission. You owe me something. Well, Tim, boy, he'll come around. I don't want Tim anymore. I want you. Mm. <laughs> I'll get you a drink. We can talk about it. Carew told me that Tim was a pretty good boy. You can fill his shoes. Come here and get your drink. Tell me about nine o'clock tonight. It'll get dark. I got a new dress. I think you'll like it. I probably would. The place above Malibu, we could have dinner, listen to some music. I want to be with you, Jeff. That deal's fast again. I don't care. I don't care. I just decided something, Jeff. I'm going to like being with you. I'm going to like it a lot. <laughs> Well, she didn't want me to go, but I was thinking about the prince and the way everything looked. I told her I'd see her that night. I was just climbing into my car when Tim Rogers, her ex-number one boy, stepped out from the gate. I waited for him to walk over. You're pretty good with your women, Regan. You look lonely, Timmy. Somebody stole your popsicle? Bum joke, Regan. I've been waiting to talk to you. You were so quiet in the house, I didn't want to make any noise. Any better here? You came out champ this afternoon. But you won't even make the prelims next time. You got something to say? Stay away from her. You're shaking. You need a drink. Stay away from her, Regan. I've been with her too long. Known her too long to take the bounce from a two-bit gum heel. Mm, goodbye. I'm not finished, Cat. That's your version. Now get your foot off that running board, punk, or I'll take it with me. I left him standing in the middle of the driveway. If I'd have waited another minute, he'd have been crying. I stopped off and had some barbecued ribs at a drive-in out on Sunset. It was just getting dark when I got to my place. I had company. It was Velma Carmen, Prince Carew's right-hand man. 
She was sitting on the edge of my sofa. Her back was as stiff as a filing cabinet, and there was a little ring of white around her lips. She looked like she'd just been measured for a coffin. There was a twenty-five automatic sitting in her lap. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Wick. I asked the janitor to let me in. Yeah? He was very nice about it. I told him I was associated with one of your clients. Yes, I told him I was associated with one of your clients. Did you know that Prince Carol was my husband? Since when? Oh, a long time now, a long time. Not many people know that. Is that what you came here to tell me? No. I... I came to tell you that you don't have to worry anymore. That none of us have to worry anymore. You mean you're calling me off the case? That's it. That's exactly it. I'm calling you off the case. Well, well I've already been called off. My office phoned me when I was over at her house. Where's Nichols? Yeah. And it was about her? Yeah. Huh. Well, then, we don't have to worry anymore, do we? No. She's very pretty, isn't she? I've seen her many times. I think she's quite pretty. I I could hardly blame the prince. I could hardly blame him at all. What are you getting at? Of course, all the others were pretty, too. Where'd you get that gun? This. I bought it for thirty dollars. Let me see it, huh? Oh, yes. I brought it here so I could show it to you. I, 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 I paid thirty dollars for it. I paid thirty dollars. I'd imagine the air would be cleaner in there, don't you? What are you talking about? I mean, it's really very humane, they tell me. It's just like sitting down and never waking up. I've read all about it. You just walk in and sit down, and if you don't try to hold your breath, you... You go to sleep, don't you? You've met murderers before, Mr. Regan. Do I make a good murderer? Do I make a good murderer? Stop it. Stop it, will you? You trying to tell me you killed him? Oh, Mr. Regan, that's why I came here. I shot him. I walked up behind him and I put the gun close to his back and pulled the trigger. They don't make such a great deal of noise, do they? I left him sitting there in his house by the sea and he looks very much alive. Only, only he's not alive at all. Now what is to me? Now what is to me? Do I make a good murderer? Do I <laughs> you are listening to the story of the House by the Sea, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. They're still available for qualified nurses. Yes, the Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. To find out if you do qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the House by the Sea and Jeff Regan, Investigator. Well, after she got through, she settled down to a slow, even kind of a giggle that started somewhere around her shoelaces and didn't get past her knees. It was one of those things that gives you a feeling like somebody's standing in back of you with a red-hot iron ready to press your pants before you get them off. Now, she wasn't going to do any more talking, so I went downstairs and brought back a doctor friend of mine named Sammy Wing. He brought his little black bag with him and gave her a shot or something. And she wilted like last night's orchid and went to sleep on my couch. Sammy began talking. Some playmate. Wish I'd have been here for the party. I had four appendectomies and one broken leg today. So down will lie. Well, is she? You know her better than me. No, is she going to be all right? Well, she'll wake up in five or six hours and I want some water. And then what? She might ask you what happened or it might start all over again, whatever it was. By the way, what was it? Well, I found her here when I got home. I should find something like this. She said she killed an ex-client of mine. Oh, maybe I'm lucky at that. What does all the past tense mean? I was called off the case. Oh, nice. It's all clean. No clients to protect. Is there a corp someplace? I don't know, Sammy. Call the police. They'll find out. And then you and me can go out and get a drink. She said she used this gun. Smell it, Sammy. It hasn't been fired. Safety catch is still on. She's pretty and she's nice, and I'll bet she looks like a million bucks in a bathing suit. 
But if I'd admit it within the last three hours, I'd have run for help. Call the police. Is that professional? This is acute hysteria. The kind that pops off guns and pops off people and does a lot of things they can't remember later on. Call the police. What about the gun? What about guns? Call the coroner while you're at it. Tell him to go out there with some DOA forms. He'll use them. Or you stay here with it, like it back? Corpse hunt? Just an idea. Hitler had an idea. The odds were against them. You got about as much chance as a three-legged horse in the Kentucky Derby. She's bit somebody and she's told you about it. I want to make sure. What do they do when a private eye walks in and messes up an ice cream murder? Sammy, will you stay? Had any bourbon around here? Yeah. Okay, take your time. Maybe both of us will get our pictures in the paper. I left him with a kind of a soft smile on his face like he had some inside information on Tuesday's winner at Del Mar. Well, it was 9.30 by the time I got there, and it was dark enough to give a ghost the creeps. It was different, too. Maybe it was the fog. I used that ring of keys I'd taken from her purse. It smelled dry and funny inside, and it was real quiet, like somebody was waiting for the world to fall apart. I clicked on my flashlight, and I walked down the long hall to his office. He was there, just like she said. There were three holes in the front of his shirt, but it wasn't the laundry's fault. I spotted a thirty-eight on the floor by his hand. I broke it, and three cartridges came out was the right gun for the job. It was pretty messed up. While I was standing there trying to figure Velma Carmen's story, the lights came on. A fat man wearing a sheriff's star was standing by the switch. There was a taller man in a brown overcoat next to him. They both looked like they'd just finished dinner. Scavenger hot, son. You don't talk, Charlie. Mm, ain't much for him to say, is that, Cap? Guess not. Well, son... Well, it looks like you're going to be calling me names. What do you like best? Killer, murderer, or slayer? The papers use slayer a lot. I don't like any of them. And the breezy for a hot boy, ain't you? Mind giving me a name? It's Regan. I'm a private detective. Hmm. It's Regan. He's a private detective, Cap. Yeah. Got a card or something with you, son? Yeah. Yeah, he's right. For the international. Lion still there? Yeah. Who's that? An old bum I used to know. Regan, why do you go around killing people? The lion will be mad. Look, this is a fix. Now, why do you want to say a thing like that? Somebody tip you? Phone call a little while ago. Huh? Funny kind of a voice, a whisper. Said we'd find a stiff up here, but didn't say we'd find you. You're extra. Look, I just came here to see what it was all about. Same thing we did. Only we come up with a suspect and a corpse. No cop could ask for anything better. Charlie, better call a coroner. Ocean Town, just a small place, Regan. Only me and Charlie around. We borrow from the county when we get something like this. I can find you a real answer in an hour. You let me and Charlie worry about that. You look good enough for the time being. All right, son. Let's go. I had as much chance as an elephant in a tea room, and if those two locked me up and booked me... So I leaned back into his gun and spun around and knocked his wrist down. He pulled the trigger, and by that time I flicked the light switch and was out the door. I didn't run for my car. I cut across the driveway and doubled back up the hill. I could hear him yelling and shooting out in the dark. I hailed a cab about five blocks away, and he took me to the place above Malibu. I found her in a booth with a piano player. She was wearing one of those black strapless things, and it was worrying a couple of ball-headed guys sitting at the bar. You're late, Jeff. We said nine o'clock. I had three drinks all alone. You want me to get mad or are you going to catch up? How long you been here? You sound like you're out of the mood. I thought we were going to look at the stars together. How long you been here? Looks nine o'clock. Looks matter? I've been working tonight. Well, it's after hours now. Tell me how you like my new dress. It's the right color with the wrong cut for a funeral. I haven't read the obituaries today. It'll be in tomorrow's paper, only it'll make the front page. Have a drink. Let's wait for tomorrow. Your friend was killed tonight. What friend? Kru. He was no friend of mine. I told you that. So did he. Car smash up or did he fall off his house? 38. We didn't talk about him this afternoon. Let's not start now. Look, two cops in Ocean Town are kind of crowding me. They think I'm going to take a good picture. Is that why you're late? It's a murder rap, lady. We should have had dinner together. They'll be knocking down your door in the morning. Why, darling? Because you threatened to kill him because he hired me to call you off. Oh, wait a moment, Jeff. We've been having fun up there now. Who told you that? Why did you think he sent me over today to sell magazines? I never found out you were called off. I suppose he hired you to scare me. 
Except we're old friends now. I can tell you a family secret. I know about him blackmailing you. And that puts you ahead of me for the cops. Did you do it? I don't know. Did you? What he told you don't sound right. What does sound right? I went to him one day and put him in a trance. Only I used scotch. Found out what he was doing and how I was doing it, so I turned the tables. It was good, clean fun, but expensive for him. You've been draining him? I thought that's why you came today. That's why I had Timmy around. Well, some of this is beginning to make change. If he was your meal ticket, then you got an alibi. I don't feel like stars anymore, Jeff. Let's go over to my place and talk. On the way over, she didn't have much to say, and I couldn't think of anything. I was all too mixed up. If she'd really been shaking him down, then she figured out. And the girl back in my apartment figured in. Only she had the wrong gun. And then there was a little business that I'd have to explain with the Ocean Town cops. Well, when we turned in the driveway, I stopped figuring. Tim Rogers, the man with the guns, was there standing on the porch. Oh, gorgeous. I've been waiting to see you. You're home late. I thought I fired you. Still tramping with this tramp, huh? I thought you'd be sick of him by now. For once, I'm glad to see you, Tim boy. That sounds cozy, but I don't want to see you. I know where your 38 is. You're wrong. It's her 38. And it's got her prints on it. Jeff, he's making it look bad for me. Ask me. Ask him what he's doing here, will you? Just in for a showdown, Angel. You're tagged for his murder. They'll want you. I fixed it good. I can fix it so you can get away. How? A friend of mine shutting off at Pedro. Four o'clock. To go all over the world. Jeff, if all of this is straight, I'm in a spot. Relax. This guy never did anything right. Tell me how I'm wrong. All right, that tip to the Ocean Town cops was wrong. Trying to pile up a scare on me was wrong. Killing Cairo was wrong. And this clinches it. Yeah? Well, that's where you're twisted, Pilgrim. I got a warrant out for you right now. Plugging a murder suspect is something they'll thank me for. You said her prints were on that gun. They'll find that out in the morning. And how was I to know? Just happened to hear on the radio they were looking for you tonight. I see you, I plug you. Everybody will be sorry, but it'll be manslaughter and suspended. I worked it once in Toledo. What do you say, Angel? Do I plug him and meet you somewhere in two weeks? Let me have a smoke. Let me think it over. Sure. Sure, go ahead. Angel! Well, the gun's empty now. I carried this for three years. I never used it. He deserved to die, didn't he? Didn't he, Regan, didn't he? I don't know, lady. You knew him better. Well, it unwound like red thread in the Levi factory. Grace Nichols had been putting the shake on the prince. He got tired of it and called me in and told me his phony story so he'd have a good self-defense angle when he finally got around to shooting her some afternoon. He had Tim planted there to keep me from really seeing her. Oh, it was a nice idea, only I bounced Tim and got inside. And then Tim made a phone call and the lion jerked me before I had a chance to compare notes with her. I guess Tim went kind of crazy seeing how well we got along together and... He figured Grace would do anything if she was wanted for murder. So he killed the prince and made her the patsy with those fingerprints. She'd handled the gun before, see. But then I had my caller, Velma Carmen, the prince's wife. She went kind of crazy, too, when she walked in and found him dead. It took three doctors a couple of weeks to tell her what really happened. When I told it all to the lion, he was mad at first, but then he saw Grace Nichols' picture in the paper. He asked just one question. What was I doing at Grace's place all afternoon? I didn't even bother to answer him. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS same time next week for hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Grace Nichols was played by Betty Lou Gerson, David Ellis was Tim Rogers, Lorreen Tuttle was Velma Carmen, and Marvin Miller was Prince Carew. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. 4,000 of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. The educational opportunities offered the nurse by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage to her in her work. Don't wait. 
If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card now for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Dick Around. Jeff Regan, investigator, is heard every Saturday at 9.30 over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of Cain and Abel and the Santa Maria. This is the way it started. It was one of those cold, clammy mornings that the Chamber of Commerce doesn't like to have in print. I was in my place working on a four-minute egg that tasted like a boiled golf ball when the phone began bouncing. Now, I let it ring a while, and I got to thinking that it might be an old-fashioned girl who knew how to cook. It was the lion. Hello, Regan talking. This is me. I've been working all morning. I'll buy you a time clock. Get to the point. Our uh, lucky day. I just talked to Dunn and Bradstreet. How are they? I don't be funny. We got a new client, and they tell me when the Treasury Department gets in trouble, they come to him. Yeah? The guy's name is Abel Roderick. Got a special from him an hour ago. He asked for a man, and I'm sending you, Regan. You're sending me where? His ranch. He raises horses. Horses don't talk. What's bothering him? Uh, maybe it's his wife. Tell me she's got a pair of legs she'll never forget. He just said he wanted an operator out there by 12 o'clock. You never learn, do you? This means stove. What else does it mean? We'll go as far as homicide and arson when they got pockets as long as his. Money all you ever think about. Yeah, you learn something when you're as old as I am. That's all there is to think about. Well, then get yourself another boy and start teaching him. I don't learn easy. Now, just a minute. That's no attitude. Taking somebody's check before you know who's who and what's what means trouble. Jeffrey, please. You misunderstand me. I wouldn't jeopardize your bond or the good reputation of International by accepting an unreliable client. Look, last week that guy had a record longer than a roll of ticker tape. I've been with Harry Presidio all morning. He knows Abel Roderick. Yeah. He's the grandson of Gallant Roderick. Name used to be Rodriguez. One of our finest old California families. Jeffrey, he's a gentleman like yourself. Oh, that's nice. And he needs our assistance. Well? All right, where is it? In and route between here and Santa Ana. Take Firestone. Yeah. Now, you run out there and see what Mr. Roderick wants. And, uh, Jeffrey... I know, I know. Call me, Jeffrey. Call me if you're running into any trouble. Well, when the lion hung up, he sounded as happy as a chorus girl with a new mink coat. Oh, he's a smart guy, I guess. But he uses check stubs for a telephone directory. Well, the home of Abel Roderick wasn't too hard to find. All I had to do was to get out on the highway and look for a hill. That's where it was. One of those old Spanish-type places with a flock of porches windows and lots of iron grill work. Yeah, 20 years ago, it might have rated the good home section, but now you couldn't tell where the grass stopped and the weeds began. It's kind of used up and sad, like a derby winner with a broken leg. A tall blonde guy, about 30, in a black polo shirt, was stretched out on a beach chair in the front porch. He pulled off his dark glasses and watched me get out of the car and come up the steps. And he gave me one of those looks, like he was already tired of knowing me. We don't want any. How do you know? We never want anything. Go away. I'm here to see Abel Roderick. You him? No. But he lives here, doesn't he? Yes. Who are you? My name's Regan. So? I want to see him. Go ahead. See him. Everybody as nice as you. Oh, I got a merit badge for being the nicest. What did you say your name was? Regan. What did you say you wanted to see him about? I didn't say Mm-hmm. Well, it's too hot to play games, so I'll tell you. 
I don't like you and he won't like you. Well, now, what am I supposed to do? Roll down the stairs? It might help, baby. Well, where'd you find him, Kane? Janie, this is Mr. Regan. He came to see your husband. I guess he has business with him. Hello, Mr. Regan. Is Abel expecting you? At 12. You're 10 minutes late. Well, I'm still trying to see him. He's in the study. Come on. I'll see you later, Regan. I thought I knew all of Abel's business acquaintances, but I don't remember you. Oh, no, I'm a new one. And what do you do? A lot of things. You're very interesting, Mr. Regan. Mm-hmm. Will you be coming here often? I don't know. I hope so. You keep your husband in a vault? <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> You're cute. Here we are. This is Abel's study. I guess he stepped out for a moment. Would a drink take off the uh, rough edges? Might. Good. I'll make you one. Okay. Where are the horses? Horses? I gave that up a long time ago. I've given up a lot of things, Mr. Regan. Let's not worry about that. Yes, you think. Thanks. That blonde boy out on the porch doesn't like me. Okay. He doesn't like anybody. But let's not worry about him, either. You're crowding me. Don't you like to be crowded? It all depends on whose wife is doing it. You're worried about Abel? I'm drinking his whiskey. I've never had any complaints. I don't see why you should. What kind of a nasty crack is that? You figure it, lady. Mr. Nobody talks to little Janie like that. Hello, my dear. Introduce me to our visitor. Oh, Abel. This is Mr. Regan, darling. He says he has business with you. Regan? Oh, Regan. Yes, of course. How do you do, Mr. Regan? I'm Abel Roderick. How are you? I see Janie's made you comfortable with a drink, so we can get right down to business. Oh, uh, uh, Janie, my dear, why don't you ask Kane if he'd like to play some tennis? You're not very subtle, darling, but I was just leaving. That's a good girl. I hope to see you again. Don't let her worry, Regan. It's an act. Do I look worried? <laughs> She's lovely, and if you're young and tall and Janie's around, she adopts you. I wasn't an orphan. Mm -hmm. She'll be sulky all day now. <laughs> well, thanks for coming out. I hope you can help me. Well, so far, I don't even know who's on the team. A man in my alleged position is quite often the object of subterfuge. You can understand that. Well, you mean because you got money, yeah. To be quite frank, I have no money, Mr. Regan. Mm. That's going to come as a shock to somebody I know. Who? Never mind. Go on. It's my grandfather, Gallant Roderick. He controls all of the wealth in this family. You his front man? The eldest son of a son. And I live in this deplorable old shack waiting for grandfather to die. How long have you been waiting? Too long, Mr. Regan. But I'm past 40 now. I don't know how to do anything else, so I continue to wait. Along with my devoted brother, Kane, who has the same thing to look forward to. Yeah, I met him. If you think he's bad, you should meet my grandfather. He fitted us with these charming names, Kane and Abel. Well, what's all this got to do with me? Here. Look at these. Mm -hmm. Two little ships of silver. Perfect replicas of the Pinta and Nina, named after Columbus's fleet. Yeah. You can't buy stuff like that anymore. Not even on a time plan. Hardly. Twenty years' work on the part of an ancient silversmith in Madrid. And a prized possession of the Rodriguez family for seven generations. My great-great-great-grandmother wore them on her wedding dress. Where's the other one? You guessed it, Mr. Regan. The Santa Maria is missing. Janie wore it to Ciro's night before last. Did you lose it? Nothing so simple. It was stolen. How? Oh, she was with Kane. It was late when they got back. A masked man stopped their car on the turnoff. According to Janie, he was very polite, merely removed the Santa Maria, took nothing else. What about Kane? He was passed out. Janie was driving. Regan, the usual thing is for me to get a telephone call and have an opportunity to buy it back. Isn't that right? Well, a heist job usually works that way, yeah. Well, I haven't been contacted. I'm getting worried. What does your insurance company say? My grandfather owns the insurance company. I've told no one but you. You don't want him to know about it, huh? Well, he might cut me off. He thinks I've been careless. Well, what do you advise me to do? Wait for that phone call and buy it back. I'm willing to buy it back, but the truth of the matter is grandfather will be in from the east this week. The first thing he does when he comes out here is ask to see those ships. Well, now, look, whoever pulled the job couldn't unload a thing like that without being caught. And if he melted it down, he'd be lucky to get 50 bucks. He's bad off as you are. Do you think you could hurry it up? Well, I know a couple of people. Then you'll try and contact them for me. I'll do what I can. 
Oh, thank you, Regan. Now we just sit back and wait for my ship to come in. <laughs> Bad joke, huh? I left him sitting there in that big room. He looked about as happy as a St. Bernard with a stomach ache. Well, he'd have probably felt worse if he'd have been outside on the porch. Janie was there with his brother, only they didn't hear me. Well, maybe they were just checking each other for broken ribs. I didn't bother to ask. Out on the highway, about a mile from the place, a 49 Nash picked me up. I turned off a couple of times on those little roads to make sure, but he stuck with me. Once he got real close, but he was wearing dark glasses and a straw hat and could have been Whistler's mother for all I knew. When I pulled into the lot by our building about 3 o'clock, he drifted along with the Broadway traffic. I took his license number, and then I backed out and drove over to 3500 Hope Street. No, I said, when I go see my friend Moriarty. Okay, buddy, well, let's see. I want to trace a license number. Accident? No. Okay, man. Try with the 11. Thanks. Next. I want to know who's registered for these plates right here. 4E7542. This year? Yeah. I'm a private detective. I think it might be connected with a case. Yeah, makes you think that. Well, the car followed me this afternoon. Yeah. Just tell me who owns it, will you? Then what? Well, then I'm going to write you a letter. I don't collect stamps. You worked here too long, lady. You telling me. Six years I collected fines A through G. Now I'm doing this. Thanks, huh? Who does the car belong to? Well, I gotta look. Well, the cars in Los Angeles. Thousands of cars. Mad, mad months ago, he'd brains out if he knew just how many cars there really are around this town. Well, Ruby, do I know, mister, and don't you forget it. 4 e seven five four two belongs to a guy named Richard I. Chambers. Address? Hotel de Soto. Thanks. Come back any time, doll. Glad to help you out. The name Richard I. Chambers meant about as much to me as a shipload of stale bread, but it didn't take 20-20 vision to see that there was a connection. And the whole thing was phony. It was like cutting your leg off to cure your bunions. Well, I went back to the office and checked with the lion. Okay, Regan, give it to me. It's a heist. One of the family heirlooms. And our meat. When was it lifted? Two nights ago. Any contacts yet? No, none. That's why it's screwy. What do you mean, screwy? Well, it was a little silver ship called the Santa Maria. Now, they'd have to sell it back to Roderick or go on relief. Mm, where does that leave us? With another bum case. Now, don't say anything like that. Well, your dope on Roderick was secondhand. Mm, tell me. His grandfather keeps the keys. How do you know? Roderick said so. Mm. You shouldn't let out family secrets. You let me worry about that. Just find his little ship. Yeah, yeah. Guy called half hour ago, left the number for you. Chambers? Yeah, who told you? Who did? I want you to phone him. But... Never mind, skip that. I know where to get him. <laughs> Things began to move. That meant that all the cards were out and somebody was asking for bets. Over at the DeSoto Hotel, the clerk told me that 305 belonged to Chambers. He was a little guy about a head shorter than Margaret O'Brien. He shoved three inches of nose out at me through a crack in the door. I thought I left word for you to phone. You, Chambers? I was having a beauty nap. Come back in an hour, yeah, will you? you need it. Look out! Hey, what is this? Oh, <laughs> tough guy, yeah? All right, you're tough. I think you're a bum. All right, simmer down, Junior. You'll never make Eagle Scout. Oh, you're so good. I gotta take that from you, huh? We're gonna talk. What makes you think so? Everybody's grown up now. Dickie Chambers talks when he feels like talking. All right, squirt, have it your way. Hey, that kind of stuff ain't gonna get you nothing, Regan. Your weight's up, Dickie. You got a different job now. I said you're a bum. You tell me today. Ask your mother. What you want me to phone about? Wrong track, I'm sure. The two buck windows downstairs. You're in this somewhere, and I want to know where. <laughs> Through being tough, Regan? I'll let the boys in the personnel division handle you. What do you mean? That shiv on your dress is about an inch too long to be legal. <laughs> Call him. See where he gets you. I'll send you a nickel later. Uh, okay, okay, I'll open. Just said I don't like to get shoved around, that's all. Why didn't you figure that before you got tangled up? I'm your contact. All right, come on, let's put the show on the road. How much does it cost? Five grand and tens and twenties. Go on. Tonight, ten o'clock, you come with him. Where? Mile of side of Santa Ana Airport. Little road turns left off 101, right? Two miles in park. And then what? Well, if you got the five grand, you don't try anything funny. He gets his little silver ship back. That it? That's it, people. Happy? See you later, Dickie. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm checking out tomorrow. Hey, look, Buster, you aren't any heist, man. They come smoother. What's your angle? Maybe I love jewelry. 
Do you care if maybe I love jewelry? I don't. A guy like you's got to love something. I called Roderick and told him what I'd found out. He sounded relieved, like he'd been underwater for a long time or just coming up for air. He said he'd get the cash, and I made arrangements to meet him at his place later on. Then I called the lion and told him. After that, I stopped off at a place on Wilshire, and I ran up a tab watching a skinny guy trying to make a piano sound like a symphony orchestra. Well, I had some steak and potatoes, and then I drove back out to Roderick's place. It was about nine o'clock when I got there, and the same people were on the front porch doing the same thing. I remembered what the lion had said about those legs of hers. Oh, Joe. Having fun? Oh, Regan, huh? I thought I told you we didn't want any. That was eight hours ago. We still don't want any. I'm still here to see your brother. More business? Something like that. I don't like you any more now than I did this morning, and I hated you then. Yeah, well, I'm going to cry about that when I get home. You're pretty smart, aren't you, Regan? King, please be careful. He's awful smart. Kane. Let me go. Yeah, let him go, lady. I'll give him back. Now, you I'll show you trying to spy on people, huh? I'm going to give you something, people. Ah. He's been drinking. Now, Look out. Look out. Nothing. Go on. Oh. Well, I guess he deserved that. Nasty when he works at it. How was the other times? There aren't any other times. Too bad. Maybe he'll be different when he wakes up. What do you mean about the liquor? Skip it. You're getting the wrong idea about everything. What are you, kid? I was a hat check girl in a cheap nightclub. What's going on out here, Jamie? Oh, Regan, you're here. Uh, what was he acting up about tonight? Mr. Regan. Uh, well, it doesn't make any difference. Take care of him, will you, Janie? Of course, Abel. That's a good girl, Janie. Well, you all ready, Regan? You got it. All set. I'll be home early, Janie. Come on, Regan, let's go. Well, we climbed in my car. We drove to the place Dickie Chambers told me about. It wasn't hard to find. It was a flat dirt road to the edge of the airport. We clicked off two miles on the speedometer, and then we switched off our lights and parked. It was dark and quiet there, like the inside of an empty barrel. Roderick didn't have much to say. He just sat there chewing on a cigar and looking at nothing. He was real good at waiting. I looked at my watch about three minutes to ten, then I saw the headlights of another car coming down the road from a long way off. Roderick nodded his head, and I began to have a feeling like I was standing on top of the trap, and the warden had just smiled at the hangman. That must be ours, Regan. Do you think we should switch on our headlights? They may not see us. Well, unless they got wings, they got to pass us. They don't seem to be slowing down much, do they? I'll get out of the car. What? Get out of the car. Say, what is Don't this? Don't talk. Move. Oh, all right, all right. What's got into you, Regan? Come on. Well, we can't just... Well, them think something's Look, wrong. Look, this is a packed deck. You're a ringer. I'm not sure I... Spun him around and he fell against the car. I pulled out my gun, but it didn't do any good. Whoever it was must have been in vaudeville. That was the fastest disappearing act since Houdini. You are listening to the story of Kane and Abel and the Santa Maria. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. If you are a graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the regular Officers Reserve Army Nurse Corps. If you are eligible and meet the high standards to qualify to serve with this fine organization, you may elect active or inactive status. In addition to this privilege, they also have the opportunity to take advantage of special training courses. So if you believe that you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply now to the Adjutant General's Office, Washington, D.C. That's the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of Cain and Abel and the Santa Maria and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, there was enough loose lead around there to start a scrap drive. Whoever it was wanted to make real sure. My car was as full of holes as a canceled check. I found a forty-five slug in the seat packing, and I piled Roderick inside, and I drove over to a motor court on the highway. An old lady with a dust mop or a head of hair registered us and complained about all the drunks there were in this world. And then when I got rid of her, I went out to the phone booth and gave the lion a ring. I woke him up. It's 11 o'clock at night. What do you want? I'm in a jam. You're always in a jam. Tell me about it in the morning. Look, I'm, I'm giving it to you right now. You'd 
drunk? I've been with your client trying to get that ship back. How'd you do? I got lead instead of silver. What do you mean by that? Somebody doesn't like Roderick. Who is it? I don't know. We got there for the buyback and somebody opened up. They can't do that. Well, they did. Oh, where's Roderick now? With me. Get a doctor and come on over. What? He got in the way when they started the 4th of July. Well, take him to a hospital. Now look, Fatso, he isn't hurt bad, but he needs help. You're always talking about money, and here's your chance to make some. Yeah? They'll give you a bonus if you keep him out of the papers. I'll be there in half an hour. Well, the lion showed up 20 minutes later. He had a long-faced guy with him who said he was a doctor. He looked more like an undertaker, but I didn't argue. I told the lion to keep Roderick there till I phoned back. Then I beat it over to the DeSoto Hotel. The door to 305 was open. Dickie Chambers had company, only he wasn't receiving. He was lying under a sheet. A fat guy in a wrinkled suit seemed to be running things. Come on in, brother. I didn't know Dickie had any friends. I guess he didn't. Who are you? I'm a guy who met him once. Who are you? Ed Granger, constable. This is my territory. What's your name? Regan, private investigator. International? Mm Mm-hmm. The lion's eye, huh? Know anything about this? I talked to him this afternoon. He gave up riding horses for other things. What kind of things? He was contact man on a heist job. Yeah? Where do you come in? I was hired. That's why I met Dickie. Mind telling me by who? Mm Mm-mm. It's a client, Ranger. This is a murder. Okay. Better go for now. When'd you find him? A little while ago. Clerk called, said he heard shooting. I came down with the boys and found Dickie doing the long sleep. Happened less than an hour ago. He's a tough little guy. Well, them 45s don't know nothing about that. 45? Big holes. Chest and neck, close ranch. <laughs> Corner's gonna lose two bits. He thinks it's a 38. Well, look, if it turns out big, try this one for a match here. Oh, uh-huh. You have been playing games tonight? Somebody gave it to me. Connected? Ballistics will tell you. Mm-hmm. Anything else? No. What'd you come back for? Talk to Dickie. No good, huh? No good. I should have asked him earlier. We uh, can get you through international. Yeah. Well, if you got anything, remember the name. Ed Granger. He was peeking under that sheet looking at Chambers when I left. It was kind of a sad smile on his face, like somebody put gasoline in his thermos bottle. I drifted across the street for a package of cigarettes, and then I came back and climbed in my car thinking about the whole thing. I don't know how long I sat there in the car, but when I looked up, there was a shadow against the wall of the building. It was a good-looking shadow. Doing your homework? Yeah, I do for a diploma. Congratulations. What would you like for a gift? How about a little silver ship, huh? Sorry, too expensive. Try again. All right, give me a forty-five. What would you do with that? Give it to a cop named Granger. Then what? All right, go home and go to bed. You haven't asked me what I'm doing yet. I know. Payne? Him too? He isn't so bad when you get to know him. From where you're sitting, he must have wings. Well, if it isn't the gum heel, you ready for laughs? What do we got, a comedy? Take a look, Janie. Okay, bright boy, where is he? You sober enough to shoot straight? I took the pledge. Before or after you came by us out on that road? After, baby. You don't smell like it. Where is he? Try my car trunk. I'm using him for ballast. What did you do with him, Regan? Kane, there's some people coming. Has he told you what he did with Abel? Not yet. You'll have to talk to him somewhere else. Right, Angel. Okay, Regan, come on, get out. Turn me up. Now turn around. Let me guess what's coming. It's a trip to the moon. Sit tight, baby. Here you go. I settled down to having a headache. Then the headache went someplace and I had nothing. Oh, it was a nice play. Everybody was a quarterback and everybody had the ball. I looked as good as a fat girl in a French bathing suit. It was some time later, maybe ten years, I had a mouthful of brandy and my throat was burning like an oil stagger. We were in Roderick's place. She was standing over me holding a bottle in one hand and a forty-five in the other. Coming around now. Got to work fast. <laughs> Don't worry, he'll talk. <clears throat> Feeling better, baby? <clears throat> well, you're going to feel worse. Now, shut up, baby. Come on, it's time to talk. Now, wait a minute, Kane. Wait. Uh, Let me ask you. We're all alone here. No one's going to disturb us. We'll find out anyhow. Why don't you tell us what you did with him? I get a short memory. I forget things. It's a shame to let Kane do this to you. I think you're pretty. Might not be able to stop him once he gets started. It's your idea, lady. I'm along for the view. Iron men went out with short skirts, but I guess you don't know it yet. You look tough, brother, but you bruise easy. You're already wearing striped pants. You mangled it when you tagged me tonight. Think so? 
Tell me how. All right. No one knew I was a detective but your brother. That meant you hired Dickie Chambers to find out. So you know it. So what? So you bumped Dickie when you thought it was finished. Well, yeah, that makes you know I'm not kidding. There's a constable named Granger. Okay. Relax, Angel. Relax. Don't let him scare you. He hasn't told anything to anybody. No? No. If you did, we would have found him in a hospital. I saw him go down. Are you sure? Of course I am. Now all we got to do is find him. So let's get started. <laughs> Well, you talk now, huh? No? It's going to get worse, baby. You might have to write it later. You got hold of a bad label. Stop it, now stop it. This isn't getting us anything. Oh, yeah, but I'm having fun. No, kill him. Let go of my arm. Now we need him. We've got to find him in the car with Abel. It's ruined if you kill him. I said let go. Now, where were we, baby? I said to stop it. Huh? Stand away from him. Are you crazy or something? It will work fine if you can think. But you can't think. You're no good to me anymore. Janie. Janie! Ah! 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 He shook all over a couple of times like he was saying no in a big way. And then he finally relaxed. She knelt down and took something out of his pocket. I tried to lift one of my arms, but I got about as far as I would trying to hook a whale with a salad fork. I must have looked real bad, because all of a sudden her eyes kind of lit up and she came over. You've taken a lot of punishment, mister. Yeah, not as much as you're going to take. A matter of opinion. By the way, you didn't happen to be carrying that five grand. You looking for a stake? Yeah. I'm going out prospecting. Trip around the world? Far enough to make some new connections. That's all a girl needs. Here. Here's the little ship. You didn't do it for nothing. You run out of bullets? No. If they ever get me, I'll say justifiable homicide. He's trying to kill you. You're my witness. Oh, you are pretty. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. That's all she said, and that was the last I ever saw of her. Well, it seems that Janie and Kane had figured to tag both of us out on that road, and it'd all be blamed on a phony heist gang. <laughs> there was a lot of insurance they could have turned into ready cash, but I had a feeling that when I made Abel get out of that car that night, it'd ruin things for him. Janie and Kane thought that they could still do it if they could find him and get us together again. That's why he went to work on me. Kane already killed Dickie Chambers because he thought there might have been a double cross, and I guess he was kind of crazy by the time he got around to me. Well, anyway, about three months later, a detective sergeant down in Miami Beach spotted Janie one night working the hat stand in a nightclub. Everybody wondered how he could recognize her. She dyed her hair, and she really changed her appearance. But it figured. You see, the police folder had a picture of her in a bathing suit, and She couldn't change those legs. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at 9.30 next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator, written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Janie Broderick was played by Lorene Tuttle. Marvin Miller was Abel and Wally Mayer was Kate. Dickie Chambers was Sidney Miller and Paul Freeze played Ed Granger. Are you a graduate registered nurse? Do you know someone who is? Then please listen carefully to this important message from the Adjutant General's Office, Washington, D.C. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses are given the opportunity of receiving a commission in the regular Army Reserve. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, (laughs) D.C. Original music for this program is by Dick Arant. 
Jeff Regan, the investigator, is heard every Saturday at 9.30 over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast, present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Tonight there's frost on the windows of Dr. Watson's familiar study, and an overcast sky threatens another fall of snow. But as we sit snug and warm in front of a glowing fire, our thoughts turn to Sherlock Holmes and his immortal exploits. Well, which one are we to have tonight, Dr. Watson? Tonight, Mr. Harris, I think I'll tell you the case of the avenging blade. One of the most touch-and-go, not to say hair-raising adventures, it was ever my privilege to share with the sage of Baker Street. Meaning Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I was certainly not referring to Mrs. Hudson. (laughs) Yes, when I think how close that sword came to decapitating the person we (laughs) both... There I go, anticipating again... But before I become further involved in the attempt at murder which occurred at the base of the equestrian statue of Charles I, suppose you stop me long enough to say a few well-chosen words on another important subject. I'll do my very best, Dr. Watson. You may have noticed that Clippercraft clothes are never on sale at reduced prices. There's a reason for this. It's that Clippercraft clothes are so low-priced in the first place, for such remarkable quality, that sales just aren't necessary. What makes these amazing values possible? Right in your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Well, it's the famous Clippercraft plan. The plan that concentrates the buying power of 1036 great stores across the country, creating year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. You're the gainer through the efficient Clippercraft plan. That's why you pay only 40 and 45 dollars for a Clippercraft suit, only 40 dollars for a top coat or overcoat, and only twenty-six fifty for sport jackets. That's why your eyes will pop with amazement when you see the fine tailoring and the rich, long-wearing fabrics at these low prices. Yes, compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to the Avenging Blade, the attempted murder and the equestrian statue, Dr. Watson. Yes, yes, the famous statue of Charles I stands in Charing Cross, which, as you know, is often called the center of London. Charing Cross, isn't that the open space to the south of Trafalgar Square, Dr. Watson? Correct, Mr. Harris. But uh, to begin at the beginning, it is one of those clear, rare days in late January which now and then surprise the city of London. The sky was a brilliant blue and the light, powdery fall of snow reflected the dazzling sunlight outside. Holmes was lounging on the sofa in a brilliant purple dressing gown. His pipe rack within his reach, ashes scattered on the floor, and the crumpled morning papers littering the room in all directions. My dear Holmes, no one could accuse you of being a tidy man. Only in my head, Watson. My brain houses what is probably the most accurate and complete collection of information in all of England, if not in the entire world. And it's all in meticulous and precise order. Conceit. Not at all, Watson, merely accuracy. But of what use are my unequal mental abilities? For months there's been no crime worthy of my attention, no case with any originality, any imagination. Oh, I wouldn't say that. You found the Shah of Baghdad's missing emerald. You outwitted the band of nihilists who were threatening to blow up both houses of Parliament. Hmm. Commonplace. Strictly routine investigations. 
Oh, there's a front doorbell. Maybe it's a case. Well, look out of the window, Watson, and see who's on the doorstep. That's a good chap. Ooh, pity you wouldn't be stir yourself now, then. Mm, tallish man. Dressed in Highland regalia. Bonnet, kilts. Even wearing a Scottish dirk in his stocking. Hmm. Rather drafty attire for a day like this. By the way, Watson, what day is it? Wednesday, of course. I mean, what day of the month? Let me see. The uh, 30th, I believe. Well, at least according to the Times, it is. Yes, I think we may grant that that is one subject on which the Times is fairly accurate. The 30th of January, of course, it's the anniversary of the beheading of Charles I. So that's why he's donned his kilts. Mrs. Hudson is slow answering the door this morning. He's looking up here. Great Scott Holmes, it's the Duke of Buckinghurst. I suspected as much. Well, for heaven's sake, don't just sit there, Holmes. Help me to tidy, him, um, um, tidy up this clutter. Well, well, what sort of an impression do you expect him makes sprawl there in the midst of all this mess? My dear Watson, if his lordship has a case sufficiently important to warrant my attention, he'll be in no mood to notice trifles. If not, I'm not interested in his lordship. I'm not impressed by titles, Watson. They're so apt to due to chance of heredity, like red hair or a Roman nose. Uh, at least you might straighten your collar. Oh, come in. Oh, Lord Buckinghurst, this is an honor. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. No, 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 not that chair. I, I think you'll find this one more comfortable. May I uh, relieve you of your bonnet? Uh, would you like a drop of brandy? Watson, if you'll stop playing the palpitating hostess, Lord Buckinghurst might like to explain why he's called to consult me. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. It's all so fantastic, I... I really don't know where to begin. If I had received this note at any other time, I'd have put it down to some poor demented half-wit. Persons in my position, Mr. Holmes, are unfortunately the recipients of a great many curious communications. Everything from begging letters to blackmail. There's nothing fantastic about blackmail in your position, Lord Buckinghurst. Consequently, that is not the gist of the letter that brought you here. Good Lord, no. But it's so well, it's incredible. I, I hardly know how to describe it. Suppose you allow me to view the letter and judge for myself. That, that would be the most sensible procedure, I suppose. Here you are, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. Paper, excellent quality. An educated script. Half English, half continental. Notice the final S's, Watson. Huh? Well, yes, but uh, to blaze it with the S's, what does it say? You must pardon my friend's lack of restraint, Lord Buckinghurst. He will never realize that the writing paper and general appearance of the letter often give me more information about the sender than the contents of the message. I think you will agree that the contents of this letter is of no small interest, Mr. Holmes. Mm, yes. Let's see. To the late Duke of Buckinghurst. Hmm, interesting. Beware the blade of the martyr king... Brief, but uh, bewildering, eh, Holmes? Not entirely. Lord Buckinghurst, you are, if I'm not mistaken, descended from the Duke of Buckinghurst, who was the favorite and boon companion of the ill-fated Charles I. Correct, Mr. Holmes. As the eldest of my family, it thus evolves upon me to attend the memorial services which are held every 30th of January by the Royal Martyr Society and place a commemorative wreath on the pedestal of the statue. Designed, if I'm not mistaken, by Grinling Gibbons. Really? I had no idea. It's not so old as the statue, I believe. The, the, the pedestal, I mean. Quite. Tell me, Lord Buckinghurst, does this expression, the blade of the martyr king, have any particular significance to you? Why, yes and no. I presume it refers to the ancient superstition which concerns the sword in the statue's hand. Which is? It seems that after the monarchy was restored, Charles II witnessed the execution of Thomas Harrison and the other regicides at Charing Cross. After the bloody event was over and his predecessor had been avenged, he made a proclamation to his followers. Witness the fate which befalls those who dare to turn against the crown. And so that you shall be reminded thereof, I hereby decree 
that on this spot shall be erected the statue of my martyred ancestor, Charles, and to his hand shall be restored the sword which he carried at Marsden Moor and Naseby, and which was taken from him by the Scottish friends who foully betrayed him to his enemies. If any man dare henceforth to plot against the crown, let him beware that sword. They say, Mr. Holmes, that when a traitor to the crown approaches the statue, the sword trembles and cries out for vengeance. How is that supposed to affect you, Lord Buckinghurst? Lest if I know. And yet, uh, someone obviously wants you to believe that if you attend this ceremony today, there'll be a catastrophe of some sort. I see, why not just say in words you have a bad cold and can't attend? As a medical man, I'd be more than glad to vouch for your indisposition. Never. Whoever wrote that note doesn't know me very well. If he thinks he can scare me off by any such hocus-pocus... Or he may know you very well. Tell me, Lord Buckinghurst, if you should be incapacitated on any of these occasions, who would be called on to place the wreath on the pedestal? Why, uh, my heir, of course. You uh, have a son old enough to represent you? No, Doctor. What's I allude to my brother, James? I'm a bachelor and have no children. If anything should happen to me, my brother inherits the title. By any chance, Lord Buckinghurst, was your brother educated in France? Why, uh, yes, Mr. Holmes. He attended the Sorbonne. It was while he was studying in Paris that he met Claire, uh, uh, his wife. Oh, I see what you're driving at. You think James may have written that note hoping to keep me at home so he would have the limelight in today's celebration? No, no. In the first place, my brother knows me too well for that. And in the second place, he's insufferably shy. He'd die of stage fright if he had to make a public appearance of any sort. But he will attend the ceremony. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. The entire family will be there. Hmm. Should be a rather colorful affair. What do you say we accompany Lord Buckinghurst, Watson? Oh, with pleasure. And I promise you, sir, that whatever the danger is that threatens you, you'll be quite safe with Sherlock Holmes along. Don't be fatuous, Watson. <laughs> Why do you think I dropped in this morning? But uh, we'd be better be getting along. The program begins in half an hour. Oh, there's no hurry. We have plenty of time for a stirrup cup. Uh, scotch, I believe, would be appropriate to the occasion. I take my advice and drink it neat. Those breezes round Charing Cross are very brash this time of year. Uh, shall I get the bottle, Holmes? No, Watson. I'll do the honours. Uh, you might fetch my greatcoat, however. And your service revolver, that's a good chap. Right, Holmes. I don't know whether you know it, Lord Buckinghurst, but the statue of Charles I you are about to decorate has a rather ironic history. Really? It was cast in 1633 by Hubert Le Sir, a pupil of Giovanni Bologna, that had not yet been erected when the Civil War broke out and the first Charles was deposed and beheaded. It was subsequently sold by Parliament to a brazier by the name of Rivet. Rivet? <laughs> Appropriate cognomen, eh, Holmes? Don't interrupt, Watson. Mr. Rivet was ordered to melt the statue down. Rank vandalism. That's the trouble with people always wanting to destroy someone else's handiwork. Calm yourself, Watson. Remember, the statue does stand in Charing Cross today. You mean old man Rivet uh, didn't destroy the silly thing? He announced that he'd done just that. And for years, he made a tidy living out of selling fragments of metal as souvenirs to both cavaliers and roundheads. However, when the restoration came along, he sold the statue back to the government at a neat profit. It was subsequently erected on the spot where it now stands. Well, the old scoundrel. I say, uh, Lord Buckinghurst, you uh, look a bit glassy-eyed. Uh, don't you feel very fit? For a fact, I, I do feel a bit squeamish. Must be the most of the handsome cab. Never had it affect me this way before. Hold tight, we're nearly there. Just turning into Trafalgar Square. Goodness for that. Yes, look, Holmes. There's the statue up ahead. Quite a group of people gathered around. 
Lots of them wearing kilts and uh, there are bagpipers. <laughs> I do enjoy a Highland air on the doodle sack, you know. Oh, here we are, Lord Buckinghurst. Good. Get me out of here. Uh, you all right when I get my feet on terra firma. Thought you would never get here. They've been waiting nearly half an hour to begin the ceremonies. The pipers have blown themselves practically out of breath keeping the crowd entertained. Sorry. Claire, my dear, may I present Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? Gentlemen, this is my brother James and his wife. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Quite. Oh, how delightfully exciting. But, Robert, why a detective at a time like this? Just a precaution. Precaution? Precaution against what? Do not tell me there is something of which my brother-in-law, the indomitable Duke of Buckinghurst, is afraid. Yes, you do look a bit wonky, Robert. Is uh, anything wrong? Matter of fact, I, I do feel a trifle under the weather. Uh -oh. uh, that Finn and Hattie I had for breakfast must have upset me. James, if I should have to retire suddenly... You take over when it comes time to place the wreath. Oh, but I, 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 I couldn't. I, I couldn't really. Why not? Uh, everyone would be looking at me. I, I wouldn't know what to do. You don't do anything but carry the wreath, escorted on either side by bagpipers playing a dirge. But when you reach the statue, you place the wreath at its feet, and the pipers break into a Scottish battle song. That's all there is to it. Am I right, Lord Buckinghurst? That's all. Uh, James, no, I... no, no, I can't let him do it. James is just out of his sick bed. He would have to remove his overcoat. And in those kilts in this icy wind, it would probably kill him. The wind, Lady Clare? I say, look, the ceremony is nearly ready to begin. The minister's about to read the benediction. Uh, you'll, you'll have to excuse oh, me. Oh, Robert, you, you can't leave now. I have to, James. I, I, I think I'm going to be sick. I know I'm going to be sick. Holmes, what did you put in that scotch you gave to Lord Buckinghurst? come the bagpipers with the wreath. Well, Lord Buckinghurst hasn't come back. Looks as though you'd have to carry on, Sir James. Oh, dear, dear, I... I, I do wish Robert would come back. I, I'm not at all good at this sort of thing. James, not... I forbid you to do it. You can't take off your overcoat. Let someone else place the wreath. Let Mr. Holmes do it. Uh, thank you, madam, but it's an honor to which I'm afraid I cannot aspire. My ancestors were mostly roundheads, you know. I'm afraid King Charles wouldn't approve. I wouldn't want to come within striking distance of that famous sword. Oh, you are joking. Such an amusing man. Am I? Oh, dear. Yes, they, they've noticed Robert is missing. Uh, they're bringing the wreath to me. Here, somebody hold my coat. Oh, no, James, no. Sorry, madam. You know the expression, noblesse oblige. Carry on, Sir James. Uh, yes, I, I... I suppose I shall have to. Oh, dear, I... I wish I'd stayed in bed. James, you fool, you idiot. Not a very impressive figure, the cadet branch of the House of Buckinghurst, eh, Holmes? No man with knocked knees should wear kilts in public. Still, there are all kinds of courage, Watson. James, 
If he's reached the statue, he's... He's kneeling to place the wreath. Watson, quick, hand me your revolver. Yes, but what will... I don't like the angle of the statue sword over his head. Oh, Holmes, have you taken leave of your senses? You shall know when they start to play the battle cry. Yes, the pipers are filling their lungs. Here they go. I prevented it from impaling Sir James's body. No, no, this is too much. It's killed him. He's lying on the ground. He's dead. Calm yourself, madam. Your husband's only fainted. The sword missed him completely. Oh. Watson, will you go and revive Sir James? I'll attend to her ladyship here. Oh, very well, Holmes. Now, madam. Now what, Mr. Holmes? Why did you attempt to kill your husband's brother? You knew the vibrations of the wild Stuart battle cry on the bagpipes would dislodge the loosened sword in the statue's hand. You knew it would probably pierce the back of anyone kneeling below. You screamed to warn your husband before the sword fell. <laughs> oh, cher, monsieur Holmes. You are almost as clever as people say you are. I will not bother to deny your accusations. Why should I? There is nothing you can prove. What have I to be afraid of? The man you hired to loosen the sword in the statue's hand. With my sources of information, it shouldn't take me more than 24 hours to find him. With my powers of persuasion, it shouldn't take me more than 24 minutes to make him talk. What is that expression they teach the children in this country, Mr. Holmes? Do not count the chickens until they are hatched? <laughs> It's no trick to make ordinary clothes at low prices, but it takes real manufacturing genius to produce really fine clothes that not only look far above, but are far above the modest price you pay for them. That's why we say try on a clipper craft tomorrow. It'll be hard to believe you're getting so very much for so very little. Such expert tailoring, smart styling, and superb long-wearing fabrics. This tremendous feat is accomplished through the renowned clipper craft plan which concentrates the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. It brings you Clippercraft suits at only $40 and $45, top coats and overcoats at only $40, and sport jackets at only $26.50. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. We find them standing in the dim light of a street lamp which marks the entrance to a crooked lane in Soho. Large flakes of falling snow intensify the expectant silence of the winter night. How much longer do we have to wait out here in this confounded snow, Holmes? It's after midnight. We shall wait here, Watson, until the Lady Claire arrives to pay a visit to the artisan who loosened the sword for her. You see, I was better than my promise. I tracked him down in less than 24 hours. What makes you so sure she'll come? She must, Watson. As long as Andre Bogard is alive, he's a threat to her safety. You think she'll try to finish him off? My dear Watson, a woman who's capable of attempting to murder her husband's brother so that he may inherit 
Is he capable of anything? Holmes, uh, when did you first suspect the Dixon? From the beginning. The letter of warning had to be written either by James or his wife. They were the only two who'd benefit by the death of Lord Buckinghurst. They were the only two who knew him well enough to know the effect the letter would be bound to have on him. You mean he'd attend the ceremony come hell or high water? Exactly. James didn't duck when the bagpipes burst into that violent squalling. Claire, however, screamed to warn him. Hence, she was the guilty party. QED. Here comes a four-wheeler. Yes, it's turning down this alleyway. Down behind these barrels, Watson. It stopped in front of Bogard's shop. I see she's... She's not getting out. No. She's seen Andre's shadow on the blind. Yes, she's lowering the cab window. A woman's hand comes out of the window. It's holding a revolver. Very well, Lestrade, you have your proof. You may come down from the driver's seat and arrest the lady. You... Sherlock Holmes. Yes, better you use handcuffs on her, Lestrade. By the way, madam, this should teach you. Never, when on a secret mission, never take the first cab that presents itself. Never know who the coachman is. Oh, and uh, thank you so much for your display of marksmanship. I think it'll persuade Andre to tell us all we wish to know. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I never miss. It is too late for Andre to tell anyone anything. I'm so sorry to disillusion you, but it was, wasn't Andre's head your bullet hit. What? Merely a cleverly arranged silhouette of the man. I cut it out of cardboard myself only an hour ago. Oh. You see, Lady Claire, I have artistic blood in my veins. Or didn't you know? You... I think you are the devil himself. No, madam, only his second cousin. <laughs> All right, Lestrade, you may take her away. Well, that was a touch-and-go adventure, Dr. Watson, just as you promised. But tell me, what did Holmes put in the Duke of Buckinghurst scotch? Something out of my medical kit, I'm afraid. Something called Epicac. It's a well-known emetic. You see, Holmes had to be sure the Duke of Buckinghurst would not be able to perform his part of the ceremony. Oh, I see. And now, Dr. Watson, what's the theme of next week's story? Next week, I'm going to take you back to Hurlstone, Mr. Harris. Hurlstone? Wasn't that the ancient manor house that was the scene of the Musgrave ritual? Right. Next week's story is a different one, however. It concerns a gruesome family ghost story told by Reginald Musgrave's newly acquired wife and how Mr. Plunkett, the Pickle King, insisted on sleeping in the room where Charles I had slept and how the ghost story was reenacted with more accuracy than anyone had believed possible. The makers of Clippercraft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Ockram, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the sanguinary Spectre. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer. And he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. This is Cy Harris.
speaking to Clipper Craft Co. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations, a mutual broadcasting system. Be sure to hear Melvin Elliott reporting the latest headline news, which follows in just a moment. Fly Eastern Airlines' new type constellation with 300 million passenger miles of dependability. Fly Eastern Airlines. Remember, there's no finer way to travel. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? Yeah, he's right here. Who's this? Archie, hang up. Don't ask questions. You, uh, you have a wife? Archie, it's past your bedtime. Well, I'm afraid, Mr. Wolf, uh, it's past his bedtime. Your bedtime. It's a client, boss. That's what I was afraid of. Fooey. Hello? Hello? Well, why do you look so bewildered? He's coming right over. He says he's got a date. With murder. <laughs> Detective genius who rates the knife and fork, the greatest tools ever invented by man. The ponderous, brilliant, and unpredictable Nero Wolf. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's story, The Case of the Calculated Risk, was as strange and baffling as any Nero Wolf had to deal with. It started late one night when a big-shouldered man sporting a reddish beard and billing himself as Dave Caffrey pushed his way in, walked up to Nero Wolf's desk, and rocked him with this opener. Tomorrow morning, Mr. Wolf, I'm going to kill a man. I beg your pardon, sir? I'm going to kill a man with these two hands. I've been told strange things across this desk, Mr. Caffrey. This is the first time a murderer has confided his intention to me in advance. This man you speak of... I'm not telling you his name. I'm not telling you where I'm going to meet him. This session tomorrow is going to be private and personal. But if anything happens to me between now and then, I want you to take over. Mr. Gaffrey, do you seriously think I could assist you in a matter of private vengeance? That's not what I'm asking. This guy deserves to die. I plan to kill him with these two hands. Me, myself. But if I slip up, if he gets me first, I want you to see that justice is done. But I assure you, sir... I told you this guy deserves to die. Let me tell you why. Years ago, down south, there were three men in business together, partners. Me and two others. Your notebook, Archie, if Mr. Gaffrey doesn't mind. You're wasting your time, Wolf. The names I'll use will be phony. I won't give you anything you can check back on. We'll take our chance, sir. Please proceed. It happened in a town about... 40 miles from the place where we had our business. We'd gone there to collect some money. The three of us. Carl, Mitch, and me. Dave Caffrey. But all we collected was bad news. So bad that Carl hadn't even given our right names at the hotel. Said he was scared some of our creditors had come hitting up on us for what we owed. Three of us had had some drinks, and we'd been pacing around for nearly an hour. I can still remember the way Mitch stood and looked at me. And then up at Carl... When Carl suddenly pulled to a stop and came out with this idea of his. So, Dave, you've got 6,000 cash on hand. You counted it, Mitch. Well, didn't we make it 6240, Carl? Whichever. We've got this 6,000 R, plus some slow accounts receivable against debts of 38,000. With three of us trying to live from the business, we haven't got a chance. Well, we ain't got much of a one, Carl, but. It's hopeless, Dave. With two partners, though. Two partners? You reckon on pulling out, Carl? I say we cut cards for it, Mitch. Low man drops out. Break up the partnership? After sticking together all these oh, years? Oh, wait a minute, Dave. Wait a minute. Maybe Carl's right. Maybe this could work. Carl, you mean the low man drops out clean? Right now? Right now, Mitch. Other two to take over assets and debts and see if they can get this thing back in the black. Okay, Carl. Get the cards out. Dave? Well, that's what you guys want. Okay, then. Here's a new deck. Shuffle them, Mitch. All shuffled. Cut them, Dave. Go ahead, Mitch. You get first pick. Spread them if you like. 
Here goes. Ah, six. Your turn, Dave. Okay. Nine o'clock. Hey, lucky guy, Dave. I put you in uh, whatever car pulls. I'll pull it fast. There she is. Denise. Sorry, Mitch. That leaves you elected. Well, Mitch, I'm sorry, too. I guess we all had a fair whack at it, but... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me see that ace again, Carl. Easy, Mitch. I said I was sorry, Look, but... Dave. Yeah, what is it, Mitch? All the aces are marked. <laughs> Carl, I'm going to cram this dick right down your crooked throat. Oh, Look out, Mitch. He's got a knife. Sure. Oh. Carl, you... All right. I've cut him for keeps. What do we do now? What do we do? Look, Carl, I, I didn't mark those cards. I, I didn't kill Mitch. And what's more... Shut up, I... Dave. We're both in and out now. Come on. Let's get out of here. Now, now what, Carl? Look, Dave. This is where we split up. Two men together, easy to trace. You head one way, I go the other. Yeah, but the door, I... I got no money. Here, I'll split up the 6000 This is your hair. Here, stick the envelope in your pocket. Now, grab that tray. Get set. I'll catch the next one going the other way. Get going, Dave! And that's how it was, Mr. Wolf. It all happened so fast that I... Mm, this man you call Carl... <laughs> He would seem to be one of the world's choice creatures, Mr. Geoffrey. When I thought to look in that envelope he gave me, I found $40 and a few folds of wrapping paper in it. I was mad enough to... Well, I got off the freight and intended to go back, but... Then I picked up a paper. And read all about the murder of your friend Mitch with the statement that Carl had accused you of the crime and that the police believed him in view of your escape. That's it. Classical, but not at all original. Well, I was young then and stupid. I'd had those drinks to start with. And you spent the intervening years hunting down the man Carl, am I correct? Yeah. I tramped the country from east to west, from north to south. Tramped it for years, searching for him. And yesterday, I located him. He's a big wheel these days up on that 37th floor of his. But tomorrow, when I get... Yes, Mr. Caffrey, the 37th floor of... Never mind what building. Now, wait a minute, Caffrey. If you expect Mr. Wolf to help you... I you... don't want him to help me. I'll help myself. But if I slip off, I know Wolf's reputation well enough to know that he'll never rest till this, this rotten, chiseling murderer is sitting in the chair. That's why I've come here. Just to provide a backstop in case my dear friend of long ago manages to get the best of me. How will we know? You see this envelope? Read what it says. Near old Wolf, 601 West 35th Street, New York. Delivered to him in case of my death. That's right. And this envelope was $500. Nearly all I've got in the world. Along with it, the full details on that knife. Real names, dates. The proof you'll need in case I don't finish it up. Go on. Tonight, Mr. Wolf, I'm going to give this envelope to the manager of the hotel where I'm stopping. I'm calling on, well, Carl. Tomorrow at noon, right after his secretary goes to lunch. If I'm not back in my hotel at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the hotel manager will deliver this envelope to you. Is that clear? Perfectly. But you don't think I'm going to allow you to go through with this wire plan, do you? You can't stop me. And don't have Goodwin follow me. I'd lose him in two blocks. Good night. Shall I try to tail him, boss? It's no use, Archie. Get Inspector Kramer on the phone at once. I want the police to help us head off this murder. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie, I'm calling from the morgue. And? They found Caffrey's body in a subway washroom, mugged and stabbed. Wallet gone, pockets cleaned out, no envelope. Just two hours ago, he was here. No envelope, eh? Gone. Witnesses? None so far. Homicide's calling it straight mugging and robbery. As it well might look, except for... Except for a guy named Carl. How much do I tell Kramer? All of it. I see inspector to start queries throughout the South on the original killing. The original killing? Look. It's our best chance of getting a description of the man called Carr. The original killing and the partnership. Starting from, say, eight years ago and working back to the middle twenties. Tell him to concentrate on towns and railway lines. Putting out pictures of Caffrey and... Pictures and dentistry. Fingerprints to Washington. Kramer will know. And if I come across a haystack, do I keep my eye out for needles? We are going to find Carl, Archie. 
We're going to find him if it takes him now till doomsday. Mr. Wolf, let's face it, we're licked. Licked, Archie? Three days now. We found Caffrey's hotel here in New York. No traceable phone calls. Not a witness has turned up on that subway washroom party. And Kramer says he's getting nowhere with those answers from the Southland. The original story is bound to come slowly, Archie. We are asking a check on the unsolved killings of a dozen states over a 20-year period. Mm. And what now? You start trudging, Archie. Trudging? Through office buildings, through 37 floors of many office buildings. You keep trudging till we find him. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. This is a big city, remember? I might have to go through hundreds of buildings. This morning, Archie, the municipal reference library informed me that there are exactly 34 buildings of 37 floors or higher in Manhattan. Now, when you rule out the United Nations building, hotels Okay, and... okay. Maybe not so many 37 floors, but lots of offices per floor. Maybe 40 or 50. Call it 30 times 40 and you've still got uh, uh, 1,200 to start with. And you don't know what kind of business, you don't know what Carl's real name is, you don't even know what he looks like. There could be 4,000 men like him. 4,000 affluent men, Archie? Yeah, well, all right. (laughs) Caffrey said he was in the chips, though. You know, for a guy who'd been bumming around, that could mean anything from 10 grand a year up. Say, wait a minute, that cuts your field to 1,000. 1,000 tall men? Tall? I've been over those notes. Caffrey didn't say he was tall. As plainly as you could ask. Caffrey was almost your height, but he said Mitch stood and looked at me. And then he looked up at Carl. Up, Archie. That makes Carl your height or taller. Yeah. Well, maybe Caffrey and Mitch were sitting down, and Carl was, uh... Caffrey told us the three were standing at the time. Check your notes. I've studied them. Okay. Maybe that does cut it down some. Yeah, it's still a lot of citizens that start checking for a southern accent. Don't rely on accent, Archie. Carl has had many years to lose any accent he might have had. Yeah, that's true. And so we narrow it, Archie. A man almost surely tall. A man not using the name he was born with. A man with an unexplained gap in his past. I ought to be able to reach right out and tap him. You go skeptical again, Archie? Well, it's still a pretty big haystack. Let's see if we can't trim it some more. On these building lists I've been going over, I've ruled out for now the members of professions requiring lengthy formal training. Medical men, lawyers, scientists of most kinds. Yeah, that's chopping it down. I'll admit that. I'll have further eliminations as we get into it. And I'm putting soil pans on a second list this afternoon. Some of the credit references I'll handle by phone. So I start trudging, huh? You start trudging. And remember, Archie, since you'll probably be operating through secretaries, you're looking for a murderer named Carl, not for a new set of telephone numbers to brighten your winter. Tall? I don't know what you're peddling, Goodwin, but if my boss put his elevator shoes on and stood on a box... He'd still be down somewhere around my necktie. If he stood on his money, though, <laughs> we'd need a helicopter to get up near his shoelaces. Oh, Miss Tunis, do you mind if I sit down? Why, of course not, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, thanks. You know, I've been in 12 offices on this floor, and you're the first girl who's seen the importance of this survey first crack out of the box. <laughs> Well, I'm sort of new here, and, and I try to pay attention. Oh, when... you're not just beautiful. You've got a head on you. Is Mr. McLean in? Well, he's at lunch right now. Lunch? But... Oh, that reminds me. Know any good restaurants up this way? Well, I was just going to the downstairs drugstore myself, but I wouldn't say Well, that... come on. Put your bonnet on and let's skip the drugstore. <laughs> this meal is on the Executive Resources Survey. <laughs> Yeah, boss, the boil down. Tinsley, McLean, Fernandes, Tessero, and Cabrin. All five of them tall, all five a little misty in the background. You and Sorrel have done well, Archie. Very well. But I'm crossing off Fernandes and Kaplan. Why? The Credit Bureau report clears Fernandes, and Kaplan was on a special war job. The FBI x rayed his record twice. Leaving J.P. Tinsley, Carson McLean, and Philip Tesro, huh? 
I'd like to see all three here, Archie. Get them here one way or another. And so you do admit that Tinsley isn't your real name? Mr. Wolf, are you a blackmailer or what? I'm a licensed private investigator, sir. Any disclosure you make will be kept in confidence, provided it doesn't touch on the case I'm engaged on. You haven't said what the case is. I don't intend to. If you prefer to explain this mysterious gap in your background at the district attorney's office... Well, I'm using the name Tinsley because I've got an undivorced first wife out on the coast. We broke up 20 years ago, but uh, she said she'd see to it that I never married again. And she knew where I was today. Well, I I don't say I'm a saint, but uh, she's a vindictive woman. I see. May I have names, dates, and places starting 1924? I can't quite understand your interest, Mr. Wolf. It's rather complicated, to put it briefly, Mr. McLean. I'm working in the interest of a client. Our people have found this puzzling gap in your background, and I'd appreciate such clarification as you may be able to supply. But I told you, Mr. Goodwin, I was raised and educated in the Orient. Until 32, I was in business with my father in China. Where you say your father died? Died. With the Depression, I returned to New York, started this importing business in a small way, weathered through the early 30s, and I think my bankers can assure you of my standing today. They've done so. Carson, McLean, and company has an excellent credit rating. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. To switch somewhat abruptly, Mr. McLean, would you happen to remember how you spent the evening of the 19th? Of this month? Of this month. Well, I could hardly... Wait. You say the 19th. Would that have been on a Tuesday? Yes, it was Tuesday. Well, that simplifies it. I'm nearly always at the office on Tuesday nights dictating the revisions in our weekly wholesalers' lists. Let me see... Yes, I was there on the 19th. Had a tray sent in. Miss Tunis and I worked till just after midnight. Miss Helen Tunis. The secretary Mr. Goodwin spoke of. She's been with me for two or three months. Miss Tunis can confirm this dictation on the night of the 19th? Of course. And Mr. Wolf, your manner is so persuasive that I'd scarcely realize you're asking some extraordinary searching questions. May I ask why in the world you... If you'll indulge me, Mr. McLean, my... Prying is nearly concluded. You say you were in China until 1932. Mr. Tessero, I'll be brutally frank. We know that your name is not Tessero. And we know that you served a prison term from 34 to 38 for arson. I'd like some straight answers. I didn't say I wouldn't answer your questions. The past can remain your own provided... Now look, Mr. Wolfe. I've been going straight for 12 years. And this business of mine is on the level. Now, if this is a shakedown... I'm asking where you were on the night of the 19th. And I'm telling you I stayed in town. I ate alone. And I went to a movie. I caught the 11.35 for Stanford. And that's all there is to it. You're denying that you were ever in business in the South? I was born in the South, but I haven't been back there since I was a kid. What about the arson? I put in four years squaring for that mistake. Let's start again, Mr. Tessero. You say you were in Cincinnati in 1931. Okay, Mr. Wolf, three candidates and we're still on the one-yard line. Our one-yard line. Tessero McLean Tinsley. No, no, rule out McLean. He gave references enough for those years in China. And with Helen Tunis, he's got the one firm alibi we've laid on to. Caffrey was killed before midnight. With conditions as they are in the Far East, Archie... It would be weeks before cables came back on McLean's claims. Uh, claims? You figure the whole Chinese background's a fake? I want you to see Miss Tunis again, Archie. Taking all precautions for her safety. And this is one time I give you permission to ply her with all the attentions you can contrive. <laughs> Are we far enough to pull tails on any of these three? I've got sore pans on, Tessro. And Saul promised to have men on Tinsley and McLean. Pictures of the three have gone to Kramer for circulation in the south. Oh, no answer yet from the coast on Tinsley, huh? Not yet. For the moment, Archie, you'll concentrate on Helen Tunis. (laughs) 
Helen, I've got to see you tonight. I'd love to, Archie, Now, look, but... Helen, I phoned you to come out in the corridor this way because I didn't want McLean to know we're talking. Do you still say you got that new mink coat on your own money? Mr. Goodwin, I don't know what right you Helen, have Helen, if you to... get five guys to buy your stuff, it's your business, Mr. But... McLean said his wife might be sending detectives around. Well, you can go right back to your old Mrs. McLean and tell easy, her that I... Easy, Helen, easy. He was dictating to me. You know, baby, the harder you lie, the prettier you look. But if this is a fake alibi, and if you keep propping it up, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Bad trouble. Now, how about it? Do I see you at your apartment tonight, or would you rather come down with me to Nero Wolf's right now? Archie, I... All right. I can't go with you now, and I've got a dinner date with my aunt tonight that I can't break, but... I'll try to be back at my apartment by 11. <laughs> Archie. Yeah. Nero Wolf speaking. This is Archie, Mr. Wolf. I'm at Helen Jonas's apartment. Well? I could cut my throat for not making her come with me this afternoon. Trouble? Not for her anymore, poor kid. I got here three minutes ago and found her strangled. Couldn't have happened more than half an hour ago. McLean. McLean. Didn't Saul Panzer say he was getting a tail on him? He was a new man and he lost him. I should have left you on McLean, Archie. Yeah, we were both wrong. What do you want me to do? Form the police immediately. Well, this is 32nd Street. I'm only three blocks in a job from the office. What if I come back and call from there? Come back then. I'll phone Kramer myself. Mr. Wolf, I'm still kicking myself for that. Look out, Archie. Too late, Mr. Wolf. Keep coming right in, Goodwin. With your hands up. No, I wouldn't try that. McLean. And keep your hand out of that desk drawer, Wolf. This time, you're too late, McLean. My hand's in the drawer, and I think I'll leave it there. You don't think I'd shoot? I'm sure you would. But you've got two of us to cover now. No, Archie, don't try to draw yet. How'd you get in here, McLean? He surprised me after making his way in through the area way below, and of course, it had to be Fritz's night out. I caught your fat friend just two seconds before he could get in his call to the police, Goodwin. I overheard his talk with you from the hallway here. My apologies for not crying out sooner, Archie. Get your hand out of that drawer. Pull it out without the gun, Wolf, or I'll let you have it now. I refuse to, McLean. Seems obvious that you mean to kill us in any case. I'm afraid that's true, Wolf. But when you called me here and Goodwin started making dates with Helen Tunis... Poor kid, I told her not to talk to you. He didn't, Goodwin. I've been scared of you and Wolf since I followed Colby here that first night. Colby? You knew him as Caffrey. I caught up with him afterward in that subway washroom. No, keep that hand up and watch that gun of yours, Wolf. When I found that envelope on him and read the letter to you contained in it, I knew he hadn't spilled the whole South Carolina story to you. South Carolina? Would the original knifing have been taking place anywhere near Hampton or Jasper Counties? Hampton County. But our business is over the line in Georgia. It doesn't matter now. Uh, pity, Archie, we learned this afternoon that we were growing warm on South Carolina. Mr. McLean, may I ask what you hope to achieve by this insane project of disposing of Mr. Goodwin and myself? I'm buying time, Wolf. I've 90,000 in small bills in that bag there, plus a plane ticket to Buenos Aires. I've got a silencer on this gun. If you two aren't found till tomorrow morning... I'll be out of the country before they start looking for me. You don't think the police will put out an alarm for you when they find the body of Helen Tunis? Goodwin left it to you to report that, remember? Let's remind ourselves to be prompter on reporting death, Sachi. Starting with our own, Mr. Wolf. Glad you can take it that way, Goodwin. You actually think you can knock the two of us off? I'm about to find out, Goodwin. One moment, McLean. You've never been a real gambler. You know that. With marked cards, of course. But you're not the man to face a sure loss now. A sure loss? The loss of your life within seconds after you try to pull that trigger. I told you I had a silencer. You think anyone will hear the shots? There will be more shots than you count on. My hand's on a pistol now in this drawer, and Mr. Goodwin has a thirty-eight in his shoulder holster. You can't shoot through the desk. And Goodwin won't get a chance to draw. You're an intelligent man, McLean. Vicious, but intelligent. May I describe the certainty of your immediate death if you don't throw that pistol on the desk and give yourself up? There are two of you, I know that, but... McLean, you must be aware that in the actual fact, exceedingly few men are killed instantly by a single shot, even from a pistol of heavy caliber. 
The one you hold is a 32. And it's a 45 in that drawer, McLean. I assure you, McLean, that neither of us will surrender the weapons we have. Should you start shooting, we'll both do our best to draw and keep firing till you're dead. You're stalling, Wolf. What have I got to lose by trying for you both now? Your life? I'll correct that. The loss of some six or eight weeks of your life, possibly months. Whatever the time necessary to bring you to trial and to convict you and execute you for the murders you've committed. Suppose I cancel you out and then take my chances with Goodwin. A better choice, but still a dubious one. I'm fat, exceedingly fat. And for perhaps the first time in my life, I'm thoroughly grateful for that. My bulk affects the calculation, McLean. McLean, you could pull off all seven shots and still not hit Mr. Wolf where it counts. You have to start, you better start on me. You exaggerate, Archie, and I thank you for the gallantry of it. No, it's quite likely that with two or three shots, McLean might well dispose of me, but not uh, with your first shot, McLean, and we'll not permit you many more than your first. Look, if I promise to do no more than tie you two up to give me my head start, will you toss in your guns? Of course not. Do I speak for us both, Archie? Check. I say let's start it now. Wolf, if I give you half of what's in that bag, would you forget these admissions I've made and help on my defense? I've told you I refuse to bargain. I think that I should count five. If your weapon hasn't been tossed on the desk by then, I'll do my best to get my pistol into action. How are you in the court, Archie? Start counting. Wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. One. If I trade half that bag for no shooting and one hour's start, no tying up, just your promise that... Two. All the bag for a half hour start, 90,000. Three. Are you ready, Archie? All set, sir. Uh, except if you're the one who walks out of this, call up every number in my little red book, huh? And tell each girl I was thinking of her just before you got the five. Agreed. I resume four. Okay. You win. Holy sweet Susan, it worked, it worked. A commendable choice, McLean, for us at least. You see, I'm afraid I forgot to mention one slight factor which might have operated in your favor. What's that, boss? I must confess, Archie, that my forty-five is in the upstairs den where I took it to oil it last night. Holy cow, you didn't have a gun? Why, you dirty... Take it easy, I... McLean. I've really got one. Oh, by the way, Mr. Wolf, <laughs> signals off on those women, huh? When my heart gets back down out of my throat, I'll call them myself. I'll trouble you for a beer first, Archie. And then if you'll be good enough to phone Inspector Kramer, you can bid him pick up his triple murderer. The one-time cutter of cards. Fortunately for us, who's never been a real gambler. <laughs> ah, you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin and Lorraine Carter, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, Herb Butterfield, and Vic Rodman. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Phantom Fingers. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.
Good shot, Markham. Perfect score for you so far. All it's gotten me in this skeet shooting contest with you, Vance, is a tie. That shows you what a tough man you ought to beat. Testimony disregarded as having no basis in fact. <laughs> as district attorney, you should know better than to make statements <laughs> like that. Kindly <laughs> refrain from prompting this witness, Vance. <laughs> Your shot, you know. So it is. Well, the rules allow me to load only two shells in this gun of mine. The shells are in. I'll see what I can do with two birds. Ready? Ready? Two for two. Well, you certainly give me something to shoot at, Vance. Tell me, is there anything you can't do? Yes, I can't tell when you'll invite me in on a murder case. All I know is it won't be this afternoon, inasmuch as there was no case in your office when we took this holiday, and there are no telephones out here on the skeet field. I know that disappoints you, but I'll try to make a contest out of this skeet match to make up for it. My turn. Try for two. Ready? Ready? Uh-oh. Well, that puts you one up on me, Vance. Vance! Over! Well, well, well. Do you hear what I do, Markham? <laughs> the clarion cry of a female. The voice of your secretary, Ellen Deering, unless I'm very much mistaken. What could she want out here? I don't know. All I can do is hope. Vance! Over here, Ellen! You mean you hope an interesting case came into your office while we were out here? Mm -hmm. A case interesting enough to get your secretary to come after you? You didn't miss with that shot, my friend. We'll know Ellen's mission in a moment now. Here Dad. She is. Oh, hello, Mark. Hello, Ellen. Woo! What a hike. <laughs> Isn't there some way they could have put this skeet field nearer the road? I wasn't meant for walking, I can tell you that. Well, I'll see what I can do about having a pair of wings made for you, Ellen. So I could fly over here and have somebody shoot me down? Oh, <laughs> fine thing. You'd still be flying if I was the one with the gun. <laughs> well, Miss Deering, if you've recovered your breath and your bearings, perhaps I'm you... okay now. Markham, I really came out to see you. Oh? Your office called to see if you were with Vance, and I volunteered to come out here and bring you the message. Which was? Which was that a woman named Edith Allen has been murdered in her apartment. Uh-huh. There's no apparent motive. She was happily married, her husband has a perfect alibi, and nothing in the apartment has been touched. Well, at least Vance was wrong about one thing. He was certain we wouldn't be called in on a murder case while we were out here. A murder without motive. Well, that's the most fascinating kind to solve, Markham. The most difficult, you mean. Well, looks like we go to work, Vance. Fun's over for today. On the contrary, Markham. Apparently, it's just beginning. <laughs> exemplary life and was respected by everyone in her community. Police are baffled by the lack of motive. Mrs. Allen was found by a maid lying on the floor near the piano in the Allen living room, strangled. With no motive and no clues, the police face one of the most baffling crimes in years. Homicide Department Sergeant Heath admitted to the Chronicle representative today. Good story, Joe. Nicely handled. Right to head for it yourself and give yourself a byline. Okay, Chief. Unknown assailant Look, strangles Mrs. J.C.L. For heaven's sake. I have Bye, to go there. I got to get out of the <laughs> Vance and I want to be alone in the murder room, Heath. Keep everybody out for a while, please. Okay. Well, well Markham, it looks as if first reports were correct. There's nothing in this room that even remotely resembles a lead to Mrs. Allen's killer. From the position of the body, I think she was playing this piano when her murderer came into the room and strangled her. She fell from the piano bench to the floor. That's probably true, but doesn't help us at all. Oh, this is the song she was playing, Blue Penny. It's that new hit they keep doing on the radio. Isn't that a rather unusual title page, Markham? Not too... Picture of a girl who's apparently the penny in the title, a flowing blue summer dress, the names of the writers and the publisher. What's unusual about it? I'm not sure, but a little of the blue ink just came off on my thumb. I've handled a lot of sheet music. That never happened before. Vance, we're working on a murder. I know, but this blue ink that came off on my thumb may supply the color in this case. <laughs> Songs as good as Blue Penny? Yeah, yeah, it is. Huh. Another hit like that, and I'm gonna go broke. 
Okay, I'll listen. Go ahead, play it. Yeah? Mr. Morris, there's a man named Philo Vance here to see you. Philo Vance? Tell him to come in. Bye, Danny. I'll hear the rest of that song later. I got a visitor. Okay. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought... It's all right, it's all right. Come in, Vance. This guy was just leaving. So long, Danny. So long. Well, Vance, what can I do for you? You write a song or something? No, Mr. Morris. I want to talk to you about your Blue Penny number. <laughs> now I know why you're here. It's a crime the way that song's getting plugs and ain't selling. You want to investigate the crime, huh? Not exactly. Mr. Morris, when do you print a song you publish? When? Well, we take it from the writers. We give an order to our printer saying how many copies we think we'll need. And they print it. We work on the song for a couple of weeks. And it generally starts to sell. Only not Blue Penny. Blue Penny, we printed up to 50,000 copies when we took it. We still got half of them. Is that so? I thought it was a big hit. You thought. Everybody thought. Only it's just one of those things get plugged, but nobody buys it. Who prints your music? Acme. There's only three firms in the city that print music. I'll write the names and addresses down for you. Uh, what's it all about, Vance? It's about the murder of Mrs. J.C. Allen. You've read about it in the papers. Hmm. They say there was no motive for her death. I'm inclined to believe there was. A motive I not only know, but after I make my next stop, I think I can prove. That's a pretty sound those printing presses make, ain't it, Ears? Pretty, Eddie. Beautiful. Ears, tell me how much of a genius I am. I like to hear it. Of course you got a beautiful head. <laughs> beautiful. How you ever figure this out, I don't know. Neither will anybody else. How we can be making all this dough on something that sells for only a quarter or 30 cents? I don't know either. But it's beautiful money. Beautiful. Here's listen. Yeah? A guy publishes a song. It costs him money to print. Uh-huh. Money to plug. Yeah? Money for royalties. Well? He makes a hit out of it, right? Right. All right. I got a printing plant. I publish the same song. The publisher has all the expenses. I get all the profits. It costs me two cents to print. I get 18 from the dealer. 16 cents profit. On a million copy song like Blue Penny? Figure it out. (laughs) Too much for me, but I'll take my... Come on in. I'm Philo Vance. Which one of you is Ed Stevens? That's me. What's with you, Vance? I've been told there were only three firms in this city that were equipped to do music printing. I've already seen the other two companies. You mind if I look at your shop? What for? I have an idea about the murder of Mrs. J.C. Allen. Now, may I see your machines? Well, Vance, at any other time, I'd be glad to let you inside. This afternoon, maybe, if you come back. But uh, right now, we're running some uh, special stuff for a guy who asks that we keep everything very much on the QT. It's an announcement of some new product, and he doesn't want any word of it to get out. Now, that's understandable, isn't it, Vance? Of course. Thank you, Stevens. I'll be back later in the day. Goodbye. So long, Vance. Boss, you handle that beautiful. Beautiful. Only Vance will be back later. We'll have those copies of Blue Penny off the presses by then. I don't like the idea of Vance finding us. Maybe I ought to take care of him. Like you did, Mrs. Allen? Yeah. Nothing doing is. We'll take care of Vance, all right. Only it'll be in a way he's never been taken care of before. Philo Vance speaking. Vance, this is Marie Dale, Wentworth Apartments. You don't know me, but please come over here quickly. I've got to see you. What's the trouble, Miss Dale? Hurry, Vance. You've got to get here before he does, because if you don't, I'll be dead. Yes, what happened, Miss Dale? He was here. Vance bent down. Look. Look at my neck. His fingers. Vance, he was going to kill me. Now, take it easy, Miss Dale. The police are on their way here. I called them after you called me. Who was it? I, I don't know. Someone phoned me and said he was the man who strangled Mrs. Allen. He was going to do the same thing to me. I read your name in the newspapers. Knew you were working on that case, and I phoned you. You sound better now, Miss Dale. I'm sorry I didn't get here in time. Oh, I'm sorry, too. 
I'm all right now, Vance. And I'll be fine when the police get here. Thanks for coming. No trouble, Miss Dale. I'm very close to the man responsible for Mrs. Allen's death. Oh? I have an appointment at a printing plant in an hour. And I have an idea I'll wind up three things at that time. I'll find the individuals responsible for killing Mrs. Allen, the man who choked you, and I'll break up a very unusual racket. Well, come right in, Vance. Sit down. Thank you. You're a man of your word. Said you'd be back this afternoon, and here you are. You said when I did get back, I could take a look at your printing presses, Mr. Stevens, remember? Sure, sure. Perfectly all right. I'd, uh, I'd like you to see something else first, though, Vance. What? This, uh, this photograph. It's a print, and it's still wet, but, uh, you won't have any trouble recognizing the people in it. Well, let me see it. Oh. So there was a photographer in Miss Dale's apartment when I bent down to examine her neck. Yes. Looks like you're making love to her, doesn't it? Not that uh, that wouldn't be bad, only uh, her name isn't Dale Vance. It's Williams. Marie Williams, and she just got out of jail last week. I'm beginning to see what this is all about. I'm going to... Now, Vance, that won't do you any good. Oh, but it'll make me feel better. I guarantee that. Uh. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Vance. Slugging me won't help you any. I don't want anything from you. Just leave town for two weeks, that's all. Two weeks. When you come back, I hand you the negative of this picture, and nobody will know you ever made love to a gal just out of jail. So that's the story, eh? Look, you can go through this plant with a microscope, and you won't find any evidence that we've been printing somebody else's music on our own. I don't know how you figured our racket, but there isn't a thing in this shop to prove what you think now. There was this morning when I was here, though. So? Look, Vance... You leaving town, or do I make a million copies of this picture and flood the town with them? Philo Vance, leading crime fighter in the city, and his girlfriend just released from jail after serving seven years for manslaughter. Well? Hmm. May I use your phone? Wait a minute, Vance. Calling the cops would be stupid. You've actually got nothing on me, not a thing. And if I go to the coop, I've got a friend who releases these pictures. I wasn't going to call the police, Stevens. I merely wanted to call the airport and find out what time the next plane leaves. This is District Attorney Markham. We're working on a case that started with the strangling of a Mrs. Allen, wife of a newspaper man. In some way, her death is linked with a piece of sheet music, a connection that Philo Vance knows but hasn't told me. Vance hasn't been heard from for several hours, and I can't understand why he hasn't been in touch with me. However, Ellen Deering, Vance's secretary, did call, and apparently Vance had left a note for her asking her to see Mrs. Allen's husband, J.C. Allen, a rewrite man on the Chronicle. Ellen should be with him now because it is several hours. Look, Mr. Allen, Vance left a message for me to see you. You've got to help me. How? Don't you think I want to find the man who killed my wife? What can I do to help you? Just one thing. Your wife played piano, didn't she? Yeah, sure, of course she played. Where did she buy her music? That's one question Vance wants answered. Where? Yes. Little shop around the corner from our house. Cut-rate music shop run by a man named Baker. What difference does it make? All the difference in the world, according to Vance. You see, his note said he knew who killed your wife. He knew why she was killed. But there's only one way of proving it. That cut-rate dealer is the one way a murderer can be made to face the music. And I'll see him after I see a certain young lady. Coming! Coming! Yes? Um, are you Marie Dale? What do you want? I want in. My name is Deering. I'm Philo Vance's secretary. Vance? Who's he? Now, don't give me that. Uh, look, I found your name and address on Vance's pad. I know he was up here to see you. And, um, I want to know where he is now. I haven't the slightest idea. Goodbye, Miss Deering. Oh, no, you don't. When I leave here, it'll be because I want to go. Take your hand off my arm. Miss Deering, you don't want anything in here. Why don't you try the lost and found apartment if your boss is missing? You're going to be missing something if you don't start talking. A couple of teeth, for instance. Ah, ha, ha. Tough, <laughs> aren't you? 
Well, we'll see how tough your hair is. Ow! Oh, you little devil, if you want to play like that, I'll play with Ooh. you. My arm! Stop! You're breaking you it! You let go of my hair! You stop twisting my arm! I, I, I'll tell you all you want to know. Well, go ahead. Start talking before I start twisting. Vance came here to see me. Hmm. I don't know why. I told him there wasn't anything I could do or say to help him, and, and he left. I don't know where he went. Big help you are. Oh. There. There's oh. your arm back. You... You've hurt me. Oh. Well, I've wasted enough time up here. I thought you might know where my boss is, but apparently you're not going to help me find him. So I'll just go follow his instructions. Next stop, music shop. Best-selling piano record on the market. She don't like it. Okay, lady, off it goes. By the way, lady, what happened to your cheek? Oh, I got caught on a couple of nails. Mr. Baker, tell me, who sells your sheet music? A lot of people. Sometimes I buy from Jarvis. Sometimes I buy direct from publishers. Sometimes from independent salesmen. Who sold you your copies of Blue Penny? Blue Penny? Yes. A um, fellow named Ears Mackley. So you know something funny? Uh, right now, I'm not looking for laughs. Uh, where do I find this Mackley? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You know this Mrs. Allen who was killed? I should know her. Her death is the reason I'm here. What about her? Well, she asked me the same question you did the morning she was killed. I gave her the same answer. Why didn't you tell that to the police? What for? It didn't sound important. Besides, nobody asked me. Well, that sounds reasonable. Uh, where do you reach this uh, Mackley who sold you the Blue Penny song copies? All I got for him is a phone number. You want it? I'll say I want it. That phone number means that Ears Mackley's number is up. This is the printing place, Markham. Mm. When I called the phone company, I asked them for the address of the phone number I got from Mr. Baker. This is the place they gave me. Well, let's go in. Somehow I wish that Vance were here. No word from him? Nope. That's why I called you. Well, take a deep breath, Ellen, old girl. Here we go. Well, what do you two want? Hey, Eddie, the guy's the district attorney. That's Mark. That's right. This is Miss Jeering. I want to see you as Mackley. What about it? You, Mackley? My name is Stevens. What do you want with Mackley? Awful tough, isn't he, Markham? Maybe I ought to soften him up. Sometimes I'm a little unhappy with my official position, Ellen. Look, Stevens, here's Mackley as a direct lead to the killer of Mrs. J.C. Allen. We want him, and we know we can find him here. Is this Mackley? A beautiful guest, the A. Beautiful. Okay, Mackley, you're coming with us. He isn't going anywhere, but you two are. Markham, he's got a gun. He'll never get a chance to use it. Ow! Shut that dame up. You shut her up. I'll handle this guy. Ah! Cut. Cut her, Eddie. Get this gun butt down on this guy's head. Hey. You did it, Eddie. You did it. Uh, take this dame off my hands. She's kicking my ankles off. I'll take care of her, then we'll wait until dark and take care of both of them permanently. Pretty good actress I am, don't you think, Eddie? Shut up, will you, Marie? I gotta think. Well, I'm still a pretty good actress. I got Philo Vance here to my apartment so you could snap his picture and run him out of town with it, and I fooled his secretary. Didn't I? Yeah, yeah, you handled that good. Now, will you be quiet? I got the <sighs> district attorney and Vance's secretary tied up in my printing joint. But... I gotta find a way to get rid of him by tonight. You're gonna kill the district attorney? You're out of your head. How many times do I have to tell you to shut up? This is important. I can't have them alive. They know I've been duplicating sheet music copies. Now, how they know, I'll never know. They know Ears killed that Mrs. Allen, too. But why did he kill her? Why? Yeah. What else could he do? She came down to the shop. We found out her husband was a newspaper man and that she traced us through a phony copy to Blue Penny song. What did you expect Ears to do? Let her live? So she could feed the story to her old man? Now, look, Eddie, I, I took one rap for a killing. I'm not going to be mixed up in another one. Especially if it's the DA that's going to be bumped. Include me out. I only signed up for that picture stunt to frame Vance. No murder for Marie. No, thank you. You think I'll leave you alive if you don't come in with us on this? Well, sure, you know I won't talk. Yeah, sure I know it. 
I'm making sure of it right now. Eddie, Eddie, you will. (laughs) Another few seconds and it'll all be over. You said no murder for Marie, huh? How wrong you were, honey. How wrong you were. Markham. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, Ellen. I'm all right now. Mm, my head feels like a pumpkin. What about mine? I got slugged, too, right after they knocked you out. Mm. But we're still in that printing joint, I know that much. Yes. It's getting dark out. Oh, I wish I'd left word where we were bound for. Nobody knows we're here, Ellen. And nobody knows how tight these ropes are around my hands and feet. I'm tied up to a printing press, I think. I think I'm pretty well anchored here myself. I wish I had the explanation for all this. It's very simple. Or at least it's simple to Vance, wherever he is. I know where I wish he was, right here. Shh. What? The door just opened outside. It's Vance. He's come down to find us. Oh. Vance. Vance. In here. (laughs) Beautiful voice he's got, right, Eddie? Beauty. It's those two characters, Ellen, Stevens and Mackley. That's right. Who did you expect, your friend Vance? Let's not say expect. Let's say hope. Good word. Lady, you're soon going to join Mrs. Allen and an ex-girlfriend of mine in another world. You kill them? Why? Don't take all the credit, Eddie. I knocked off Mrs. Allen. Yeah, you did, Is, And very nicely. You mean beautifully. Have it your way. Mark him. About your friend Vance, he'll be gone for a couple of weeks. And the way things are going, by the time he gets back, we'll be out of this country. Okay, is Slug the dame again, and we'll cart him out of here. Well, okay. I'll take care of the deal. You just untie me, you and I'll... keep away from me, you ghoul. Watch what? this, Eddie. I'll show you an artistic way of knocking a dame on the I... noggin. Watch. I don't... Vance! Vance! Vance, where did you come from? You should be more concerned about where you're going. Slug him, Vance. Slug the bum. Ellen, Get remember, him. you're a lady. Slug the bum, Vance. Really let him have it. I'm trying to... Bring top you so right. I'm going to... Oh. Thanks. Well, that last smack was a dilly. A beaut. Whew, I'm glad you're not angry with me. Not at all, Ellen. While I'm getting you out of these ropes, I'll tell you I'm very pleased with you. You did exactly what I wanted you to do while I pretended to be out of town. What was that all about, Vance? I'll explain that some other time, Markham. And also how I figured out the racket Eddie Stevens was in. Like to hear it? I sure would. As soon as I get out of these ropes... Yeah. yeah. Ellen's free now. Markham, you're next. Sounds like a barbershop. It should. You and I, Ellen, really had a close shave. Ready? Don't you ever miss Vance? Of course I do, once in a while. Your turn, Markham. Hey, wait a minute. What about me? Uh, I'd like a shot at one of those clay pigeons. Use my gun, Ellen. Thanks. Okay. Ready? Oh, well. Here's your gun back, Vance. Not very good. Doesn't shoot where I aim. Well, it doesn't. Vance, I think I've waited long enough. Will you please tell me what the lead was in the Blue Penny murder case? Of course, Markham. It was very simple. The ink wasn't dry on the title page of that song we found in Mrs. Allen's apartment, right? That's right. Some of it came off on your finger. Well, Markham, if that was a legitimate copy of the song, it would have been printed months ago. Apparently, someone was bootlegging copies of Blue Penny. But who? Always a good question. I found out Eddie Stevens' plant could handle music. And when I went there, he wouldn't allow me to inspect the presses. I was sure then that I was on the right track. I pretended to fall for their blackmail photo scheme and had Ellen check the shop where Mrs. Allen bought her music. That led her and you, Stevens, and his friend. And I came out of hiding in time to handle them when they were about to mishandle you. They killed Mrs. Allen because she was on their trail and they knew she'd give her husband the whole story and he'd print it, eh? That was the motive. A little hard to find, but the motive just the same. I heard enough from Stevens while I was tied up to convict him, Vance. So I guess when I put him and ears on trial, that'll be the end of them. Of them and the Blue Penny murder case.
move you. No. No, don't shoot me. Okay, if you do like I say. Yes. Get up that dough. Come on, get it up. Uh, the money in the drawer, I just saw you counting it. Get it up. Well, I have no money. Business has been bad. Business has been great. We've cased this store for a week. Pull open that cash drawer. No, no, I can't. I can't. Okay, so I'll do it. No. I know what you're thinking. I'll be a cinch to describe the cops. Dark, medium height, wearing a mask, a checkered suit, and a gray hat. Oh, I, I wouldn't go to the Oh, cops. yes, you would. Now, back away from this drawer. Yes. Good boy. No money in here, huh? Business is bad, well, huh? Uh, you to... No, 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 don't. I, I'm an old man. You're lucky you live this long. Take this money. And here's a receipt for you. Oh. You're not unconscious. Don't fake it. I don't want you to be out completely. You've got your money now. Now, what do you want? I want you to be able to describe me, and I want you to see this. Look at me. Keep looking at me. Uh, what for? I want you to be able to tell the cops you were held up and robbed at midnight by a guy wearing a checkered suit and a gray hat. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell them this. Where are you? I can't see you. Of course you can't. I've made myself invisible. Tell the cops that. See if they believe you. You're hurt bad. Uh, Here, I'll put my coat under your head and I'll go phone for an ambulance. Here you are. Thank you. What happened to you? Uh, I saw somebody with a gun backing away just now, but all of a sudden he seemed to vanish. Uh, Did he shoot you? I left my house a few minutes ago. Take it easy. Exactly. Midnight. Man in mask. Checkered suit. Man in a checkered suit. Gray hat. Yes. Help me up. Uh, I resisted. He shot me. The police will be interested in that. Uh, I'll call and tell them that just as soon as I call a doctor for you. Uh, thank you. Shouldn't be too hard to find a man in a checkered suit and a gray hat. Uh, Only how are they going to find a man who vanishes? Police department. Oh, police. Come quickly. My name is Martin. Yeah? I've got a store on Main Street. A little while ago, exactly midnight. A man in a mask, a checkered suit, and a gray hat held me up. He, what? He hit me on the head. He... He... Huh? He thought I was unconscious, and then... Then he made me come to, and... And after he hit me, he stood over me a minute, and... And told me to describe him. And then he disappeared into thin air. Wait a minute, wait a minute. A masked man in a checkered suit slugged and robbed you at midnight on Main Street and vanished? Yeah. What's going on? We got two other reports in the last two minutes that a guy answering that description committed two other crimes in two different parts of town all at midnight. Oh, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. All I know is I'm hurt. Please, send someone over here right away. This is serious. Sure, sure, I know, Mr. Morton. It's serious, but it sure sounds awful funny to me. What do you make of it? Three crimes all taking place at midnight in different parts of the city, and all by a man answering the same description. I don't know what to make of it, Markham, except to dismiss it by saying it's impossible, which you answer immediately by saying, I know it's impossible, but it happened. I've left out the most startling bit of information of all, Vance. If you think the three situations are fantastic, I want you to hear a witness to one of the crimes. Wait till you listen to his story. Come with me. Right. I have a policeman guarding him in this store right here, Vance. Just wait till you hear what he has to say. All right, Markham, I'll wait. It will have to be something to be more unusual than three crimes by one man committed at the same time in three different parts of this city. It is. In all my years as a district attorney, I never heard of anything like this. So come in here with me. Hi, D.A. Hello, oh, Mr. Vance. Hello, Collins. Hi. I think our friend Mr. Frank here has calmed down a little, D.A. Yes. Yes, I'm all right now, Mr. Markham, only I... I still say that what I told you actually happened. Well, suppose you tell me, Mr. Frank. I heard shots at midnight, and I started to run toward them. I saw a man on the ground. He'd been hit. I saw a masked man in a checkered suit backing away, his gun in his hand. 
And then while I watched him, he whirled around and became invisible. Invisible? See what I meant, Vance? Completely mm. invisible. I could see him one minute very plainly. A second later, he'd vanished. I, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it happened just that way. Well, perhaps, Mr. Frank, he passed beyond your range of vision. But that's impossible. I could see the drugstore on the corner, and that was 50 yards in back of him. He just vanished into thin air. The same thing happened in the other two crimes, Vance. The thug just vanished. You know, Markham, come to think of it, anybody who can be in three different places at the same time might be able to do a little thing like become invisible. <laughs> About time the boss got here, don't you think, Pete? Yeah, sure. <laughs> What's with you? <laughs> yeah, nothing. Just thought of something funny. Yeah? Can you imagine the look on the cops' kisses when they get a description of you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Medium height, dark hair, wearing checkered suit and gray hat. And then they get the same description of me and the same one of Eddie. That's part of the boss's plan, Pete. Boss is awful smart. I say. Awful smart, awful cool, awful tough, and awful crooked. Yeah. You know, if I had my choice of any four things in the world, those are the four I'd want. Sure, if you had them, what else would you want that you couldn't get awful easy? But you know something? What? One thing I wouldn't want is for the boss to be sore at me. <laughs> I know what you mean. Sometimes I... Well, hello, boss. Hey, boss, everything went smooth tonight. Georgie and Eddie and me did just like you told us. Wore the clothes, made sure the suckers got a good look at us. Uh, I had to shoot a guy, and Georgie here had to knock a guy in a noggin, but what's that? The other boys haven't reported in. None of the rest of my boys is working tonight. You uh, both did very well. Where's the money, the fruits of your activities? The results of my well-formulated planning? Fruits? What fruits? Uh, I got all the loot, Miss Walker. Got it all here, ready for you on a table. Here. Here, look. Mm, I can see it there. And I think you know me well enough by now not to try holding out. And, uh, now, uh, how would you like to hear about our next job? Uh, personally, I'd like. What is it, Miss Walker? Gentlemen, where, besides the bank, is there better than $25,000 in bills of various denominations lying around, waiting for us to pick it up? Search me. That would hardly help us any. <laughs> hey, that's a pretty funny <laughs> joke. Gentlemen, the situation I described is real. I know where there's about $25,000 in cash just waiting for a smart young man in a checkered suit, uh, but carrying a submachine gun this time, to uh, grab it. I'm young. Well, I'm the smart one. Send me, Miss Walker, huh? I'll send you both, and Eddie will be there, too. Wearing his checkered suit. Yeah. <laughs> you might even have a couple of more boys in checkered suits scattered around. In case of a tie. Whatever you say goes, Miss Walker. But where is this 25 grand that's just waiting to be taken? I'll let you know, Pete. When the time comes. And, uh, when the time comes, you go. <laughs> Just listen to the suckers having a wonderful time. Sure, Ted. Just listen to this. This is the money they paid for having that wonderful time. Must be over $20,000 here. Not bad for one night. One nightclub. You better put that money away. It's making me nervous. Let's go into the office. Okay. I'll stick it in the safe in a minute. I kind of like the idea of holding this kind of dough in my hand. It makes me feel important. Now, one of these days, I'm going to have a club of my own. It's great when it shows a profit. But you can lose your shirt if things go bad. I'll take my chances. I'm a little tired of being here night after night, checking the waiters and keeping books. Someday I'm... Okay, you both of you freeze. But... Stick up. That's right. You won't need all these lights in here in case somebody gets nosy and looks in. Yeah. Is he good enough for what I want? And what is that? All the dough in front of you guys. You want to live to report that a masked man in a checkered suit did the sticking up, shove all that money in a bag and make it quick. Ain't that I'm nervous, you understand? Just as this Tommy gun is. Do it, Ted. I'll be darned if I will. I'm going to show this. Silly boy. Are you other guy going to be brave and dead or smart and alive? Work fast before somebody pokes his head in here. I, I'll get you your money. Step on it, Dan. Too bad the customers can't see this act. This would really be a floor show for them. Because as soon as I get that dough, me and the dough are going to disappear right before your eyes. No, I'm 
sorry, Markham. I haven't found out a thing. You read about the murder at that nightclub last night, Vance? Yes, the checkered suit killer again. And he did his vanishing act again, I understand. He's getting a little too cute, Markham. Cute? He's getting ridiculous. There's no known way of arresting a man who can be three places at once and turn invisible at will. There's a reasonably simple explanation for all that, Markham, I'm sure. For instance, there isn't one man involved, but three or possibly four, all answering the same general description and all wearing checkered suits. That's right. As for the... I beg your pardon, Mr. Vance? That's right. I'll call you back, Markham. I have a visitor. Good enough. Bye, Vance. Goodbye. Please come in, won't you? You make a very attractive picture framed in the doorway, but... This chair will be just as flattering, I'm sure. Thank you. Vance, do you know who I am? The fallacy of my life is that I am so very familiar with a lot of things that aren't half as interesting. Mm, thank you. The fallacy of my life is that I've heard too many things that aren't half as interesting. It would surprise me greatly if this kind of talk was the reason you came to my office. You needn't be surprised. It isn't. Vance, my name is Walker, Elise Walker, and uh, we have business to discuss. Have we? Yes. What about? Oh, it's about this crime wave now going on. The shootings and hold-ups done by the man in the checkered suit. According to the papers, the uh, police are baffled. You mean because they can't figure how one man can be in so many different places at the same time? Mm, something like that. That's easily explained. The crimes are being committed by more than one man. I still don't see what brought you to me, Miss Walker. I have been rather indirect, haven't I? Mm-hmm. Vance, I uh, came to you because uh, I want a million dollars. Well, your desire is understandable, but you're coming to me for it isn't. I don't have a million dollars. Oh. And haven't you heard, Miss Walker, getting a million dollars isn't quite as easy as that? You've got to do something more than just go up to a total stranger and ask for it. Yes, I know all that. But still, I want the million, and strangely enough, I think you're going to want to get it for me. I'm a little selfish that way. I always had the idea that I was going to make my first million for myself. Oh, it isn't your money I want. It's the city's. It isn't information I want. It's clarity. All right. Now, before I begin, let me tell you this. If you were twice as clever as you are, you could never prove this conversation between you and me ever took place. And if you ever accuse me of saying what I'm about to say, I'm going to laugh it off. I think you've made your point. Now, what is this about a million dollars? I uh, want a million dollars for turning over to you, or uh, to the police, the men in the checkered suits, the men responsible for the recent robberies and shootings. Where are you going to find them? I uh, know where they are. Oh. And I know where the million dollars are, too. Do you? Yes. Yeah. They're, uh, they're in the uh, city treasury. You can go to your friend Markham, the district attorney, and act as intermediary in the deal. Yes, I suppose I could if I had any inclination to. Oh, you have regard for people, Vance. You don't want to see innocent people being killed. That's right, isn't it? That's right. Very well, then. I can stop all that. But if you don't go to see Markham, and when you see him, sell him on the idea of giving me a million dollars... In this city, you'll see the greatest crime wave, the most horrible reign of terror in its history. Think it over, then. You have until tomorrow. This is District Attorney Markham. The checkered murder case opened when three different people in various parts of the city reported they had been assaulted at the same time by a masked man wearing a checkered suit who became invisible. Philo Vance is certain that a gang is at work and indicated to me that he had something terribly important to say but believed he'd wait for further developments. All he said was that an attractive woman was involved in the checkered gang, a woman whose identity I do not know and whose whereabouts are a complete mystery. She might be... Where's Pete, Georgie? He was supposed to be back a half hour ago. Search me, Miss Walker. Well, I have an idea he stopped off somewhere after he completed his mission. If he did, I wish he hadn't. Pete's okay, Miss Walker. And you know something? What? He looks good in a checkered suit. Me, I've got his color and I'm his height, but on me, nothing looks good. I wish I looked good in checks like he does. I wish you were here. He's supposed to have a report on the bank vaults over at First National. I told him to put on a blue serge suit and to rent a safety deposit box so he'd get close to the inside and draw a sketch for us. Well, that's our next job, huh? Yeah. We sure did a pretty one on a nightclub. How much we get on that, Miss Walker? You'll get your... Hey! Hmm. 
Where have you been, Pete? Well, you sent me over to the bank. What kept you so long? I got delayed. You left there over an hour ago. Where have you been? I, I had to go see my girl. She called me up. I had to go see her. She told you to go see her, and I told you to come right back. But you listened to her. Oh, half hour, one way or another, don't make no difference. Mm, it does to me. All right, now, wait a minute, boss. Ain't you getting a little silly? What? Huh? They said, ain't you getting a little silly? A guy's got a right to see his girl once in a while. A guy's get... Miss Walker. Boss, don't... <laughs> I go to see my girl. The boy shoots me. Honest, boys, it wasn't worth it. Well, Georgie, any questions? Not me, boss. I ain't got any girl. Perhaps I should have waited until after he told me the bank plans. Oh, now you'll have to go. That my next assignment? Yeah. Uh, no. No, get rid of this body first. I don't care what you do with it, but get rid of it. And do it on schedule. That understood? Sure. Why not? By tomorrow morning at 11, I want the plants of the bank vault and description of how you got rid of the body. Okay. And, um, tell Eddie what happened. You mean that you knocked off Pete? Why should I do that? Why? Yeah. Because he has a girlfriend, too. <laughs> The day's almost over, Vance, and your mysterious lady friend hasn't called you. I know, Markham, but she will. She was very definite about wanting to cross her gang for a million dollars. What kind of a mind would dream up an idea like that, Vance? It's the strangest and most unreal thing I've ever heard of. Of course it's ridiculous, my friend, but that doesn't make the woman any the less dangerous. The idea's not normal, and probably she isn't either. But the fact of the matter is that she is a menace. Well, what are we going to do when, as, and if she calls or appears? I don't know. All I know is what we're not going to do. We're not going to give her any million dollars. What kind of a woman can she be, I wonder? She could be an attractive one. If it weren't for her eyes, they're ice cold. What was it the man said once? The eyes are the windows of the soul? <laughs> That's right. Miss Walker, if that quotation has any basis in fact, has a frosted soul. <laughs> Personally, I'd feel more at home with... Oh, finally. I hope it's she... Hello? Van? That's right, this Miss Walker. Yes. I told you I'd call. I'm calling. You want to know what decision I've made as to your proposition? That's exactly what I want to know. Have you spoken to Markham? You can deliver the checkered killers? Definitely. Mr. Markham is with me now. He'd like to know that for sure. Can he meet you somewhere? Why not? I'll drive down to the end of Neck Road and be waiting for him in, uh, well, in about an hour. It's rather late for an unescorted young lady to be in that deserted section. I have nothing to worry about. The only thing people fear in this town is the Checker Gang. And they work for me. Remember? You realize, of course, that instead of sitting here in my car, I could arrest you this minute, Miss Walker, after what you've told me. Oh, you couldn't make it stick, Markham, and you know it. Why didn't Vance come with you to meet me? He didn't say. Getting back to you and your proposition, you know, there's never been anything quite like this done in any city. There's never been anybody quite like me in any city. Mm. Yes, yes. <laughs> Let me tell you something that I didn't tell Vance. Yes? Suppose you do catch one of the checkered killers. There are half a dozen waiting to take his place. They're all well-paid and well-organized. A million dollars is cheap to get rid of them. A million dollars of taxpayers' money used to make a deal with a criminal organization. Why not? <laughs> Who's going to benefit if there's no check at gang? The public, of course. This makes sense. Very good sense. Not to me, it doesn't, boys. Who are you? Apparently, he's one of my boys, Mark. Checkered suit, mask, dark. Who are you? You said it right, lady. I'm one of your boys. Mm -hmm. One of your boys that followed you out here to find out what was going on. What? I found out. Uh-oh, uh, Miss Walker, don't do that. I better you? take your hand no, back. No, get back. I'm going to go up again. Look, whoever you are, I'm not going to... Shut up. Boys, this is the district attorney, and you were going to make a deal with him, weren't you? Well... I don't know what I'm going to do with you, but as for the D.A., he gets this. Oh. I think he'll be more comfortable laying out here in the road, so out of the car he goes. Move over to the wheel, boss. You're driving me back to the hideout where I can tell the boys what you were up to. They're going to have something to say about what you was trying to do. 
And they're gonna do more than just say it. Believe me. <laughs> Next thing I knew, Eddie, she yanked out a gun and shot me. Yeah? Right where you're standing. Oh, Shot him like she was putting on lipstick. That's how calm she was. Oh, she, 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 she's ice, that broad, Georgie. Ice. Then she tells me what to do about the bank vault. Says to get rid of Pete's body, just like that. Yeah. Honest, that name is tougher than any guy I know. You ain't kidding, Georgie. You ain't kidding, huh, sir? Well, uh, did you get rid of it? Sure. Think I want okay, to... Oh, in your car. What's the matter? Don't what is it? Hey, lies. guys, relax. Oh. I just brought the boss here so you could hear what's been going on. You don't believe him. He's making the whole thing up. Yeah, what whole thing? The boss was trying to make a deal to turn all of us into the district attorney. Don't be Wait fooled. a minute. Wait a minute. You with the gun. Who are you? I'm wearing a checkered suit, ain't I? Yeah? I'm wearing a mask, ain't I? Yeah, yeah. I'm one of you guys. She hired me yesterday. I followed her out the neck road about an hour ago, and I had to make a deal with the D.A., so I dragged her back here. That's not true. I never saw him before. I'll prove it to you. I'll yank off that... Keep your hands away from... There we are. See, boys? It's Philo Van. Grab his arm, Eddie. Grab the gun. I'll get the gun. You get him. Eddie, use your blackjack. All right. Oh, yeah. Miss Walker, we done it. We knocked yeah. him cold. Good, grabbing his gun like you done. That made it easy. Only he put up quite a scrap. So that's Philo Vance, huh? He sent a friend of mine up. This one's on me. Give me your gun, Georgie, huh? Sure. Here you are. Thanks. Vance, Vance, you can't hear me, but just for luck, I'm saying goodbye. Nobody in that room, move. What, what? My men have machine guns. That's Mark and he's bluffing. He's alone. Let him have it, boy. Okay, yeah. Okay, hold it, everybody. Right. I said hold it, hold it. Now keep me covered from here in case they're not as dead as they look. I'm going in through this window. Okay, okay. okay. right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. I just hope we didn't get here too late. That's Vance lying on the floor. If he's been hurt... Vance, Vance. Um, hello, Markham. Easy, old boy. Finally got here, eh? Yes. Mr. Swell Scrap, my friend. I almost handled the two of them. You missed a rather interesting gun battle. Both of the men are dead, as you can see. And I think the girl... Girl is still alive, D.A. Oh, I don't think she will be much longer. Your cops shoot too straight. Yes, they do. Well, Miss Walker, I think the best thing we can do is get you to a hospital. Oh, don't kid me. I never last the ambulance right. Well, I guess this is it, eh? <laughs> Funny, I wanted a million dollars. And this is how I get paid off. I wanted gold and got paid off in lead. I'd say that the only thing I don't understand about the checkered gang is how they turned invisible. That still sticks in my mind as impossible. It is, Markham. The invisible gimmick was a trick. The checkered suits were only checkered in front. The back was solid black. That applies to the back of the gray hats they wore, too. They worked in darkness or semi-darkness. The whole thing was planned to have a theatrical effect on the victims. And it practically had the same effect on me. <laughs> You're quite an actor yourself, Vance. <laughs> When you showed up in that checkered suit and mask out on Neck Road, I wasn't sure it was you at all. I wanted it that way. The blank cartridge I fired at you didn't hurt any, did it? <laughs> no, but the bump when I landed on the road did. <laughs> you ought to be more careful how you throw corpses out of the car. A corpse couldn't complain. Only did it so it would be logical for Miss Walker to drive me to the hideout so you and the police could follow us. Oh, I see. It was the only way I knew to get her to take me to the gang. Well... You saved the city a million dollars tonight, Vance. And tonight saw the end of Miss Walker's overambitious plans. That it did. But Markham, most important of all, tonight saw the end of the checkered murder case. <laughs>
Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. New York Police Department calling. Mr. Dollar, will you accept the charges? Uh, yeah, put them on. Just a moment, please. Ready with your call to Hartford, Connecticut. Go ahead. Hello, Dollar? That's right. This is Sergeant Papish, robbery. I have a notation here. You're the one to contact in the case that came up. Allied Adjustment Bureau? Well, I've done a lot of work for him. What's it about, Sergeant? Well, we've recovered a mink coat you were looking for about six months ago. Oh? Yeah, stolen from a party named Jacoby in Rochester. The Jacobys are in Europe right now, but the furrier's already identified it as the one he sold to him. Jacoby? Rochester? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. It was insured for $5,000. There's some other things taken in the same hall. A watch, rings, bracelet. That's the job. So far, we just have the coat and the girl who was wearing it. What does she say? Nothing. So far, she's got a couple of bullet holes in her. Maybe I better get down there, Sergeant. Room 212, Sergeant Papish. Right. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment... It's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Adjustment Bureau, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Rochester theft matter. Expense account item one, $1.65. Person-to-person collect call from Sergeant Papish, New York Police Department. Item two, $32.56. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City after clearing authority to resume on the Jacoby case. It had been stalemated six months before when the Rochester police and I were unable to recover any part of the item stolen from the Jacoby residence. I arrived in New York at 1.35, dropped my bags off at the New Weston, then went directly to the Metropolitan Police Station. Uh, hello. Uh, I wonder if you could help me. I'm looking for Sergeant Papish. I'm Papish. Oh, Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Oh. Thanks for coming down, Dollar. I have a chair. Oh, Thanks. There are mink coats in the crime lab. They're looking it over. Uh-huh. We still haven't found out much about the girl who was wearing it. What's her name? Yeah, just Jane Doe for now. We didn't have her prints on file here, but we're waiting to hear from Washington now. She's been unconscious ever since we picked her up. Pretty bad shape. Well, what exactly happened? I came in as a complaint about uh, three this morning. Woman over on 57th Street telephoned about a disturbance. The prowl car went over to the address and found this girl lying in the entrance to the apartment house wearing the mink coat. She'd been shot twice. Uh-huh. 
No one in the apartment house seemed to know her or had ever seen her before. We asked about the neighborhood. No dice. But we did find out how she got there. How? The lady across the street said she saw a man drive up sometime after midnight and unload the girl from his car. She, uh, was able to give us a fair description of the car and the man. Yeah. Nice. But nothing definite. No license number or anything like that. Could be any car and any man, from what she said. Got an APB out, of course. Was there a purse or anything? Nothing. The dress she was wearing came from a store downtown. Hundreds just like it. The coat was the only item that might have helped, and it turned up listed in the stolen property file. How about jewelry? Small diamond ring on her little finger. When I looked over the list of things taken in that Jacoby robbery, it doesn't fit any of those. You can look at it if you want to. I'll take your word for it. The supposed insurance company paid off the claim. Yeah, the whole thing. Well, at least we have the coat back for you. Maybe we'll get a line on the other things when this girl regains consciousness. If she does. Pretty bad, is it? Yeah. Nice-looking girl, too. Only about 25 or so. Excuse me. Sure. Robbery, Sergeant Pabish. Oh, let me get it down here. Two thirteen West. Right. Okay. See you there. Bye. Just got an answer from Washington. They able to identify the girl? Yeah, dress and all. She had a postal savings once. Name's Eileen Madden. You mind if I go with you? Yeah, come on. Maybe you'll get back all of your loot. I accompanied Sergeant Papish to the address for Eileen Madden. Turned out to be a fairly nice apartment in a fairly nice neighborhood. By the time we arrived there, a full crew of technicians were at work giving the place a complete check. Sergeant Papish introduced me to a tall, heavy set man. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company, Walt. Sergeant Walter. Hi. How are you, Sergeant? Oh, fine. I'm afraid we haven't done any good for you so far. Haven't found anything here to go with that mink coat. Oh. Have you talked to anybody around here yet? Just getting started on it. The lady who lives across the hall might be able to help us. Where is she? In there. Her name's Ethel Stromberg. Mrs. Okay. I'll take it here. All right. Uh, are you Mrs. Stromberg? Yes, I am. I'm Sergeant Papish. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? How is poor Eileen? Not very good, Mrs. Stromberg. She's still unconscious. Oh, dear, that's terrible. It's just a terrible thing. Where is she? I'd like to go to see her if it's possible. She's at the police emergency hospital right now, Mrs. Stromberg. I'll have them phone you when she can see people. Well, thank you. What an awful thing. How did that happen? What's that all about? Now, maybe you can tell us something about her, Mrs. Stromberg. Where she worked, how she lived, what people she knew. Oh, dear. How long have you known her? Well... I moved in here about five months ago. I met her the very first day. Mm -hmm. Nice girl? Oh, yes, very nice, very nice girl. Quiet, minded her own business. Do you know where we can contact her family? No, I can't help you there, Sergeant. I, I know they live somewhere in California, but that's about all. She talks about them now and then. How about her friends here in town? What about them? Did she talk about any of her friends to you? What do you mean? Well, she's a pretty girl, young, boyfriends, maybe. Yes, she did talk about them now and then. You suppose one of them had something to Mrs. do? Mrs. Stromberg, Eileen Madden was dumped from a convertible last night after she'd been shot. A witness described the car as possibly blue or black in color, white top, white sidewalls. She said it was a late model Cadillac or Buick. Do you know if any of Miss Madden's friends drove a car that comes near that description at all? Why, yes. Yes, I saw him pick her up one night. I was just coming home. Uh, saw who pick her up, Mrs. Stromberg? A man she called Bill. Bill who? I really don't know his last name. She didn't introduce me to him. But she talks about him. He drove a black Cadillac. Can you tell us what he looks like? Well, he seemed very tall. As tall as Sergeant Papish here? So about your height, very nice looking. He seemed quite big. Husky, sort of. Very nicely dressed, too. What color was his hair? I don't know. He always wore a hat. I, I think it was dark, though. His eyes? I don't know. About uh, how old, would you say? Oh, I'm no good at this, but uh, 
I say between 30 and 35. Mm, seems to fit what we have from the witness. Yeah. Uh, this Bill, would you say he had money? Oh, yes, I would say so. He drove that nice big convertible. He always dressed so nice. And he gave Eileen pretty nice things. Do you know if he ever gave her any jewelry? I don't know. I don't think so. Eileen would usually run across the hall and show me when he sent her something nice. I don't remember her ever showing me any jewelry. I just talked to the hospital. How is she? Just coming around. I think you better go over there and talk to her if you're gonna. Is she bad? They think she's dying, Mrs. Stromberg. She'll make it? Uh, hard to say right now. Sometimes they rally. She must have been in that doorway a half hour or better before we got to her. Mm -hmm. She said anything, Doctor? No. You, know, you might have to wait a little while for her to come around. I see. I'll tell you both. Ask what you have to know quick. Two minutes is about all I can give you with it. Sure, Doctor. Oh, you better put your cigarettes in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, miss. Okay, boys. Is she conscious? Yeah, she can hear you. Are you Eileen Madden? Is Eileen Madden your name? Yes. Yes. You're seriously hurt, Miss Madden. Can you tell us how it happened? Miss Madden? No. Bill shot you? Yes. What's Bill's name? Where can we find him? I... 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 Doctor, watch. <coughs> Nurse, hand me that. Sorry, fellas. There was nothing I could do. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Eileen Madden died at 3.35 in the afternoon without giving us the full name of the man who shot her the night before. I stayed with Sergeant Papish and Sergeant Walters as they continued their investigation of her death and the appearance of the mink coat covered in policy number 27M55567 issued to Roland J. Jacoby, Rochester, New York. The apartment where she had lived yielded some information. Here it is. Letters from Robert J. Madden in Riverside, California. Looks like her father. Okay, we'd better notify him. This might be the best lead. What's up? This picture. Found in one of her closets. Let's see. Hmm. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Love, Bill. He loved her all right. Yeah. Anybody identified this yet? That Mrs. Stromberg's supposed to be here right now. What time you got? 
Oh, half past. She said she'd be here at six. Anything on the bullets? I didn't check with anything in our lab. Ballistic says it was an Army 45. The old 1911 model. Pretty good gun for killing. What gun is it? Oh, I got the wrong room at first. Oh, come in, Mrs. Stromberg. You remember Sergeant Papish and Mr. Dollar? Yes. Do I have to answer more questions? Not many more. Oh, I'm just all worn out. I can't get over this terrible thing happening to Eileen. Did you get in touch with her family? Business office is doing it right now. Oh, dear. What a terrible, terrible thing. Mrs. Stromberg, have you ever seen this man before? Oh, yes. That's Bill. The man Eileen's been going with? Yes. The man who drives the black Cadillac convertible? Yes, that's him. But did he do this terrible thing? It looks that way, Mrs. Stromberg. Oh, dear, dear. <clears throat> Sergeant Pavish. Yeah. Yeah, right. Goodbye. Did Eileen Madden ever mention to you that she had been married? Why, no. She never did. Was she? In the state of New York in 1951. Just found out from vitals. Divorced? Yeah. Her ex-husband's name is Bill. Bill Powers. <laughs> Sergeant Papish, this is Mr. Dollar. Uh, how do you do? What's the matter? May we come inside, Mr. Powers? Sure. Well, what's this all about? Do you know a woman named Eileen Madden, Mr. Powers? Yeah, sure. We were married once. Why? Eileen Madden was shot to death last night, Mr. Powers. Eileen? Yes. What? Are you sure? I... We checked her prints. Oh. oh. Shot? Yes. Who? Oh, what happened? I... Well, how, how could a thing like that happen? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Powers. I, I can't believe it. I mean, dead. Have you seen her lately? Well, yeah, I, I saw her last week. Had a drink together. Are you sure it's Eileen? We'd make sure before we came around to news like this. Uh, Mr. Dollar represents an insurance company, Mr. Powers. Miss Madden was wearing a stolen coat when we found her. Stolen coat? Yes, a stolen mink coat. Was uh, she ever in trouble anywhere? I don't care what she was wearing. Eileen never steal anything. She was a fine girl, a wonderful girl. I was a fool to ever let our marriage go on the rocks. <laughs> Can you come with us, Mr. Powers? Where? We need a positive identification. Sure. Sure, Sergeant. I'll be right with you. Want to smoke? Thanks. Well, he isn't the bird in the picture. No. Did you see the car in the driveway? Yeah. 51 Caddy black convertible. <laughs> On the way to the city morgue with the ex-husband of Eileen Madden, we tried to get more information from him regarding her activities up till the time of her death. But power seemed so distraught that he could only speak of their short marriage and the reason it had ended. It was an old and especially sad story of a man who couldn't provide well enough for a beautiful wife. However, once he'd seen her body at the morgue and identified it, he seemed to get better control of himself. We all walked across the street for coffee. I hope you get whoever did this, Sergeant. I hope you get him fast. We sure want to, Mr. Powers. Why would anybody do that to Eileen? Why? Maybe you can help us answer that. Oh, you're just interested in that coat you say she was wearing. Well, mister, I don't believe she was wearing a stolen coat. What do you think of that? I'm just looking for the facts, Mr. Powers. I'd like to prove what you just said as badly as you'd like to have it proved. But we have to start somewhere. You can understand that. I, I suppose so. You told us you saw her last week for a drink. That's right. Have you been seeing her right along? Yeah, sure. Did you know that she's been going with somebody else? Sure. Then uh, you know Bill? Bill Chambers? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know him, but 
She talked about him a lot. Is, uh, this Bill Chambers, Mr. Powers? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. I thought you knew You're sure this is him? I'm sure. This picture was in her place. I went there one day and saw it and asked her who he was. I mean, told me all about him. What did she tell you about him? Why, she said she was going with him. She she told me that he wanted to marry her. Said he had lots of money. Did she tell you where he works? No. Or what kind of work he does? No. You know where we can get in touch with him? No, I don't know that either. I say... Do you think he might have done this to her? We'd like to talk to him. I... I know she's been going with him for a few months, what she told me. And you've been seeing her the same time she was seeing Chambers? Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. She didn't want to marry him. She wanted to marry me again. Do you know what kind of a car Chambers drives? Cadillac. Thought you never met him. Well, she told me about his car. It's another thing. I went out and bought one myself. I thought it might do me some good with her. Mm-hmm. Were you at home last night? Yeah. Can you prove it? Yeah. <laughs> I was home. She was out getting killed. The name William Chambers was checked through the New York police files. They listed 24 persons who more or less fit his general description. Took two days to locate and talk with all of them. Neither Mrs. Stromberg nor the witness who had seen the body dumped from the car could identify any of them. An all points bulletin regarding the suspect and his car had been issued as soon as we learned his name. Same results, nothing. On the third day, the pawn shop detail turned up two more items that had been taken in the Jacoby robbery. There they are. Huh. Watch and ring. Jacoby stuff? Case numbers on the watch checkout. The ring's engraved. Where'd they wind up? Shop on 3rd Street. The proprietor says it was sold yesterday. Man who sold them signed the buy book James Agenian. How about his description? Fifth Chambers down the line. Well, at least he was still in town yesterday. Yeah, but the stuff's been on the hot sheet for a long time. If he's had any experience at all, he knew he was taking a chance trying to unload it. Probably trying to raise cash to get out of town. That's what I was thinking. Huh. Gave him an address on Polk Street, a vacant lot. If he keeps on trying to unload it, I'll have all the loot back. If he keeps on trying, we'll keep on trying. Well, they found his car. Where? Used car lot in the Bronx. He sold it at 10 o'clock this morning. At the used car lot, we learned that a man answering the description of William Chambers had driven in that morning and offered a black 51 Cadillac convertible for sale. The used car lot manager had finally settled on a price and made out a check. He reported that the man had seemed extremely nervous and anxious to make a quick deal. The car was impounded and examined. A full set of fingerprints on the steering wheel and dashboard gave us a positive identification of William Chambers. William Carlson, alias William Carls, William Charles, Walter Cameron, male, Caucasian, age 33, 178-61. Let's see, 14 arrests, two convictions, both car theft. Quite a lad. Aren't they all? <laughs> Doesn't look like a killer, though, does he? I don't know. What's a killer supposed to look like? The search to locate William Carlson, alias William Chambers, extended to all parts of the city. The associates and relatives listed in his criminal file were contacted and questioned. All of them denied having any knowledge of his whereabouts. In the meantime, two more pieces of stolen property connected with the Jacoby theft were recovered by the pawn shop detail. Each of the pawn shop proprietors identified the mugshot of the wanted man. He'd used different names in each instance. The handwriting was the same. Each address had to be checked out. I went with Sergeant Papish to the one he had given on 78th Street. It was not a vacant lot. Hello? Hello. We're looking for William Courtney. You found him? Huh? Cops? Yeah. Come on in. 
Hold still. I'm clean. Checked me through the buy book yesterday? Yeah. Your name's Carlson, isn't it? William Carlson? Yep. We've been looking a long time for you. I know. Yesterday, I decided I'd let you find me. I get my right address. You want to get your hat? Sure. Look, I didn't mean to kill Eileen. I, I didn't mean to at all. I want you to know that. Let's we'll talk about it downtown. No, no, we won't. I'm not talking to anybody downtown. I'm talking to you two right now, and that's it. So you better listen. Okay. I've been doing pretty good with these house jobs. Real good. Enough to buy myself a nice car, get some clothes, get around a little bit. I work all alone. I met her. I liked her. I wanted to marry her. I did. I, re I really did. We went out the other night, and I gave her the mink coat for a present. I thought that it sent you. She didn't want to take it. She told me she was going to marry some guy she'd been married to before. I, I let her have it. That's all? That's all. That's it, mister. I could have run. Sold my car. Been getting rid of a lot of odds and ends I have around. I decided not to, after all. I don't want to run. Okay, let's get with it. I remember, I let you get me. I wrote my address right down where I knew you'd check it out. Okay. And there's no more talking. You two got it all straight. What's the matter with you, anyway? You got it all? I mean, about everything? I... Yeah, I've got it. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. You there guys now. are too late. I... I took it when I heard you knock on the door. Where's the phone? It's too late, I tell you. It's in my stomach now. It's too late. Not for me, brother. I handle plenty of babies, just like you. Not too late. Grab him, Miss. Yeah, I got Go. Here we go. Ah, shut up. You're going to stand trial, baby. Sergeant Papish had handled attempted suicides. A lot of them. In the five minutes before the arrival of the emergency ambulance, he managed to force William Carlson to take an antidote that saved his life. The remainder of the Jacoby theft items were found in and around the apartment of the suspect along with other stolen property listed with the New York police. All of the articles on the enclosed list have been impounded and will be available following the trial of William Carlson. Expense account item three, hotel and board while in New York, $88.65. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $155.42. Remarks... Please file a copy of the above report for the information of William Powers in regard to his ex-wife, Eileen Madden. I think this is what he wanted. Well, that's it. Here's truly Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, John McIntyre, Jim Nusser, Jeanette Nolan, Victor Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle.
The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Why let your floors get scuffed up? Beacon Wax stops floor scuffing. WBBM FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Philip Martin, Johnny. Hold on, Mr. Martin. Got a job for you. Fine. Man named Carl Nelson is insured with our company. He was killed. How? Shot to death. Got a police record. Small time hoodlum. Beneficiary is a woman named Gilkerson. Maud Gilkerson. Uh huh. She disappeared. Police think it probably has something to do with Nelson's death. Want to see what you can find out? Sure. All right. Get down to New York as soon as you can. Contact Lieutenant Korchak at 11th Precinct Homicide. He'll give you all the help he can. I'll get right on it. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste... Plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Nelson matter. Expense account item one, $15.36, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and after registering at the hotel, went directly to the 11th Precinct Police Station where I introduced myself to Lieutenant Korchak of Homicide. Uh, how much does your company insure the frog for? The frog? Uh, Nelson. He was called the frog. He, he looked like one. Oh? <laughs> he was insured for 10000 And Maud Gilkerson gets the money. Do you think she had something to do with the killing? Well, I think she knows something about it. Any theories about why he was killed? Nothing definite. The frog was a hood, long record, did time twice, and in every racket from the numbers to stick-ups. You know, you don't generally get anything definite on a killing like this. Some of the boys wanted him dead. Who or why is hard to tell. He's been associated with Ellis Hartje for the past year or so. That's pretty big company. Yeah, Hartje's about as big as it come. Probably got unhappy with a frog and had him eliminated. Have you questioned Hartje? Sure, but just as a matter of routine. If Hartje had something to do with it, it's going to be tough to prove. Well, I guess the first thing to do is find the beneficiary, Maud Gilkerson. Well, that's not going to be easy. We've done a lot of looking. Well, I got a friend in town that just might be of some help. Do I know him? Probably, but... I'd rather not mention who it is. He doesn't get along very well with cops. <laughs> not many people do. My friend's got a king-size allergy. But for the right people and the right price, he can be very informative. Well, good luck, Dollar. Thanks. I'll let you know if I come up with anything. Expense account item two, $2.35, cab fare from the precinct to Skid Row and Hetz Hilarity. 
a saloon that always looked as though it wanted to collapse when the sun hit it too hard. Inside, I found Wilbur Truett sitting at the almost deserted bar, sipping muscatel through a glass straw. Hello, Wilbur. Bucko! You are indeed a sight for sore eyes. And, Bucko, my eyes are sore. Pull up a heifer white and rest yourself. Can I buy you a drink? Oh, noble prince, a king among kings. You've come in the nick. Can you buy me a drink? If it were not so early in the day and my spine not yet limber, I would bend and kiss your feet. I'll just take a rain check. Innkeeper, a flagon of your best amber tonic. Oh, Bucko, I've missed you. Do you realize what with economic conditions such as they are, that your absence has been the bane of my existence? Goodwill is a thing of the past. Wilbur. I once looked upon mankind with a warm smile and a kind heart. But I find it difficult to keep from becoming a complete cynic. People are pinching pennies completely out of shape. Soon the exchequer will be filled with a gigantic mass of unrecognizable copper. Why, a year ago I was averaging as much as 50 cents a day. A whole bottle. Maybe it's your pitch. My pitch? Sir, my pitch is a thing of beauty. An excursus of cogent puissance. A compassionate discourse on human suffering. Okay, My okay. pitch would tear the heart out of Mephistopheles himself. Wilbur. Uh, yes, Bucko. Where can I find Maud Gilkerson? You know why my eyes are sore, Bucko? No. Why are your eyes sore, Wilbur? I had to brave the morning sun. Things had become so desperate, I pawned my dark glasses. Oh, I'm sorry. If things don't improve, I may have to part with my glass straw. The only sure method of deriving substance when in the throes of the shakes. Maud Gilkerson is worth a bottle. Granted. In fact, I'd venture to guess that the lady is worth uh, two bottles. Mm -hmm, you're probably right. I'll have I'm staying at the Yorkshire. She may not want to see you. Tell her I've got 10000 for her. I beg your pardon. Tell her the frog left a $10,000 insurance policy and she's the beneficiary. Good Lord. Perhaps I was wrong. There are still a few good deeds left in the world. Sure. I just gave you two quarts worth. <laughs> Expense account item three, $2.60 for a cab back to the hotel, where I went up to my room and smoked a half a dozen cigarettes while I waited for Wilbur Truett to call. Around 4.30 in the afternoon, the phone finally rang. Johnny Dollar. Bucko? Yeah, Wilbur? I finally contacted the party. She's not happy. Did you tell her about the insurance? The first words out of my mouth. But it seems Mr. Nelson's insurance is not enough to bring color to her cheeks and a smile to her ashen lips. What does she want? Some insurance of her own. What do you mean? She's hiding because her life's in danger. She has no money to leave town. She'll make a deal with you. Go on. Enough money to leave the country. You said town. A logical progression. The town first, then the country. Believe me, Bucko, her plight is worth considering. What will she give me in exchange for the money? That is her own personal secret, but she told me to tell you it's worth every cent. All right. Go to 107 River Street, the last room at the back of the hall. Tell her Wilbur sent you. Right. Thanks, Wilbur. <laughs> put on my hat and coat, crossed the room, and opened the door to go out into the hall. But I didn't make it. There, standing on the other side of the door, about to knock, were two ugly-looking men dressed in loud jackets. Your name Dollar? Yeah. Mind if we come in? What would happen if I did? We'd come in. That's what I thought. Then why'd you ask? I make little bets with myself. I want to talk with you for a few minutes, Dollar. Okay. What are you doing in New York? It's a nice town. Want some advice? Not especially. Make a little bet with yourself. You're going to get it anyway. 
I'm a lap in front of you. Then here it is. When Bert asks you a civil question, give him a civil answer. Okay. Ask me a civil question, Bert. What are you doing in New York? It's a nice town. <coughs> oh! Why, you... Hold it. He'll just belt you again. With a broken arm? <laughs> You're pretty tough, huh? All in how you look at it. If breaking his arm is being tough, then that's the best name for it. Okay. We don't want any trouble. <laughs> that's a funny line. I won't ask you no more questions. That'll save some time. I'm just going to tell you. Lay off a Nelson killing. You understand? Yeah. You said, lay off the Nelson killing. Good boy. Because if you keep nosing around, somebody will just have to come down and investigate the dollar killing. Understand? Yeah. You said somebody will just have to come down and investigate the dollar killing. Fine, fine. Now that you understand, we'll be going. Nice meeting you both, informally, like this. Expense account item four. $3.25 $3.25 for another cab that took me down to 107 River Street. The address was an old two-story frame house that faced the water. I went in and walked down the dark hall to the back room. Who is it? Wilbur sent me. What's your name? Dollar. Come in. Are you Maud Gilkerson? Yeah. Wilbur said you'd make a deal. That's right. But I want to know what I'm getting in return. Look, Sonny, take my word for it. You're getting more than you're paying for. Now, how much did you bring? I got a couple of hundred. A couple of hundred? That's all I had on me. If you want more, I'll have to get it. Sonny, I got to get out of the country. This is enough to get you out of town. If what you've got is worth it, I'll send you the rest. Not on your life. When I leave this room, nobody's ever going to hear from old Maud again. You've got 10000 coming from Nelson's insurance policy. Uh, how long will it take to get it? Well, that depends. First, I've got to report on Nelson's death. I've and... got to get out of here as soon as I can. Another day or so, they'll find me. Well, it'll take at least three weeks before... Three weeks? Sonny, if I stay here, I'll be buried in three weeks. What are you scared of? Dying. I don't like the idea. I don't blame you. How soon can you get me some more money? How much more? 500 What am I buying? I'm not telling you anything until I get the money. Okay, then we'll just forget it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not trying to be tough, but what I got is too hot to go around shooting my face off about. How do I know if I tell you that you won't take it to the cops? You don't? Well, Wilbur said I could trust you. That's right. Okay, okay. I'll tell you. But give me the 200 on account. There you are. Okay, thanks. You want a drink? No, thanks. Mind if I have one? Go ahead. I don't usually take this stuff, but I, I need it. <coughs> oh, Frog left me 10000 huh? That's right. Nice guy. Nasty disposition, but he was okay. You didn't know him, huh? No. Well, he's been with the outfit about a year now. The outfit? Boss Harchie. Alice Harchie. Yeah. The frog done pretty well for himself. Until lately. Yeah, he he always worried that hit him in the head. He was always planning they shouldn't. You know how it is with small guys like the frog. You never know when something goes wrong and the outfit sends word to hit you in the head. Frog always worried about getting hit in the head. Ah, but he was smart. While he was alive. Yeah, yeah. He he figured as long as he was smart like he was, he'd fix it so hard she would never be able to hit him. Frog was in on most of the stuff Hodgie's been setting up in this town. Not big in it, you know, but in it. And he kept his eyes open. Found out too much and they killed him for it? Yeah, but it wasn't only what he found out. It was what he collected. Collected? Enough evidence to send Hodgie and his boys away for a hundred years. Maybe the chair even. Did Hodgie know it? Sure. Frog told him when he found out he was hot. He told Hodgie if he got killed, the stuff would go to the DA. And you've got it? I got it. Why didn't you give it to the DA? Well, even if they send Hodgie up, he's got friends. I'd be dead before he went to trial. You want another 500 for... And that's dirt cheap. Especially when the dirt's liable to be in my face. How long do I have to get it? Oh, just as soon as you can. Like I said, I ain't got much longer. You found me and you ain't got connections like Hodgie. Oh, they'll find me. I'll have the 500 in an hour. Okay, okay. I'll make arrangements. Uh, 
Wait a second. Here. What is it? Well, what does it look like? It's a key. You've been okay with me, so I'll trust you. It's a key to a locker in Grand Central, number 415. That's where the package is. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley's Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley's Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. After Maud Gilkerson gave me the key to the locker in Grand Central, I left the old house on River Street and started back for town. It was getting dark and there were no cabs in that section, so I headed west for the busy traffic. I'd only gone about a hundred yards when a car pulled away from the curb about a half block behind me. A big black car with the lights off. I thought about the key in my pocket and the evidence in the locker that would send the biggest hoodlum in the country away for life. I had to get rid of the key before they caught up with me. I turned a corner, and there, a few feet in front of me, was a blind man. A beggar sitting with his legs folded, and on his lap, a tin cup with a stack of pencils. Bless you. Thanks. I'm going to need it. Hold it, Dollar. Well, good evening. Get in the car. Get in. In the back seat. Just don't take advice, do you, Dollar? You didn't say anything about taking a walk. I told you to lay off the Nelson killing. Who says I didn't? You dug up Maud Gilkinson. Who? <clears throat> oh! I told you. When Bert asked you a civil question... Give, give him, him a, a civil, civil answer. answer. Okay. So I dug up Maud Gilkinson. So what? What'd she give you? A lot of double talk. She gave me nothing. I think you're lying. But we let a couple of the boys off to talk to her. They'll find out. What happens in the meantime? We drive around while a goon searches you. Then we go see someone who wants to have a little talk with you. Okay, goon. Search him. Get down on the floor. Is that your name, goon? Get down there. I should have guessed. What? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Bert drove us around. The goon made me strip down to my socks while he searched my clothes. When he didn't find what he was looking for, he swatted me across the back of the neck, told me to get dressed. Then Bert drove us across town to a big apartment house that overlooked the river. Bert parked in the basement garage, and I was led into an elevator that took us to the penthouse. Ellis Harji, the czar of the underworld, looked up from his evening paper. This is Dollar, boss. Did he find more? Yeah. Ernie and Frank are with him. Uh-huh. Well, sit down, Mr. Dollar. All right. Bert told me he and the gun paid you a little visit this afternoon, eh? If you can call that a little visit. The gun get rough? Don't tell me he can do something else. <laughs> You're kind of fresh, huh? I'm ripe enough to know I don't like getting pushed around. Sometimes you got to take a pushing around to understand things. I don't take a pushing around from you or anyone else, Harji. You think you've got a choice? Not at the moment, no. If I want you to take a beating, you'll take one. I'll make up for it. You ain't making up for anything. Now, you've got to understand. I'm running things, see? You ain't going to say nothing about what happens or what don't happen. 
So you just try and relax and take what comes, huh? You cooperate. It's going to be nice. He didn't have anything on him. Nothing, huh? I went over him good. He didn't have nothing. She tell you where it is, Tyler? What? You know what I'm talking about. Whatever it is, the frog left for Maud Gilkerson. I found Maud Gilkerson to tell her Nelson left her $10,000. Now, she didn't say nothing about me. Not a thing. She didn't say anything but thanks and get out. He was in with her for about ten minutes. So it took her ten minutes to say thanks and get out, huh? Look, what do you think she said to me? That's what I want you to tell me, Dollar. How can I tell you something when there's nothing to tell? I located Maud Gilkerson to tell her that Okay, Nels- okay, okay, you said that. I don't know what you're so worried about me for. Or an old dame like Maud. What can we do to a big man like you? Make me mad. Nello. Yeah. No. All right, take care of it. Yeah. Now, that was Ernie. Maud, tell him anything? Yeah. She told him that she gave Dollar a key. Is that right, Dollar? She gave you a key? She told him she gave him a key to a locker in Grand Central Station. Is that right, Dollar? She told him the locker number was 415. The stuff was in a locker. Is that right, Dollar? Do me any good to say no? No. The goons searched me. He didn't have no key on him, boss. All right. All right, where is it, Dollar? I haven't got it. Take him somewhere and find out what he'd done with it. Let's go, Dollar. You're making a mistake, Archie. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. The goon and Bert took me back down in the elevator, hustled me into the car, and drove me back across town to a warehouse in the Bowery. In a small room on the second floor of the warehouse, the goon went to work while Bert stood by with a gun. Where's the key, Dollar? I don't know. <laughs> and you're the guy that was going to bust my arm. be a whole lot easier if you just tell us. I can't tell you about something I haven't got. <clears throat> oh. The goon worked on me until I passed out. Then he threw some water in my face and started working on me again. Oh, he knew his job. It hurt, but it didn't kill me. When I was coming to for the third time, the phone rang. And Bert left the room to answer it. I knew this was the only chance I was going to get. When the goon leaned over me with a bucket of water, I grabbed the cuffs of his trouser legs and pulled. I staggered up to my feet as the goon started up off his back. I kicked him as hard as I could in the face. I grabbed the heavy bucket and stumbled over to the door. Just as Bert came back from the phone call. Hey, goon. Ask me a civil question, Bert. I tied them up as best I could, then took Bert's gun and the car keys. I found my way out of the warehouse, climbed in the big black sedan, and drove across town to the block that ran into River Street. All the way, I kept my fingers crossed that the blind man with the tin cup and pencils would still be there. Pardon me. Yes? I came by here a little while ago and dropped a key in your cup. Oh, yes, I found it. Uh, uh, Here it is. I'd like to buy it back. Buy it? Yeah. Here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I guess I'd better be going. It's beginning to rain. No, it isn't. It's just bleeding out. I wheeled the big car back across town to the 11th precinct and caught Lieutenant Korchak just going off duty. He took one look at my face, mumbled something about careless truck drivers, and sat down to listen to my story. Bird and the goon? Yeah. I left them in a warehouse. They won't stay tied up long. The boys that picked up Maud Gilkerson were named Ernie and Frank. Ernie Phillips and Frank Seller. I'll have them picked up. This key could bust this town wide open. I hope you're right, Dollar. 
A lot of people have tried to get Harger. Now, let's go down to Grand Central. Right. Oh, uh, about Maud Gilkerson. What about her? They uh, fished her out of the river about an hour ago. Okay, give me the key. Here. Archie knows about this locker. Ernie and Frank forced Maud to tell them before they killed her. You sure? They called Archie while I was in his apartment. He told me. Ah, let's see what we've got. Huh. A package. Cortex, look out! Huh? I'd seen them just as they came around the corner. The goon was grinning through the teeth I'd kicked out, and Bert had a big lump on the side of his head where I'd nailed him with a bucket. Everyone came out with their guns all at once. Korchak jumped to one side, and I dropped to my stomach while I squeezed out all six shots from the gun I'd taken away from Bert. When the smoke cleared, Korchak was down, but he was smiling. He'd caught one high on the shoulder, but Bert and the goon were through being bad boys. The goon was dead, and Bert didn't have far to go to catch up. wagon cleaned it up and Korchak and I got ourselves patched up at emergency. They wanted to keep us in for observation, but Korchak had waited too long to get Harji, and nothing was going to stop him from making the arrest. I didn't want to miss it either. Korchak collected a squad and we paid a visit to the penthouse. Think he skipped? Stakeout said he hasn't left the building. Come on, Harji, open up. This is Korchak, and I got a present for you. Hey, get back. Come on in, Korchak. I got a little something for you, too. You know, I'm kind of glad he wanted it this way. I'll shoot the lock, and then we go in. All right, hit the door. You all right, Dollar? Yeah, sure. Is he dead? He sure is. Expense account items five and six. The two hundred dollars I gave to Maud, which they never recovered, and a dollar fifty for the two bottles I gave to Wilbur, who recovered three days later. The contribution to the blind man is on me. Expense account items seven and eight, seventy-five dollars and ninety-five cents. Hotel bill, train fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total three hundred and one dollars and one cent, and multiple bruises. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Rodman, Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield, Jim Nusser, James McCallion, Martha Wentworth, and Bill Conrad. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle.
The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1,036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are as usual, toasting our hands in front of Dr. Watson's crackling fireplace. Mm, feels awfully good. Say, I thought my right hand would drop off. It got so cold tonight holding my hat coming down the street, Doctor. Mm, let's see, Mr. Harris. Yes, slightly nipped, perhaps, but uh, no real signs of frostbite. Well, yes, reminds me of a patient I once had. Now, his hand was in a really bad way. Not from the cold, mind you, but from an encounter with a heavy and not too blunt instrument. Holmes always called it the adventure of the engineer's thumb. <laughs> I thought you were leading up to a story, Dr. Watson. The adventure of the engineer's thumb. Sounds sufficiently bizarre. Oh, it was, Mr. Harris, it was. Strange in its inception and dramatic in its details. Yes, I don't think I can do better than tell you that one. It began with one of the goriest patients any doctor ever had collapsed in his waiting room. And it ended with Holmes getting himself in the tightest spot he was ever called upon to get... Oh, but uh, hadn't you better say a few words first? Thank you, Doctor. You'll go far and wide, and you won't find quality clothes so modestly priced as Clippercraft. Because even in the face of rising markets, Clippercraft has kept its prices down. This has been possible for just one reason, a big reason, the famous Clippercraft plan. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, providing year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution. Cost of production is cut way down, and you are the gainer. That's why you pay less for Clippercraft. Only 40 and $45 for a Clippercraft suit. Only $40 for a top coat or overcoat, and only twenty-six fifty for sport jackets. What's more, they're available at your own local independent store, where you get friendly, personal attention. See for yourself. Compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, will you go on with your story? It was in the summer of 89, Mr. Harris, uh, some little time after my marriage. After that important event, you remember, I abandoned Holmes and our Baker Street rooms and returned to civil practice. Oh, I still dropped in on him, of course, and now and then I even persuaded him to forego his bohemian surroundings and come and partake of a respectable Sunday dinner with Mary and me. And how did he and Mrs. Watson get along? Splendidly. She adored him, Mr. Harris. Well, uh, I had settled down and become a respectable married man. Practice steadily increasing and all that. My house was no great distance from Paddington Station, and I had a few patients from among the officials. One morning, a little before seven, I was awakened by the maid rapping frantically at my door. Dr. Watson! Oh, Dr. Watson, sir! Oh, uh, hello, yes, come in, come in. Oh, Dr. Watson, come quick. Oh, what's up, Millie? What's happened? <laughs> An accident, sir. A nasty accident. Here's his card. Hmm. Mr. Victor Haverley, hydraulic engineer, 16A, Victoria Street, SW. Yes, sir. Walked over from the station, he did. I let him in. He's downstairs now in the consulting room. Looks like death, he does. Well, it can't be too serious if he had the strength to walk over from the station by himself. Looks like he's in pain, sir. It's his end, his left end. Then to stop with handkerchief it is. And it's all a dripping with blood, Oh, sir. dear, dear, dear. Sounds more serious than I suspected. 
Millie, you might go and heat some water. I'll go, go right down to him. Yes, sir. Hmm, severe hemorrhage. Wonder what the accident was. Oh, Mr. Victor Hatherley. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm sorry to wake you up so early. I had a serious accident during the night. I came in by train this morning. They told me at the station that you were a good doctor. I came here. A night journey. Hmm, that in itself is a rather tiring and monotonous affair. You couldn't call my night monotonous. Monotonous? I never had a less monotonous night. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Pull yourself together. I, I, I'm sorry. I have been making a fool of myself. The, the relief, you understand. I, I apologize. No, oh, no, not at all, not at all. Often happens in a case of shock. Here, take a swig of this brandy. That's better. Uh, now let's have a look at your hand. It's my thumb, Dr. Watson, or rather what used to be my thumb. Here, take a look. Good heavens, this is a terrible injury. Flesh badly mangled. Will it have to be amputated? No, 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 I think we can save it. Mm. Unpleasant wound. Must have bled considerably. Yes, it did. I, I guess I fainted when it happened. When I came to, I was still bleeding, so I tied one end of a handkerchief very tightly around the wrist and braced it with a twig. Excellent. You should have been a surgeon. Well, just a question from hydraulics, Dr. Watson, well within my own province. Mm. Must have been done by a very sharp and heavy instrument. Uh, a cleaver, Dr. Watson. Accident? No, an attack. A, a murderous attack. Dear, dear, that sounds serious. Yes, I, I shall have to tell my story to the police, I suppose, but between you and me, I doubt if they'll believe my statement. Problem, eh? Uh, well, if it's anything of that nature you want solved, I strongly recommend my friend Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I, I've heard of him, of course. Do you think he'd be interested? Could you could you give me an introduction? Oh, I'll do better than that. I'll take you around to him myself. But uh, first, let's attend to this thumb. Then we'll call a cab and drop in on Holmes for a bit of breakfast. Another bit of Mrs. Hudson's omelette, Mr. Hatherley. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I feel a new man since Dr. Watson bandaged my hand and... Your excellent breakfast has completed the cure. Good. Now you can tell us your story if you're sure you feel strong enough. Well, I'll take up as little of your valuable time as possible. To begin with, I must tell you that I'm an orphan and a bachelor residing alone in lodgings here in London. By profession, uh, a hydraulic engineer, I had seven years' experience with the firm of Venner and Matheson before I decided to go into business for myself. Well, <clears throat> the start of any new firm is always rather slack, I suppose. Uh, so far, I've had uh, three consultations and one small job. Not what you'd call a rushing business. Well, uh, no, not exactly. Every day from nine till four, I waited in my little den until at last my heart began to sink and I began to feel I should never have any practice at all. Uh, well, I know that feeling. <laughs> Would you believe it? The first two months after I resumed my medical practice, I... Watson, 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 don't interrupt. Oh, sorry. Go on, Mr. Heavily. It all began yesterday, just as I was thinking of closing up for the day. My clerk came in to say that there was a gentleman waiting to see me on business. His card gave me the name of Colonel Lysander Stark. Well, I told the clerk to show him in by all means. Hmm, Colonel Lysander Stark. Picturesque name, eh, Watson? Uh, what sort of man did he turn out to be? Slightly over middle height and exceedingly thin. I don't think I've ever seen a thinner man. His whole face sharpened away into nose and chin, and the skin was drawn tightly over his protruding cheekbones. Hmm, an invalid? No, Mr. Holmes, I should say just naturally uh, emaciated. He his eye was bright, a trifle too bright, I thought, his step brisk and his bearing assured. He spoke with a slight German accent. I have the honor. This is Mr. Victor Hatherley Nichtwa. Uh, why, yes, Colonel Stark. Uh, won't you sit down? Danke. You are recommended to me, sir, for a young man who is clever and also discreet. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all. I know also that you are an orphan, bachelor, and you live alone. Quite correct, but I, I don't see why that can possibly concern you. I understood that, that it was on a professional matter that you wanted to see me. Yeah, Gavis, I have a professional commission, but I must insist on secrecy, absolute secrecy, and that is easier from a man what has no family. If I promise to keep a secret, Colonel Stark, you may depend on my doing so. You promise, then? I promise. Good. Now we can get down to business. Uh, one moment, please. Yes, it is as it should be. These clerks, you know, sometimes they are so interested in the affairs of the master. 
Uh, bring your chair close to mine, huh? Mm, uh, very well. Yeah. Now we can talk with safety. Uh, but if you don't mind, Colonel, my, my time is valuable. So? To whom then? I know how much work you have done lately, my young friend. Oh. <laughs> you do not fool me. How does 50 guineas for a night's work strike you? Why, uh, well, that's very generous, Colonel Stark. I have said a night's work, an hour's work would be more correct. Your opinion is all we ask. Okay. I have a hydraulic press. It is in bad order. You show us what is wrong, we fix it ourselves. You will do that, huh? Why, uh, of course. Good. You will come tonight by the last train? Where to? Air Force, that is in Berkshire. Your train arrives at 11.15. A carriage will come to meet you. Oh, your place is out in the country. Yeah, a good seven miles from the station. There's no train back. You will spend the night. Yes, but couldn't I come at a more convenient hour tomorrow in the daytime? Impossible. It is for your inconvenience that we pay the 50 guineas and for the secrecy. Well, of course, but perhaps if you could explain the reason for all this, uh, this caution... Very uh... well, I explain... You know, do you not, that Fuller's Earth is a very valuable product and is to be found only in two places in England? Uh, my, yes, I believe I have heard something to that effect. Some time ago I have bought a place, a very small place, you understand, and one day I am so fortunate I discover a small deposit of Fuller's Earth in my backyard. Congratulations. I investigate. I find it is a link between two so much larger deposits, but... In the property which belongs to my neighbors. <laughs> These people, they do not know the value of their land. So you bought it up? No, Mr. Hatherley. I am not a rich man. I have not the money. So I speak to some of my friends and we work our little deposit in secret. So we can earn the money to buy the land near us. Yes. But I don't understand what use you can make of a hydraulic press in excavating Fuller's earth. We we compress the earth into bricks so we can remove them without showing what they are. That is a detail, a mere detail. So, I have taken you into my confidence. I expect you tonight, Mr. Hatherley. I shall be there, Colonel Stark. Good. Not a word to a soul. It is best you do not even tell anyone that you are going away. Very well, if you wish it. I not only wish, I insist. Ah, here is twenty guineas in advance. Well, are we the same, Mr. Hatterley? Sounds fishy to me, eh, Holmes? Fifty guineas is a suspiciously large fee for a small job like that. Quite, Watson, quite. Hydraulic presses, eh? Hmm. Did this emaciated German colonel have a scar on his forehead? Uh, why, 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 yes, now you mention it, I believe he did. Ha, huh, I thought so. Then you know who he is, Holmes? I can guess. I can guess. But uh, go on with your story, Mr. Hatherley. You reached Erford at 11.15? Yes, Mr. Holmes. As I passed through the station gate, I found Colonel Stark waiting for me. Without a word, he hurried me into a carriage which was waiting for us both. We got in. He drew up the windows on both sides, tapped on the glass, and away we went as fast as the horse could go. One horse or two? Only one, Mr. Holmes. Did you observe the color? Yes, I saw it by the carriage lamps as I was getting it. It was a chestnut. Tired looking or fresh? Oh, fresh, fresh and glossy. Mm. Well, we drove for the better part of an hour. And from the rate at which we were going, I should say the distance we covered was nearly twelve and seven miles. Yes, interesting. What did the countryside look like? It was a dark night, Mr. Holmes. I saw nothing. Moreover, the carriage windows were made of, of frosted glass. Sounds funny to me, eh, Holmes? Mm. The roads, were they smooth or bumpy? Decidedly bumpy, Mr. Holmes. We lurched and jolted terribly. Moreover, we seemed to be going continually up and down hill. Well, finally, the bumpy road was exchanged for the crisp smoothness of a gravel drive. The carriage came to a standstill, and I got out. Can you describe the front of the house? No, I'm afraid I can't, Mr. Holmes. I was whisked into the front door so fast I could see nothing. The instant I crossed the threshold, the door slammed behind us, and I heard the rattle of the wheels as the carriage drove away. Minna? Minna? Yeah? Here come, ma. Bring a lamp. Ah, that is better. It is not nice to keep our guests standing in the dark. So, that is good common. Gavis, take the lamp into my study. 
Now, Mr. Hatterley, if you will be so good, come with me. Mena, you can go now. Ja, ich gehe. My sister, Mr. Hatterley, a good girl. She does what she is told. And now, you will excuse me a few minutes, please. I come right back. Of course. I... Make yourself comfortable. Hmm. Gloomy-looking hole. Smells musty as though it hadn't been lived in for a long time. All the windows shuttered and barred. Confound that clock. Wish it wouldn't tick like that. It gives me the jumps. Hello, I... It is only me. Please, do not call out. I must tell you oh, something. It's all right. Please don't look so frightened. No, no, it is not all right. You must go. You must not stay here. There is no good for you to do. Yes, but I came to inspect a machine. I can't leave before. No, you must. You can do no good. The last man who came, he... Oh, this is too terrible. Nina? Nina, where are you? Be goodness, villain, before it is too late. Pick this way. Nina! Nina! Down this passage, not that door. So dark. Nina, who are you talking to? How do you run? So, you let him go, huh? Please, you will not hurt him. Don't hurt him. Wait till I get hold of him. Wait. He's coming. Run! Run! Well, I got a glimpse of him coming after me with a cleaver, and I ran. Ran for dear life. But he ran, too. I just managed to scale the garden wall before he got to it. Even so, I wasn't quite quick enough. That cleaver came down on my left hand before I could get away. What a filthy blackguard. I crawled over to some bushes as best I could and then promptly fainted. Funny he didn't come after you and finish the job, they hope. Well, the bushes hit me, I guess, but someone must have found me sooner or later. It must have been the girl, or perhaps she bribed the coachman to help me. What makes you say that? Well, when I came to, the sun was just rising. I was lying in an angle of a hedge along the high road, and just a little lower down was a long building. The Erford Station. Well, I'm blessed. Half dazed, I went to the station. The early morning train was just pulling in. I boarded it and returned to London. What I can't understand is why I should have been lured to that lonely spot, and what reason Colonel Stark can have had for making his murderous attack on me. Yes, interesting little problem. We shall have to look into it. Oh, by the way, I have a newspaper clipping I think might interest you. Uh, Watson, hand me last year's index. That's a good fellow. Right, uh... There you are. Let me see. January, the Limehouse Plague, Lady Waterfield's Pearls, February, March. Ah, yes, here we are. Read this. Last on the 9th of May, Mr. Jeremiah Hailing, age 26, hydraulic engineer. I say, that's a coincidence. Left lodgings at 10 o'clock at night. Has not been heard of since. Was dressed in grey tweed, soft hat, black boots. Yes, yes, I suspect that represents the last time the colonel's machinery needed overhauling. Then that explains what the girl was trying to tell me. Undoubtedly, your colonel is a cool and desperate man, Mr. Hatherley. He lets nothing stand in the way of his little game. And, like some of our early pirates, he believes in leaving no survivors behind from a captured ship. Good heavens. Oh, I have had a narrow escape. Quite. He'd have killed you sooner or later in any event. Well, Holmes, uh, what are you going to do? I think I shall run down and have a look at that machinery for myself. But, Holmes, that's just putting your head into the lion's mouth. Yes, I only hope the lion hasn't run away. Well, at least let me go along. Well, you can come as far as Erford Station if you like. I may need reinforcements. And I'm coming too. But your wound... Oh, better... rubbish. I feel 100% improved. After all, this is my problem, and my curiosity, if nothing else, won't let me take a, a passive part in its solution. Very well. Come along, both of you. We've barely time to catch the 10.45 train. Well, here we are, Holmes. Erford Station. Now what? First of all, we must find Colonel Stark's house. I, uh, I mentioned the name to the station agent in passing. Said he never heard of it before. Yes, it's an assumed name, of course. The gentleman in question is famous for his aliases. Well, then, how are we to find the house? I brought an ordnance map of the surrounding country. Of course. I drove ten miles at the most twelve in that carriage. All we have to do is draw a circle with a radius of twelve miles, and this station is its center, then visit all the places within that limit. Yes, rather a tiresome job. I think I can lay my finger on it without all that bother. Oh, you formed your opinion. I bet I know it's in the south. The country's more deserted there. No. I'd say east. I seem to remember driving east. Wrong again. Then it was west. There are several quiet little villages over there. No, it wasn't west. Well, then I'm for the north. There are hills there. Mr. Hatherley said he drove up and down hills. <laughs> Well, you've completely boxed the compass between you. You're both wrong. Mm -hmm. That's impossible. Not at all. This is my choice. It's here we shall find the house in the center of the circle. The starting point itself. What about the 12-mile drive? Six miles out and six miles back. Then that drive was just a hoax. And there, if I'm not mistaken, is the house. 
almost across the road. You're right, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure you are. Well, that's the very same wall I vaulted last night. And, and there, further down the road, are the bushes I hid in. I thought so. Well, I'll go over and have a chat with our friend, Colonel Stark. Mr. Hatherley, you and Watson stay here. Why can't give me go with you? Impossible, my dear Watson. I don't want to frighten Colonel Stark off before I have a look at that machine of his. Yes, but you're not a hydraulic engineer, Mr. Holmes. You wouldn't understand it. He'll suspect you immediately. I have a fairly good knowledge of hydraulics. I think it will see me through. However, if I'm not back inside of 15 minutes, you may come and get me. I may need assistance. <laughs> Most men are loyal customers of the friendly local store in their community, the store they can trust. Therefore, it's doubly pleasing that this fine independent store, the leading establishment in town, sells Clippercraft clothes. It's nice to get all the advantages of group buying at the store of your choice. And it's mighty easy on your pocketbook, too. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1,036 stores from coast to coast, bringing you beautifully tailored Clippercraft suits. At only forty and forty-five dollars, top coats and overcoats at only forty dollars, and sport jackets at only twenty-six fifty. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now, back to Sherlock Holmes. We find him at the door of the mysterious Colonel Stark. Confound it, you don't suppose he's made his getaway. Who are you? What do you want? Oh, how do you do? Colonel Stark, I presume? I've come to repair your hydraulic press. You, you, how dare you? Well, you see, a friend of mine, Mr. Hatherley told me of his experience here last night. I, I said I thought he was a fool to run away like that, that you must have mistaken him for someone else last night when you chased him in the dark. Yes, uh, yes, uh, that is so. A, a suitor of my sister, a good-for-nothing scoundrel. It was all a mistake. Just as I suspected. And when Mr. Hatherley said he wouldn't come back, and when I learned what a fine fee you'd promised him, I thought, why not come and have a look for myself? Of course, why not? You, too, are a hydraulic engineer? Naturally. Very well. You may come in. Ah, trunks and boxes in the front hall. We're about to leave this neighborhood? Yeah, uh, the, the English climate. It is bad for my sister's health. We go to the south of France. I wonder if I might see your sister. So sorry. She is in her room. She is not well. Oh, just for a moment. Hatherley seemed to be worried about her. Said he thought you might have mistreated her last night after he got away. Uh, ridiculous. Of course, but uh, if I could just see her, I could reassure him. He uh, seemed to want to call in the police. Uh, the foolish young man. Uh, but come, I, I let you see her. This way. She shall tell you herself that she is all right. That's very good of you, I'm sure. I wouldn't dream of troubling you myself, but you see, young Heatherly is... A... This is her room. Minna? Minna? Yes. See, Minna, I bring a gentleman who is anxious to know if you are all right. Uh, tell him how you feel, huh, Minna? I am well, thank you. I'm delighted to hear it. You see, my friend Mr. Hatherley was worried about you. Mr. Hatherley? The young gentleman I mistook for someone else last night. Oh, how is he? He's all right. Why, yes, of course. Oh, I'm so glad. Hold on a minute. Look here. Those bruises on your neck and arms... Has anyone been treating you badly? Uh, that was from falling downstairs, Amina. Uh, yes. I see. Well, Colonel Stark, suppose we take a look at your hydraulic press. Certainly. Of course. This way, please. Uh, 
Goodbye, Fräulein Stark. I hope you'll enjoy the south of France. The south of France? Yes. Lovely climate. Well, goodbye. This way, the press is on this floor. Here we are. Hmm. Gigantic affair, Colonel. Yes, it is capable of exerting enormous pressure. The sides are all of iron. Yes, very impressive. I pull the lever so. The water flows into the cylinders, you hear? But there's a leakage somewhere. Yes, loss of power. Yes, that third driving rod, the rubber banding around the top, seems to have shrunk. It doesn't quite fill the socket. Of course, how stupid of me not to notice for myself. Yes, it would have saved you a lot of trouble, wouldn't it? You can stop the machine now. Let's have a look at the inside. Very well, if you wish. You can enter here. Hmm. Very impressive. Like a prison. Hello, what's this on the floor? Metallic deposit. Wasn't it Fuller's Earth you're supposed to be mining? Yes, I thought you might see that. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Great thunder, he's locked me in. Start the machine. The ceiling's coming down on me. Well, Sherlock Holmes, you let yourself in for something this time. Closer. Closer, you wouldn't think it could move so fast. In a few minutes, it'll grind me to a helpless pulp. Better not think about it. I can reach it now. Down. Down. No good trying to push it back. I'll find it. I can't stand up any longer. Well, then, sit down, Sherlock. Lower. Lower. If I lie on my face, the weight will crack my spine. No, the other way will be less painful. Please, mister. Minna, where did you come from? Here, near the floor. A panel, it's open. By Jove, another outlet. Hurry, hurry, do not talk so much. You can get out. The opening's pretty small. Quick, quick. Yes, I... I can just squeeze through. There. God said, thank you, I saved. <laughs> Pretty close shave. Oh. Hear that? The presser has just hit the floor. Another minute in there, and I'd have been ground to a pulp. So, Minna was the good angel a second time, Doctor. Yes, a great girl, that Minna. Hathaway took quite a fancy to her. In fact, she eventually became Mrs. Hatherley. Oh, and her brother? Oh, Hatherley and I caught him on his way out as he was making his getaway. He's uh, still in prison, serving a life sentence for attempted murder and counterfeiting. What a ghastly story, Doctor. So that was what the hydraulic press was used for, counterfeiting. Yes, of course, Holmes suspected it from the first. Naturally. And now, Dr. Watson, would you like to give us a hint about next week's adventure? Uh, next week, I think I should explain why the ancient statue of Charles I, which stands in Charing Cross, holds a modern sword. I may even tell you how the original sword threatened the life of one of the premier dukes of England. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Give your child a run for your money. Join the March of Dimes. Send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Keep your kids in the running. Join the March of Dimes. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the Avenging Blade. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York... See your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your ticket. This is 
Cy Harris speaking for Twitter Craft Show. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations for mutual broadcasting systems. Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. What were those eggs Waldo had for breakfast, Nick? They had nitroglycerin in them. What? Someone put nitroglycerin in the eggs? No. What? Then how'd it get in? The chickens that laid these eggs put the explosive in. What? The eggs were laid by chemical chickens. And now the case of the chemical chickens. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. In Nick's office, he and Patsy are busy with the morning report. Uh, take this letter, Patsy. Right, Nick. To Mr. Jason Griggs. Dear sir, enclosed you will find a photograph taken on infrared film proving the will in question. Oh, Nick, boy, Nick, boy, I've been poisoned. If you don't save me, I'm a dead man. Now, Walter, look, we're too busy for practical oh, jokes. Oh, I'm feeling fast. If you don't find me an antidote, I'll be dead in two minutes. What have you got in that bowl? Eggs. Poisoned eggs. And I ate one of them. Are you kidding, Waldo? No, no, Nick. Some criminals have poisoned these eggs I was having for me breakfast. They're after me, Nick. Oh, nonsense. N- they've been poisoned, Nick. Smell of them here. All right. By George. Hmm? Sit down, Waldo. Sit down. Oh, is it too late, Nick? No, you're not dying, if that's what you mean. I have to make a chemical analysis to be sure. But you may have stumbled onto something, Waldo. <laughs> anything, Nick? Not sure yet. Oh, Patsy, get your pad. This is the last will and testament of Waldo Aloysius Smiglin, who departs this world foully murdered by his enemies. Quiet, Waldo. <laughs> you haven't been poisoned. Then what's in them eggs? Nitroglycerin. Uh, the explosive? I had dynamite for me breakfast. In minute quantities, yes. Someone put nitroglycerin in the eggs. No, the chickens that laid these eggs put it in. Oh, huh? Nick, are you joking? I'm not. These eggs were laid by chemical chickens. And nitro isn't a thing that chickens can pick up anywhere. Nick, I'll look into this. What do you think's going on, Nick? Can't tell you, but here's what we'll do. We'll all go to the store where Waldo's landlady bought these eggs. Uh-huh. We'll each buy as many as we can carry and bring them back here and test them. Who knows? Maybe we'll find crooks in our omelet. <laughs> This is the place, Nick. Bleak is gross. Now, those eggs were large brown eggs. Uh-huh. They go in separately and order five dozen each. I'll go first, Waldo next, Patsy last, right? Okay, Nick. Right. All right, I'm going in now. Follow me after a few minutes, Waldo. Sure. Okay, bud, how many dozen eggs are you here for? Uh, about five. Five dozen eggs and a buck a dozen. Here's your dough, five bucks. Hey, what's this for? It's the payoff, but I'm shelling out for the bum eggs I sold this morning. I beg your pardon, sir. I'm Janet Steele, pure food inspector for the health department. If you'd like to register a complaint about the eggs sold by this man... Have a heart, lady. I'm handing this customer a five-buck bill. What more do you want? No, no, you don't understand. I didn't buy any eggs this morning. I want to buy five dozen now. Ha-ha, I'm laughing. This dame already confiscated every egg in a joint. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, just dropped in to purchase a little hen fruit. No eggs in uh, this store will be sold. Huh? That's right, mister. No eggs. Uh, no eggs? You, you, you got boxes of them back there. I've condemned every one of them. Looks as if we'll have to try some other place, my friend. Yeah, but why can't we get some of these here? Say, Nick, what in the... Quiet. Hmm? We couldn't buy any eggs. Let's get away from the store window. I want to go around... Take a look in back of the store. What's this all about, Nick? Looks like a phony setup, Bessie. Oh? I'm sure the man in there isn't Bleaker. I miss my guess. He's a crook posing as Bleaker. Hey, what makes you think so, Nick? First place, the way he talked. Second place, by the money he offered me. I only got a quick look, but that $5 bill he offered me looked phony. What? Is this a counterfeiting case? It's worse. 
I'll explain in a few minutes. Right now, I want to see what's happened to the real bleaker. Ah, let's see. Regular suburban back alley. Garage behind the store. And here's the cellar entrance to the store. I think we better duck down to the cellar and look around. Get that door open, Walter. Right, Nick. Patsy, take a look at the garage. Just to play safe. Right away, Nick. God, this is a heavy door, Nick. Quiet. I'll give you a hand. Nick. Yes? Come here, quick. Look what I found in the garage. Holy smokes. It's a, it's a man all, all tied up and gagged. That would be bleaker. Help me get these ropes off, Walter. Yeah, sure. Take off the gag, Patsy. Golly, I don't think he's breathing. Yeah, maybe he's dead. No, no, he's still warm. Oh, thank heaven, Nick. Here, quick, Walter. Try artificial respiration. Yeah. One chance in a thousand, we can save him. All right, Nick. Listen, Patsy. We're in a spot. Yeah. Two. We've got to call Matty for an ambulance Three. and pull motor at once to give this man a chance. Four. But when an ambulance arrives, the crook inside the store is going to catch on. You've got to help me. How? Take off your hat. Four. Comb your hair into bangs. Make your face up heavily with plenty of lipstick. Disguise myself as a tough, in other words. Four. Right. That thug in there hasn't seen you yet. Four. So you can get away with it. Go into the store and get him out of there. Yeah. Get him out by hook or crook and stay with him. Oh, trust me, Nick. I'll do it if I have to sing torch songs. Now, look, Nick, I'm pretty sore about this. What's the idea letting that mug in the grocery store get away? I didn't let him, Matty. Patsy took him away. Do you realize that we can't bring Bleaker too? It's a murder rap? It's more than just a murder rap, Matty. Well, how are they doing with the pull motor, Waldo? Uh, no luck yet, Nick. Nick, what's all this about poisoned eggs? Very simple. Chickens are funny birds. What they eat goes into the eggs they lay. For yeah. instance, if a chicken eats moth bones, its eggs smell of camphor. No kidding. Fact. Now, somewhere in the country, there are some chickens that have been drinking water polluted with nitroglycerin. What's that? The eggs Waldo had for breakfast had traces of nitroglycerin in them. So? Might have been an accident, but when I found an obvious thug posing as a grocer in the store where the eggs are bought, I knew it was something else. Somewhere, Matty, up in the farming country, there's a crooked plant manufacturing supplies for criminals. Mm. Bootleg nitroglycerin for blasting safes, counterfeit money, probably everything that a crook can't buy legitimately. Holy smoke. And these polluted eggs are the giveaway to the plant. Huh? Right. Some of the nitro must have seeped out accidentally and polluted the water in a brook or something that run through a chicken farm nearby. Well, I'll be darned. That's why I had to hold on to that thug without tipping my hand. You've got to lead us to that place. Oh, what's the pull motor stopping for, Matty? Oh, the job is done, Nick. Oh, that man was practically dead when we found him, but he's alive now. You saved him, Oh, boy. good, good, Waldo. Can I question him? Oh, no, no, not, not for two or three days, the doc says. He is going to be tough enough just keeping him alive. Two or three days? Well, by that time, this whole mob may be a thousand miles away. Ah, it's all up to Patsy now. All we can do is go back to the office and wait for her to check in. <laughs> Daddy. Yep. Close that door, will you? I can't hear myself think. You're a funny babe. Okay. <laughs> when you invite a lady to eat in a private dining room, she likes to be private. <laughs> I never knew old man Bleaker had a good-looking daughter like you. What a break for me. You coming into the store looking for him? <laughs> Come you mind in the store for him? He didn't say he was going nowhere. He got a rush call. Had to see somebody about some garage business. Ah. Uh... Gonna be plenty sore when he hears I close up the place to go eat lunch with his knockout door. Oh, Eddie. <laughs> Ain't that waiter ever gonna bring us some food? Huh? Oh, I'll go call him. I'll get that punk moving. Okay, babe. Important garage business. That's a good one. <laughs> Back already, babe? Hello, Carla. Janet. Uh, I thought you were... The girl you brought? No, she's outside phoning, Carla. Phoning? In five will get you ten, she's calling a guy named Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Yes, Carla, Nick Carter. The man who came into Bleaker's store to buy eggs this morning when I was posing as a health inspector. And that pretty face you're making up to belongs to Patsy Bowen, Carter's secretary. Well, uh, well I knew it all the time, Janet. I you're mean... a liar. Well, don't worry about it, babe. I'll take care Not of that Not for me, kid. you won't. You're quitting the gang, Tyler. You're too dangerous to keep around. Janet. Don't, don't. So long, Tyler. <laughs> Ed 
Eddie Tyler sprawls over the table, two bullets in his heart, as Janet Steele slips out of the private dining room. With Tyler dead, Nick's only lead in the case ends. We'll learn what he does next in just a moment. And now, back to the case of the chemical chicken. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, Nick Carter and Waldo have pulled up to the cafe in answer to Patsy's urgent telephone call. Nick? Nick? Hey, this is Patsy. Yes, what is it, Patsy? Oh, Nick. Nick, it's too late. I've lost Tyler. For what? good. He got away when you were phoning me? No. Someone killed him. What? Killed him? Well, where's he now? In the back room. Sprawled over the table. I, I went back and there he was. All right, Patsy. This is a tough break, but we'll manage. You got the car and wait. Right. Waldo, come with me. All right. Yeah, that must be the room back there, Nick. Right. Come on. Keep your back to the door. No one comes in. All right, boy. Chance might have something. Pockets. No. No wallet. No papers. Nothing. Then then we're stuck, Nick? Not quite. There's one chance. His pockets and his pants cuffs. (coughs) What are you ripping his pockets out for, Nick? You'll find out later. Now, this is what we do. You telephone Matty. Tell him about this murder. Yeah. And join me at the lab. Okay. Patsy goes to Bleecker store to check the crates the tainted eggs were delivered in. Those crates are usually stenciled with the address of the farm that delivered them. Yeah, but what's that If for? Patsy can find that address, it may tell us where Eddie Tyler came from. Oh. She can't. We'll have to depend on his pockets and the cuffs of his pants. <laughs> Pocket steady, Walt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Want to be sure this vacuum cleaner picks up every particle of dirt and grit that's in it. Uh, this one's clean now, Nick. All right, give me the cuff of the pants. Okay. Clean them out, too. Look, I don't get it, Nick. Hold it steady. Mm. All right, that's clean. Yeah. And the other one. Okay. Oops, careful. That's it. All right, all finished. Yeah. Now, we open the vacuum cleaner. Mm-hmm. And we have one porcelain trap filled with assorted dust. Dust? And this dust is going under the microscope right now. Why? It's going to tell us where Eddie Tyler's been during the past few weeks. How the devil can dust do that, Nick? Use your head, Warren. Yeah, but, but there's dust in the air everywhere. But it's not all the same kind of dust. I find particular kinds of dust in particular localities. And that's what I'm counting on. Found anything yet, Nick? Uh-huh, I think so. Huh? Patsy? No, it's the law. A darn good in store, too, if you want to know. Find Eddie Tyler, Mary? Nick, this is a fine mess. You let Tyler get away so you can break the case and he ends up a corpse. Oh, when the commissioner hears about this tomorrow morning... The he... case will be ended by tomorrow morning. Are you kidding? No, hoping. I've been checking the dust from Tyler's pockets. What? Outside of ordinary dust found almost everywhere, I've found smelter dust, flower dust, and particles of dry hay, all in the deepest layers. That means Tyler's been living in a farming vicinity that also has an iron foundry and flour mill somewhere near. Would you like that? Give me that industrial map, Waldo. Right. Uh, Nick Carter speaking. Nick, Patsy, I've just finished searching Bleecker's store. Yes? It's no good, Nick. Every egg crate in the place has been destroyed. Not one left anywhere. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. This must be it. Huh? Nick, what on earth are you talking about? I've been checking my industrial map while you were reporting, Patsy. Oh. Matty, there's only one town in the near vicinity that's a farming center and at the same time has a flour mill and an iron foundry. That's Brickton. Huh? Brickton? That must be the place Tyler came from. I don't understand, Nick. Oh, you will pretty soon. Hurry back to the office, Patsy. You, Waldo, and I are driving up to Brickton right away. Half mile, Nick. That's what the sign said. Uh huh. Now remember, 
We stay undercover in this town. There's a sheriff in here that hates the very sight of me. Hey, did you have a run-in with him before, Nick? Yeah, in the Joplin case last year. But it was a, it was a run-in with her. Oh, hmm? oh, a lady sheriff? Like in Texas, eh? Hmm? Tougher in Texas. <laughs> Sheriff Moss Stickney is convinced I double-crossed her last year. She'll do everything she can to obstruct me now, so we stay undercover. All right. Now, look, when we get into Brickton, you and Waldo each rent a car. Yeah. I've divided Brickton into three areas. Each one of us covers one of the areas. Uh-uh, here's the town line, Nick. Uh-huh. Now, each of us visits every farm in our area and asks the farm owners if they deliver eggs to Bleecker in New York. Yeah, but wait, some of them farmers might not answer, Nick. Well, here are two $100 bills. You and Patsy each take one. Uh huh. If you meet a close-mouthed farmer, tell him this $100 bill was found in a crate of eggs delivered to Bleecker. He can collect if he has records proving deliveries of yesterday. Well, that ought to work. Oh, slow down, Nick. We're passing a rent a car or garage. Uh-oh. Run by the terrible Ma Stickney. All right. Go ahead. Each of you rent a car. And we'll meet back here at 6 o'clock tonight. Good luck. This is farm number three for Detective Waldo McGlynn to examine with his piercing eyes. Uh, Wilson's farm. Maybe we'll have better luck with this one here. (laughs) Ah, it is a farmer. It's a farmerette I'm going to be questioning. (laughs) Very pretty, too, in them pants. Uh, uh, Just a minute there, young lady. Yes? Uh, How would you like to earn one hundred... It's the health inspector. Oh, I've seen you before, haven't I, in Bleecker's Grocery this morning? Well, ma'am, I... You're the famous Waldo McGlynn, aren't you? Nick Carter's great assistant. (laughs) You got the right man, (laughs) ma'am. But it's a secret. Nobody's supposed to know that me and Nick is up here. Mr. McGlynn, I'm certainly glad to see you. It's about those eggs. uh, The bad eggs. Oh, you found them then? Yes, they're, uh, they're here on this farm. I need your help, Mr. McGlynn. I'm only a weak woman, and you... (laughs) Waldo McGlynn's the right man for you, ma'am. Where are them bad eggs? There's a building back of this farm. Up this road a little. I'll show you. Good. Does Mr. Carter know you're here? No, ma'am. Waldo McGlynn works alone. Good. Now, what's the layout here, ma'am? You see that house there, right along the chicken yard? Yep. There's some men live there. They rented it from Wilson. They pretend to be scientists doing research, but they... I I know, I know. They're crooks, ma'am. They're making dynamite and burglar tools for more crooks. Well, in some way, the nitroglycerin they're making got into the chicken's drinking water and tainted the eggs. I've already deduced that myself, ma'am. So this morning, when the eggs were delivered to Bleecker's Grocery in New York, Bleecker called Farmer Wilson on the telephone and complained. Uh Ah. Huh? And Wilson asked the crooks about it because he thought they were scientists. He couldn't understand it. Uh huh. And the crooks realized that the tainted eggs might lead the police up here to their factory. Yeah, sure. Enough. So when they learned that all the eggs in this particular shipment went to Bleecker's, they rushed down to the city and tried to cover up by closing Bleecker's mouth and paying off all the customers who came back to the grocery to complain. Yeah, sure. They even had a woman pose as a health inspector to make it look legitimate. But, ma'am, you... Come into the house, Mr. McGlynn. The crooks aren't here now. Hey, but, ma'am, you you were the health inspector. Yes, you... Mr. McGlynn, I was. Hi, Janet. Who's the character with the walrus spinach? Nosy little man. Works for Nick Carter. Hey, you can... Stand still, McGlynn, and don't reach for that rod or I'll blow you wide open. You're in cahoots with him. Shut You're up. The... Bindle. Yeah? Carter's in town. You have to drop everything and take care of him. You'll never harm Nick Carter. Hide You'll never down, get... Grandpa. Bindle. Tell the boys to get ready. You can tie up this character in the meantime. Okay. Oh, oh I no, forgot to tell you. I had to kill Eddie Tyler in town. He turned out to be a nuisance. What time is it, Betsy? 6.30, Nick. Oh, where in blazes is Waldo? Should have been here at 6.00. Maybe he located the farm. Yeah, he's probably there now, blasting away with that old forty-four of his. Guns of bigger menace to Walter than the underworld. <laughs> Sheriff Stickney! Sheriff Stickney, is that you? Well, well, it's that health inspector from New York. Sheriff Stickney, the most amazing thing just happened to me. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I thought Sheriff Stickney was in this car. If you want help, I'll be glad to give it to you. I'm Nick Carter. Not the Nick Carter? Well, I'm Janet Steele, a health inspector from New York. I was up here investigating a shipment of bad eggs. What did you say just happened to you, Miss Steele? Oh, it's the strangest thing. I found a car parked out on the road. It's one that Sheriff Stickney rents. And, and guess what was stuck in the windshield? Half of a hundred dollar bill. In what road? Where? Just outside Wilson's farm. It was near a large white building alongside the chicken yard. Chicken yard? Nick, that's it. Yes, Patsy, come on. Let's get out there fast. <laughs> Heavy Roadster surges forward as Nick and Patsy drive into what is apparently a cleverly baited trap. We'll see whether or not the jaws of the trap close on them in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of the case of the chemical chickens. Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It's 7 o'clock. The night is pitch black. Alongside the White House behind Farmer Wilson's chicken yard... Five men and a woman wait tensely, watching the turnpike road. We ought to be along any minute, then. I took the shortcut. He couldn't be more than five minutes behind me. He'll be along. This is what we do, Bindle. When he comes waltzing in looking for Grandpa, we knock him and the girl cold. Uh-huh. We take the three of them over to the covered bridge and drive them in the car into the river. Big accident. Oh, better do it. Hold it, so... Bindle. Listen. Car. It's Carter. I know that car. Get set, everybody. When I give the word, give them the lights and show them they're covered. Looks like Carter and the girl. Uh-huh. All right, Bindle. Now. Yeah. Oh! You're covered, Carter. You and the... Holy! What's the meaning of this ruckus? What are you doing with them guns? Guns is illegal in Brixton County. It's the team sheriff. Your name's Bindle, ain't it? And yours is Steele. Well, you're both under arrest. We got you covered, Ma. I'm sorry, your number's up. Don't get excited, boys. Ma's gonna have a fatal accident along with Carter and the girl. The only accident I'm gonna have is to pull the trigger of this Tommy gun. Hey, that's Carter. Carter, where? On the roof of your little factory, covering all of you. The first man who turns the light toward me gets a head full of slugs. Your racket's finished, Janet. You wanna know why? Ask your lawyer. You'll be seeing a lot of him while you're trying to beat a murder rap. Hand it to you. You're all right for a New York detective. Laying the whole case in my lap the way you did was mighty generous. Oh, Nick, boy, I got to apologize. I failed me mission. Just when I had this whole mystery solved, I made one little slip. One little slip. You walked right into a trap with your eyes wide open. You and your 44. Oh, <laughs> Just one thing, Carter. How'd you know that story of Janice was phony when she tried to trap you and Miss Bowen? Well, Sheriff Stickney, three things. Before I came out here, I checked up and couldn't find any record of an inspector on the health department staff named Janice Steele. That was the first thing. Then I didn't like the idea of a health inspector working up here in Brickton. It sounded phony. She wouldn't have any jurisdiction up here. She sure wouldn't. But the slip that jailed everything for me was when she claimed to recognize Waldo's car as one of the cars that you rented. For a stranger in Brickton, it was obviously impossible for her to know that. So I pretended to fall into the trap. And that's all. Ah, you done it in great style, Nick boy. When you showed up on that roof with a tummy gun in your hands, you was old Sim Carter all over again. Ah, none of that fancy deduction stuff. No, sir, bullets and action. Nick, take Waldo McGlynn's word for it. You'll be a detective yet. Well, Nick, what about the adventure Old Dutch Cleanser will bring us next week? Before I answer that, Bob, I I wish to remind our listeners that National Boys Club Week begins tomorrow. And as you know, sponsoring a boys club of my own, I'm particularly interested in this fine work which is combating juvenile delinquency so effectively. More than a quarter of a million boys find wholesome activity and entertainment in these clubs. Under competent leadership, they receive companionship and recreation and learn to develop skills and ambitions. According to law enforcement authorities, boys' clubs lessen delinquency wherever they're established. 
For these reasons, I personally, as well as the makers of Old Dutch Cleanser, wish to salute the Boys Clubs of America for their great contribution in building the citizens of tomorrow. And now, next week's adventure. Oh, it scares me just to remember that case. If it scares you, it must be some story. What's it all about? Well, Bob, it started with the mysterious disappearance of a lot of new cars that were never found again. And just about finished when Nick and I ended up in an old abandoned quarry full of water. But thanks to a new shortwave device, we managed to solve the case. I certainly want to hear this story. Uh, what do you call it, Nick? I call it the case of the lucrative Rex. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. Remember, when you go shopping tomorrow, get the cleanser preferred by more women in America than any other. Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Waldo is played by Humphrey Davis. Matty by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Tell you what's the matter with people, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Vance. Philo Vance. Oh, yeah, that's right. Vance. Want me to tell you what's the matter with people, Mr. Well? They're in a hurry. Always in a hurry. Rush here, rush there. Why? Well, some people have to be in certain places at certain times. Yeah, but why? Well... Suppose everybody was late getting it. Then it wouldn't make any difference, would it, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Vance. Philo Vance. Oh, yeah, yeah. Perhaps your logic is correct. So happens I have an appointment with the district attorney, and I'm early, so I thought I'd take your hansom through the park. I'm glad you did. Glad you did. Nice to have somebody to talk to. Of course, I could talk to my horse, Sadie, and in fact, I do. But once in a while, a, a man likes to get an answer, eh? Isn't that right, Sadie? Huh? Right, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, Edward Smith. No, Vance, you said it was, didn't you? Yes, but that seems such a long time ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, what are you doing up at the district attorney's, Mr. Vance? You're not in trouble, are you? Hardly. I'm a private investigator, and Mr. Markham is a friend of mine. Oh, you say you're a private investigator, Mr. Rick. That's right, I am. Funny thing me driving you, then. Awful strange things been happening in this park last couple of days. What? Well... For the past year, rain or shine, hot or cold, an old gent and a lady about 60, 70 maybe, have been meeting on the bench just around the bend of the road. Yes. Well, last couple of nights, only the lady was here. Seems like she was waiting for the old gent, but he ain't showed up. Now, where do you think he is? I haven't the slightest idea. Hmm. Some private investigator. I'll tell you something, though, mister. The last night this old gent was with the old Judy, she was crying something fierce and, and kind of pleading with him not to do something. Only I guess he did it anyhow on account if he ain't shown up in the last couple of days. It might have been a lover's quarrel. Uh-uh, not the way he kissed her just before he left. <laughs> <laughs> nah, something awful funny's going on with them too, mister. If I ever seen anybody who needed help, it was that old lady. Say, she's probably there now. What are you going to do about it? Well, let me know what happened.
Vance, will you, Mr. Vance? Yes, I will, Cabby. <laughs> Hello. Something wrong? Oh, uh, oh uh, no, nothing really. I... Forgive me for speaking to you. My name is Philo Vance. I understand you're in trouble of some sort. No, no, I don't think so. Thank you just the same, sir. You're very kind, but there really isn't anything. You are crying. <laughs> Mr. Vance, when you reach my age, there are so many things a woman can find to cry over. It's really nothing anyone can help me with. You might tell me your name. That certainly <laughs> isn't a secret you'd mind sharing. Well, I'm Mary Davis. Miss Mary Davis. Hello, Miss Davis. Hello. Now that we've met formally, do you mind if I sit here on this bench? Oh, not at all. It'd be nice to have someone to talk to. Oh, thank you. Miss Davis, I'm a private investigator. Oh, really? How, how nice. Well, apparently you don't understand. Well, to be perfectly honest about it, I don't. Well, when people are in trouble, I try to help them. You, for instance. I know you're in trouble. Won't you let me help? Oh, please leave, Mr. Vance. But why? Only a moment ago, you seemed anxious for me to sit down Go here. away, please. Go far away. Leave me alone and never come back. Never. I don't understand, Miss Davis. I don't want you to understand. I don't want anybody to understand anything. Just go away. That's all I ask you to do. Go away. Well, I only want Mr. to... Mr. Vance, I'm an old woman. I love only one thing in this world. One man. And if you don't go away and go away quickly... Jason will be killed. Now will you go away? Kind of cramped in this room. Guess you'd rather be out in the park with your girlfriend, huh, Jason? Well, stop tramping up and down. Give me a little peace. Peace? I, I've got to think. Nothing to think about. You do like I say, you'll be able to keep those nightly meetings with your girlfriend. She's probably out on that bench waiting for you now. Don't you want to go see her? Well, of course I do. Only you're not to talk about her. I won't let her be talked about by anyone like you. I won't, you hear me? Sit down, you old buzzard. If I'd blow on you, you'd fall flat on your face. Let's get this thing down pat so we don't miss tonight. What time do you unlatch the door so I can get in? Mr. Woods... I've been butler for the Oxford family for 20 years. You can stay there another 20 for all I care. Nobody will suspect you. That's why I dreamt this whole idea up. You open the front door. I come in. You hand me the combination of the safe. I pick up all that cash and those jewels in the library safe. Go out before anybody knows I've been there. Oh, I can't. I, I can't do it. I, I, I can't get you the combination. I can't let you in the house. Okay, so you stay here till you decide you can. Look, I just made up my mind. You're getting out of here right now, reporting for work. You know Oxford opens the safe every night. Watch him close and get the combination, and at midnight you're coming down and unlatching the front door. Am I? You don't, and I'll take care of that Judy you're so in love with, that Mary Davis. I told you never to mention her. <laughs> I'll do more than slap you and mention her if you don't do like I say. How come you never married her, Jason? Oh, shut up. <laughs> shut your mouth. <laughs> okay, okay. I guess that is none of my business. But money and jewels are my business. You're going to do as I say about that door in the safe so that at midnight tonight, business is going to be very, very good. Hand me that screwdriver we brought. This safe will be open in five minutes. Billy, we shouldn't. Just like a dame. What do you mean we shouldn't? This money is ours, isn't it? Uncle Dick keeps it in the safe and won't give it to us, will he? That money belongs to us and we're going to get it. Yes, I know it's ours, but I can't help it. I, I was brave enough up until now, but well, doing something like this, I, I, I just can't... Come on, it. What was that? What was what? Somebody's coming. He's passing the library. It was the butler, Jason. I thought you told me he was sick. He must have come back tonight. He didn't see us. I wonder where he's going. Shh. Shh. All right. Come on in. He's letting somebody come into the house. Yeah. Come on, Billy. I, I don't want to be caught. Let's get out of here. Uh. 
You're old, Vance. Only please, no double sixes. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough trouble beating you at backgammon without you getting lucky, too. All right, Markham. No double sixes. <laughs> Here we go. Oh. Four and an ace. Well, I think I'll make a board point. There. Your play, Markham. Yes, I know. Now, let's see. What points would I like to throw? The dice won't be able to hear even after you decide. Well, you can't be too sure. They're my dice, you know. Oh. <laughs> By the way, Vance, what delayed you tonight? An incident in the park with a charming old lady. It's still bothering me, by the way. I wish she'd have let me help her. I imagine by this time, so does she. Well, I think I'd like a 6-5 combination. I get it. I can close up a point on my home ball. Here we are. 6-5. Hmm. Well, Vance. Well, wait until the district attorney hears about the district attorney and his crooked <laughs> dice. <laughs> you know, I... Excuse me, Vance. Oh, surely. Hello? Mr. Markham? Yes? Rogers at headquarters. Yes? There's been a murder at 42 Johnson Street. What? A man named Oxford lives there alone. He's been killed. The butler's missing and the safe's been robbed. Right, Rogers. I'll be down there right away with Philo Vance. <laughs> No, Rogers, never mind. Philo Vance and I will go into the murder room alone. It was the master bedroom, wasn't it? Right, D.A. Nothing's been touched except the body's been removed. Good enough. Coming, Vance? Of course. Well, it seems to be an open and shut case, Vance. The downstairs door wasn't forced, the windows hadn't been jimmied, and the butlers disappeared. Apparently, he got tired of working for a living, strangled his employer, and departed. Apparently. Do you have a file on him, Markham? Rogers, checked. We know his name, Jason Masters. Mm -hmm. But he's never been in trouble, and apparently he's worked here for quite a while. I see. Anything else I should know? Only that the dead man had a niece and nephew, Jane and Billy Reed. They're his heirs. Will you want to see them? I might as well. Apparently our murderer has covered his tracks pretty well. Perhaps Jane and Billy Reed might lead to a clue. <laughs> I'm going to tell the police, Billy. I'm going to tell them. Oh, you are, are you? Yes. And are you also going to tell them what we were doing in the library at the time? Are you? Yes, I'll, I'll tell them that. I'll tell them anything. We needed our money, so I agreed to help you get it from Uncle Dick's safe. But we know who killed him. We've got to tell. Do we? Yes. Oh, fine. Well, then tell me, who killed Uncle Dick? Uh, the, the man Uncle Dick's butler led into the house while we were there. And who was that? Well... I, I don't know. All we know is that we were there and that some unknown man came into the house. You've got nothing to tell the police. I haven't, but but you have. You stayed behind when I ran out the back. Jane. Billy, did you... Shh. That might be the police. Oh. Now calm down, Janie. Come in. Good evening. I'm Philo Vance. Uh, hi, I'm Bill Reed, and this is my sister, Jane. And look, Mr. Vance, if it's about Uncle Dick's death, we don't know a thing. Not a thing. Wait a minute, that's not true. Jane. I don't care, it's not. Vance, you're not the police. I, I know about you. Please, please don't have us arrested. We, we didn't do anything. Perhaps you'd better finish what you started to say when your brother stopped you. Well, we, we were in the house when Jason the butler let a man in. We don't know who it was. I ran out. But don't do listen it. to her, Vance. She doesn't know what she's saying. It's true. Find the man that Jason led into the house and, and you'll find my uncle's killer, Vance. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Vance. Well, uh, like I was saying, Mr. Uh, riding through the park in my handsome cab gets to be a habit. See? You rode in it last night, you ride in it again tonight. That's right. Uh, let me off here, will you? Oh, okay, but I don't know what your hurry is. People always in a hurry. Oh, city worker. Well, here's your money. Goodbye. Bye. Come on, Sadie. Step on it. Come on, girl. Can I get home? Get something to eat? I'm sorry. <laughs> Good evening, Miss Davis. Oh, hello, Mr. Vance. I was hoping you'd come this evening. I want to tell you how sorry I am about being so rude last night. Oh, that's all right. Has your friend made an appearance this evening? No, but he will. Oh, I'm sure he will. It's too wonderful an evening for him not to come. I hope he does. Well, I thought I'd stop and say hello. 
I was trying to work out a problem in the hansom cab just now, but the cabbie wanted to talk, so I thought I'd get out. Oh. I'll see you again, Miss Davis. Uh, good night, Mr. Vance. Mary. Mary. Darling, where are you? Right here. Oh, Jason. I was waiting until you finished talking. Jason. Jason, darling. Oh, it's been so long. Many, many years, Mary. Too many. But it's not too late. Whatever time we have left, we'll spend together. We'll go away and forget. Forget? Yes, darling. Forget everything. Especially last night. The worst night any man ever experienced in his life. This is District Attorney Markham. The Oxford murder case opened with the finding of the body of millionaire Richard Oxford. Vance has questioned his true heirs, Jane and Billy Reed and has some information which he hasn't as yet disclosed to me, but feels that it pertains to the murderer. Jason, family butler to the Oxfords for many years, is missing. And the last I heard from Vance, he had decided to... No. Please. No, I can't tell you anymore, Mary. Don't ask me. But, Jason, you must. We can't start Perhaps off... Jason will tell me. Good evening again, Miss Davis. Mr. Vance. Mary, who is this? My name is Philo Vance, Jason. I was hoping you'd show up here tonight. You were Mr. Oxford's butler, weren't you? Yes, yes, I was, but but believe me... You had nothing to do with his death, I know. And by the way, in case you think my coming here just now was coincidence, it wasn't. Miss Davis here mentioned your name the first time I saw her, the time she ordered me away. Uh, yes, I did. I, I didn't mean to, Jason. Believe me, I didn't mean to. No, I don't imagine she did. But the fact that the Oxford butler was missing, the fact that she hadn't seen you for a few days, was too much coincidence to ignore... Especially as the name Jason fitted both of you. I decided to wait for you to show up. And here you are. All right. Here I am. Now what, Vance? Now you tell me who it was that you let into the Oxford house. How could you know that? It doesn't matter, Jason. Tell him. Please tell him. All right. It, it was a man named Harry Woods. He threatened harm to Miss Davis here unless I did what he said. Then he killed your employer. Well, I, I don't know. When I let him in, I went to my quarters. Do you know where I can find him? I know where he lives. I should. I was kept there for two days. Good. Give me the address, and Mr. Markham and I will try and get his number. This is the place, Vance. According to the address you got from Jason, this Harry Woods lives here in this house on the river. We'll stop. It's all right if you don't arrest Jason right now, isn't it, Markham? But as long as you know where to reach him... I do. Well, look, Vance. There's a man running for the speedboat that's moored to the dock. That's probably Woods. Come on, we've got to stop him. We won't if he ever gets into that boat. We won't stop him and we won't find him. Woods! Stop! Stop! A shot might do it, Markham. I think you'll find he has a record. All right, Vance. It's the only way, I guess. Got him in the leg. Excellent shooting, my friend. Now we can go and take him rather easily, I believe. I'll keep my gun out just in case. But that's the man who murdered Richard Oxford, Vance. I didn't say that. I wish it were. No, Markham, we've caught a criminal. But I don't think we've caught up with Oxford's killer yet. Come in. Uh, Mr. Vance? Miss Davis. Well, please come in. Thank you. Mr. Vance, I came to tell you that... Jason and I are married. Congratulations. I'm glad you did tell me. And I came to ask a favor. He's told you all he knows about Mr. Oxford's death. Won't you let him leave town with me? We want to go away. Well, that's really up to the police to decide. I know, but you have influence. Wouldn't you use it, please, for us? Well, I'll... Excuse me. Certainly. Philo Vance speaking. Hello, Vance. This is Jane Reed. Oh, yes. I I've got to talk to you. Will you come right over, please, before my brother gets here? Of course, but what is it? The night of the murder, I, I left Uncle Dick's house, but he stayed on. 
He knows something about Uncle Dick's death. Please, Vance, get here right away. So Billy might know who killed Mr. Oxford, eh? Yes, I think so. I, I, I'm sure you can get, get the whole story out of him. Where is he now? Well, he's out playing tennis at Windmere Courts. But I, I want you to be here when he gets home. Well, maybe I ought to go to the Windmere Courts to see him. No, no, I, I want to be with you when you make him tell what he knows. Come here, Vance. I'll be waiting. Very well, Miss Reed. I'll come at once. Goodbye. Well, Miss Davis, or rather, Mrs. Jason Masters... I think maybe I'll be able to do as you ask. Oh. Someone who knows something about the murder of Richard Oxford is going to talk. Oh, wonderful. Well, it isn't wonderful yet. First, I've got to hear what he has to say. Oh, I'll tell Jason. He'll be so happy. Do that. I'll be in touch with you, Mrs. Masters, before very long, I promise you. <laughs> District Attorney Markham speaking. Markham, this is Vance. Oh, glad you called, Vance. I'm having a lot of trouble with that Harry Woods. He's wanted by the police, all right, but he insists that he had nothing to do with the killing of Mr. Oxford. I tried to tell you that he wasn't our killer, Markham. But he admits that he was in the house at about the time of the murder. There were several people in the house at that time, Markham. I think I'm about to deliver the real killer to you. Excellent, Vance. Who is he? Not so fast, my friend. Young Billy Reed is going to do some talking. Meet me, Markham, because if Reed doesn't use his head... He's going to put his foot in it. Hey, you're running me ragged, pal. Cut it out. Cut it out. Hey, let's see if you can hit that one back. <laughs> hey, you missed, friend. Outside. Well, looks like my game. Now me for the showers and home. See you later, Frankie. Okay, Billy. Good so day. long. Yeah, sure was. Mr. Reed. Oh, Jason. What are you doing out here at the courts? I came to see you. Come over here where we won't be watched. Well, all right. What is all this? Hey, how did you happen to know I was here? Oh, that isn't important, Mr. Reed. I understand you know who killed Mr. Oxford. Who told you that? The same person that told me you were out here. My sister? Oh, she's crazy. I, I don't know who killed Uncle Dick. No, I do. Who was it? You're asking me to tell you. Why did your sister say what she did? Oh, because she knows I was in the house just before the murder took place. That's why. Oh, you were. And did you see your uncle killed? No. No, I didn't. You lie. No. You saw me kill him. No, honest. You were going to tell the police. No, now no. I'm going to kill you with my Jason, own hands. No, just no, I did your no, uncle. No. With my own hands, the way I killed him. Oh, I had to kill him. No. He woke when I went to his room to get the combination of the safe. He saw me. That'll be all, Jason. Get your hands off me. Vince. You too, huh? I can handle you. I may look old, but I'm strong. I'll get him. No, you won't. No. And now I'll do the same to you, Vance. You heard too much. You're smart. But your neck is just as easy to choke as... Don't, Jason. I don't want to have... Hold it, Vance. We're coming. Uh, hurry, Mark. Uh, Hang here. All right, Billy Daniels. Help me get this bad man off. You'll never take me. Billy Daniels. I can handle five like you. I can... Give him your hand. Get him. Hold him. Well, 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 that was close, Markham. Yes. I don't think our young friend Billy Reed suffered much damage. Oh, he'll be all right. You can take Jason in, you know. Murder? That's right, Markham. I heard him admit he killed Mr. Oxford when he tried to strangle young Billy Reed here. But I knew it was he long before that. Say, I, I, I've been reading about your work in the Oxford murder case, Mr. Uh... Uh, Vance. Uh, that's right, Vance. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I've been reading about it. You're pretty smart. Only you solved the case in too much of a hurry. Everything everybody does is in a hurry. Why? Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Let's let it go at that. Hey, tell me something. Yes? The papers say you knew it was this old Jason guy even before you heard him brag about it while he was choking us Billy Reed. How'd you know? Well, that wasn't difficult. First of all, Mr. Oxford was killed in his bedroom. Why would anybody kill him there if the only motive for murder was robbery of the safe? Oh. Oh, that's why it couldn't have been either that Billy Reed or his sister, huh? His sister had left the house, and young Reed had no reason to go into his uncle's bedroom. 
All he was there for was to get into the uncle's safe, and he could have done that rather easily. But how about this Harry Woods guy that the district attorney shot? He was a fugitive from the police, as I suspected. But he never knew that Jason had crossed him. Apparently, Jason had given him the combination of the safe, but Woods found it empty. And the reason it was empty was because Jason had been there first. Woods had no reason to go into Oxford's bedroom. None at all. Yeah. Well, how come Jason had a reason? He wanted the money from Oxford's safe. Money he could get married on. Apparently, his mind went a little haywire during the past few years, and he decided to get the combination of the safe from his employer's room. He was caught, and so he strangled Mr. Oxford. Seems to me he was taking a pretty big chance. Not really. There was always Harry Woods to throw the blame on. Yeah, yeah, sure there was. You know, there's one other thing I don't understand. And that is? Well, how this Jason all of a sudden made up his mind to kill young Billy Reed at the tennis court where you grabbed him. He thought he had to kill Reed. You see, Jason's wife was with me when Billy Reed's sister phoned and told me her brother was in the Oxford house the night of the murder and had probably seen the murderer. I repeated this conversation to Jason's wife. Oh, I get it now. The wife told Jason, told him Billy Reed knew who the murderer was, was going to talk, and that he was at the tennis court. So Jason went there, huh? I suspected that would happen, so I called District Attorney Markham, and we were there, too. The ironic part of the whole thing was that Billy Reed actually didn't know a thing. He left the house soon after his sister did. Well, you got this Jason call, and account of he had to get money in a hurry. Had to get it in a hurry. That's what I always say about hurrying... Gotta lead you to trouble. Oh, city. Word him. Well, thanks for the inside story. Oh, this is the end of the line, Mr. Uh... Vance. <laughs> and you're welcome. It's the end of the line, my friend, and also the end of the Oxford murder case. <laughs> Sorry, mister, and no harm done. No harm, you see. I'll very well show you. Hey, Rocky, come over here. Say, mister, what's the idea of the gun? You will never try that again. Never! Yeah, that goes all around, Buster. Give me that gun. Stop it, sir. Come Take your hands off of me. Not like get that gun. Yeah. How, how, how dare you, sir? How dare you? It always happens when customers come waving guns in the tambourine. You saw what he deliberately knocked from my pocket, scattered like chaff on the floor. Diamonds, sir. Diamonds of incredible value. So they're diamonds. Rocky, I was just carrying a tray past this table. I happened to bump into them. Happened indeed. You haven't heard the last of this, sir. Not for one moment. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Yes, Del Monte, the best-liked brand of canned fruits and vegetables in the whole wide world, takes you now to the Café Tambourine in Cairo, gateway to the ancient East, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story... Foolproof. They always pick my cafe tambourine. Like the fat guy who had draped his 300 pounds over a chair at a corner table, sipped at a drink, and waited for something. I kept watching because I'd seen him slide a gun under his coat lying on the table, and I didn't like it. 
When Chris bumped the table going by, a leather pouch hit the floor. And what came pouring out sparkled like a kid's eyes in a candy store. Mr. Fat whipped up with a gun, and it took me a good three seconds to get it away from him. Do you realize, sir? You have no right. I make all the rules in the tambourine, mister. They don't include guns. Honest, Rocky, it was just an accident. To deliberately knock the diamonds from my coat? Just pick them up, whatever they are. Yes. Yes. Here, I'll I'll help you. No, 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 don't touch them. Don't touch them. Uh, Have it his way, Chris. Well, you got him now, mister. You know what to do. Uh, I... I suppose there's no harm done after all. Sure, it's past history. So before there's any more trouble... Wait, sir. Perhaps I should apologize. Nobody's asking it. I'm Mr. Hegeman, Sidney Hegeman. Carrying such valuable gems on my person made me nervous. When they were knocked to the floor, I, I automatically pulled the gun. I didn't mean anything by it. Well, the next time you may automatically pull the trigger, so just move along. But uh, I had an appointment here. Not anymore, you haven't. You give me no choice. About my gun? Now, wait a minute. Won't hurt anybody now. All right, take it and get out. Thank you, sir. Good day. It had all the elements. A fat guy, a gun, and a fistful of diamonds. They were gone, but I figured the forgetting wouldn't come so easy. Things don't happen that way. It took just 15 minutes for more to come. An excited, slim-built fellow with five feet six of nervous blonde clinging to him. They stood looking around like they expected somebody. And I didn't have to guess who. Eddie... Eddie, I don't see him. Take it easy, Marguerite. This is the place. He said the tambourine. Well, yes, I know, but... Hey. Hey, you. Some folks call me that. You seen anything of a guy, a big fat guy? Called himself Sidney Hageman? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. He been in here? He's been in and out. Out? That was my idea. But I don't get it. He said to meet him here, it was all set. What was all set? Eddie, don't you see... No, no, no. It's all right, baby. You heard what Hageman said. He wouldn't let us down. He could have changed his mind. Please, let's just go away and forget about it. Sure. Why don't you do that? He's right, Eddie. Don't you see it? Now, look, Marguerite. You wouldn't ask me to pass up my big chance, would you? It's the kind of deal I've been waiting for all my life. It'll put us on easy street. Us, Eddie? Of course, baby. You know I'm doing this for you. I just wish I could be sure. Well, just give me a chance, then. All we got to do is sit down and wait for him. Yeah, suit yourselves. Oh, hey, wait. He didn't ask for me. Eddie Gamble? Didn't say a word. Yeah. Well, maybe he'll phone and tell me where to meet him. You'll let me know. Yeah, I'll let you know. Uh, Rocky, come over here a minute. Where's it now, Chris? Behind the bar. I want to show you something. Yeah. Have a look at this. I just found it. One of Hageman's diamonds? Yeah. Must have rolled behind the leg of a chair when fat stuff dropped him. Accidentally missed it when he was picking him up. A beauty, ain't it? It looks real enough. Of course it's real. Anybody could tell that. Big one, too. Just like all the rest of them he had. Well, I'll take it, Chris. Oh, uh, keep an eye on that couple at the front table. One diamond could mean enough, but when people start getting dramatic about a whole fistful of them around my place, it's time the police were in on it. So my destination was Captain Sam Sabaya. But along the way, I decided to stop by a little jewelry shop run by the trusted Abu Simbel, just in case. Ah, Effendi Jordan, is he not? Hi, Mr. Simbel. Allah has been gracious. And you? The same. Say, would you mind looking at this for me? A diamond, Effendi? I want to know what you think. Well, permit me to observe it under the eyeglass. But a moment... What do you see from there? The diamond of great brilliance. And quite perfect for one of such size. Then it's real. Say, a whole bag full like it would bring quite a price, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. A very great sum. If uh, you wish me to name a price, I must make further tests. Oh, don't bother for now. Thanks, Mr. Symbol. You would guard it carefully, Effendi. Why so? It has been said that the diamond is but a star sent to earth to give happiness. Should we not keep it so? Sure. I'll remember that. Well, Jordan, what brings you to headquarters this time? Maybe nothing, maybe a lot, Sam. (laughs) Must you always prepare me for what you have to say? Come, Jordan. That's about this diamond. It's a real one, too. I had it checked. 
What about it? A big guy named Hagerman had a whole sack full like this at my cafe this afternoon. He uh, happened to leave this behind. Then you have only to return it to him. I'm wondering, have there been any big diamond thefts lately? No, none that has been reported. Just the same, you better look up, Hagerman. Why, Jordan? You must know that diamonds are not uncommon in Africa and surely not in Cairo. What do you expect me to do? Nothing you don't want to do, Sam. If you wish to leave the stone for lost and found... No, no, no. If Hagerman comes back, I'll give it to him. It was just a hunch. <laughs> Jordan, be patient. You never need search for trouble. It will find you. Sam's advice made some sense, and I went back to the tambourine. Chris was switching on the front lights when I got there. Hagerman wasn't around, and neither was Eddie Gamble now. Only the girl still seated at the front table. She turned quickly as I came in, then looked disappointed. Oh, what happened to the boyfriend, Marguerite? Why, uh, he wanted me to wait. For what? Where is he? Well, Mr. Hagerman phoned shortly after you left to arrange a new meeting place. Where? Oh, I don't know. Eddie talked to him. Sure. This time he wanted you to stay here, out of the way, so you wouldn't queer the deal. Well, Eddie knows how I feel. Marguerite, Hagerman has it set up to sell Eddie something, right? Why, A lot I... of diamonds, like this one here. Mr. Jordan, how did you find out? Oh, all sorts of ways. But this one isn't... Don't worry about it. Hagerman has plenty left. How much is Eddie paying? A hundred thousand, maybe? Well, he wouldn't want me to say. Fifty thousand? Well, much less than they're actually worth. You know, people don't deal in diamonds this way unless there's something wrong. Of course, but what can I do? Ever since the deal started, Eddie's thought and talked about nothing else. I can't reason with him. Sure. It happens to people. Yes, greed can change a person so much. Oh, Chris. Yeah, Rock? Eddie Gamble got a phone call a while ago. Did you hear any of it? How could I help it here? All about a fistful of diamonds. At a good price, he kept saying. Did you get where he was going, Chris? Sure. The Dervish Bar. You know, that joint down in the Nile toward Bulak. Come on, Marguerite. I think we'd better join them. I locked the jewel carefully away in my office safe, and then we were driving for the Dervish Bar. It took a half hour to make it through the dark streets, and we got there just too late. Sidney Hagerman was in front at the curb, squeezing himself into a taxi that was off and gone. So it looked like the deal was finished. And we were sure of it when we saw Eddie Gamble standing under a dim streetlight a little way down, jostling a leather pouch in his hand. We were too late again as two natives with gleaming knives swung toward him out of the shadows. Eddie! Eddie, look out! He fought back without a chance. We kept running, but before we got there, the natives had suddenly turned and vanished. Only one of the knives was still there. Eddie! Eddie, darling! Very easy with him. Oh, what's happened to you? My... My They... Didn't get the diamonds. They tried. I don't care, darling. It's you. It's you. Here, take, take them. I. Huh. Eddie. Oh. Why didn't he listen to me? You'd better come away, Marguerite. Give me the pot. No. Give it to me. Come on. No, nobody will ever have them. What do you mean? These awful diamonds caused Eddie's death. They're to blame for everything. Nobody will ever have them. Marguerite, wait. Come back. She kept going wildly right toward the bank of the Nile. And she didn't stop till she was at the water's edge. Before I could stop her, she tore open the pouch and threw the jewels out over the water. Scattered pinpoints of fire that disappeared into the black, swirling river. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Friends, I know most of you like tomato juice. Maybe you like it with a squeeze of lemon or a dash of Worcestershire sauce. But the first time you try Del Monte tomato juice, try it just as is. And I think you'll get the surprise of your life. I know I did. I just didn't think it was possible for a tomato juice to be so fresh tasting and natural tasting. Really, Del Monte is a remarkably good tomato juice, friends. Just notice the fragrance when you pour it. If anything ever reminded you of a plump, juicy, fresh tomato picked fully ripe off the vine, that's it. 
You simply can't mistake that Del Monte presses this juice from the finest tomatoes. And they've packed it so fast and under such close quality control that what they've delivered in the way of rich, tangy, natural flavor is something very special. Why, it's so refreshing. My family drinks tomato juice between meals now. And think how good it is for them. Yes, if you like the flavor of fresh, ripe tomatoes, friends, you ought to be drinking Del Monte tomato juice. Get several cans at your grocer's tomorrow. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Foolproof. The jewels were gone now, somewhere in the mud at the bottom of the Nile. All I could do was call Sam Sabaya to pick up the late Eddie Gamble. We got Marguerite to her hotel. She was in no shape to talk about anything just then, so we called her tonight. I was sure there was something more here than an attempted robbery murder by a couple of Arabs. But it wasn't until the next evening that Sam buzzed me to come to headquarters. Marguerite was there. We went over what had happened, but I could tell Sam had something else on his mind. Jordan, you are sure you could not identify Eddie Gamble's assailant? No, Sam. They look like any of a thousand others. And you, Marguerite? I'm afraid not, Captain. It was so dark. Everything happened so quickly. Hmm. Nonetheless, we will make every effort to find them. Doesn't matter now. If I only could have stopped Eddie before... Yes, yes, I know. Most regrettable. All just for a handful of diamonds. How could we think it was worth it? Who can answer? It is written that Avarice is the brother of misery. Well, that seems to be all. And hey, what about Hageman, Sam? He was in on the beginning. Kindly keep me advised of your whereabouts, Marguerite. I may wish to see you again. I'll be at my hotel. Goodbye, Captain. Mr. George. Good day. Goodbye, Marguerite. Sam, don't tell me this is all. Most certainly not, Jordan. Now come with me. I followed Sam out and we got into his limousine. He likes a waiting game, so I held up the questions as we drove across to the Azbekia sector. We pulled up in front of a big mansion, half Egyptian style, with a few columns thrown in for the right effect. A servant let us in, and Sam asked for Mr. Claude Morgan. The name was familiar. A wealthy member of the British crowd. He came down right away. Captain Sabaya, it's very kind of you to give my call your personal attention. A valuable diamond theft demands my attention, Mr. Morgan. Diamond theft, Sam? Uh, uh, this is Mr. Jordan. A pleasure, Mr. Jordan. If Madam. you'll step into the library. Please be seated. Thank you. Now, Mr. Morgan, if you will tell us exactly what happened. May I explain that I've been on a business trip to Italy. When I got back, the diamonds were gone from my wall safe. Would you have any idea when the theft occurred? No, Captain. I was away for almost a month, returning only yesterday. I did not discover the theft until this afternoon, when I called you. It begins to look like my hunch was right, Sam. As you say, Jordan. I was not aware of this when you talked to me yesterday. I do not understand, Captain. A man known to have a large number of diamonds on his person was in Mr. Jordan's cafe yesterday, a very fat man named Hagerman. Hagerman? Then you know of him? Why, yes, I've had some association with him. Like I, I said, don't... Sam, find him. I shall, Jordan. But the perplexing problem remains that of the evidence. We know that he had some jewels, but how can one say that they were from Mr. Morgan's safe? Yeah, I see what you mean. The jewels are now lost at the bottom of the Nile River. But that's incredible. If what you say is true... Hey, wait, Sam. They're all gone except one. Still in my office safe. Oh, yes, of course. I'd quite forgotten. Say, Mr. Morgan, could you tell if the diamond I have is one of yours? Oh, I could, yes. The stones were insured, each piece listed and described separately. I could surely tell. Let's get it, Sam. Jordan, I have met at headquarters. Please bring the stone there for Mr. Morgan to see, say, in two hours. If that is agreeable. By all means, Captain. Two hours. I'll be there. Sam and I went out together. He dropped me at the tambourine, and I promised to let him know what cooked. The night crowds were just coming in, but Chris wasn't around. I wondered about that as I went through the cafe and opened my office door. Chris! Rocky! Uh, take it easy. I'll get the gag off. Ah, uh, that's better. Boy, am I glad you got here, Rock. The cords in my wrists are killing me. Uh, just a sec, I'll have you loose. Come on now, what happened? Well, I... Uh... I heard a noise back here. 
When I came in, a couple of Arab natives were tearing up the place. Well, you're lucky they didn't put a knife in you. Don't I know it. They grabbed me and tied me up. Yeah. What about the safe? Oh, they couldn't get in there. Oh, we better make sure. But I'm telling you, Rox, they didn't open the safe. Chris, think again. The diamond's gone. Gone? But ain't that it? No. There's a stone here, all right. Same size, but not the diamond. Look at it. Yeah. Not so clear. No sparkle like the other one. Well, what the heck goes? I was here all the time. That's what I want to know. How could anyone get in the safe, take the diamond, and on top of that, leave this one in its place? Maybe somebody switched them before you put it in the safe. Oh. What I put in there was the diamond, I'm certain. Well, you sure got me, Rock. It all makes sense. Everything makes sense, Chris. When you get the answer. I made sure Chris was all right, sent him out front to help catch up with the customers. I closed the safe, put the stone in my pocket, and went out the back way to get to my car. I was as far from any answer as the Earth is from Mars. But somebody could tell, including a couple of native Arabs. I met them sooner than I expected. Hold him at the wall, Jehovah. As you say, Negab, the knife is at the throat. Yeah, I saw the other one. For each man, there is the knife. Sure. Like the one you used on Eddie Gamble, what? We love life, Effendi. We would not like to take yours. You weren't so squeamish the last time. We kill only when we are told. So give it to us. Quickly. Give you what? The stone. The stone which you have. Search the Nile. you find a lot of them. Only the stone which you have. At once, Effendi. It's in my right coat pocket. Make up a look. So. Yes, Jehoshaphat. This is the one. You two guys collect rocks for a hobby? <coughs> we have another. But we love life, Effendi. So we spare yours. I'll send you a thank you card. Where to? No address. We fold our tents like the Arabs. And they silently stole away. Now it was about as plain as a Chinese puzzle with all the pieces missing. A diamond is taken from my safe. A new stone is put in its place. Undoubtedly one that's worthless. Then they steal the new one. That's how it looked. And if that wasn't it, what was? I didn't know, but pretty soon I was pounding at the door of Abu Simbel, the jeweler. His wife finally let me in, and I waited till he came down, pulling on a robe and straightening his fez. Oh, Mr. Jordan again. You have brought the diamond to my place of business. Now the diamond's gone now, Mr. Simbel. Then why do you wake me at this hour? Because another stone showed up in its place. Only, uh, it's gone too. Uh, if in the... Uh, perhaps the sleep is not yet from my mind. Look, you said something about making further tests. Was that to name a price or to make sure it was a diamond? Even the humble jeweler is sometimes fooled by what he first sees. I put the diamond you saw in my safe yesterday. A while ago, I found another stone in its place. But the sparkle was gone. So, I was mistaken. What do you mean? Tell me. The test would have shown a diamond is double refractory. Not so the jargon of Ceylon. Jargon? Some call it the zircon. When placed in silver sand and subjected to great heat, it becomes clear and takes on great brilliance for a time. For how long? Mm, two days, perhaps. The luster then fades. So you're telling me the stone I had was a jargoon. It never was a diamond. No, a star sent from heaven. I am most sorry, Mr. Jordan, if my mistake has brought you trouble. Oh, no, no trouble at all, Mr. Symbol. You've told me just what I wanted. I left Abu Simbel and got to my car, and I knew where I was going. So the whole fistful of diamonds Hageman had sold Eddie Gamble weren't diamonds either. Only jargoons from Ceylon. In just ten minutes, I was pressing on the buzzer to Marguerite's hotel room, first floor rear. She was still up. Oh, Mr. Jordan. One last visit, Marguerite. Please, what are you doing? You didn't say you were coming here. I was until now. But things change, don't they? I don't understand. Like a lot of hopped-up jargoons. Jargoons? Yeah, like the ones you deliberately planned to throw away right into the Nile. You know better than that, Mr. Jordan. Why would I plan such a thing? Just so they wouldn't be found till too late, if at all. But I was beside myself. I didn't know what I was doing. You saw yourself. Wasn't I supposed to? Why, anyhow, the jewels are gone. Sure. Hageman makes the sale for plenty of money, and then you get rid of them. Only it happens the jewel stuff is penny ante. There's a murder involved. Your boyfriend, Eddie Gamble. Not as far as I'm concerned. A couple of stray Arabs did that. All foolproof. 
Yeah, I thought they were strays, too, at first. But when they jumped me for the jewel this evening, I saw they were working for somebody who tied in with a diamond job. I wish I knew what you were talking about, Mr. Jordan. You know, Hagerman made quite a mistake when he left that phony diamond on my tambourine floor. It put a big hole in your scheme. Somebody had to get it back. Did they? Come to think of it, who knew I had that jewel? You did. I showed it to you in my tambourine. Well, you're not trying to accuse me you're of You're up the... to your ears in murder, Marguerite. Maybe there are a few things you'd like to tell me now. Why should I tell you anything? It's either me or Sam Sabaya. Make your choice. Why, if I tell you, you... Mr. Jordan! She was looking at the window, but before I turned, the shots came. <laughs> they were for Marguerite, and she dropped. And without thinking, I ran over to the shattered window. A man was running up the passageway to the street, and I went after him. When he turned, I ducked back. The slugs cut the wall over my head, and I was moving again. So was he. The next shots were thrown wild over his shoulder. After the last one, he dropped the gun. And we did the 440 till I reached him a block and a half further on and tried for a flying tackle. It took his wind, and the fight was over. But I kept it up, dragging him to his feet and over under a light where I could see who it was. I got a surprise. The kind that finally told me what it was all about. He was the man from the big house in the Azbekia sector. Claude Morgan. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. It's a sure sign of spring when people start breaking out the picnic baskets and polishing up the barbecue forks. That means outdoor meals ahead. And that means Del Monte catsup to me. There just isn't a catsup made that does as much for a picnic sandwich or a grilled hamburger. Yes, and from the way Del Monte catsup is disappearing off the shelves at the grocery store, plenty of women must think so, too. Try it yourself. Pour it out, bright and red and tempting. Get the fragrance of those fine spices and just taste the special richness of flavor Del Monte gets out of ripe tomatoes with that wonderful ingredient, pineapple vinegar. You'll say you've absolutely never enjoyed catsup flavor like this before. Well, I'd say it's just the catsup you'd expect from Del Monte. Why, I doubt if there's a woman in the West who doesn't know what that name means in quality and flavor. You'll like everything about Del Monte catsup, friends, including its low price. If you haven't tried it, how about tomorrow? Back now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. Well, Claude Morgan came along to headquarters peaceably enough. By the time he was able to think straight again, he was already booked and in a cell for the murder of Marguerite. Right quick after that, Sam went out looking for Sidney Hagerman. I went back to the tambourine, and just before closing time, Sam came in and joined me at a back table. I will only be a moment, Jordan. Oh, no rush, Sam. Sit down. A couple of coffees here, Chris. Right away, Rock. Oh, an excellent idea. Jordan, you will be interested to know that we have found Sidney Hagerman. Oh, good. That leaves only a couple of stray Arabs. There's a call out. They will be found. However, a few things are not quite clear to me. Better check my ideas with Claude Morgan. Figures he's the kingpin in the whole scheme. Mm, yes, the scheme. An insurance gyp, Sam. A big elaborate setup to convince us that Morgan's diamonds were stolen. He probably has them tucked away in Italy someplace. Hey, you might contact the police there. If Morgan himself does not tell me. Ah, uh-huh. the coffee. Oh, thanks, Chris. Sure, Rocky. <clears throat> now, Jordan, this strange tale of the jargoon. Oh, it isn't important where Hagerman got them. The idea was for me to see them at the tambourine and then to know of their sale to Eddie Gamble. Hmm. Then Gamble was not a party to the scheme. No, just the fall guy. Marguerite knew how to use him, too. Gamble gets killed, Marguerite goes wild and throws the jewels into the Nile. Now, everybody thinks Morgan's jewels are gone. There's all the proof he wants. I see. Meanwhile, what is at the bottom of the Nile are only jargoons. Morgan has the real one and can still file an insurance claim. With all the proof he needs that the diamonds are stolen. Except for one big slip. The stone which Hagerman accidentally left on your floor. Sure. I take it they had put the heat to the jargoons to make them look like diamonds the day before. If he'd gotten back the one I had before it changed to its original color, we still might not have the truth. A great deal of trouble for only a faded jargoon. 
Well, the insurance scheme and Morgan's part in it was new to me till Marguerite got killed. And when I caught up with Morgan, it all cleared. Mm. It seems that Marguerite and Hagerman chose a dangerous employer. Yeah. I'd guess Morgan planned to knock off Hagerman just like he did Marguerite. Then nobody would know. <clears throat> this is excellent coffee. Tell me, how do you make it? <laughs> My professional secret, Sam. But I'll, uh, I'll trade it for some of your professional secrets. <laughs> Need you find that necessary, Jordan? You have a way of learning what you would know without my help. For the finest in tomato flavor, enjoy the whole family of Del Monte tomato products. Del Monte catsup and chili sauce. Del Monte tomato sauce and tomato juice. And Del Monte whole peeled tomatoes. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jane Avello as Sam Sabaya and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is The Strange Fate of Professor Amar. When it's real corn patch flavor you want, just ask for Del Monte corn, either golden cream style or vacuum-packed whole kernel. Yes, if you want rich, sweet, melt-in-your-mouth butter tender corn, look for Del Monte, the brand that always puts flavor first. Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. 